be heard, and now they're using their lack of playing to be heard even louder. Professional athletes using their actions to call for change. Wendy Woolfolk, NBC News. President Trump didn't go far to accept the Republican nomination in an unprecedented move. He delivered his acceptance speech on the South Lawn of the White House. The final night of the RNC was more upbeat, including a moving message on second chances from a criminal justice reform advocate pardoned by the president. The nearly 22 years I spent in prison were not wasted. God had a purpose and a plan for my life. I was not delayed or denied. I was destined for such a time as this. I recognize that my dad's communication style is not to everyone's taste. And I know that his tweets can feel a bit unfiltered. But the results, the results speak for themselves. We face an invisible enemy that we didn't ask for nor invite, but we will defeat it. We will defeat it because America is where innovation happens. NBC's Tracy Potts joins us with more from D.C. And Tracy, the president's message, though, was decidedly darker than that. Well, it was, Francis, and it was actually the second longest convention speech that we have ever seen in either party. Uh, the first was the president's speech four years ago. And while he was speaking at the White House, there were protests happening outside. In fact, Senator Rand Paul said that he was attacked by what he called an angry mob. He described it as a crazed mob of about 100 people. This while inside 1,000 people were on the White House South Lawn listening to President Trump and a large part of that speech was attacking Joe Biden and his record. Joe Biden is not a savior of America's soul. He is the destroyer of America's jobs. And if given the chance, he will be the destroyer of American greatness. If you give power to Joe Biden, the radical left will defund police departments all across America. They will make every city look like Democrat-run Portland, Oregon. No one will be safe in Biden's America. The problem we have right now is we're in Donald Trump's America. They're looking for more violence and more disruption because it helps them politically. He views this as a political benefit to him. You know, he's rooting uh, for more violence, not less. And it's clear about that. And what's he doing? He's kept pouring gasoline on the fire. This happens. Also countering the president's speech in Washington, vice presidential nominee Kamala Harris. Uh, she said that the president had failed the most basic and important part of his job, protecting the American people. Francis. All right, Tracy, thank you. This morning, don't miss Craig Melvin's exclusive sit-down interview with Senator Kamala Harris coming up on the Today Show. Another Confederate statue has been toppled, this time in Lake Charles, Louisiana. The South's Defenders Memorial Monument survived the summer protests but could not stand up to Hurricane Laura. Just two weeks ago, officials voted to keep the statue on the courthouse lawn after a lot of debate. It has been damaged in other storms before, and restored, but critics hope that that will not be the case this time. So we see the damage there. Let's talk about now Laura's aftermath and where it's headed. Here's NBC meteorologist Janessa Webb. Janessa, good morning. Hey, good morning. Good morning, everyone. We now have tropical depression. Laura, it has been downgraded. I do think we'll see our last advisory from the National Hurricane Center this afternoon, but still it's causing a lot of rain for central Arkansas as it makes its way through the Mississippi Valley. We're still going to watch the leftovers of the storm system across the Ohio Valley for your Saturday morning before it starts to really push into more of the northeast. It is going to be a soggy one from Charlotte all the way into to Boston. That's a look at the big weather story of the day. Here's a closer look at your day ahead. Our temperatures across the deep south, we have heat alerts that are in place uh, across uh, Texas and even for the upper Midwest. We're going to watch the severe weather threat Orlando today. Cloudy skies all the way into Charleston. We'll look at that all important weekend forecast coming up. All right. Great job with all the hurricane coverage yes. this week, Janessa. Right, two people are lucky to be alive after their small plane crashed and flipped upside down in the Florida Evergr Everglades. It happened in an isolated area of Broward County, so rescuers needed to pick them up in airboats. The pair suffered minor injuries, and the FAA and the National Transportation Safety Board are investigating that crash.
Breaking news overnight, Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe is stepping down. Japan's national broadcaster NHK reported that the Prime Minister intends to resign. The news caused stocks to briefly fall in Japan. Abe says that he plans to step down to deal with health issues. He has made some recent visits to the hospital. The Prime Minister confirmed the reports just moments ago during a press conference. A major reversal from the CDC. The agency is now walking back a recommendation from earlier this week that said people with no virus symptoms do not necessarily need a test. The previous recommendation said all close contacts of infected individuals should be tested regardless of symptoms. The CDC's director now says that all close contacts of confirmed or probable COVID-19 patients may consider testing. The change comes after the decision sparked backlash from medical experts. A new study from UCLA revealed a disturbing trend about the toll of COVID-19. It shows there was a five-fold increase in coronavirus deaths among working-age Latinos in California over the last three months. One researcher said the victims are unsung essential workers like farmers and truck drivers. The coronavirus has killed more than 12,000 people in California, and nearly half of them are Latino. Today, tens of thousands of people are expected to descend on the National Mall to protest police brutality in a march organized by the Reverend Al Sharpton's National Action Network and the NAACP. It comes on the 57th anniversary of the March on Washington, where hundreds of thousands gathered to demand civil and economic rights for African Americans. The march culminated with Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. delivering his historic I Have a Dream speech on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial. Lord & Taylor is officially going out of business. The luxury department retailer announced that it is closing all of its 38 stores, ending a nearly 200-year run. The announcement comes weeks after the company filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy protection. Our interactive state-by-state -state plan year vote guide has everything you need to know about casting a ballot in the 2020 presidential election. See where your state stands on voting rules and read up on deadlines, restrictions, and more. Visit NBCNews.com slash plan your vote to learn more. A new song is playing throughout San Francisco this summer. The mysterious sound seeping through the fog is leaving some Bay Area residents confused. To some, it sounds like a hum. And for others, a whistle. NBC's Jake Ward may have solved the mystery. Since early June, a ghostly sound has drifted across San Francisco. And social media lit up with a range of reactions, calling it soothing, unsettling, even alien. But it's not supernatural. It's the city's most iconic landmark, the Golden Gate Bridge. The big factor in designing a bridge is, of course, wind. This, the Golden Gate, is a big cut in the landscape that acts as a wind tunnel. That means that the whole design of the bridge turns into one big sail when the wind is strong enough. And these, the original 1937 struts of the railing, catch the wind. It's the new, thinner version of those struts that are creating that noise. When you ask engineers why wind matters on a bridge, well, they always name the same one, the Tacoma Narrows Bridge. The bridge whips about like some fluttering ribbon. It was nicknamed Gallop and Gertie for its tendency to move in the wind. And in 1940, against gusts of just 40 miles an hour, it began to twist, then the concrete buckled, and it collapsed. It literally shook itself to pieces. The consensus was that the solid side railings were responsible. Engineers everywhere are haunted by it. This wind retrofit project is to ensure that that type of effect or phenomenon doesn't happen here at the Golden Gate Bridge. The important thing is that scale model tests of earthquakes and high winds showed the bridge will be stronger than ever. But those tests didn't reveal the eerie sound it would make. Engineers here are working on a plan to quiet the hum. But in the meantime, the bridge harmonics are a reminder of the high stakes and complicated work of building and maintaining a roadway high above the waves. Jake Ward, NBC News, San Francisco. Wow, it's fascinating. fascinating. At least after all this time, we know now the cause of it is originally just to make everybody safer. Yeah, hey, it's some creepy wind chimes, but it's better than that yeah, Tacoma right? Bridge. Yeah, Tell exactly. That. That's right even now. freaky to watch after all this time. 
Good morning, everyone. It's all about the weekend now, and it's going to be kind of a soggy one for the East Coast. That's the leftovers of that tropical system, Laura. Nice and sunny across the Great Lakes. But if you're across the East Coast, Sunday is going to be the day where it'll start to dry out and temperatures very comfortable. The heat and humidity, it starts to die down. Really want, to, want everyone to enjoy the weekend because when I see you on Monday, let's talk about the tropics. Once again, we have two systems that have potential development late next week. Francis yeah, let's talk about some whiplash after that. Make sure we'll enjoy the weekend then. Janessa, wow. thank you. The Gulf Coast is now assessing the damage after a direct hit from Hurricane Laura. Lake Charles, Louisiana was in the path of the eye of the storm as it made landfall. The city likely has a long road to recovery ahead of it. NBC's Jay Gray is on the ground there. And Jay, tell us more about the aftermath that you see there. Well, you know, Francis, it's overwhelming. It seems everywhere you turn, there's devastation and debris. This twisted, sheared metal, part of what used to be a gas station here. You can see the pumps still there, but this one is gone, ripped away and tossed away by the storm, evidence of the sheer power of Laura. At first glance, it has the appearance of a child's messy playroom. Cars and trucks scattered on their sides. But a closer look and it's clear. This mess is no game. There's so much damage here. You, you're going, this is, this is a disaster area. You know, I mean, it's a literal disaster. From Cameron, where the massive storm came ashore through Lake Charles, the devastation from Laura stretches for miles. This was the most powerful storm to ever make landfall in Louisiana. A Category 4 hurricane with sustained winds of 150 miles an hour. Ripping apart homes and businesses, literally pulling trees from the ground, snapping power poles, scattering and twisting lines, most of the area still without electricity. <laughs> Communities, and we now know families, cut to their core. At least six people killed in the storm, and officials fear that number could grow. Certainly I'm concerned that as we continue to go out and do primary and secondary search and rescue, we're going to find more fatalities. I, I hope not. Survivors now working to piece together what Laura left behind, the hurricane, tearing away most everything here, except... We will rebuild. We always do. Their resolve. Yeah, and look, it's the strength this community is definitely going to need. Uh, Francis and Philip, this is going to be a long, a very difficult recovery here. Back to sure, you. tough days ahead for them. Jay, thank you. All right, there, uh, there's a lot. It's full of musician memorabilia and is all going up for auction soon and all for a good cause. Items range here from a pair of Ozzy Osbourne's glasses. How cool is that? A jacket worn by Cher uh, to a signed Billie Eilish ukulele. Uh, even a tracksuit worn by Sir Elton John. Uh, not just music items either. Her John Stamos' leather jacket yeah. from Full House. So that cool. Uncle, Uncle Jesse. Yeah, exactly. It all goes uh, to benefit Music Care's COVID-19 Relief Fund. Uh, the bidding, I understand, has already begun, and the actual auction closes on September 9th. I love it. Great. Good stuff out there. I'm thinking the apartment building is going to fall on top of us because you can hear stuff knocking against the, the brick. Hurricane Laura unleashes devastation on multiple states, taking at least six lives in the process. We've got the latest. A big night for Republicans who used the White House for the final night of their convention. As President Trump accepted his party's nomination for a second term amid fanfare and big protests outside the grounds. Protests in the wake of the Jacob Blake shooting, including an interview with a 17-year-old accused of killing two, and the next steps for the NBA and professional athletes whose professional paws captured a nation. And we'll meet the woman who has survived two pandemics as she shares her secret to a happy life on this final Friday of August. Early today starts right now. Thanks for ending your week with us. I'm Francis Rivera. And I'm Philip Mena. Hurricane Laura delivered a shattering and deadly blow to the Gulf Coast, leaving a trail of chaos. At least six people died from the storm. A riverboat casino got wedged under a bridge and plumes of smoke blanketed the air after an oil refinery went up in flames. People living within a one-mile radius of Westlake were told to shelter in place because of the release of chlorine gas. And this is what Lake Charles, Louisiana looks like. 
Boats were tossed around, roofs peeled off their homes. President Trump is set to visit that storm-ravaged area this weekend. Our Chris Pallone has the latest. In southwest Louisiana, it was a day of taking stock and cleaning up. There's so much damage here. You, you're going, this is, this is a disaster area. You know, I mean, it's a literal disaster. I mean, the recovery time for this is going to be phenomenal. Hurricane Laura struck the area just after midnight, the most powerful storm ever to make landfall here. Packing 150 mile per hour winds and heavy rain, the storm destroyed buildings, toppled trucks, and brought trees and power lines down. Lake Charles, one of the hardest hit cities. I'm thinking the apartment building is going to fall on top of us because you can hear stuff knocking against the, the brick. A chlorine gas leak at a plant near Lake Charles caused a major fire. The smoke could be seen for miles, and nearby residents were told not to go outside. And yet, despite all of it, the governors of Louisiana and Texas are counting their blessings. We're thankful we didn't get more storm surge than we did. A terrifying night, which will be followed by weeks, maybe months, of cleanup and construction. Chris Pallone, NBC News, Lafayette, Louisiana. More than 500,000 people were ordered to evacuate ahead of the storm. A number chose to remain and endure the dangerous night in their homes and others with concerns about coronavirus and shelters. Sam Brock spoke with those who rode out the storm. Francis, good morning. Ahead of a Category 4 hurricane, hundreds of thousands of mandatory evacuations in Texas and Louisiana. But not everybody heeded the call, although many lived to tell about it. We find out why they decided to stay behind. Families across Texas uprooted by a Category 4 hurricane after opting to ride out the storm. Why'd you stay home? Because we had trouble getting back in here whenever Hurricane Rita come through. And I swore I'd never leave again after that. The cracked trees and splintered roofs. Last night I heard a crash and of course this oak tree is in the middle of the house. Destroying homes but not shaking foundations. We've done it a few too many times in the last 20 years. But Anyway, we will rebuild. We always do. They battened down their property as in past storms, but this one bore a new threat, coronavirus. Being in a large shelter or a large building with a lot of people, um, it, it was a huge factor in my thinking of evacuating. Arata Young also says he couldn't afford to evacuate. The five-year Marine Corps veteran has tied up his life savings in a yoga and jujitsu gym. He just opened last week, along with his fellow veteran partner, Tyler Pete. The pair weren't sure what they'd find. How relieved were you when you walked up here and saw that your gym is still intact? It was insane. Yeah, it was, I walked in and it was literally like someone had taken a 45 pound plate off of my shoulders. I'm extremely relieved. Um, I could probably kiss him. <laughs> a ray of hope shining through a frightening storm. As you can see, not every homeowner in Laura's path was so fortunate. Many now forced to begin the rebuilding process under a cloud of COVID-19 and economic uncertainty. Francis, back to you. Hoping for the best for him. Sam, thank you. President Trump delivered his case for a second term right from the steps of the White House. On the final night of the Republican National Convention, the president painted a dire portrait of a country that would plunge into chaos if Joe Biden wins the election. Throughout his speech, protesters made their voices heard, chants and music echoing faintly in the distance. No peace! No justice! No peace! No justice! No peace! NBC's Alice Barr has more on the fireworks of the night. A grand finale for the Republican National Convention. President Trump laying it all on the line in his bid for a second term in office. I profoundly accept this nomination for president of the United States. Drawing a sharp contrast between his vision for America and Thank Joe you. Biden's. Joe Biden is not a savior of America's soul. He is the destroyer of America's jobs. And if given the chance, he will be the destroyer of American greatness. The president formally accepting his party's renomination against the unprecedented backdrop of the White House and at a time of crisis, offering support to those in the punishing path of Hurricane Laura. And as racial justice protests rekindle after the police shooting of Jacob Blake in Wisconsin, the president forcefully underscoring his law and order message. No one will be safe in Biden's America. My administration will always stand 
with the men and women of law enforcement. On the coronavirus pandemic, downplaying the devastating death toll and touting his administration's response. We will have a safe and effective vaccine this year, and together we will crush the virus. President Trump appealing to his base with promises to protect conservative values. If the left gains power, they will demolish the suburbs, confiscate your guns, and appoint justices who will wipe away your Second Amendment and other constitutional freedoms. Trailing in the polls, the president and his party making a primetime sales pitch for a second term. In Washington, Alice Barr, NBC News. Well, that dark tone served as a through line at the GOP's convention, despite the initial promise of a positive message. Make no mistake, no matter where you live, your family will not be safe in the radical Democrats' America. Crime, violence, and mob rule. Crime ravaging our streets. That is what America would see if it allowed Biden-Harris to run this country. Trump was elected to protect our families from the vengeful mob. They want to abolish the suburbs altogether. Nightmares are becoming real. Cops killed, children shot. Drug addicts, guns on the street. The mob will try to destroy you. They want to enslave you to the weak, dependent, liberal, victim ideology. Burn down the foundations of our country to the ground. Spawns of Satan. You will not recognize this country or yourself. The American way of life is being dismantled. Anarchy and chaos on our streets. This election is shaping up to be church, work, and school versus rioting, looting, and vandalism. The police aren't coming when you call. They want to steal your liberty, your freedom. They'll disarm you, empty the prisons, lock you in your home. They want to control what you see and think and believe so that they can control how you live. It's a horror film, really. It's madness. It remains to be seen how the tone resonates with voters, but we know ratings for the RNC have taken a hit. Wednesday drew in about 15.7 million viewers. Last week's DNC brought in just under 21.5 million on its third night. And after the onslaught of attacks on Joe Biden during the RNC. Well, the Democratic nominee, I guess, is, she's firing, is firing back this morning. He also, uh, he responded to calls to not even bother debating the president. He spoke one-on-one -on -one with our Andrea Mitchell. After Republicans blamed him all week for violence, including in Kenosha, Joe Biden and Kamala Harris fighting back. Biden responding to Vice President Mike Pence saying, you won't be safe in Joe Biden's America. The problem we have right now is we're in Donald Trump's America. They're looking for more violence and more disruption because it helps them politically. He views this as a political benefit to him. You know, he's rooting uh, for more violence, not less. And it's clear about that. And what's he doing? He's kept pouring gasoline on the fire. This happens to be Donald Trump's America. You think the president of the United States is rooting for the violence because he thinks it helps him politically? I think he views it as a political benefit. And by the way, I condemn violence in any form, whether it's looting or whatever it is. So who's, who's rooting for the violence here? Biden also said the biggest safety issue is people dying from COVID and what he called pressure on the scientists on testing and therapies, possibly on vaccines. Did you ever see any administration put so much pressure on the FDA? There's no bounds to what this guy does and his team does. We should listen to the scientists. How concerned are you that they're going to rush something out even before Election Day? And I, I pray to God that would happen tomorrow. That'd be wonderful. But the fact is, let's assume we finally do get a vaccine, that it works. And how much credibility are we going to have telling people to take it after going through all this stuff that they've misrepresented so far? Kamala Harris also punching back with Craig Melvin for The Today Show. And the American people, regardless of race, or gender, or age, or geographic location, have a right to believe that their leaders will speak truth, even when these are difficult truths. After Nancy Pelosi joked that Biden should not debate the president because she said the president doesn't tell the truth, Biden told me he will be at the debates, but will have to fact check the president while debating. Francis. All right, Andrea, thank you. Uh, NBC meteorologist Janessa Webb joining us now with the latest on what remains of Laura. Janessa, good morning. 
Hey, good morning, Francis and Philip. We're continuing to watch the storm system now downgraded to a tropical depression. But what you're going to see throughout the weekend is going to be a rainmaker. Right now, we've already seen about five inches of rain across central Arkansas. And as the system continues to split apart, it's definitely losing its wind force, but the rain is going to continue all the way into the Mississippi and upper uh, Mississippi Valley. Even for Ohio, we're going to watch that for Saturday afternoon and then it heads towards the northeast late day for your Saturday. That's a look at the big weather story of the day. Here's a closer look at your day ahead. Our temperatures across Wichita this afternoon, 97 degrees. We're also watching the threat of some severe storms sparking up a few tornadoes possible. New Orleans, more rain, lower 90s, Raleigh, 93. We'll take a look at that all-important weekend forecast coming up, guys. All right. Can't wait to hear it, Janessa. Thank you. So, so this morning you're grabbing your coffee and then your donuts. Some exciting news for the donut lovers here. Krispy Kreme is back with their popular chocolate glazed donuts for one day only. Today, the classic original glazed donut is covered in a rich chocolate glaze. It's being offered at locations across the U.S. It's normally a short-lived appearance on their menu, so make sure you actually get out there and grab it before they run out. Yeah, I do not think I've ever had a chocolate glaze. No, not from right? there. Leading the news, a wrongly imprisoned black man has been freed from a North Carolina prison after serving 44 years. 64-year-old Ronnie Long was released on Thursday after the state of North Carolina filed a motion in federal court to vacate his 1976 conviction by an all-white jury. Long had been sentenced to life in prison for first-degree rape and first-degree burglary, something he says he didn't commit. The federal appeals court says they also found a pattern of police suppression of material evidence in the case. I just appreciate the people that come out and supported me. And I wanted you to know, you understand, saying, look, if they will never, ever, never, ever, ever lock me up again. That's right. They'll never lock me up again. Yeah. All right, Ronnie says he's excited for his first meal out of prison. It'll be mac and cheese, beef ribs, a salad, and some lemonade. Additional charges have been filed after two people were killed during protests in Wisconsin. According to court documents, 17-year-old Kyle Rittenhouse faces two first-degree homicide charges as well as two charges of attempted homicide. On the streets of Kenosha, the community continues to call out for change after the police shooting of Jacob Blake. Here's NBC's Wendy Wolfolk. The Kenosha community is grieving as a result of this tragic shooting. A grieving community, but a fourth night of protests over the police shooting of Jacob Blake. Peaceful. The voice of those people is not falling upon deaf ears. We are hearing what is being said. And new calls for swift action. Burn upon the, spirit, the, upon the state's attorney in this state, attorney general, to move and move quickly. We must know that justice works for the people. Wisconsin's attorney general identified the officer who shot Blake seven times in the back as Rustin Chesky. He's been with the Kenosha Police Department for seven years but also announcing that investigators found a knife in the driver's side floorboard of Blake's car. Before the shooting, according to investigators, Shesky and two other officers were responding to a domestic incident and unsuccessfully tried to taser and arrest Blake. Oh. Meanwhile, 17-year-old Kyle Rittenhouse is charged with intentional homicide after two people were shot and killed during protests Tuesday night. There are Orlando Magic players heading back into the locker room. And unprecedented aftermath in the sports world. After the NBA abruptly canceled games this week, and some Major League Baseball and soccer teams followed suit. They're using that voice to be heard, and now they're using their lack of playing to be heard even louder. Professional athletes using their actions to call for change. Wendy Woolfolk, NBC News. London Zoo began its annual weigh-in to find out how the longest closure in the zoo's history since World War II has affected their animals. Staff noticed that some of the species have been sad because there were no visitors due to the pandemic. The test will confirm if over 19,000 animals have been physically changed by the toll of the lockdown. I know we have. Right? I've been sad with no Across visitors. Across the board. <laughs> you know? I wonder what that first animal was, though. It had some, it had like zebra legs. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. Fascinating. Yeah, all right. Panda fans, here is your first look at the National Zoo's new baby panda. 
Mei Xiong left the cub alone to get some water, giving us a close-up look. You can see the cub there crying, tossing, and turning. Aww. Yeah, the baby is Mei Xiong's fourth successful birth. Oh, Mama's letting that cub <laughs> cry it out. You yeah. have to tend to it right away. Yeah, self-soothing. Right. Yeah, <laughs> after spending over 500 days in a shelter, a three-year-old dog named Joey has finally found a loving home. When Joey's new owners came to take him home, the shelter's staff lined up to drape lays around the pooch's neck. Joey responded with goodbye kisses. The staff said it was the day they have all been waiting for. So hopefully at the end of the week, all these cute puppy animals and, and nice. Like Cuties great, make you smile. Yep, great story for a Friday. Good morning, everyone. This is the last weekend of August. It's going to be kind of sloppy for most of the East Coast. Drenching rain due to that tropical uh, depression right now. Nice and sunny, though, for the Great Lakes and the heat. It's going to continue to build for the Pacific Northwest. Sunday, it's the day for the Northeast. Get out there and enjoy it. 89 across portions of the Mid-Atlantic. We'll be right back. They moved today, 200,000 strong, down a broad and tree-shaded avenue in Washington, D.C., softly singing and chanting the hymns born of their movement and those that have gone before. There were no ranks, but they were orderly. They moved with dignity, but there was no sternness. Their placards demanded the uprooting of every vestige of discrimination and said it must be done now, but they showed no anger. Regardless of all else, for most, these will be the lasting impressions of the March on Washington for jobs and freedom. On this day in 1963, hundreds of thousands of protesters gathered in Washington, D.C. to demand civil and economic rights for African Americans. The march culminated with Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. delivering his historic I Have a Dream speech on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial. And today, tens of thousands are expected to gather in that same spot to protest police brutality in a march organized by the Reverend Al Sharpton's National Action Network and the NAACP. Now to a birthday party for a woman born in 1918. Aunt Bob's has lived through two pandemics and is full of advice. Here's NBC's Harry Smith. If it looks like Babs Miss Rucky knows how to wear a crown, it doesn't surprise her family. To them, she is royalty. We love her to death. Babs turned 102 this week. I hope I look that good when I'm 75. And still holding court. Happy Yay! birthday! She has more stories than anybody you ever seen in your life. Some are not true, some are true, some get exaggerated, but boy, is she a lot of fun to listen to those stories. A child of immigrants born into a pandemic, through years thick and thin, a witness to history, and an optimist. I had a confidence that the country will be fine, everything will be good, because I was told that it would be. My father told me, my mother told me, my president told me. That was FDR for the record. In the game of life, making it to 100 requires luck, love, and most likely, a twinkle in your eye. Get a Coke and chips, have fun. Have fun and enjoy. And it, it's, it's a good life. It's worth suffering for and living for. Life is good. And that part, we do believe. Harry Smith, NBC News. Wow, whatever her secret is, she better bottle that because it is working for yeah. 102 years. 102 years old, happy birthday to Bab. She does look great. Wow, if we can only, like they said it best, if we can only look like that 70 or 80, we'll take it. There you go, have fun, enjoy. That's what's up. I'm thinking the apartment building is going to fall on top of us because you can hear stuff knocking against the, the brick. Hurricane Laura unleashes devastation on multiple states, taking at least six lives in the process. We've got the latest. A big night for Republicans who used the White House for the final night of their convention as President Trump accepted his party's nomination for a second term amid fanfare and big protests outside the grounds. Protests in the wake of the Jacob Blake shooting, including an interview with a 17-year-old accused of killing two, and the next steps for the NBA and professional athletes whose professional pause capped a nation. And we'll meet the woman who has survived two pandemics as she shares her secret to a happy life on this final Friday of August. Early today starts right now. 
Thanks for ending your week with us. I'm Francis Rivera. And I'm Philip Mena. Hurricane Laura delivered a shattering and deadly blow to the Gulf Coast, leaving a trail of chaos. At least six people died from the storm. A riverboat casino got wedged under a bridge and plumes of smoke blanketed the air after an oil refinery went up in flames. People living within a one-mile radius of Westlake were told to shelter in place because of the release of chlorine gas. And this is what Lake Charles, Louisiana looks like. Boats were tossed around, roofs peeled off their homes. President Trump is set to visit that storm-ravaged area this weekend. Our Chris Pallone has the latest. In southwest Louisiana, it was a day of taking stock and cleaning up. There's so much damage here. You're going, this is, this is a disaster area. You know, I mean, it's a literal disaster. I mean, the recovery time for this is going to be phenomenal. Hurricane Laura struck the area just after midnight, the most powerful storm ever to make landfall here. Packing 150 mile per hour winds and heavy rain, the storm destroyed buildings, toppled trucks, and brought trees and power lines down. Lake Charles, one of the hardest hit cities. I'm thinking the apartment building is going to fall on top of us because you can hear stuff knocking against the, the brick. A chlorine gas leak at a plant near Lake Charles caused a major fire. The smoke could be seen for miles, and nearby residents were told not to go outside. And yet, despite all of it, the governors of Louisiana and Texas are counting their blessings. We're thankful we didn't get more storm surge than we did. A terrifying night, which will be followed by weeks, maybe months, of cleanup and construction. Chris Pallone, NBC News, Lafayette, Louisiana. More than 500,000 people were ordered to evacuate ahead of the storm. A number chose to remain and endure the dangerous night in their homes and others with concerns about coronavirus and shelters. Sam Brock spoke with those who rode out the storm. Francis, good morning. Ahead of a Category 4 hurricane, hundreds of thousands of mandatory evacuations in Texas and Louisiana. But not everybody heeded the call, although many lived to tell about it. We find out why they decided to stay behind. Families across Texas uprooted by a Category 4 hurricane after opting to ride out the storm. Why'd you stay home? Because we had trouble getting back in here whenever Hurricane Rita come through. And I swore I'd never leave again after that. The cracked trees and splintered roofs. Last night I heard a crash and of course this oak tree is in the middle of the house. Destroying homes but not shaking foundations. We've done it a few too many times in the last 20 years. But Anyway, we will rebuild, we always do. They battened down their property as in past storms, but this one bore a new threat, coronavirus. Being in a large shelter or a large building with a lot of people, um, it, it was a huge factor in my thinking of evacuating. Arata Young also says he couldn't afford to evacuate. The five-year Marine Corps veteran has tied up his life savings in a yoga and jujitsu gym. He just opened last week, along with his fellow veteran partner, Tyler Pete. The pair weren't sure what they'd find. How relieved were you when you walked up here and saw that your gym is still intact? It was insane. Yeah, it was, I walked in and it was literally like someone had taken a 45-pound plate off of my shoulders. I'm extremely relieved. Um, I could probably kiss him. <laughs> <laughs> a ray of hope shining through a frightening storm. As you can see, not every homeowner in Laura's path was so fortunate. Many now forced to begin the rebuilding process under a cloud of COVID-19 and economic uncertainty. Francis, back to you. Hoping for the best for him. Sam, thank you. President Trump delivered his case for a second term right from the steps of the White House. On the final night of the Republican National Convention, the president painted a dire portrait of a country that would plunge into chaos if Joe Biden wins the election. Throughout his speech, protesters made their voices heard, chants and music echoing faintly in the distance. No peace! No justice! No peace! No justice! No peace! NBC's Alice Barr has more on the fireworks of the night. A grand finale for the Republican National Convention. President Trump laying it all on the line in his bid for a second term in office. I profoundly accept this nomination for President of the United States. Drawing a sharp contrast between his vision for America and Joe Biden's. Joe Biden is not a savior of America's soul. He is the destroyer of America's jobs. And if given the chance, he will be the destroyer of American greatness. 
The president formally accepting his party's renomination against the unprecedented backdrop of the White House and at a time of crisis, offering support to those in the punishing path of Hurricane Laura. And as racial justice protests rekindle after the police shooting of Jacob Blake in Wisconsin, the president forcefully underscoring his law and order message. No one will be safe in Biden's America. My administration will always stand with the men and women of law enforcement. On the coronavirus pandemic, downplaying the devastating death toll and touting his administration's response. We will have a safe and effective vaccine this year. And together, we will crush the virus. President Trump appealing to his base with promises to protect conservative values. If the left gains power, they will demolish the suburbs, confiscate your guns, and appoint justices who will wipe away your Second Amendment and other constitutional freedoms. Trailing in the polls, the president and his party making a primetime sales pitch for a second term. In Washington, Alice Barr, NBC News. Well, that dark tone served as a through line at the GOP's convention, despite the initial promise of a positive message. Make no mistake, no matter where you live, your family will not be safe in the radical Democrats' America. Crime, violence, and mob rule. Crime ravaging our streets. That is what America would see if it allowed Biden-Harris to run this country. Trump was elected to protect our families from the vengeful mob. They want to abolish the suburbs altogether. Nightmares are becoming real. Cops killed, children shot. Drug addicts, guns on the street. The mob will try to destroy you. They want to enslave you to the weak, dependent, liberal, victim ideology. Burn down the foundations of our country to the ground. Spawns of Satan. You will not recognize this country or yourself. The American way of life is being dismantled. Anarchy and chaos on our streets. This election is shaping up to be church, work, and school versus rioting, looting, and vandalism. The police aren't coming when you call. They want to steal your liberty, your freedom. They'll disarm you, empty the prisons, lock you in your home. They want to control what you see and think and believe so that they can control how you live. It's a horror film, really. It's madness. It remains to be seen how the tone resonates with voters, but we know ratings for the RNC have taken a hit. Wednesday drew in about 15.7 million viewers. Last week's DNC brought in just under 21.5 million on its third night. And after the onslaught of attacks on Joe Biden during the RNC. Well, the Democratic nominee, I guess, is, is, she's firing, is firing back this morning. He also, uh, he responded to calls to not even bother debating the president. And he spoke one-on-one -on -one with our Andrea Mitchell. After Republicans blamed him all week for violence, including in Kenosha, Joe Biden and Kamala Harris fighting back. Biden responding to Vice President Mike Pence saying, you won't be safe in Joe Biden's America. The problem we have right now is we're in Donald Trump's America. They're looking for more violence and more disruption because it helps them politically. He views this as a political benefit to him. You know, he's rooting uh, for more violence, not less. And it's clear about that. And what's he doing? He's kept pouring gasoline on the fire. This happens to be Donald Trump's America. You think the president of the United States is rooting for the violence because he thinks it helps him politically? I think he views it as a political benefit. And by the way, I condemn violence in any form, whether it's looting or whatever it is. So who's, who's rooting for the violence here? Biden also said the biggest safety issue is people dying from COVID and what he called pressure on the scientists on testing and therapies, possibly on vaccines. Did you ever see any administration put so much pressure on the FDA? There's no bounds to what this guy does and his team does. We should listen to the scientists. How concerned are you that they're going to rush something out even before Election Day? And I, I pray to God that would happen tomorrow. That'd be wonderful. But the fact is, let's assume we finally do get a vaccine that it works. And how much credibility are we going to have telling people to take it after going through all this stuff that they've misrepresented so far? Kamala Harris also punching back with Craig Melvin for the Today Show. And the American people, regardless of race or gender or age or geographic location, have a right to believe that their leaders will speak truth, even when these are difficult truths. 
After Nancy Pelosi joked that Biden should not debate the president because she said the president doesn't tell the truth, Biden told me he will be at the debates, but will have to fact check the president while debating. Francis. All right, Andrea, thank you. NBC meteorologist Janessa Webb joining us now with the latest on what remains of Laura. Janessa, good morning. Hey, good morning, Francis and Philip. We're continuing to watch the storm system now downgraded to a tropical depression. But what you're going to see throughout the weekend is going to be a rainmaker. Right now, we've already seen about five inches of rain across central Arkansas. And as the system continues to split apart, it's definitely losing its wind force, but the rain is going to continue all the way into the Mississippi and upper uh, Mississippi Valley. Even for Ohio, we're going to watch that for Saturday afternoon in then it heads towards the northeast late day for your Saturday. That's a look at the big weather story of the day. Here's a closer look at your day ahead. Our temperatures across Wichita this afternoon, 97 degrees. We're also watching the threat of some severe storms sparking up a few tornadoes possible. New Orleans, more rain, lower 90s, Raleigh, 93. We'll take a look at that all-important weekend forecast coming up, guys. All right. Can't wait to hear it, Janessa. Thank you. So this morning you're grabbing your coffee and then your donuts. Some exciting news for the donut lovers here. Krispy Kreme is back with their popular chocolate glazed donuts for one day only. Today, the classic original glazed donut is covered in a rich chocolate glaze. It's being offered at locations across the U.S. It's normally a short-lived appearance on their menu, so make sure you actually get out there and grab it before they run out. Yeah. Leading the news, a wrongly imprisoned black man has been freed from a North Carolina prison after serving 44 years. 64-year-old Ronnie Long was released on Thursday after the state of North Carolina filed a motion in federal court to vacate his 1976 conviction by an all-white jury. Long had been sentenced to life in prison for first-degree rape and first-degree burglary, something he says he didn't commit. The federal appeals court says they also found a pattern of police suppression of material evidence in the case. I just appreciate the people that come out and supported me. And I wanted you to know, you understand, saying, look, if they will never, ever, never, ever, ever lock me up again. That's right. They'll never lock me up again. Yeah. All right, Ronnie says he's excited for his first meal out of prison. It'll be mac and cheese, beef ribs, a salad, and some lemonade. Additional charges have been filed after two people were killed during protests in Wisconsin. According to court documents, 17-year-old Kyle Rittenhouse faces two first-degree homicide charges as well as two charges of attempted homicide. On the streets of Kenosha, the community continues to call out for change after the police shooting of Jacob Blake. Here's NBC's Wendy Wolfolk. The Kenosha community is grieving as a result of this tragic shooting. But a grieving community, but a fourth night of protests over the police shooting of Jacob Blake. Peaceful. The voice of those people is not falling upon deaf ears. We are hearing what is being said. And new calls for swift action. Burn the burn the, the, the state's attorney in this state, attorney general, to move and move quickly. We must know that justice works for the people. Wisconsin's attorney general identified the officer who shot Blake seven times in the back as Rustin Chesky. He's been with the Kenosha Police Department for seven years but also announcing that investigators found a knife in the driver's side floorboard of Blake's car. Before the shooting, according to investigators, Shesky and two other officers were responding to a domestic incident and unsuccessfully tried to taser and arrest Blake. Oh. Meanwhile, 17-year-old Kyle Rittenhouse is charged with intentional homicide after two people were shot and killed during protests Tuesday night. There are Orlando Magic players heading back into the locker room. And unprecedented aftermath in the sports world. After the NBA abruptly canceled games this week and some Major League Baseball and soccer teams followed suit. They're using that voice to be heard and now they're using their lack of playing to be heard even louder. Professional athletes using their actions to call for change. Wendy Woolfolk, NBC News. London Zoo began its annual weigh-in to find out how the longest closure in the zoo's history since World War II 
has affected their animals. Staff noticed that some of the species have been sad because there were no visitors due to the pandemic. The test will confirm if over 19,000 animals have been physically changed by the toll of the lockdown. I know we have. Right? I've been sad with no Across visitors. Across the board. <laughs> you know? I wonder what that first animal was, though. It had some, it had like zebra legs. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I don't know. Fascinating. Yeah. All right. Panda fans, here is your first look at the National Zoo's new baby panda. Mei Shang left the cub alone to get some water, giving us a close-up look. You can see the cub there crying, tossing, and turning. Aww. Yeah, the baby is Mei Shang's fourth successful birth. Oh, Mama's letting that cub <laughs> cry it out. You yeah. have to tend to it right away. Yeah, self-soothing. Right. Yeah, <laughs> after spending over 500 days in a shelter, a three-year-old dog named Joey has finally found a loving home. When Joey's new owners came to take him home, the shelter's staff lined up to drape lays around the pooch's neck. Joey responded with goodbye kisses. The staff said it was the day they have all been waiting for. So hopefully at the end of the week, all these cute puppy animals and, and nice. Like Cuties great. make you smile. Yep, great story for a Friday. Good morning, everyone. This is the last weekend of August. It's going to be kind of sloppy for most of the East Coast, drenching rain due to that tropical uh, depression right now. Nice and sunny, though, for the Great Lakes and the heat. It's going to continue to build for the Pacific Northwest. Sunday, it's the day for the Northeast. Get out there and enjoy it. 89 across portions of the Mid-Atlantic. We'll be right back. They moved today, 200,000 strong, down a broad and tree-shaded avenue in Washington, D.C., softly singing and chanting the hymns born of their movement and those that have gone before. There were no ranks, but they were orderly. They moved with dignity, but there was no sternness. Their placards demanded the uprooting of every vestige of discrimination and said it must be done now, but they showed no anger. Regardless of all else, for most, these will be the lasting impressions of the March on Washington for jobs and freedom. On this day in 1963, hundreds of thousands of protesters gathered in Washington, D.C. to demand civil and economic rights for African Americans. The march culminated with Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. delivering his historic I Have a Dream speech on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial. And today, tens of thousands are expected to gather in that same spot to protest police brutality in a march organized by the Reverend Al Sharpton's National Action Network and the NAACP. Now to a birthday party for a woman born in 1918. Aunt Bob's has lived through two pandemics and is full of advice. Here's NBC's Harry Smith. If it looks like Babs Miss Rucky knows how to wear a crown, it doesn't surprise her family. To them, she is royalty. We love her to death. Babs turned 102 this week. I hope I look that good when I'm 75. And still holding court. Happy Yay! birthday! She has more stories than anybody you ever seen in your life. Some are not true, some are true, some get exaggerated, but boy, is she a lot of fun to listen to those stories. A child of immigrants born into a pandemic, through years thick and thin, a witness to history, and an optimist. I had a confidence that the country will be fine, everything will be good, because I was told that it would be. My father told me, my mother told me, my president told me. That was FDR for the record. In the game of life, making it to 100 requires luck, love, and most likely, a twinkle in your eye. Get a Coke and chips, have fun. Have fun and enjoy. And it, it's, it's a good life. It's worth suffering for and living for. Life is good. And that part, we do believe. Harry Smith, NBC News. Wow, whatever her secret is, she better bottle that because it is working for 102 years. 102 years old, happy birthday to Bab. She does look great. Wow, if we can only, like they said it best, if we can only look like that 70 or 80, we'll take it. There you go. Have fun, enjoy. That's what's up. I profoundly accept this nomination for President of the United States. President Trump caps off the final night of the week-long Republican convention using the People's House for his political event as protests rained outside the White House gates and Biden and Harris weighed in too. 
the remnants of Hurricane Laura leaving death and massive destruction in its path. Protests in the wake of the Jacob Blake shooting, including an interview with a 17-year-old accused of killing two people, and the next steps for the NBA and professional athletes whose professional pause captured a nation. And have you heard about the ghostly sound drifting across San Francisco since early June? Some call it soothing. Others say it's unsettling and even alien. Early today starts right now. Glad you're with us to end the week. I'm Francis Rivera. And I'm Philip Mena. Hurricane Laura leaves a path of death and destruction on the Gulf Coast. Hundreds of people are still without power, and thousands of Louisiana residents are waking up with their lives upside down. In the town of Westlake, people had to shelter in place after an oil refinery went up in flames. Plumes of smoke released hazardous chlorine gas. And this is what Lake Charles looks like. Boats were tossed around, roofs were peeled off from homes. President Trump is set to visit the storm-ravaged areas this weekend. Our Chris Pallone has more. In southwest Louisiana, it was a day of taking stock and cleaning up. There's so much damage here. You, you're going, this is, this is a disaster area. You know, I mean, it's a literal disaster. I mean, the recovery time for this is going to be phenomenal. Hurricane Laura struck the area just after midnight, the most powerful storm ever to make landfall here. Packing 150 mile per hour winds and heavy rain, the storm destroyed buildings, toppled trucks, and brought trees and power lines down. Lake Charles, one of the hardest hit cities. I'm thinking the apartment building is going to fall on top of us because you can hear stuff knocking against the, the brick. A chlorine gas leak at a plant near Lake Charles caused a major fire. The smoke could be seen for miles, and nearby residents were told not to go outside. And yet, despite all of it, the governors of Louisiana and Texas are counting their blessings. We're thankful we didn't get more storm surge than we did. A terrifying night, which will be followed by weeks, maybe months, of cleanup and construction. Chris Pallone, NBC News, Lafayette, Louisiana. More than 500,000 people were ordered to evacuate ahead of the storm. The number chose to remain and endure the dangerous night in their homes and others with concerns about coronavirus and shelters. Sam Brock spoke with those who rode out the storm. Francis, good morning. Ahead of a Category 4 hurricane, hundreds of thousands of mandatory evacuations in Texas and Louisiana. But not everybody heeded the call, although many lived to tell about it. We find out why they decided to stay behind. Families across Texas uprooted by a Category 4 hurricane after opting to ride out the storm. Why'd you stay home? Because we had trouble getting back in here whenever Hurricane Rita come through. And I swore I'd never leave again after that. The cracked trees and splintered roofs. Last night I heard a crash and of course this oak tree is in the middle of the house. Destroying homes but not shaking foundations. We've done it a few too many times in the last 20 years. But Anyway, we will rebuild. We always do. They battened down their property as in past storms, but this one bore a new threat, coronavirus. Being in a large shelter or a large building with a lot of people, um, it, it was a huge factor in my thinking of evacuating. Arata Young also says he couldn't afford to evacuate. The five-year Marine Corps veteran has tied up his life savings in a yoga and jujitsu gym. He just opened last week, along with his fellow veteran partner, Tyler Pete. The pair weren't sure what they'd find. How relieved were you when you walked up here and saw that your gym is still intact? It was insane. Yeah, it was, I walked in and it was literally like someone had taken a 45-pound plate off of my shoulders. I'm extremely relieved. Um, I could probably kiss him. <laughs> <laughs> a ray of hope shining through a frightening storm. As you can see, not every homeowner in Laura's path was so fortunate. Many now forced to begin the rebuilding process under a cloud of COVID-19 and economic uncertainty. Francis, back to you. Some tough times ahead. Sam, thanks. Let's turn now to the latest in Kenosha, Wisconsin. According to court documents, 17-year-old Kyle Rittenhouse is facing two first-degree homicide charges related to the fatal shootings that happened during the protests. After, after several nights of escalating tension, there were more peaceful demonstrations and new calls for change. NBC's Wendy Wolfolk has this report. The Kenosha community is grieving as a result of this tragic shooting. A grieving community, but a fourth night of protests over the police shooting of Jacob Blake. Peaceful. The voice of those people is not falling upon deaf ears. We are hearing what is being said. And new calls for swift action. Bring the button to, the, the button to say to turn in this state, 
transgender to move and move quickly. We must know that justice works for the people. Wisconsin's Attorney General identified the officer who shot Blake seven times in the back as Rustin Shesky. He's been with the Kenosha Police Department for seven years. But also announcing that investigators found a knife in the driver's side floorboard of Blake's car. Before the shooting, according to investigators, Shesky and two other officers were responding to a domestic incident and unsuccessfully tried to taser and arrest Blake. Oh. Meanwhile, 17-year-old Kyle Rittenhouse is charged with intentional homicide after two people were shot and killed during protests Tuesday night. There are Orlando Magic players heading back into the locker room. And unprecedented aftermath in the sports world. After the NBA abruptly canceled games this week and some Major League Baseball and soccer teams followed suit. They're using that voice to be heard and now they're using their lack of playing to be heard even louder. Professional athletes using their actions to call for change. Wendy Woolfolk, NBC News. President Trump didn't go far to accept the Republican nomination in an unprecedented move. He delivered his acceptance speech on the South Lawn of the White House. The final night of the RNC was more upbeat, including a moving message on second chances from a criminal justice reform advocate pardoned by the president. The nearly 22 years I spent in prison were not wasted. God had a purpose and a plan for my life. I was not delayed or denied. I was destined for such a time as this. I recognize that my dad's communication style is not to everyone's taste. And I know that his tweets can feel a bit unfiltered. But the results, the results speak for themselves. We face an invisible enemy that we didn't ask for nor invite, but we will defeat it. We will defeat it because America is where innovation happens. NBC's Tracy Potts joins us with more from D.C. And Tracy, the president's message, though, was decidedly darker than that. Well, it was, Francis, and it was actually the second longest convention speech that we have ever seen in either party. Uh, the first was the president's speech four years ago. And while he was speaking at the White House, there were protests happening outside. In fact, Senator Rand Paul said that he was attacked by what he called an angry mob. He described it as a crazed mob of about 100 people. This while inside 1,000 people were on the White House South Lawn listening to President Trump and a large part of that speech was attacking Joe Biden and his record. Joe Biden is not a savior of America's soul. He is the destroyer of America's jobs. And if given the chance, he will be the destroyer of American greatness. If you give power to Joe Biden, the radical left will defund police departments all across America. They will make every city look like Democrat-run Portland, Oregon. No one will be safe in Biden's America. The problem we have right now is we're in Donald Trump's America. They're looking for more violence and more disruption because it helps them politically. He views this as a political benefit to him. You know, he's rooting uh, for more violence, not less. And it's clear about that. And what's he doing? He's kept pouring gasoline on the fire. This happens. Also countering the president's speech in Washington, vice presidential nominee Kamala Harris. Uh, she said that the president had failed the most basic and important part of his job, protecting the American people. Francis. All right, Tracy, thank you. This morning, don't miss Craig Melvin's exclusive sit-down interview with Senator Kamala Harris coming up on the Today Show. Another Confederate statue has been toppled, this time in Lake Charles, Louisiana. The South's Defenders Memorial Monument survived the summer protest but could not stand up to Hurricane Laura. Just two weeks ago, officials voted to keep the statue on the courthouse lawn after a lot of debate. It has been damaged in other storms before, and restored, but critics hope that that will not be the case this time. So we see the damage there. Let's talk about now Laura's aftermath and where it's headed. Here's NBC meteorologist Janessa Webb. Janessa, good morning. 
Hey, good morning. Good morning, everyone. We now have tropical depression, Laura. It has been downgraded. I do think we'll see our last advisory from the National Hurricane Center this afternoon, but still, it's causing a lot of rain for central Arkansas as it makes its way through the Mississippi Valley. We're still going to watch the leftovers of the storm system across the Ohio Valley for your Saturday morning before it starts to really push into more of the northeast. It is going to be a soggy one from Charlotte all the way into to Boston. That's a look at the big weather story of the day. Here's a closer look at your day ahead. Our temperatures across the deep south, we have heat alerts that are in place uh, across uh, Texas and even for the upper Midwest. We're going to watch the severe weather threat Orlando today. Cloudy skies all the way into Charleston. We'll look at that all important weekend forecast coming up. All right. Great job with all the hurricane coverage this week, Janessa. Right, two people are lucky to be alive after their small plane crashed and flipped upside down in the Florida Evergr Everglades. It happened in an isolated area of Broward County, so rescuers needed to pick them up in airboats. The pair suffered minor injuries, and the FAA and the National Transportation Safety Board are investigating that crash. Breaking news overnight, Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe is stepping down. Japan's national broadcaster NHK reported that the Prime Minister intends to resign. The news caused stocks to briefly fall in Japan. Abe says that he plans to step down to deal with health issues. He has made some recent visits to the hospital. The Prime Minister confirmed the reports just moments ago during a press conference. A major reversal from the CDC. The agency is now walking back a recommendation from earlier this week that said people with no virus symptoms do not necessarily need a test. The previous recommendation said all close contacts of infected individuals should be tested regardless of symptoms. The CDC's director now says that all close contacts of confirmed or probable COVID-19 patients may consider testing. The change comes after the decision sparked backlash from medical experts. A new study from UCLA revealed a disturbing trend about the toll of COVID-19. It shows there was a five-fold increase in coronavirus deaths among working-age Latinos in California over the last three months. One researcher said the victims are unsung essential workers like farmers and truck drivers. The coronavirus has killed more than 12,000 people in California, and nearly half of them are Latino. Today, tens of thousands of people are expected to descend on the National Mall to protest police brutality in a march organized by the Reverend Al Sharpton's National Action Network and the NAACP. It comes on the 57th anniversary of the March on Washington, where hundreds of thousands gathered to demand civil and economic rights for African Americans. The march culminated with Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. delivering his historic I Have a Dream speech on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial. Lord & Taylor is officially going out of business. The luxury department retailer announced that it is closing all of its 38 stores, ending a nearly 200-year run. The announcement comes weeks after the company filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy protection. Our interactive state-by-state -state plan your vote guide has everything you need to know about casting a ballot in the 2020 presidential election. See where your state stands on voting rules and read up on deadlines, restrictions, and more. Visit NBCNews.com slash plan your vote to learn more. A new song is playing throughout San Francisco this summer. The mysterious sound seeping through the fog is leaving some Bay Area residents confused. To some, it sounds like a hum. And for others, a whistle. NBC's Jake Ward may have solved the mystery. Since early June, a ghostly sound has drifted across San Francisco. And social media lit up with a range of reactions, calling it soothing, unsettling, even alien. But it's not supernatural. It's the city's most iconic landmark, the Golden Gate Bridge. The big factor in designing a bridge is, of course, wind. This, the Golden Gate, is a big cut in the landscape that acts as a wind tunnel. That means that the whole design of the bridge turns into one big sail when the wind is strong enough. And these, the original 1937 struts of the railing, catch the wind. It's the new, thinner version of those struts that are creating that noise. When you ask engineers why wind matters on a bridge, well, they always name the same one. 
the Tacoma Narrows Bridge. And the bridge whips about like some fluttering ribbon. It was nicknamed Gallop and Gertie for its tendency to move in the wind. And in 1940, against gusts of just 40 miles an hour, it began to twist, then the concrete buckled, and it collapsed. It literally shook itself to pieces. The consensus was that the solid side railings were responsible. Engineers everywhere are haunted by it. This wind retrofit project is to ensure that that type of effect or phenomenon doesn't happen here at the Golden Gate Bridge. The important thing is that scale model tests of earthquakes and high winds showed the bridge will be stronger than ever. But those tests didn't reveal the eerie sound it would make. Engineers here are working on a plan to quiet the hum. But in the meantime, the bridge harmonics are a reminder of the high stakes and complicated work of building and maintaining a roadway high above the waves. Jake Ward, NBC News, San Francisco. Wow, it's fascinating. At least after all this time, we know now the cause of it is originally just to make everybody safer. Yeah, hey, it's some creepy wind chimes, but better than that yeah, Tacoma right? Bridge. Yeah, Tell exactly. That. That's right even now. freaky to watch after Eesh. all this time. Good morning, everyone. It's all about the weekend now, and it's going to be kind of a soggy one for the East Coast. That's the leftovers of that tropical system, Laura. Nice and sunny across the Great Lakes. But if you're across the East Coast, Sunday is going to be the day where it'll start to dry out, and temperatures very comfortable. The heat and humidity, it starts to die down. Really want, to, want everyone to enjoy the weekend, because when I see you on Monday, let's talk about the tropics. Once again, we have two systems that have potential development late next week. Francis yeah, talk Phillip. about some whiplash after that. Make sure we'll enjoy the weekend then. Janessa, wow. thank you. The Gulf Coast is now assessing the damage after a direct hit from Hurricane Laura. Lake Charles, Louisiana was in the path of the eye of the storm as it made landfall. The city likely has a long road to recovery ahead of it. NBC's Jay Gray is on the ground there. And Jay, tell us more about the aftermath that you see there. Well, you know, Francis, it's overwhelming. It seems everywhere you turn, there's devastation and debris. This twisted, sheared metal, part of what used to be a gas station here. You can see the pumps still there, but this one is gone, ripped away and tossed away by the storm, evidence of the sheer power of Laura. At first glance, it has the appearance of a child's messy playroom. Cars and trucks scattered on their sides. But a closer look and it's clear. This mess is no game. There's so much damage here. You, you're going, this is, this is a disaster area. You know, I mean, it's a literal disaster. From Cameron, where the massive storm came ashore through Lake Charles, the devastation from Laura stretches for miles. This was the most powerful storm to ever make landfall in Louisiana. A Category 4 hurricane with sustained winds of 150 miles an hour. Ripping apart homes and businesses, literally pulling trees from the ground, snapping power poles, scattering and twisting lines, most of the area still without electricity. <laughs> Communities, and we now know families, cut to their core. At least six people killed in the storm, and officials fear that number could grow. Certainly I'm concerned that as we continue to go out and do primary and secondary search and rescue, we're going to find more fatalities, I, I hope not. Survivors now working to piece together what Laura left behind, the hurricane, tearing away most everything here, except... We will rebuild, we always do. Their resolve. Yeah, and look, it's the strength this community is definitely going to need. Uh, Francis and Philip, this is going to be a long, a very difficult recovery here. Back to sure. you. Tough days ahead for them. Jay, thank you. All right. There, uh, there's a lot. It's full of musician memorabilia and is all going up for auction soon and all for a good cause. Items range here from a pair of Ozzy Osbourne's glasses. How cool is that? A jacket worn by Cher uh, to a signed Billie Eilish ukulele. Uh, even a tracksuit worn by Sir Elton John. Uh, not just music items either. Her John Stamos' leather jacket yeah. from Full House. So that cool. Uncle, Uncle Jesse. Jesse. Yeah, exactly. It all goes uh, to benefit Music Care's COVID-19 relief fund. Uh, the bidding, I understand, has already begun, and the actual auction closes on September 9th. I love it. Great, good stuff out there. I'm 
thinking the apartment building is going to fall on top of us because you can hear stuff knocking against the, the brick. Hurricane Laura unleashes devastation on multiple states, taking at least six lives in the process. We've got the latest. A big night for Republicans who used the White House for the final night of their convention. As President Trump accepted his party's nomination for a second term amid fanfare and big protests outside the grounds. Protests in the wake of the Jacob Blake shooting, including an interview with a 17-year-old accused of killing two, and the next steps for the NBA and professional athletes whose professional pause capped a nation. And we'll meet the woman who has survived two pandemics as she shares her secret to a happy life on this final Friday of August. Early today starts right now. Thanks for ending your week with us. I'm Francis Rivera. And I'm Philip Mena. Hurricane Laura delivered a shattering and deadly blow to the Gulf Coast, leaving a trail of chaos. At least six people died from the storm. A riverboat casino got wedged under a bridge and plumes of smoke blanketed the air after an oil refinery went up in flames. People living within a one mile radius of Westlake were told to shelter in place because of the release of chlorine gas. And this is what Lake Charles, Louisiana looks like. Boats were tossed around, roofs peeled off their homes. President Trump is set to visit that storm-ravaged area this weekend. Our Chris Pallone has the latest. In southwest Louisiana, it was a day of taking stock and cleaning up. There's so much damage here. You're going, this is, this is a disaster area. You know, I mean, it's a literal disaster. I mean, the recovery time for this is going to be phenomenal. Hurricane Laura struck the area just after midnight, the most powerful storm ever to make landfall here. Packing 150 mile per hour winds and heavy rain, the storm destroyed buildings, toppled trucks and brought trees and power lines down. Lake Charles, one of the hardest hit cities. I'm thinking the apartment building is going to fall on top of us because you can hear stuff knocking against the, the brick. A chlorine gas leak at a plant near Lake Charles caused a major fire. The smoke could be seen for miles, and nearby residents were told not to go outside. And yet, despite all of it, the governors of Louisiana and Texas are counting their blessings. We're thankful we didn't get more storm surge than we did. A terrifying night, which will be followed by weeks, maybe months, of cleanup and construction. Chris Pallone, NBC News, Lafayette, Louisiana. More than 500,000 people were ordered to evacuate ahead of the storm. A number chose to remain and endure the dangerous night in their homes and others with concerns about coronavirus and shelters. Sam Brock spoke with those who rode out the storm. Francis, good morning. Ahead of a Category 4 hurricane, hundreds of thousands of mandatory evacuations in Texas and Louisiana. But not everybody heeded the call, although many lived to tell about it. We find out why they decided to stay behind. Families across Texas uprooted by a Category 4 hurricane after opting to ride out the storm. Why'd you stay home? Because we had trouble getting back in here whenever Hurricane Rita come through. And I swore I'd never leave again after that. The cracked trees and splintered roofs. Last night heard a crash and of course this oak tree is in the middle of the house. Destroying homes but not shaking foundations. We've done it a few too many times in the last 20 years. But Anyway, we will rebuild, we always do. They battened down their property as in past storms, but this one bore a new threat, coronavirus. Being in a large shelter or a large building with a lot of people, um, it, it was a huge factor in my thinking of evacuating. Arata Young also says he couldn't afford to evacuate. The five-year Marine Corps veteran has tied up his life savings in a yoga and jujitsu gym. He just opened last week, along with his fellow veteran partner, Tyler Pete. The pair weren't sure what they'd find. How relieved were you when you walked up here and saw that your gym is still intact? It was insane. Yeah, it was, I walked in and it was literally like someone had taken a 45 pound plate off of my shoulders. I'm extremely relieved. Um, I could probably kiss him. <laughs> <laughs> a ray of hope shining through a frightening storm. As you can see, not every homeowner in Laura's path was so fortunate. Many now forced to begin the rebuilding process under a cloud of COVID-19 and economic uncertainty. Francis, back to you. Hoping for the best for him. Sam, thank you. President Trump delivered his case for a second term right from the steps of the White House. On the final night of the Republican National Convention, the president painted a dire portrait of a country that would plunge into chaos if Joe Biden wins the election. Throughout his speech, protesters made their voices heard, chants and music echoing faintly in the distance. No peace! No justice! No peace! No 
justice, no peace. NBC's Alice Barr has more on the fireworks of the night. A grand finale for the Republican National Convention. President Trump laying it all on the line in his bid for a second term in office. I profoundly accept this nomination for President of the United States. Drawing a sharp contrast between his vision for America and Joe Biden's. Joe Biden is not a savior of America's soul. He is the destroyer of America's jobs. And if given the chance, he will be the destroyer of American greatness. The president formally accepting his party's renomination against the unprecedented backdrop of the White House and at a time of crisis, offering support to those in the punishing path of Hurricane Laura. And as racial justice protests rekindle after the police shooting of Jacob Blake in Wisconsin, the president forcefully underscoring his law and order message. No one will be safe in Biden's America. My administration will always stand with the men and women of law enforcement. On the coronavirus pandemic, downplaying the devastating death toll and touting his administration's response. We will have a safe and effective vaccine this year, and together we will crush the virus. President Trump appealing to his base with promises to protect conservative values. If the left gains power, they will demolish the suburbs, confiscate your guns, and appoint justices who will wipe away your Second Amendment and other constitutional freedoms. Trailing in the polls, the president and his party making a primetime sales pitch for a second term. In Washington, Alice Barr, NBC News. Well, that dark tone served as a through line at the GOP's convention, despite the initial promise of a positive message. Make no mistake, no matter where you live, your family will not be safe in the radical Democrats' America. Crime, violence, and mob rule. Crime ravaging our streets. That is what America would see if it allowed Biden-Harris to run this country. Trump was elected to protect our families from the vengeful mob. They want to abolish the suburbs altogether. Nightmares are becoming real. Cops killed, children shot. Drug addicts, guns on the street. The mob will try to destroy you. They want to enslave you to the weak, dependent, liberal, victim ideology. Burn down the foundations of our country to the ground. Spawns of Satan. You will not recognize this country or yourself. The American way of life is being dismantled. Anarchy and chaos on our streets. This election is shaping up to be church, work, and school versus rioting, looting, and vandalism. The police aren't coming when you call. They want to steal your liberty, your freedom. They'll disarm you, empty the prisons, lock you in your home. They want to control what you see and think and believe so that they can control how you live. It's a horror film, really. It's madness. It remains to be seen how the tone resonates with voters, but we know ratings for the RNC have taken a hit. Wednesday drew in about 15.7 million viewers. Last week's DNC brought in just under 21.5 million on its third night. And after the onslaught of attacks on Joe Biden during the RNC. Well, the Democratic nominee, I guess, is, she's firing, is firing back this morning. He also, uh, he responded to calls to not even bother debating the president. He spoke one-on-one with our Andrea Mitchell. After Republicans blamed him all week for violence, including in Kenosha, Joe Biden and Kamala Harris fighting back. Biden responding to Vice President Mike Pence saying, you won't be safe in Joe Biden's America. The problem we have right now is we're in Donald Trump's America. They're looking for more violence and more disruption because it helps them politically. He views this as a political benefit to him. You know, he's rooting uh, for more violence, not less. And it's clear about that. And what's he doing? He's kept pouring gasoline on the fire. This happens to be Donald Trump's America. You think the president of the United States is rooting for the violence because he thinks it helps him politically? I think he views it as a political benefit. And by the way, I condemn violence in any form, whether it's looting or whatever it is. So who's who's rooting for the violence here? Biden also said the biggest safety issue is people dying from COVID and what he called pressure on the scientists on testing and therapies, possibly on vaccines. Did you ever see any administration put so much pressure on the FDA? There's no bounds to what this guy does and his team does. 
We should listen to the scientists. How concerned are you that they're going to rush something out even before Election Day? And I, I pray to God that would happen tomorrow. That'd be wonderful. But the fact is, let's assume we finally do get a vaccine that it works. And how much credibility are we going to have telling people to take it after going through all this stuff that they've misrepresented so far? Kamala Harris also punching back with Craig Melvin for the Today Show. And the American people, regardless of race or gender or age or geographic location, have a right to believe that their leaders will speak truth, even when these are difficult truths. After Nancy Pelosi joked that Biden should not debate the president because she said the president doesn't tell the truth, Biden told me he will be at the debates, but will have to fact check the president while debating. Francis. All right, Andrea, thank you. Uh, NBC meteorologist Janessa Webb joining us now with the latest on what remains of Laura. Janessa, good morning. Hey, good morning, Francis and Philip. We're continuing to watch the storm system now downgraded to a tropical depression. But what you're going to see throughout the weekend is going to be a rainmaker. Right now, we've already seen about five inches of rain across central Arkansas. And as the system continues to split apart, it's definitely losing its wind force, but the rain is going to continue all the way into the Mississippi and upper uh, Mississippi Valley. Even for Ohio, we're going to watch that for Saturday afternoon in then it heads towards the northeast late day for your Saturday. That's a look at the big weather story of the day. Here's a closer look at your day ahead. Our temperatures across Wichita this afternoon, 97 degrees. We're also watching the threat of some severe storms sparking up a few tornadoes possible. New Orleans, more rain, lower 90s, Raleigh, 93. We'll take a look at that all-important weekend forecast coming up, guys. All right. Can't wait to hear it, Janessa. Thank you. So, so this morning you're grabbing your coffee and then your donuts. Some exciting news for the donut lovers here. Krispy Kreme is back with their popular chocolate glazed donuts for one day only. Today, the classic original glazed donut is covered in a rich chocolate glaze that's being offered at locations across the U.S. It's normally a short-lived appearance on their menu, so make sure you actually get out there and grab it before they run out. Yeah, I do not think I've ever had a chocolate glaze. No, not from right? there. Leading the news, a wrongly imprisoned black man has been freed from a North Carolina prison after serving 44 years. 64-year-old Ronnie Long was released on Thursday after the state of North Carolina filed a motion in federal court to vacate his 1976 conviction by an all-white jury. Long had been sentenced to life in prison for first-degree rape and first-degree burglary, something he says he didn't commit. The federal appeals court says they also found a pattern of police suppression of material evidence in the case. I just appreciate the people that come out and supported me. And I wanted you to know, you understand, saying, look, if they will never, ever, never, ever, ever lock me up again. That's right. They'll never lock me up again. Yeah. All right, Ronnie says he's excited for his first meal out of prison. It'll be mac and cheese, beef ribs, a salad, and some lemonade. Additional charges have been filed after two people were killed during protests in Wisconsin. According to court documents, 17-year-old Kyle Rittenhouse faces two first-degree homicide charges as well as two charges of attempted homicide. On the streets of Kenosha, the community continues to call out for change after the police shooting of Jacob Blake. Here's NBC's Wendy Wolfolk. The Kenosha community is grieving as a result of this tragic shooting. A grieving community, but a fourth night of protests over the police shooting of Jacob Blake. Peaceful. The voice of those people is not falling upon deaf ears. We are hearing what is being said. And new calls for swift action. To bring the bond the, the, the state attorney in this state, attorney general, to move and move quickly. We must know that justice works for the people. Wisconsin's attorney general identified the officer who shot Blake seven times in the back as Rustin Chesky. He's been with the Kenosha Police Department for seven years but also announcing that investigators found a knife in the driver's side floorboard of Blake's car. Before the shooting, according to investigators, Shesky and two other officers were responding to a domestic incident and unsuccessfully tried to taser and arrest Blake. Oh. Meanwhile, 17-year-old Kyle Rittenhouse is charged with intentional homicide after two people were shot and killed during protests Tuesday night. There are Orlando Magic players heading back into the locker room. And unprecedented aftermath in the sports world. 
After the NBA abruptly canceled games this week, and some Major League Baseball and soccer teams followed suit. They're using that voice to be heard, and now they're using their lack of playing to be heard even louder. Professional athletes using their actions to call for change. Wendy Woolfolk, NBC News. London Zoo began its annual weigh-in to find out how the longest closure in the zoo's history since World War II has affected their animals. Staff noticed that some of the species have been sad because there were no visitors due to the pandemic. The test will confirm if over 19,000 animals have been physically changed by the toll of the lockdown. I know we have. Right? I've been sad with no Across visitors. Across the board. <laughs> you know? I wonder what that first animal was, though. It had some, it had like zebra legs. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. Fascinating. Yeah, all right. Panda fans, here is your first look at the National Zoo's new baby panda. Mei Shang left the cub alone to get some water, giving us a close-up look. You can see the cub there crying, tossing, and turning. Aww. Yeah, the baby is Mei Shang's fourth successful birth. Yeah, well, I was letting that cub <laughs> cry it out. You yeah. have to tend to it right away. Yeah, self-soothing. Right. Yeah, <laughs> after spending over 500 days in a shelter, a three-year-old dog named Joey has finally found a loving home. When Joey's new owners came to take him home, the shelter's staff lined up to drape lays around the pooch's neck. Joey responded with goodbye kisses. The staff said it was the day they have all been waiting for. So hopefully at the end of the week, all these cute puppy animals and, and nice like cuties great. make you smile. Yep, great story for a Friday. Good morning, everyone. This is the last weekend of August. It's going to be kind of sloppy for most of the East Coast, drenching rain due to that tropical uh, depression right now. Nice and sunny, though, for the Great Lakes and the heat. It's going to continue to build for the Pacific Northwest. Sunday, it's the day for the Northeast. Get out there and enjoy it. 89 across portions of the Mid-Atlantic. We'll be right back. They moved today, 200,000 strong, down a broad and tree-shaded avenue in Washington, D.C., softly singing and chanting the hymns born of their movement and those that have gone before. There were no ranks, but they were orderly. They moved with dignity, but there was no sternness. Their placards demanded the uprooting of every vestige of discrimination and said it must be done now, but they showed no anger. Regardless of all else, for most, these will be the lasting impressions of the March on Washington for jobs and freedom. On this day in 1963, hundreds of thousands of protesters gathered in Washington, D.C. to demand civil and economic rights for African Americans. The march culminated with Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. delivering his historic I Have a Dream speech on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial. And today, tens of thousands are expected to gather in that same spot to protest police brutality in a march organized by the Reverend Al Sharpton's National Action Network and the NAACP. Now to a birthday party for a woman born in 1918. Aunt Bob's has lived through two pandemics and is full of advice. Here's NBC's Harry Smith. If it looks like Babs Miss Rucky knows how to wear a crown, it doesn't surprise her family. To them, she is royalty. We love her to death. Babs turned 102 this week. I hope I look that good when I'm 75. And still holding court. Happy Yay! birthday! She has more stories than anybody you ever seen in your life. Some are not true, some are true. Some get exaggerated, but boy, is she a lot of fun to listen to those stories. A child of immigrants born into a pandemic through years thick and thin, a witness to history and an optimist. I had a confidence that the country will be fine. Everything will be good because I was told that it would be. My father told me, my mother told me, my president told me. That was FDR for the record. In the game of life, making it to 100 requires luck, love, and most likely, a twinkle in your eye. Get a Coke and chips, have fun. Have fun and enjoy. And it, it's, it's a good life. It's worth suffering for and living for. Life is good. And that part, we do believe. Harry Smith, NBC News. Wow, whatever her secret is, she better bottle that, because it is working for 102 years. 102 years old, happy birthday to Bab. She does look great. Wow, if we can only, like they said it best, if we can only look like that 70 or 80, we'll take it. There you go, have fun, enjoy. That's what's up.
thinking the apartment building is gonna fall on top of us because you can hear stuff knocking against the, the brick. Hurricane Laura unleashes devastation on multiple states, taking at least six lives in the process. We've got the latest. A big night for Republicans who used the White House for the final night of their convention. As President Trump accepted his party's nomination for a second term amid fanfare and big protests outside the grounds. Protests in the wake of the Jacob Blake shooting, including an interview with a 17-year-old accused of killing two, and the next steps for the NBA and professional athletes whose professional pause captured a nation. And we'll meet the woman who has survived two pandemics as she shares her secret to a happy life on this final Friday of August. Early today starts right now. Thanks for ending your week with us. I'm Francis Rivera. And I'm Philip Mena. Hurricane Laura delivered a shattering and deadly blow to the Gulf Coast, leaving a trail of chaos. At least six people died from the storm. A riverboat casino got wedged under a bridge and plumes of smoke blanketed the air after an oil refinery went up in flames. People living within a one-mile radius of Westlake were told to shelter in place because of the release of chlorine gas. And this is what Lake Charles, Louisiana looks like. Boats were tossed around, roofs peeled off their homes. President Trump is set to visit that storm-ravaged area this weekend. Our Chris Pallone has the latest. In southwest Louisiana, it was a day of taking stock and cleaning up. There's so much damage here. You, you're going, this is, this is a disaster area. You know, I mean, it's a literal disaster. I mean, the recovery time for this is going to be phenomenal. Hurricane Laura struck the area just after midnight, the most powerful storm ever to make landfall here. Packing 150 mile per hour winds and heavy rain, the storm destroyed buildings, toppled trucks and brought trees and power lines down. Lake Charles, one of the hardest hit cities. I'm thinking the apartment building is going to fall on top of us because you can hear stuff knocking against the, the brick. A chlorine gas leak at a plant near Lake Charles caused a major fire. The smoke could be seen for miles, and nearby residents were told not to go outside. And yet, despite all of it, the governors of Louisiana and Texas are counting their blessings. We're thankful we didn't get more storm surge than we did. A terrifying night, which will be followed by weeks, maybe months, of cleanup and construction. Chris Pallone, NBC News, Lafayette, Louisiana. More than 500,000 people were ordered to evacuate ahead of the storm. A number chose to remain and endure the dangerous night in their homes and others with concerns about coronavirus and shelters. Sam Brock spoke with those who rode out the storm. Francis, good morning. Ahead of a Category 4 hurricane, hundreds of thousands of mandatory evacuations in Texas and Louisiana. But not everybody heeded the call, although many lived to tell about it. We find out why they decided to stay behind. Families across Texas uprooted by a Category 4 hurricane after opting to ride out the storm. Why'd you stay home? Because we had trouble getting back in here whenever Hurricane Rita come through. And I swore I'd never leave again after that. The cracked trees and splintered roofs. Last night I heard a crash and of course this oak tree is in the middle of the house. Destroying homes but not shaking foundations. We've done it a few too many times in the last 20 years. But Anyway, we will rebuild. We always do. They battened down their property as in past storms, but this one bore a new threat, coronavirus. Being in a large shelter or a large building with a lot of people, um, it, it was a huge factor in my thinking of evacuating. Arata Young also says he couldn't afford to evacuate. The five-year Marine Corps veteran has tied up his life savings in a yoga and jujitsu gym. He just opened last week, along with his fellow veteran partner, Tyler Pete. The pair weren't sure what they'd find. How relieved were you when you walked up here and saw that your gym is still intact? It was insane. Yeah, it was, I walked in and it was literally like someone had taken a 45-pound plate off of my shoulders. I'm extremely relieved. Um, I could probably kiss him. <laughs> <laughs> a ray of hope shining through a frightening storm. As you can see, not every homeowner in Laura's path was so fortunate. Many now forced to begin the rebuilding process under a cloud of COVID-19 and economic uncertainty. Francis, back to you. Hoping for the best for him. Sam, thank you. President Trump delivered his case for a second term right from the steps of the White House. On the final night of the Republican National Convention, the president painted a dire portrait of a country that would plunge into chaos if Joe Biden wins the election. Throughout his speech, protesters made their voices heard, chants and music echoing faintly in the distance. No peace! No 
NBC's Alice Barr has more on the fireworks of the night. A grand finale for the Republican National Convention. President Trump laying it all on the line in his bid for a second term in office. I profoundly accept this nomination for President of the United States. Drawing a sharp contrast between his vision for America and Joe Biden's. Joe Biden is not a savior of America's soul. He is the destroyer of America's jobs. And if given the chance, he will be the destroyer of American greatness. The president formally accepting his party's renomination against the unprecedented backdrop of the White House and at a time of crisis, offering support to those in the punishing path of Hurricane Laura. And as racial justice protests rekindle after the police shooting of Jacob Blake in Wisconsin, the president forcefully underscoring his law and order message. No one will be safe in Biden's America. My administration will always stand with the men and women of law enforcement. On the coronavirus pandemic, downplaying the devastating death toll and touting his administration's response. We will have a safe and effective vaccine this year. And together, we will crush the virus. President Trump appealing to his base with promises to protect conservative values. If the left gains power, they will demolish the suburbs, confiscate your guns, and appoint justices who will wipe away your Second Amendment and other constitutional freedoms. Trailing in the polls, the president and his party making a primetime sales pitch for a second term. In Washington, Alice Barr, NBC News. Well, that dark tone served as a through line at the GOP's convention, despite the initial promise of a positive message. Make no mistake, no matter where you live, your family will not be safe in the radical Democrats' America. Crime, violence, and mob rule. Crime ravaging our streets. That is what America would see if it allowed Biden-Harris to run this country. Trump was elected to protect our families from the vengeful mob. They want to abolish the suburbs altogether. Nightmares are becoming real. Cops killed, children shot. Drug addicts, guns on the street. The mob will try to destroy you. They want to enslave you to the weak, dependent, liberal, victim ideology. Burn down the foundations of our country to the ground. Spawns of Satan. You will not recognize this country or yourself. The American way of life is being dismantled. Anarchy and chaos on our streets. This election is shaping up to be church, work, and school versus rioting, looting, and vandalism. The police aren't coming when you call. They want to steal your liberty, your freedom. They'll disarm you, empty the prisons, lock you in your home. They want to control what you see and think and believe so that they can control how you live. It's a horror film, really. It's madness. It remains to be seen how the tone resonates with voters, but we know ratings for the RNC have taken a hit. Wednesday drew in about 15.7 million viewers. Last week's DNC brought in just under 21.5 million on its third night. And after the onslaught of attacks on Joe Biden during the RNC. Well, the Democratic nominee, I guess, is, she's firing, is firing back this morning. He also, uh, he responded to calls to not even bother debating the president. He spoke one-on-one -on -one with our Andrea Mitchell. After Republicans blamed him all week for violence, including in Kenosha, Joe Biden and Kamala Harris fighting back. Biden responding to Vice President Mike Pence saying, you won't be safe in Joe Biden's America. The problem we have right now is we're in Donald Trump's America. They're looking for more violence and more disruption because it helps them politically. He views this as a political benefit to him. You know, he's rooting uh, for more violence, not less. And it's clear about that. And what's he doing? He's kept pouring gasoline on the fire. This happens to be Donald Trump's America. You think the president of the United States is rooting for the violence because he thinks it helps him politically? I think he views it as a political benefit. And by the way, I condemn violence in any form, whether it's looting or whatever it is. So who's, who's rooting for the violence here? Biden also said the biggest safety issue is people dying from COVID and what he called pressure on the scientists on testing and therapies, possibly on vaccines. 
Well, did you ever see any administration put so much pressure on the FDA? There's no bounds to what this guy does and his team does. We should listen to the scientists. How concerned are you that they're going to rush something out even before Election Day? And I, I pray to God that would happen tomorrow. That'd be wonderful. But the fact is, let's assume we finally do get a vaccine that it works. And how much credibility are we going to have telling people to take it after going through all this stuff that they've misrepresented so far? Kamala Harris also punching back with Craig Melvin for the Today Show. And the American people, regardless of race, or gender, or age, or geographic location, have a right to believe that their leaders will speak truth, even when these are difficult truths. After Nancy Pelosi joked that Biden should not debate the president because she said the president doesn't tell the truth, Biden told me he will be at the debates, but will have to fact check the president while debating. Francis. All right, Andrea, thank you. Uh, NBC meteorologist Janessa Webb joining us now with the latest on what remains of Laura. Janessa, good morning. Hey, good morning, Francis and Philip. We're continuing to watch the storm system now downgraded to a tropical depression. But what you're going to see throughout the weekend is going to be a rainmaker. Right now, we've already seen about five inches of rain across central Arkansas. And as the system continues to split apart, it's definitely losing its wind force, but the rain is going to continue all the way into the Mississippi and upper uh, Mississippi Valley. Even for Ohio, we're going to watch that for Saturday afternoon in this then it heads towards the northeast late day for your Saturday. That's a look at the big weather story of the day. Here's a closer look at your day ahead. Our temperatures across Wichita this afternoon, 97 degrees. We're also watching the threat of some severe storms sparking up a few tornadoes possible. New Orleans, more rain, lower 90s, Raleigh, 93. We'll take a look at that all-important weekend forecast coming up, guys. All right. Can't wait to hear it, Janessa. Thank you. So, so this morning you're grabbing your coffee and then your donuts. Some exciting news for the donut lovers here. Krispy Kreme is back with their popular chocolate glazed donuts for one day only. Today, the classic original glazed donut is covered in a rich chocolate glaze. It's being offered at locations across the U.S. It's normally a short-lived appearance on their menu, so make sure you actually get out there and grab it before they run out. So Leading the news, a wrongly imprisoned black man has been freed from a North Carolina prison after serving 44 years. 64-year-old Ronnie Long was released on Thursday after the state of North Carolina filed a motion in federal court to vacate his 1976 conviction by an all-white jury. Long had been sentenced to life in prison for first-degree rape and first-degree burglary, something he says he didn't commit. The federal appeals court says they also found a pattern of police suppression of material evidence in the case. I just appreciate the people that come out and supported me. And I wanted you to know, you understand, saying, look, if they will never, ever, never, ever, ever lock me up again. That's right. They'll never lock me up again. Yeah. All right, Ronnie says he's excited for his first meal out of prison. It'll be mac and cheese, beef ribs, a salad, and some lemonade. Additional charges have been filed after two people were killed during protests in Wisconsin. According to court documents, 17-year-old Kyle Rittenhouse faces two first-degree homicide charges as well as two charges of attempted homicide. On the streets of Kenosha, the community continues to call out for change after the police shooting of Jacob Blake. Here's NBC's Wendy Wolfolk. The Kenosha community is grieving as a result of this tragic shooting. A grieving community, but a fourth night of protests over the police shooting of Jacob Blake. Peaceful. The voice of those people is not falling upon deaf ears. We are hearing what is being said. And new calls for swift action. Burn upon the, 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 the state attorney in this state, attorney general, to move and move quickly. We must know that justice works for the people. Wisconsin's attorney general identified the officer who shot Blake seven times in the back as Rustin Shesky. He's been with the Kenosha Police Department for seven years but also announcing that investigators found a knife in the driver's side floorboard of Blake's car. Before the shooting, according to investigators, Shesky and two other officers were responding to a domestic incident and unsuccessfully tried to taser and arrest Blake. Oh. Meanwhile, 17-year-old Kyle Rittenhouse is charged with intentional homicide after two people were shot and killed during protests Tuesday night. 
There are Orlando Magic players heading back into the locker room. And unprecedented aftermath in the sports world. After the NBA abruptly canceled games this week, and some Major League Baseball and soccer teams followed suit. They're using that voice to be heard, and now they're using their lack of playing to be heard even louder. Professional athletes using their actions to call for change. Wendy Woolfolk, NBC News. London Zoo began its annual weigh-in to find out how the longest closure in the zoo's history since World War II has affected their animals. Staff noticed that some of the species have been sad because there were no visitors due to the pandemic. The test will confirm if over 19,000 animals have been physically changed by the toll of the lockdown. I know we have. Right? I've been sad with no Across visitors. Across the board. <laughs> you know? I wonder what that first animal was, though. It had some, it had like zebra legs. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I don't know. Fascinating. Yeah. All right. Panda fans, here is your first look at the National Zoo's new baby panda. Mei Shang left the cub alone to get some water, giving us a close-up look. You can see the cub there crying, tossing, and turning. Aww. Yeah, the baby is Mei Shang's fourth successful birth. Yeah, Mama's letting that cub <laughs> cry it out. She's yeah. not attending to it right away. Yeah, self-soothing. Right. Yeah, <laughs> after spending over 500 days in a shelter, a three-year-old dog named Joey has finally found a loving home. When Joey's new owners came to take him home, the shelter's staff lined up to drape lays around the pooch's neck. Joey responded with goodbye kisses. The staff said it was the day they have all been waiting for. So hopefully at the end of the week, all these cute puppy animals and, and nice. Like Cuties great. make you smile. Yep, great story for a Friday. Good morning, everyone. This is the last weekend of August. It's going to be kind of sloppy for most of the East Coast. Drenching rain due to that tropical uh, depression right now. Nice and sunny, though, for the Great Lakes and the heat. It's going to continue to build for the Pacific Northwest. Sunday, it's the day for the Northeast. Get out there and enjoy it. 89 across portions of the Mid-Atlantic. We'll be right back. They move today, 200,000 strong, down a broad and tree-shaded avenue in Washington, D.C., softly singing and chanting the hymns born of their movement and those that have gone before. There were no ranks, but they were orderly. They moved with dignity, but there was no sternness. Their placards demanded the uprooting of every vestige of discrimination and said it must be done now, but they showed no anger. Regardless of all else, for most, these will be the lasting impressions of the March on Washington for jobs and freedom. On this day in 1963, hundreds of thousands of protesters gathered in Washington, D.C. to demand civil and economic rights for African Americans. The march culminated with Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. delivering his historic I Have a Dream speech on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial. And today, tens of thousands are expected to gather in that same spot to protest police brutality in a march organized by the Reverend Al Sharpton's National Action Network and the NAACP. Now to a birthday party for a woman born in 1918. Aunt Bob's has lived through two pandemics and is full of advice. Here's NBC's Harry Smith. If it looks like Babs Miss Rucky knows how to wear a crown, it doesn't surprise her family. To them, she is royalty. We love her to death. Babs turned 102 this week. I hope I look that good when I'm 75. And still holding court. Happy Yay! birthday! She has more stories than anybody you ever seen in your life. Some are not true, some are true. Some get exaggerated, but boy, is she a lot of fun to listen to those stories. A child of immigrants born into a pandemic through years thick and thin, a witness to history and an optimist. I had a confidence that the country will be fine. Everything will be good because I was told that it would be. My father told me, my mother told me, my president told me. That was FDR for the record. In the game of life, making it to 100 requires luck, love, and most likely, a twinkle in your eye. Get a Coke and chips, have fun. Have fun and enjoy. And it, it's, it's a good life. It's worth suffering for and living for. Life is good. And that part, we do believe. Harry Smith, NBC News. 
Wow, whatever her secret is, she better bottle that because it is working for 102 years. 102 years old, happy birthday to Babs. She does look great. Wow, if we can only, like they said it best, if we can only look like that 70 or 80, we'll take it. There you go. Have fun, enjoy. That's what's up. I profoundly accept this nomination for President of the United States. President Trump caps off the final night of the week-long Republican convention using the People's House for his political event as protests rained outside the White House gates and Biden and Harris weighed in too. The remnants of Hurricane Laura leaving death and massive destruction in its path. Protests in the wake of the Jacob Blake shooting, including an interview with a 17-year-old accused of killing two people and the next steps for the NBA and professional athletes whose professional paws captured a nation. And have you heard about the ghost sound drifting across San Francisco since early June. Some call it soothing. Others say it's unsettling and even alien. Early today starts right now. Glad you're with us to end the week. I'm Francis Rivera. And I'm Philip Mena. Hurricane Laura leaves a path of death and destruction on the Gulf Coast. Hundreds of people are still without power, and thousands of Louisiana residents are waking up with their lives upside down. In the town of Westlake, people had to shelter in place after an oil refinery went up in flames. Plumes of smoke released hazardous chlorine gas. And this is what Lake Charles looks like. Boats were tossed around, roofs were peeled off from homes. President Trump is set to visit the storm-ravaged areas this weekend. Our Chris Pallone has more. In southwest Louisiana, it was a day of taking stock and cleaning up. There's so much damage here. You, you're going, this is, this is a disaster area. You know, I mean, it's a literal disaster. I mean, the recovery time for this is going to be phenomenal. Hurricane Laura struck the area just after midnight, the most powerful storm ever to make landfall here. Packing 150 mile per hour winds and heavy rain, the storm destroyed buildings, toppled trucks, and brought trees and power lines down. Lake Charles, one of the hardest hit cities. I'm thinking the apartment building is going to fall on top of us because you can hear stuff knocking against the, the brick. A chlorine gas leak at a plant near Lake Charles caused a major fire. The smoke could be seen for miles and nearby residents were told not to go outside. And yet, despite all of it, the governors of Louisiana and Texas are counting their blessings. We're thankful we didn't get more storm surge than we did. A terrifying night, which will be followed by weeks, maybe months of cleanup and construction. Chris Pallone, NBC News, Lafayette, Louisiana. More than 500,000 people were ordered to evacuate ahead of the storm. The number chose to remain and endure the dangerous night in their homes and others with concerns about coronavirus and shelters. Sam Brock spoke with those who rode out the storm. Francis, good morning. Ahead of a Category 4 hurricane, hundreds of thousands of mandatory evacuations in Texas and Louisiana. But not everybody heeded the call, although many lived to tell about it. We find out why they decided to stay behind. Families across Texas uprooted by a Category 4 hurricane after opting to ride out the storm. Why'd you stay home? Because we had trouble getting back in here whenever Hurricane Rita come through. And I swore I'd never leave again after that. The cracked trees and splintered roofs. Last night I heard a crash and of course this oak tree is in the middle of the house. Destroying homes but not shaking foundations. We've done it a few too many times in the last 20 years, but anyway, we will rebuild. We always do. They battened down their property as in past storms, but this one bore a new threat, coronavirus. Being in a large shelter or a large building with a lot of people, um, it, it was a huge factor in my thinking of evacuating. Arata Young also says he couldn't afford to evacuate. The five-year Marine Corps veteran has tied up his life savings in a yoga and jujitsu gym. He just opened last week, along with his fellow veteran partner, Tyler Pete. The pair weren't sure what they'd find. How relieved were you when you walked up here and saw that your gym is still intact? It was insane. Yeah, it was, I walked in and it was literally like someone had taken a 45-pound plate off of my shoulders. I'm extremely relieved. Um, I could probably kiss him. <laughs> a ray of hope shining through a frightening storm. As you can see, not every homeowner in Laura's path was so fortunate. Many now forced to begin the rebuilding process under a cloud of COVID-19 and economic uncertainty. Francis, back to you. Some tough times ahead. Sam, thanks. 
Let's turn now to the latest in Kenosha, Wisconsin. According to court documents, 17-year-old Kyle Rittenhouse is facing two first-degree homicide charges related to the fatal shootings that happened during the protests. After, after several nights of escalating tension, there were more peaceful demonstrations and new calls for change. NBC's Wendy Wolfolk has this report. The Kenosha community is grieving as a result of this tragic shooting. A grieving community, but a fourth night of protests over the police shooting of Jacob Blake. Peaceful. The voice of those people is not falling upon deaf ears. We are hearing what is being said. And new calls for swift action. Burn the the state attorney in this state, attorney general, to move and move quickly. We must know that justice works for the people. Wisconsin's attorney general identified the officer who shot Blake seven times in the back as Rustin Chesky. He's been with the Kenosha Police Department for seven years. But also announcing that investigators found a knife in the driver's side floorboard of Blake's car. Before the shooting, according to investigators, Shesky and two other officers were responding to a domestic incident and unsuccessfully tried to taser and arrest Blake. Oh. Meanwhile, 17-year-old Kyle Rittenhouse is charged with intentional homicide after two people were shot and killed during protests Tuesday night. There are Orlando Magic players heading back into the locker room. And unprecedented aftermath in the sports world. After the NBA abruptly canceled games this week and some Major League Baseball and soccer teams followed suit. They're using that voice to be heard and now they're using their lack of playing to be heard even louder. Professional athletes using their actions to call for change. Wendy Woolfolk, NBC News. President Trump didn't go far to accept the Republican nomination in an unprecedented move. He delivered his acceptance speech on the South Lawn of the White House. The final night of the RNC was more upbeat, including a moving message on second chances from a criminal justice reform advocate pardoned by the president. The nearly 22 years I spent in prison were not wasted. God had a purpose and a plan for my life. I was not delayed or denied. I was destined for such a time as this. I recognize that my dad's communication style is not to everyone's taste. And I know that his tweets can feel a bit unfiltered, but the results, the results speak for themselves. We face an invisible enemy that we didn't ask for nor invite, but we will defeat it. We will defeat it because America is where innovation happens. NBC's Tracy Potts joins us with more from D.C. And Tracy, the president's message, though, was decidedly darker than that. Well, it was, Francis, and it was actually the second longest convention speech that we have ever seen in either party. Uh, the first was the president's speech four years ago. And while he was speaking at the White House, there were protests happening outside. In fact, Senator Rand Paul said that he was attacked by what he called an angry mob. He described it as a crazed mob of about 100 people. This while inside 1,000 people were on the White House South Lawn listening to President Trump and a large part of that speech was attacking Joe Biden and his record. Joe Biden is not a savior of America's soul. He is the destroyer of America's jobs. And if given the chance, he will be the destroyer of American greatness. If you give power to Joe Biden, the radical left will defund police departments all across America. They will make every city look like Democrat-run Portland, Oregon. No one will be safe in Biden's America. The problem we have right now is we're in Donald Trump's America. They're looking for more violence and more disruption because it helps them politically. He views this as a political benefit to him. You know, he's rooting uh, for more violence, not less. And it's clear about that. And what's he doing? He's kept pouring gasoline on the fire. This happens. Also countering the president's speech in Washington, vice presidential nominee Kamala Harris. Uh, she said that the president had failed the most basic and important part of his job, protecting the American people. Francis. All right, Tracy, thank you. This morning, don't miss Craig Melvin's exclusive sit-down interview with Senator Kamala Harris coming up on the Today Show. 
Another Confederate statue has been toppled, this time in Lake Charles, Louisiana. The South's Defenders Memorial Monument survived the summer protests but could not stand up to Hurricane Laura. Just two weeks ago, officials voted to keep the statue on the courthouse lawn after a lot of debate. It has been damaged in other storms before and restored, but critics hope that that will not be the case this time. So we see the damage there. Let's talk about now Laura's aftermath and where it's headed. Here's NBC meteorologist Janessa Webb. Janessa, good morning. Hey, good morning. Good morning, everyone. We now have tropical depression. Laura, it has been downgraded. I do think we'll see our last advisory from the National Hurricane Center this afternoon, but still it's causing a lot of rain for central Arkansas as it makes its way through the Mississippi Valley. We're still going to watch the leftovers of the storm system across the Ohio Valley for your Saturday morning before it starts to really push into more of the northeast. It is going to be a soggy one from Charlotte all the way into Boston. That's a look at the big weather story of the day. Here's a closer look at your day ahead. Our temperatures across the deep south, we have heat alerts that are in place uh, across uh, Texas and even for the upper Midwest. We're going to watch the severe weather threat Orlando today. Cloudy skies all the way into Charleston. We'll look at that all important weekend forecast coming up. All right. Great job with all the hurricane coverage yes. this week, Janessa. Right, two people are lucky to be alive after their small plane crashed and flipped upside down in the Florida Evergr Everglades. It happened in an isolated area of Broward County, so rescuers needed to pick them up in airboats. The pair suffered minor injuries, and the FAA and the National Transportation Safety Board are investigating that crash. Breaking news overnight, Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe is stepping down. Japan's national broadcaster NHK reported that the Prime Minister intends to resign. The news caused stocks to briefly fall in Japan. Abe says that he plans to step down to deal with health issues. He has made some recent visits to the hospital. The Prime Minister confirmed the reports just moments ago during a press conference. A major reversal from the CDC. The agency is now walking back a recommendation from earlier this week that said people with no virus symptoms do not necessarily need a test. The previous recommendation said all close contacts of infected individuals should be tested regardless of symptoms. The CDC's director now says that all close contacts of confirmed or probable COVID-19 patients may consider testing. The change comes after the decision sparked backlash from medical experts. A new study from UCLA revealed a disturbing trend about the toll of COVID-19. It shows there was a five-fold increase in coronavirus deaths among working-age Latinos in California over the last three months. One researcher said the victims are unsung essential workers like farmers and truck drivers. The coronavirus has killed more than 12,000 people in California, and nearly half of them are Latino. Today, tens of thousands of people are expected to descend on the National Mall to protest police brutality in a march organized by the Reverend Al Sharpton's National Action Network and the NAACP. It comes on the 57th anniversary of the March on Washington, where hundreds of thousands gathered to demand civil and economic rights for African Americans. The march culminated with Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. delivering his historic I Have a Dream speech on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial. Lord & Taylor is officially going out of business. The luxury department retailer announced that it is closing all of its 38 stores, ending a nearly 200-year run. The announcement comes weeks after the company filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy protection. Our interactive state-by-state -state plan year vote guide has everything you need to know about casting a ballot in the 2020 presidential election. See where your state stands on voting rules and read up on deadlines, restrictions, and more. Visit NBCNews.com slash PlanYourVote to learn more. A new song is playing throughout San Francisco this summer. The mysterious sound seeping through the fog is leaving some Bay Area residents confused. To some, it sounds like a hum, and for others, a whistle. NBC's Jake Ward may have solved the mystery. Since early June, a ghostly sound has drifted across San Francisco. And social media lit up with a range of reactions, calling it soothing, unsettling, even alien. But it's not supernatural. It's the city's most iconic landmark, the Golden Gate Bridge. The big factor in designing a bridge is, of course, wind. 
This, the Golden Gate, is a big cut in the landscape that acts as a wind tunnel. That means that the whole design of the bridge turns into one big sail when the wind is strong enough. And these, the original 1937 struts of the railing, catch the wind. It's the new, thinner version of those struts that are creating that noise. When you ask engineers why wind matters on a bridge, well, they always name the same one, the Tacoma Narrows Bridge. And the bridge whips about like some fluttering ribbon. It was nicknamed Gallop and Gertie for its tendency to move in the wind. And in 1940, against gusts of just 40 miles an hour, it began to twist, then the concrete buckled, and it collapsed. It literally shook itself to pieces. The consensus was that the solid side railings were responsible. Engineers everywhere are haunted by it. This wind retrofit project is to ensure that that type of effect or phenomenon doesn't happen here at the Golden Gate Bridge. The important thing is that scale model tests of earthquakes and high winds showed the bridge will be stronger than ever. But those tests didn't reveal the eerie sound it would make. Engineers here are working on a plan to quiet the hum. But in the meantime, the bridge harmonics are a reminder of the high stakes and complicated work of building and maintaining a roadway high above the waves. Jake Ward, NBC News, San Francisco. Wow, it's fascinating. At least after all this time, we know now the cause of it is originally just to make everybody safer. Yeah, hey, it's some creepy wind chimes, but better than that yeah, Tacoma right? Bridge. Yeah, Tell exactly. That. That's right even now. freaky to watch after Eesh. all this time. Good morning, everyone. It's all about the weekend now, and it's going to be kind of a soggy one for the East Coast. That's the leftovers of that tropical system, Laura. Nice and sunny across the Great Lakes. But if you're across the East Coast, Sunday is going to be the day where it'll start to dry out, and temperatures very comfortable. The heat and humidity, it starts to die down. Really want, to, want everyone to enjoy the weekend, because when I see you on Monday, let's talk about the tropics. Once again, we have two systems that have potential development late next week. Francis wow, talk Phillip. about some whiplash after that. Make sure we'll enjoy the weekend then. Janessa, wow. thank you. The Gulf Coast is now assessing the damage after a direct hit from Hurricane Laura. Lake Charles, Louisiana was in the path of the eye of the storm as it made landfall. The city likely has a long road to recovery ahead of it. NBC's Jay Gray is on the ground there. And Jay, tell us more about the aftermath that you see there. Well, you know, Francis, it's overwhelming. It seems everywhere you turn, there's devastation and debris. This twisted, sheared metal, part of what used to be a gas station here. You can see the pumps still there, but this one is gone, ripped away and tossed away by the storm, evidence of the sheer power of lore. At first glance, it has the appearance of a child's messy playroom. Cars and trucks scattered on their sides. But a closer look and it's clear. This mess is no game. There's so much damage here. You, you're going, this is, this is a disaster area. You know, I mean, it's a literal disaster. From Cameron, where the massive storm came ashore through Lake Charles, the devastation from Laura stretches for miles. This was the most powerful storm to ever make landfall in Louisiana. A Category 4 hurricane with sustained winds of 150 miles an hour. Ripping apart homes and businesses, literally pulling trees from the ground, snapping power poles, scattering and twisting lines, most of the area still without electricity. <laughs> Communities, and we now know families, cut to their core. At least six people killed in the storm, and officials fear that number could grow. Certainly I'm concerned that as we continue to go out and do primary and secondary search and rescue, we're going to find more fatalities. I, I hope not. Survivors now working to piece together what Laura left behind, the hurricane, tearing away most everything here, except... We will rebuild, we always do. Their resolve. Yeah, and look, it's the strength this community is definitely going to need. Uh, Francis and Philip, this is going to be a long, a very difficult recovery here. Back sure, to you. Sure, tough days ahead for them. Jay, thank you.
All right, there, uh, there's a lot. It's full of musician memorabilia and is all going up for auction soon and all for a good cause. Items range here from a pair of Ozzy Osbourne's glasses. How cool is that? A jacket worn by Cher uh, to a signed Billie Eilish ukulele. Uh, even a tracksuit worn by Sir Elton John. Uh, not just music items either. Her John Stamos' leather jacket yeah. from Full House. So that cool. Uncle, Uncle Jesse. Yeah, exactly. It all goes uh, to benefit Music Care's COVID-19 Relief Fund. Uh, the bidding, I understand, has already begun, and the actual auction closes on September 9th. A lot of great, good stuff out there. I'm thinking the apartment building is going to fall on top of us because you can hear stuff knocking against the, the brick. Hurricane Laura unleashes devastation on multiple states, taking at least six lives in the process. We've got the latest. A big night for Republicans who used the White House for the final night of their convention as President Trump accepted his party's nomination for a second term amid fanfare and big protests outside the grounds. Protests in the wake of the Jacob Blake shooting, including an interview with a 17-year-old accused of killing two, and the next steps for the NBA and professional athletes whose professional pause kept a nation. And we'll meet the woman who has survived two pandemics as she shares her secret to a happy life on this final Friday of August. Early today starts right now. Thanks for ending your week with us. I'm Francis Rivera. And I'm Philip Mena. Hurricane Laura delivered a shattering and deadly blow to the Gulf Coast, leaving a trail of chaos. At least six people died from the storm. A riverboat casino got wedged under a bridge and plumes of smoke blanketed the air after an oil refinery went up in flames. People living within a one-mile radius of Westlake were told to shelter in place because of the release of chlorine gas. And this is what Lake Charles, Louisiana looks like. Boats were tossed around, roofs peeled off their homes. President Trump is set to visit that storm-ravaged area this weekend. Our Chris Pallone has the latest. In southwest Louisiana, it was a day of taking stock and cleaning up. There's so much damage here. You're going, this is, this is a disaster area. You know, I mean, it's a literal disaster. I mean, the recovery time for this is going to be phenomenal. Hurricane Laura struck the area just after midnight, the most powerful storm ever to make landfall here. Packing 150 mile per hour winds and heavy rain, the storm destroyed buildings, toppled trucks, and brought trees and power lines down. Lake Charles, one of the hardest hit cities. I'm thinking the apartment building is going to fall on top of us because you can hear stuff knocking against the, the brick. A chlorine gas leak at a plant near Lake Charles caused a major fire. The smoke could be seen for miles, and nearby residents were told not to go outside. And yet, despite all of it, the governors of Louisiana and Texas are counting their blessings. We're thankful we didn't get more storm surge than we did. A terrifying night, which will be followed by weeks, maybe months, of cleanup and construction. Chris Pallone, NBC News, Lafayette, Louisiana. More than 500,000 people were ordered to evacuate ahead of the storm. A number chose to remain and endure the dangerous night in their homes and others with concerns about coronavirus and shelters. Sam Brock spoke with those who rode out the storm. Francis, good morning. Ahead of a Category 4 hurricane, hundreds of thousands of mandatory evacuations in Texas and Louisiana. But not everybody heeded the call, although many lived to tell about it. We find out why they decided to stay behind. Families across Texas uprooted by a Category 4 hurricane after opting to ride out the storm. Why'd you stay home? Because we had trouble getting back in here whenever Hurricane Rita come through. And I swore I'd never leave again after that. The cracked trees and splintered roofs. Last night I heard a crash and of course this oak tree is in the middle of the house. Destroying homes but not shaking foundations. We've done it a few too many times in the last 20 years. But Anyway, we will rebuild. We always do. They battened down their property as in past storms, but this one bore a new threat, coronavirus. Being in a large shelter or a large building with a lot of people, um, it, it was a huge factor in my thinking of evacuating. Arata Young also says he couldn't afford to evacuate. The five-year Marine Corps veteran has tied up his life savings in a yoga and jujitsu gym. He just opened last week, along with his fellow veteran partner, Tyler Pete. The pair weren't sure what they'd find. How relieved were you when you walked up here and saw that your gym is still intact? It was insane. Yeah, it was, I walked in and it was literally like someone had taken a 45-pound plate off of my shoulders. I'm extremely relieved. Um, 
I could probably kiss him. <laughs> a ray of hope shining through a frightening storm. As you can see, not every homeowner in Laura's path was so fortunate. Many now forced to begin the rebuilding process under a cloud of COVID-19 and economic uncertainty. Francis, back to you. Hoping for the best for him. Sam, thank you. President Trump delivered his case for a second term right from the steps of the White House. On the final night of the Republican National Convention, the president painted a dire portrait of a country that would plunge into chaos if Joe Biden wins the election. Throughout his speech, protesters made their voices heard, chants and music echoing faintly in the distance. No peace, no justice, no peace, no justice, no peace. NBC's Alice Barr has more on the fireworks of the night. A grand finale for the Republican National Convention. President Trump laying it all on the line in his bid for a second term in office. I profoundly accept this nomination for President of the United States. Drawing a sharp contrast between his vision for America and Thank Joe you. Biden's. Joe Biden is not a savior of America's soul. He is the destroyer of America's jobs. And if given the chance, he will be the destroyer of American greatness. The president formally accepting his party's renomination against the unprecedented backdrop of the White House and at a time of crisis, offering support to those in the punishing path of Hurricane Laura. And as racial justice protests rekindle after the police shooting of Jacob Blake in Wisconsin, the president forcefully underscoring his law and order message. No one will be safe in Biden's America. My administration will always stand with the men and women of law enforcement. On the coronavirus pandemic, downplaying the devastating death toll and touting his administration's response. We will have a safe and effective vaccine this year, and together we will crush the virus. President Trump appealing to his base with promises to protect conservative values. If the left gains power, they will demolish the suburbs, confiscate your guns, and appoint justices who will wipe away your Second Amendment and other constitutional freedoms. Trailing in the polls, the president and his party making a primetime sales pitch for a second term. In Washington, Alice Barr, NBC News. Well, that dark tone served as a through line at the GOP's convention, despite the initial promise of a positive message. Make no mistake, no matter where you live, your family will not be safe in the radical Democrats' America. Crime, violence, and mob rule. Crime ravaging our streets. That is what America would see if it allowed Biden-Harris to run this country. Trump was elected to protect our families from the vengeful mob. They want to abolish the suburbs altogether. Nightmares are becoming real. Cops killed, children shot. Drug addicts, guns on the street. The mob will try to destroy you. They want to enslave you to the weak, dependent, liberal, victim ideology. Burn down the foundations of our country to the ground. Spawns of Satan. You will not recognize this country or yourself. The American way of life is being dismantled. Anarchy and chaos on our streets. This election is shaping up to be church, work, and school versus rioting, looting, and vandalism. The police aren't coming when you call. They want to steal your liberty, your freedom. They'll disarm you, empty the prisons, lock you in your home. They want to control what you see and think and believe so that they can control how you live. It's a horror film, really. It's madness. It remains to be seen how the tone resonates with voters, but we know ratings for the RNC have taken a hit. Wednesday drew in about 15.7 million viewers. Last week's DNC brought in just under 21.5 million on its third night. And after the onslaught of attacks on Joe Biden during the RNC. Well, the Democratic nominee, I guess, is, is, she's firing, is firing back this morning. He also, uh, he responded to calls to not even bother debating the president. He spoke one-on-one -on -one with our Andrea Mitchell. After Republicans blamed him all week for violence, including in Kenosha, Joe Biden and Kamala Harris fighting back. Biden responding to Vice President Mike Pence saying, you won't be safe in Joe Biden's America. The problem we have right now is we're in Donald Trump's America. They're looking for more violence and more disruption because it helps them politically. 
he views this as a political benefit to him. You know, he's rooting uh, for more violence, not less. And it's clear about that. And what's he doing? He's kept pouring gasoline on the fire. This happens to be Donald Trump's America. You think the president of the United States is rooting for the violence because he thinks it helps him politically? I think he views it as a political benefit. And by the way, I condemn violence in any form, whether it's looting or whatever it is. So who's who's rooting for the violence here? Biden also said the biggest safety issue is people dying from COVID and what he called pressure on the scientists on testing and therapies, possibly on vaccines. Did you ever see any administration put so much pressure on the FDA? There's no bounds to what this guy does and his team does. We should listen to the scientists. How concerned are you that they're going to rush something out even before Election Day? And I, I pray to God that would happen tomorrow. That'd be wonderful. But the fact is, let's assume we finally do get a vaccine, that it works. And how much credibility are we going to have telling people to take it after going through all this stuff that they've misrepresented so far? Kamala Harris also punching back with Craig Melvin for The Today Show. And the American people, regardless of race, or gender, or age, or geographic location, have a right to believe that their leaders will speak truth, even when these are difficult truths. After Nancy Pelosi joked that Biden should not debate the president because she said the president doesn't tell the truth, Biden told me he will be at the debates, but will have to fact check the president while debating. Francis. All right, Andrea, thank you. Uh, NBC meteorologist Janessa Webb joining us now with the latest on what remains of Laura. Janessa, good morning. Hey, good morning, Francis and Philip. We're continuing to watch the storm system now downgraded to a tropical depression. But what you're going to see throughout the weekend is going to be a rainmaker. Right now, we've already seen about five inches of rain across central Arkansas. And as the system continues to split apart, it's definitely losing its wind force, but the rain is going to continue all the way into the Mississippi and upper uh, Mississippi Valley. Even for Ohio, we're going to watch that for Saturday afternoon in then it heads towards the northeast late day for your Saturday. That's a look at the big weather story of the day. Here's a closer look at your day ahead. Our temperatures across Wichita this afternoon, 97 degrees. We're also watching the threat of some severe storms sparking up a few tornadoes possible. New Orleans, more rain, lower 90s, Raleigh, 93. We'll take a look at that all-important weekend forecast coming up, guys. All right. Can't wait to hear it, Janessa. Thank you. So, so this morning you're grabbing your coffee and then your donuts. Some exciting news for the donut lovers here. Krispy Kreme is back with their popular chocolate glazed donuts for one day only. Today, the classic original glazed donut is covered in a rich chocolate glaze. It's being offered at locations across the U.S. It's normally a short-lived appearance on their menu, so make sure you actually get out there and grab it before they run out. Yeah, I do not think I've ever had a chocolate glaze. No, not right? from there. Leading the news, a wrongly imprisoned black man has been freed from a North Carolina prison after serving 44 years. 64-year-old Ronnie Long was released on Thursday after the state of North Carolina filed a motion in federal court to vacate his 1976 conviction by an all-white jury. Long had been sentenced to life in prison for first-degree rape and first-degree burglary, something he says he didn't commit. The federal appeals court says they also found a pattern of police suppression of material evidence in the case. I just appreciate the people that come out and supported me. And I wanted you to know, you understand, saying, look, if they will never, ever, never, ever, ever lock me up again. That's right. They'll never lock me up again. Yeah. All right, Ronnie says he's excited for his first meal out of prison. It'll be mac and cheese, beef ribs, a salad, and some lemonade. Additional charges have been filed after two people were killed during protests in Wisconsin. According to court documents, 17-year-old Kyle Rittenhouse faces two first-degree homicide charges as well as two charges of attempted homicide. On the streets of Kenosha, the community continues to call out for change after the police shooting of Jacob Blake. Here's NBC's Wendy Wolfolk. The Kenosha community is grieving as a result of this tragic shooting. A grieving community, but a fourth night of protests over the police shooting of Jacob Blake. Peaceful. The voice of those people is not falling upon deaf ears. We are hearing what is being said. And new calls for swift action. Burn upon the state's the attorney in this state, attorney general, to move and move quickly. We must know that justice works for the people. 
Wisconsin's Attorney General identified the officer who shot Blake seven times in the back as Rustin Chesky. He's been with the Kenosha Police Department for seven years. But also announcing that investigators found a knife in the driver's side floorboard of Blake's car. Before the shooting, according to investigators, Shesky and two other officers were responding to a domestic incident and unsuccessfully tried to taser and arrest Blake. Oh. Meanwhile, 17-year-old Kyle Rittenhouse is charged with intentional homicide after two people were shot and killed during protests Tuesday night. There are Orlando Magic players heading back into the locker room. And unprecedented aftermath in the sports world. After the NBA abruptly canceled games this week and some Major League Baseball and soccer teams followed suit. They're using that voice to be heard and now they're using their lack of playing to be heard even louder. Professional athletes using their actions to call for change. Wendy Woolfolk, NBC News. London Zoo began its annual weigh-in to find out how the longest closure in the zoo's history since World War II has affected their animals. Staff noticed that some of the species have been sad because there were no visitors due to the pandemic. The test will confirm if over 19,000 animals have been physically changed by the toll of the lockdown. I know we have. Right? I've been sad with no Across visitors. Across the board. <laughs> you know? I wonder what that first animal was, though. It had some, it had like zebra legs. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I don't know. Fascinating. Yeah. All right. Panda fans, here is your first look at the National Zoo's new baby panda. Mei Shang left the cub alone to get some water, giving us a close-up look. You can see the cub there crying, tossing, and turning. Aww. Yeah, the baby is Mei Shang's fourth successful birth. Yeah, well, mama's letting that cub <laughs> cry it out. You yeah. have to tend to it right away. Yeah, self-soothing. Right. Yeah, <laughs> after spending over 500 days in a shelter, a three-year-old dog named Joey has finally found a loving home. When Joey's new owners came to take him home, the shelter's staff lined up to drape lays around the pooch's neck. Joey responded with goodbye kisses. The staff said it was the day they have all been waiting for. So hopefully at the end of the week, all these cute puppy animals and, and nice. Like Cuties great. make you smile. Yep, great story for a Friday. Good morning, everyone. This is the last weekend of August. It's going to be kind of sloppy for most of the East Coast. Drenching rain due to that tropical uh, depression right now. Nice and sunny, though, for the Great Lakes and the heat. It's going to continue to build for the Pacific Northwest. Sunday, it's the day for the Northeast. Get out there and enjoy it. 89 across portions of the Mid-Atlantic. We'll be right back. They move today, 200,000 strong, down a broad and tree-shaded avenue in Washington, D.C., softly singing and chanting the hymns born of their movement and those that have gone before. There were no ranks, but they were orderly. They moved with dignity, but there was no sternness. Their placards demanded the uprooting of every vestige of discrimination and said it must be done now, but they showed no anger. Regardless of all else, for most, these will be the lasting impressions of the March on Washington for jobs and freedom. On this day in 1963, hundreds of thousands of protesters gathered in Washington, D.C. to demand civil and economic rights for African Americans. The march culminated with Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. delivering his historic I Have a Dream speech on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial. And today, tens of thousands are expected to gather in that same spot to protest police brutality in a march organized by the Reverend Al Sharpton's National Action Network and the NAACP. Now to a birthday party for a woman born in 1918. Aunt Bob's has lived through two pandemics and is full of advice. Here's NBC's Harry Smith. If it looks like Bab's Miss Rucky knows how to wear a crown, it doesn't surprise her family. To them, she is royalty. We love her to death. Bab's turned 102 this week. I hope I look that good when I'm 75. And still holding court. Happy Yay! birthday! She has more stories than anybody you ever seen in your life. Some are not true, some are true, some get exaggerated, but boy, is she a lot of fun to listen to those stories. A child of immigrants born into a pandemic through years thick and thin, a witness to history and an optimist. I had a confidence that the country will be fine. Everything will be good because I was told that it would be. My father told me, my mother told me, my president told me. That was FDR for the record. In the game of life, making it to 100 requires luck, love, 
and most likely, a twinkle in your eye. Get a Coke and chips. Have fun. Have fun and enjoy. And it, it's, it's a good life. It's worth suffering for and living for. Life is good. And that part, we do believe. Harry Smith, NBC News. Wow, whatever her secret is, she better bottle that because it is working for yeah. 102 years. 102 years old, happy birthday to Bab. She does look great. Wow, if we can only, like they said it best, if we can only look like that 70 or 80, we'll there, take it. There you go. Have fun, enjoy. That's what's up. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays, starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. Among the chaos, that I found a father trying to teach his son about peace. We don't have to retaliate with anger. We retaliate with love. That's why we're down here. There's always another way. So that's all I want him to see. This is a situation where the state continues to struggle to expand its testing capabilities. Protesters feel that they need to come out in full force and support their community because they feel like they're not getting that support from the Portland police. Another election day coming up against the backdrop of how to keep voters safe amid a pandemic. The moment to truly understand who we are and who we say we are is right here at our feet. You gotta get a four-year degree, but a four-year degree is super expensive. We have created a system where the ticket to the middle class is a thing that middle class families have to stress about and borrow for and patch together. Why is this happening? With Chris Hayes, subscribe now. Today's headlines can be hard to understand and a lot of kids have questions, so we started a newscast for them. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. We actually saw a large convoy of the National Guard come through here. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. This morning across the country, what the new normal for schools will look like. Many teachers left making tough choices between the job they love and their family. What am I going to decide? Take care of my children or have a job? That's an impossible decision. You're creating a little community school. This is a moment we could just develop ourselves and develop our community. Let's turn it over to students. How do they really feel about returning to school? What I miss is my teachers. They are resilient. A surge in coronavirus infection. New developments on several fronts. The story. Tonight, the U.S. shattering the record for most COVID cases in a single day. From every angle. What's your level of concern that the kids who have been told they're going to be home indefinitely won't be able to catch up? On the ground. Do you have faith that this is going to bring about change soon? And in death. Here in Portland, more protests expected tonight. Do you think that police in this country are under attack? NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. The news business is dynamic and probably has never been more important. With all that we're facing, I am so proud to bring the perspective of a black woman, a daughter of immigrants, the wife and mother of a husband and kids who sadly are more vulnerable to police violence because of their color, a proud nerd, and a representative of the emerging America to cable TV news. I hope the great Gwen Ifill and my mom, Philomena Carol Lamina, will look down from heaven and be proud. I'm thinking the apartment building is gonna fall on top of us because you can hear stuff knocking against the, the brick. Hurricane Laura unleashes devastation on multiple states, taking at least six lives in the process. We've got the latest. A big night for Republicans who used the White House for the final night of their convention. As President Trump accepted his party's nomination for a second term amid fanfare and big protests outside the grounds. Protests in the wake of the Jacob Blake shooting, including an interview with a 17-year-old accused of killing two, and the next steps for the NBA and professional athletes whose professional paws captured a nation. And we'll meet the woman who has survived two pandemics as she shares her secret to a happy life on this final Friday of August. Early today starts right now. 
Thanks for ending your week with us. I'm Francis Rivera. And I'm Philip Mena. Hurricane Laura delivered a shattering and deadly blow to the Gulf Coast, leaving a trail of chaos. At least six people died from the storm. A riverboat casino got wedged under a bridge and plumes of smoke blanketed the air after an oil refinery went up in flames. People living within a one-mile radius of Westlake were told to shelter in place because of the release of chlorine gas. And this is what Lake Charles, Louisiana looks like. Boats were tossed around, roofs peeled off their homes. President Trump is set to visit that storm-ravaged area this weekend. Our Chris Pallone has the latest. In southwest Louisiana, it was a day of taking stock and cleaning up. There's so much damage here. You're going, this is, this is a disaster area. You know, I mean, it's a literal disaster. I mean, the recovery time for this is going to be phenomenal. Hurricane Laura struck the area just after midnight, the most powerful storm ever to make landfall here. Packing 150 mile per hour winds and heavy rain, the storm destroyed buildings, toppled trucks, and brought trees and power lines down. Lake Charles, one of the hardest hit cities. I'm thinking the apartment building is going to fall on top of us because you can hear stuff knocking against the, the brick. A chlorine gas leak at a plant near Lake Charles caused a major fire. The smoke could be seen for miles, and nearby residents were told not to go outside. And yet, despite all of it, the governors of Louisiana and Texas are counting their blessings. We're thankful we didn't get more storm surge than we did. A terrifying night, which will be followed by weeks, maybe months, of cleanup and construction. Chris Pallone, NBC News, Lafayette, Louisiana. More than 500,000 people were ordered to evacuate ahead of the storm. A number chose to remain and endure the dangerous night in their homes and others with concerns about coronavirus and shelters. Sam Brock spoke with those who rode out the storm. Francis, good morning. Ahead of a Category 4 hurricane, hundreds of thousands of mandatory evacuations in Texas and Louisiana. But not everybody heeded the call, although many lived to tell about it. We find out why they decided to stay behind. Families across Texas uprooted by a Category 4 hurricane after opting to ride out the storm. Why'd you stay home? Because we had trouble getting back in here whenever Hurricane Rita come through. And I swore I'd never leave again after that. The cracked trees and splintered roofs. Last night I heard a crash and of course this oak tree is in the middle of the house. Destroying homes but not shaking foundations. We've done it a few too many times in the last 20 years. But Anyway, we will rebuild. We always do. They battened down their property as in past storms, but this one bore a new threat, coronavirus. Being in a large shelter or a large building with a lot of people, um, it, it was a huge factor in my thinking of evacuating. Arata Young also says he couldn't afford to evacuate. The five-year Marine Corps veteran has tied up his life savings in a yoga and jujitsu gym. He just opened last week, along with his fellow veteran partner, Tyler Pete. The pair weren't sure what they'd find. How relieved were you when you walked up here and saw that your gym is still intact? It was insane. Yeah, it was, I walked in and it was literally like someone had taken a 45 pound plate off of my shoulders. I'm extremely relieved. Um, I could probably kiss him. <laughs> a ray of hope shining through a frightening storm. As you can see, not every homeowner in Laura's path was so fortunate. Many now forced to begin the rebuilding process under a cloud of COVID-19 and economic uncertainty. Francis, back to you. Hoping for the best for him. Sam, thank you. President Trump delivered his case for a second term right from the steps of the White House. On the final night of the Republican National Convention, the president painted a dire portrait of a country that would plunge into chaos if Joe Biden wins the election. Throughout his speech, protesters made their voices heard, chants and music echoing faintly in the distance. No peace! No justice! No peace! No justice! No peace! NBC's Alice Barr has more on the fireworks of the night. A grand finale for the Republican National Convention. President Trump laying it all on the line in his bid for a second term in office. I profoundly accept this nomination for President of the United States. Drawing a sharp contrast between his vision for America and Thank Joe you. Biden's. Joe Biden is not a savior of America's soul. He is the destroyer of America's jobs. And if given the chance, he will be the destroyer of American greatness. 
The president formally accepting his party's renomination against the unprecedented backdrop of the White House and at a time of crisis, offering support to those in the punishing path of Hurricane Laura. And as racial justice protests rekindle after the police shooting of Jacob Blake in Wisconsin, the president forcefully underscoring his law and order message. No one will be safe in Biden's America. My administration will always stand with the men and women of law enforcement. On the coronavirus pandemic, downplaying the devastating death toll and touting his administration's response. We will have a safe and effective vaccine this year. And together, we will crush the virus. President Trump appealing to his base with promises to protect conservative values. If the left gains power, they will demolish the suburbs, confiscate your guns, and appoint justices who will wipe away your Second Amendment and other constitutional freedoms. Trailing in the polls, the president and his party making a primetime sales pitch for a second term. In Washington, Alice Barr, NBC News. Well, that dark tone served as a through line at the GOP's convention, despite the initial promise of a positive message. Make no mistake, no matter where you live, your family will not be safe in the radical Democrats' America. Crime, violence, and mob rule. Crime ravaging our streets. That is what America would see if it allowed Biden-Harris to run this country. Trump was elected to protect our families from the vengeful mob. They want to abolish the suburbs altogether. Nightmares are becoming real. Cops killed, children shot. Drug addicts, guns on the street. The mob will try to destroy you. They want to enslave you to the weak, dependent, liberal, victim ideology. Burn down the foundations of our country to the ground. Spawns of Satan. You will not recognize this country or yourself. The American way of life is being dismantled. Anarchy and chaos on our streets. This election is shaping up to be church, work, and school versus rioting, looting, and vandalism. The police aren't coming when you call. They want to steal your liberty, your freedom. They'll disarm you, empty the prisons, lock you in your home. They want to control what you see and think and believe so that they can control how you live. It's a horror film, really. It's madness. It remains to be seen how the tone resonates with voters, but we know ratings for the RNC have taken a hit. Wednesday drew in about 15.7 million viewers. Last week's DNC brought in just under 21.5 million on its third night. And after the onslaught of attacks on Joe Biden during the RNC. Well, the Democratic nominee, I guess, is, she's firing, is firing back this morning. He also, uh, he responded to calls to not even bother debating the president. He spoke one-on-one -on -one with our Andrea Mitchell. After Republicans blamed him all week for violence, including in Kenosha, Joe Biden and Kamala Harris fighting back. Biden responding to Vice President Mike Pence saying, you won't be safe in Joe Biden's America. The problem we have right now is we're in Donald Trump's America. They're looking for more violence and more disruption because it helps them politically. He views this as a political benefit to him. You know, he's rooting uh, for more violence, not less. And it's clear about that. And what's he doing? He's kept pouring gasoline on the fire. This happens to be Donald Trump's America. You think the president of the United States is rooting for the violence because he thinks it helps him politically? I think he views it as a political benefit. And by the way, I condemn violence in any form, whether it's looting or whatever it is. So who's, who's rooting for the violence here? Biden also said the biggest safety issue is people dying from COVID and what he called pressure on the scientists on testing and therapies, possibly on vaccines. Did you ever see any administration put so much pressure on the FDA? There's no bounds to what this guy does and his team does. We should listen to the scientists. How concerned are you that they're going to rush something out even before Election Day? And I, I pray to God that would happen tomorrow. That'd be wonderful. But the fact is, let's assume we finally do get a vaccine, that it works. And how much credibility are we going to have telling people to take it after going through all this stuff that they've misrepresented so far? Kamala Harris also punching back with Craig Melvin for the Today Show. And the American people, regardless of race or gender or age or geographic location, have a right to believe that their leaders will speak truth, even when these are difficult truths. 
After Nancy Pelosi joked that Biden should not debate the president because she said the president doesn't tell the truth, Biden told me he will be at the debates, but will have to fact check the president while debating. Francis. All right, Andrea, thank you. Uh, NBC meteorologist Janessa Webb joining us now with the latest on what remains of Laura. Janessa, good morning. Hey, good morning, Francis and Philip. We're continuing to watch the storm system now downgraded to a tropical depression. But what you're going to see throughout the weekend is going to be a rainmaker. Right now, we've already seen about five inches of rain across central Arkansas. And as the system continues to split apart, it's definitely losing its wind force, but the rain is going to continue all the way into the Mississippi and upper uh, Mississippi Valley. Even for Ohio, we're going to watch that for Saturday afternoon and then and it heads towards the northeast late day for your Saturday. That's a look at the big weather story of the day. Here's a closer look at your day ahead. Our temperatures across Wichita this afternoon, 97 degrees. We're also watching the threat of some severe storms sparking up a few tornadoes possible. New Orleans, more rain, lower 90s, Raleigh, 93. We'll take a look at that all-important weekend forecast coming up, guys. All right. Can't wait to hear it, Janessa. Thank you. So this morning you're grabbing your coffee and then your donuts. Some exciting news for the donut lovers here. Krispy Kreme is back with their popular chocolate glazed donuts for one day only. Today, the classic original glazed donut is covered in a rich chocolate glaze. It's being offered at locations across the U.S. It's normally a short-lived appearance on their menu, so make sure you actually get out there and grab it before they run out. Yeah. Leading the news, a wrongly imprisoned black man has been freed from a North Carolina prison after serving 44 years. 64-year-old Ronnie Long was released on Thursday after the state of North Carolina filed a motion in federal court to vacate his 1976 conviction by an all-white jury. Long had been sentenced to life in prison for first-degree rape and first-degree burglary, something he says he didn't commit. The federal appeals court says they also found a pattern of police suppression of material evidence in the case. I just appreciate the people that come out and supported me. And I wanted you to know, you understand, saying, look, if they will never, ever, never, ever, ever lock me up again. That's right. They'll never lock me up again. Yeah. All right, Ronnie says he's excited for his first meal out of prison. It'll be mac and cheese, beef ribs, a salad, and some lemonade. Additional charges have been filed after two people were killed during protests in Wisconsin. According to court documents, 17-year-old Kyle Rittenhouse faces two first-degree homicide charges as well as two charges of attempted homicide. On the streets of Kenosha, the community continues to call out for change after the police shooting of Jacob Blake. Here's NBC's Wendy Wolfock. The Kenosha community is grieving as a result of this tragic shooting. A grieving community, but a fourth night of protests over the police shooting of Jacob Blake. Peaceful. The voice of those people is not falling upon deaf ears. We are hearing what is being said. And new calls for swift action. Brenda Bunn, the Bunn, the, the state attorney in this state, attorney general, to move and move quickly. We must know that justice works for the people. Wisconsin's attorney general identified the officer who shot Blake seven times in the back as Rustin Chesky. He's been with the Kenosha Police Department for seven years but also announcing that investigators found a knife in the driver's side floorboard of Blake's car. Before the shooting, according to investigators, Shesky and two other officers were responding to a domestic incident and unsuccessfully tried to taser and arrest Blake. Oh. Meanwhile, 17-year-old Kyle Rittenhouse is charged with intentional homicide after two people were shot and killed during protests Tuesday night. There are Orlando Magic players heading back into the locker room. And unprecedented aftermath in the sports world. After the NBA abruptly canceled games this week and some Major League Baseball and soccer teams followed suit. They're using that voice to be heard and now they're using their lack of playing to be heard even louder. Professional athletes using their actions to call for change. Wendy Woolfolk, NBC News.
London Zoo began its annual weigh-in to find out how the longest closure in the zoo's history since World War II has affected their animals. Staff noticed that some of the species have been sad because there were no visitors due to the pandemic. The test will confirm if over 19,000 animals have been physically changed by the toll of the lockdown. I know we have. Right? I've been sad with no Across visitors. Across the board. <laughs> you know? I wonder what that first animal was, though. It had some, it had like zebra legs. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I don't know. Fascinating. Yeah. All right. Panda fans, here is your first look at the National Zoo's new baby panda. Mei Shang left the cub alone to get some water, giving us a close-up look. You can see the cub there crying, tossing, and turning. Aww. Yeah, the baby is Mei Shang's fourth successful birth. Yeah, Mama's letting that cub <laughs> cry it out. You yeah. have to tend to it right away. Yeah, self-soothing. Right. Yeah, <laughs> after spending over 500 days in a shelter, a three-year-old dog named Joey has finally found a loving home. When Joey's new owners came to take him home, the shelter's staff lined up to drape lays around the pooch's neck. Joey responded with goodbye kisses. The staff said it was the day they have all been waiting for. So hopefully at the end of the week, all these cute puppy animals and, and nice. Like Cuties make you smile. Yep, great story for a Friday. Good morning, everyone. This is the last weekend of August. It's going to be kind of sloppy for most of the East Coast. Drenching rain due to that tropical uh, depression right now. Nice and sunny, though, for the Great Lakes and the heat. It's going to continue to build for the Pacific Northwest. Sunday, it's the day for the Northeast. Get out there and enjoy it. 89 across portions of the Mid-Atlantic. We'll be right back. They moved today, 200,000 strong, down a broad and tree-shaded avenue in Washington, D.C., softly singing and chanting the hymns born of their movement and those that have gone before. There were no ranks, but they were orderly. They moved with dignity, but there was no sternness. Their placards demanded the uprooting of every vestige of discrimination and said it must be done now, but they showed no anger. Regardless of all else, for most, these will be the lasting impressions of the March on Washington for jobs and freedom. On this day in 1963, hundreds of thousands of protesters gathered in Washington, D.C. to demand civil and economic rights for African Americans. The march culminated with Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. delivering his historic I Have a Dream speech on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial. And today, tens of thousands are expected to gather in that same spot to protest police brutality in a march organized by the Reverend Al Sharpton's National Action Network and the NAACP. Now to a birthday party for a woman born in 1918. Aunt Bob's has lived through two pandemics and is full of advice. Here's NBC's Harry Smith. If it looks like Babs Miss Rucky knows how to wear a crown, it doesn't surprise her family. To them, she is royalty. We love her to death. Babs turned 102 this week. I hope I look that good when I'm 75. And still holding court. Happy Yay! birthday! She has more stories than anybody you ever seen in your life. Some are not true, some are true, some get exaggerated, but boy, is she a lot of fun to listen to those stories. A child of immigrants born into a pandemic through years thick and thin, a witness to history and an optimist. I had a confidence that the country will be fine. Everything will be good because I was told that it would be. My father told me, my mother told me, my president told me. That was FDR for the record. In the game of life, making it to 100 requires luck, love, and most likely, a twinkle in your eye. Get a Coke and chips, have fun. Have fun and enjoy. And it, it's, it's a good life. It's worth suffering for and living for. Life is good. And that part, we do believe. Harry Smith, NBC News. Wow, whatever her secret is, she better bottle that, because it is working for 102 years. 102 years old, happy birthday to Bab. She does look great. Wow, if we can only, like they said it best, if we can only look like that 70 or 80, we'll take it. There you go, have fun, enjoy. That's what's up. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. Among the chaos, I found a father trying to teach his son about peace. We don't have to retaliate with anger. We retaliate with love. That's why we're down here. There's always another way. So that's all I want him to see. 
This is a situation where the state continues to struggle to expand its testing capabilities. Protesters feel that they need to come out in full force and support their community because they feel like they're not getting that support from the Portland police. Another election day coming up against the backdrop of how to keep voters safe amid a pandemic. The moment to truly understand who we are and who we say we are is right here at our feet. You gotta get a four-year degree, but a four-year degree is super expensive. We have created a system where the ticket to the middle class is a thing that middle class families have to stress about and borrow for and patch together. Why is this happening? With Chris Hayes, subscribe now. Today's headlines can be hard to understand, and a lot of kids have questions, so we started a newscast for them. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. Well, we actually saw a large convoy of the National Guard come through here. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays, starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. This morning across the country, what the new normal for schools will look like. Many teachers left making tough choices between the job they love and their family. What am I going to decide? Take care of my children or have a job? That's an impossible decision. You're creating a little community school. This is a moment we could just develop ourselves and develop our community. Let's turn it over to students. How do they really feel about returning to school? What I miss is my teachers. They are resilient. A surge in coronavirus infection. New developments on several fronts. The story. Tonight, the U.S. shattering the record for most COVID cases in a single day. From every angle. What's your level of concern that the kids who have been told they're going to be home indefinitely won't be able to catch up? On the ground. Do you have faith that this is going to bring about change soon? And in death. Here in Portland, more protests expected tonight. Do you think that police in this country are under attack? NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. The news business is dynamic and probably has never been more important. With all that we're facing, I am so proud to bring the perspective of a black woman, a daughter of immigrants, the wife and mother of a husband and kids who sadly are more vulnerable to police violence because of their color, a proud nerd, and a representative of the emerging America to cable TV news. I hope the great Gwen Ifill and my mom, Philomena Carol Lamina, will look down from heaven and be proud. I profoundly accept this nomination for President of the United States. President Trump caps off the final night of the week-long Republican convention using the People's House for his political event as protests rained outside the White House gates and Biden and Harris weighed in too. The remnants of Hurricane Laura leaving death and massive destruction in its path. Protests in the wake of the Jacob Blake shooting, including an interview with a 17-year-old accused of killing two people, and the next steps for the NBA and professional athletes whose professional pause captured a nation. And have you heard about the ghostly sound drifting across San Francisco since early June? Some call it soothing. Others say it's unsettling and even alien. Early today starts right now. Glad you're with us to end the week. I'm Francis Rivera. And I'm Philip Mena. Hurricane Laura leaves a path of death and destruction on the Gulf Coast. Hundreds of people are still without power, and thousands of Louisiana residents are waking up with their lives upside down. In the town of Westlake, people had to shelter in place after an oil refinery went up in flames. Plumes of smoke released hazardous chlorine gas. And this is what Lake Charles looks like. Boats were tossed around, roofs were peeled off from homes. President Trump is set to visit the storm-ravaged areas this weekend. Our Chris Pallone has more. In southwest Louisiana, it was a day of taking stock and cleaning up. There's so much damage here. You, you're going, this is, this is a disaster area. You know, I mean, it's a literal disaster. I mean, the recovery time for this is going to be phenomenal. Hurricane Laura struck the area just after midnight, the most powerful storm ever to make landfall here. Packing 150 mile per hour winds and heavy rain, the storm destroyed buildings, toppled trucks, and brought trees and power lines down. Lake Charles, one of the hardest hit cities. I'm thinking the apartment building is going to fall on top of us because you can hear stuff knocking against the, the brick. 
A chlorine gas leak at a plant near Lake Charles caused a major fire. The smoke could be seen for miles, and nearby residents were told not to go outside. And yet, despite all of it, the governors of Louisiana and Texas are counting their blessings. We're thankful we didn't get more storm surge than we did. A terrifying night, which will be followed by weeks, maybe months, of cleanup and construction. Chris Pallone, NBC News, Lafayette, Louisiana. More than 500,000 people were ordered to evacuate ahead of the storm. The number chose to remain and endure the dangerous night in their homes, and others with concerns about coronavirus and shelters. Sam Brock spoke with those who rode out the storm. Francis, good morning. Ahead of a Category 4 hurricane, hundreds of thousands of mandatory evacuations in Texas and Louisiana. But not everybody heeded the call, although many lived to tell about it. We find out why they decided to stay behind. Families across Texas uprooted by a Category 4 hurricane after opting to ride out the storm. Why'd you stay home? Because we had trouble getting back in here whenever Hurricane Rita come through. And I swore I'd never leave again after that. The cracked trees and splintered roofs. Last night I heard a crash and of course this oak tree is in the middle of the house. Destroying homes but not shaking foundations. Well, we've done it a few too many times in the last 20 years. But anyway, we will rebuild. We always do. They battened down their property as in past storms. But this one bore a new threat, coronavirus. Being in a large shelter or a large building with a lot of people, um, it, it was a huge factor in my thinking of evacuating. Arata Young also says he couldn't afford to evacuate. The five-year Marine Corps veteran has tied up his life savings in a yoga and jujitsu gym. He just opened last week along with his fellow veteran partner, Tyler Pete. The pair weren't sure what they'd find. How relieved were you when you walked up here and saw that your gym is still intact? It was insane. Yeah, it was, I walked in and it was literally like someone had taken a 45 pound plate off of my shoulders. I'm extremely relieved. Um, I could probably kiss him. <laughs> a ray of hope shining through a frightening storm. As you can see, not every homeowner in Laura's path was so fortunate. Many now forced to begin the rebuilding process under a cloud of COVID-19 and economic uncertainty. Francis, back to you. Some tough times ahead. Sam, thanks. Let's turn now to the latest in Kenosha, Wisconsin. According to court documents, 17-year-old Kyle Rittenhouse is facing two first-degree homicide charges related to the fatal shootings that happened during the protests. After, after several nights of escalating tension, there were more peaceful demonstrations and new calls for change. NBC's Wendy Wolfolk has this report. The Kenosha community is grieving as a result of this tragic shooting. A grieving community. But a fourth night of protests over the police shooting of Jacob Blake, peaceful. The voice of those people is not falling upon deaf ears. We are hearing what is being said. And new calls for swift action. Bring the button, the, the button, the state attorney in this state, turn general, to move and move quickly. We must know that justice works for the people. Wisconsin's attorney general identified the officer who shot Blake seven times in the back as Rustin Chesky. He's been with the Kenosha Police Department for seven years. But also announcing that investigators found a knife in the driver's side floorboard of Blake's car. Before the shooting, according to investigators, Shesky and two other officers were responding to a domestic incident and unsuccessfully tried to taser and arrest Blake. Oh. Meanwhile, 17-year-old Kyle Rittenhouse is charged with intentional homicide after two people were shot and killed during protests Tuesday night. There are Orlando Magic players heading back into the locker room. And unprecedented aftermath in the sports world. After the NBA abruptly canceled games this week and some Major League Baseball and soccer teams followed suit. They're using that voice to be heard and now they're using their lack of playing to be heard even louder. Professional athletes using their actions to call for change. Wendy Woolfolk, NBC News. President Trump didn't go far to accept the Republican nomination in an unprecedented move. He delivered his acceptance speech on the South Lawn of the White House. The final night of the RNC was more upbeat, including a moving message on second chances from a criminal justice reform advocate pardoned by the president. The nearly 22 years I spent in prison were not wasted. God had a purpose and a plan for my life. I was not delayed or denied. I was destined 
but such a time as this. I recognize that my dad's communication style is not to everyone's taste, and I know that his tweets can feel a bit unfiltered, but the results, the results speak for themselves. We face an invisible enemy that we didn't ask for nor invite, but we will defeat it. We will defeat it because America is where innovation happens. NBC's Tracy Potts joins us with more from D.C. And Tracy, the president's message, though, was decidedly darker than that. Well, it was, Francis, and it was actually the second longest convention speech that we have ever seen in either party. Uh, the first was the president's speech four years ago. And while he was speaking at the White House, there were protests happening outside. In fact, Senator Rand Paul said that he was attacked by what he called an angry mob. He described it as a crazed mob of about 100 people. This, while inside, a 1,000 people were on the White House South Lawn listening to President Trump and a large part of that speech was attacking Joe Biden and his record. Joe Biden is not a savior of America's soul. He is the destroyer of America's jobs. And if given the chance, he will be the destroyer of American greatness. If you give power to Joe Biden, the radical left will defund police departments all across America. They will make every city look like Democrat-run Portland, Oregon. No one will be safe in Biden's America. The problem we have right now is we're in Donald Trump's America. They're looking for more violence and more disruption because it helps them politically. He views this as a political benefit to him. You know, he's rooting uh, for more violence, not less. And it's clear about that. And what's he doing? He's kept pouring gasoline on the fire. This happens. Also countering the president's speech in Washington, vice presidential nominee Kamala Harris. Uh, she said that the president had failed the most basic and important part of his job, protecting the American people. Francis. All right, Tracy, thank you. This morning, don't miss Craig Melvin's exclusive sit-down interview with Senator Kamala Harris coming up on the Today Show. Another Confederate statue has been toppled, this time in Lake Charles, Louisiana. The South's Defenders Memorial Monument survived the summer protest but could not stand up to Hurricane Laura. Just two weeks ago, officials voted to keep the statue on the courthouse lawn after a lot of debate. It has been damaged in other storms before, and restored, but critics hope that that will not be the case this time. So we see the damage there. Let's talk about now Laura's aftermath and where it's headed. Here's NBC meteorologist Janessa Webb. Janessa, good morning. Hey, good morning. Good morning, everyone. We now have tropical depression, Laura. It has been downgraded. I do think we'll see our last advisory from the National Hurricane Center this afternoon. But still, it's causing a lot of rain for central Arkansas as it makes its way through the Mississippi Valley. We're still going to watch the leftovers of the storm system across the Ohio Valley for your Saturday morning before it starts to really push into more of the northeast. It is going to be a soggy one from Charlotte all the way into to Boston. That's a look at the big weather story of the day. Here's a closer look at your day ahead. Our temperatures across the deep south, we have heat alerts that are in place uh, across uh, Texas and even for the upper Midwest. We're going to watch the severe weather threat Orlando today. Cloudy skies all the way into Charleston. We'll look at that all important weekend forecast coming up. All right. Great job with all the hurricane coverage this week, Janessa. Our two people are lucky to be alive after their small plane crashed and flipped upside down in the Florida Ever Everglades. It happened in an isolated area of Broward County, so rescuers needed to pick them up in airboats. The pair suffered minor injuries, and the FAA and the National Transportation Safety Board are investigating that crash. Breaking news overnight, Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe is stepping down. Japan's national broadcaster NHK reported that the Prime Minister intends to resign. The news caused stocks to briefly fall in Japan. Abe says that he plans to step down to deal with health issues. He has made some recent visits to the hospital. The Prime Minister confirmed the reports just moments ago during a press conference. A major reversal from the CDC. The agency is now walking back a recommendation from earlier this week that said people with no virus 
virus symptoms do not necessarily need a test. The previous recommendation said all close contacts of infected individuals should be tested regardless of symptoms. The CDC's director now says that all close contacts of confirmed or probable COVID-19 patients may consider testing. The change comes after the decision sparked backlash from medical experts. A new study from UCLA revealed a disturbing trend about the toll of COVID-19. It shows there was a five-fold increase in coronavirus deaths among working-age Latinos in California over the last three months. One researcher said the victims are unsung essential workers like farmers and truck drivers. The coronavirus has killed more than 12,000 people in California, and nearly half of them are Latino. Today, tens of thousands of people are expected to descend on the National Mall to protest police brutality in a march organized by the Reverend Al Sharpton's National Action Network and the NAACP. It comes on the 57th anniversary of the March on Washington, where hundreds of thousands gathered to demand civil and economic rights for African Americans. The march culminated with Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. delivering his historic I Have a Dream speech on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial. Lord & Taylor is officially going out of business. The luxury department retailer announced that it is closing all of its 38 stores, ending a nearly 200-year run. The announcement comes weeks after the company filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy protection. Our interactive state-by-state -state plan year vote guide has everything you need to know about casting a ballot in the 2020 presidential election. See where your state stands on voting rules and read up on deadlines, restrictions, and more. Visit NBCNews.com slash plan your vote to learn more. A new song is playing throughout San Francisco this summer. The mysterious sound seeping through the fog is leaving some Bay Area residents confused. To some, it sounds like a hum. And for others, a whistle. NBC's Jake Ward may have solved the mystery. Since early June, a ghostly sound has drifted across San Francisco. And social media lit up with a range of reactions, calling it soothing, unsettling, even alien. But it's not supernatural. It's the city's most iconic landmark, the Golden Gate Bridge. The big factor in designing a bridge is, of course, wind. This, the Golden Gate, is a big cut in the landscape that acts as a wind tunnel. That means that the whole design of the bridge turns into one big sail when the wind is strong enough. And these, the original 1937 struts of the railing, catch the wind. It's the new, thinner version of those struts that are creating that noise. When you ask engineers why wind matters on a bridge, well, they always name the same one, the Tacoma Narrows Bridge. The bridge whips about like some fluttering ribbon. It was nicknamed Gallop and Gertie for its tendency to move in the wind. And in 1940, against gusts of just 40 miles an hour, it began to twist, then the concrete buckled, and it collapsed. It literally shook itself to pieces. The consensus was that the solid side railings were responsible. Engineers everywhere are haunted by it. This wind retrofit project is to ensure that that type of effect or, or phenomenon doesn't happen here at the Golden Gate Bridge. The important thing is that scale model tests of earthquakes and high winds showed the bridge will be stronger than ever. But those tests didn't reveal the eerie sound it would make. Engineers here are working on a plan to quiet the hum. But in the meantime, the bridge harmonics are a reminder of the high stakes and complicated work of building and maintaining a roadway high above the waves. Jake Ward, NBC News, San Francisco. Wow, it's fascinating. At least after all this time, we know now the cause of it is originally just to make everybody safer. Yeah, hey, it's some creepy wind chimes, but better than that yeah, Tacoma right? Bridge. Yeah, Tell exactly. That. That's right even now. freaky to watch after Eesh. all this time. Good morning, everyone. It's all about the weekend now, and it's going to be kind of a soggy one for the East Coast. That's the leftovers of that tropical system, Laura. Nice and sunny across the Great Lakes. But if you're across the East Coast, Sunday is going to be the day where it'll start to dry out, and temperature is very comfortable. The heat and humidity, it starts to die down. Really want, to, want everyone to enjoy the weekend, because when I see you on Monday, let's talk about the tropics. Once again, we have two systems that have potential development 
late next week. Francis yeah, let's talk about some whiplash after that. Make sure we'll enjoy the weekend then. Janessa, wow. thank you. The Gulf Coast is now assessing the damage after a direct hit from Hurricane Laura. Lake Charles, Louisiana was in the path of the eye of the storm as it made landfall. The city likely has a long road to recovery ahead of it. NBC's Jay Gray is on the ground there. And Jay, tell us more about the aftermath that you see there. Well, you know, Francis, it's overwhelming. It seems everywhere you turn, there's devastation and debris. This twisted, sheared metal, part of what used to be a gas station here. You can see the pumps still there. But this one is gone, ripped away and tossed away by the storm, evidence of the sheer power of Laura. At first glance, it has the appearance of a child's messy playroom. Cars and trucks scattered on their sides. But a closer look and it's clear, this mess is no game. There's so much damage here, you, you're going, this is, this is a disaster area. You know, I mean, it's a literal disaster. From Cameron, where the massive storm came ashore through Lake Charles, the devastation from Laura stretches for miles. This was the most powerful storm to ever make landfall in Louisiana. A Category 4 hurricane with sustained winds of 150 miles an hour. Ripping apart homes and businesses, literally pulling trees from the ground, snapping power poles, scattering and twisting lines, most of the area still without electricity. Communities, and we now know families, cut to their core. At least six people killed in the storm, and officials fear that number could grow. Certainly I'm concerned that as we continue to go out and do primary and secondary search and rescue, we're going to find more fatalities. I, I hope not. Survivors now working to piece together what Laura left behind, the hurricane, tearing away most everything here except... We will rebuild. We always do. Their resolve. Yeah, and look, it's the strength this community is definitely going to need. Uh, Francis and Philip, this is going to be a long, a very difficult recovery here. Back sure, to you. Sure, tough days ahead for them. Jay, thank you. All right, there, uh, there's a lot. It's full of musician memorabilia and is all going up for auction soon and all for a good cause. Items range here from a pair of Ozzy Osbourne's glasses. How cool is that? A jacket worn by Cher uh, to a signed Billie Eilish ukulele. Uh, even a tracksuit worn by Sir Elton John. Uh, not just music items either. Her John Stamos's leather jacket yeah. from Full House. <laughs> that cool. Uncle, Uncle Jesse. Yeah, exactly. It all goes uh, to benefit Music Care's COVID-19 Relief Fund. Uh, the bidding, I understand, has already begun, and the actual auction closes on September 9th. I love it. Great. Good stuff out there. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays, starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. Among the chaos, that I found a father trying to teach his son about peace. We don't have to retaliate with anger. We retaliate with love. That's why we're down here. There's always another way. So that's all I want him to see. This is a situation where the state continues to struggle to expand its testing capabilities. Protesters feel that they need to come out in full force and support their community because they feel like they're not getting that support from the Portland police. Another election day coming up against the backdrop of how to keep voters safe amid a pandemic. The moment to truly understand who we are and who we say we are is right here at our feet. You gotta get a four-year degree, but a four-year degree is super expensive. We have created a system where the ticket to the middle class is a thing that middle class families have to stress about and borrow for and patch together. Why is this happening? With Chris Hayes, subscribe now. Today's headlines can be hard to understand, and a lot of kids have questions, so we started a newscast for them. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. But we actually saw a large convoy of the National Guard come through here. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays, starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. 
This morning across the country, what the new normal for schools will look like. Many teachers left making tough choices between the job they love and their family. What am I going to decide? Take care of my children or have a job? That's an impossible decision. You're creating a little community school. This is a moment we can just develop ourselves and develop our community. Let's turn it over to students. How do they really feel about returning to school? What I miss is my teachers. They are resilient. A surge in coronavirus infection. New developments on several fronts. The story. Tonight, the U.S. shattering the record for most COVID cases in a single day. From every angle. What's your level of concern that the kids who have been told they're going to be home indefinitely won't be able to catch up? On the ground. Do you have faith that this is going to bring about change soon? And in depth. Here in Portland, more protests expected tonight. Do you think that police in this country are under attack? NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. The news business is dynamic and probably has never been more important. With all that we're facing, I am so proud to bring the perspective of a black woman, a daughter of immigrants, the wife and mother of a husband and kids who sadly are more vulnerable to police violence because of their color, a proud nerd, and a representative of the emerging America to cable TV news. I hope the great Gwen Ifill and my mom, Philomena Carol Amina, will look down from heaven and be proud. I'm thinking the apartment building is gonna fall on top of us because you can hear stuff knocking against the, the brick. Hurricane Laura unleashes devastation on multiple states, taking at least six lives in the process. We've got the latest. A big night for Republicans who used the White House for the final night of their convention. As President Trump accepted his party's nomination for a second term amid fanfare and big protests outside the grounds. Protests in the wake of the Jacob Blake shooting, including an interview with a 17-year-old accused of killing two, and the next steps for the NBA and professional athletes whose professional pause kept a nation. And we'll meet the woman who has survived two pandemics as she shares her secret to a happy life on this final Friday of August. Early today starts right now. Thanks for ending your week with us. I'm Francis Rivera. And I'm Philip Mena. Hurricane Laura delivered a shattering and deadly blow to the Gulf Coast, leaving a trail of chaos. At least six people died from the storm. A riverboat casino got wedged under a bridge and plumes of smoke blanketed the air after an oil refinery went up in flames. People living within a one-mile radius of Westlake were told to shelter in place because of the release of chlorine gas. And this is what Lake Charles, Louisiana looks like. Boats were tossed around, roofs peeled off their homes. President Trump is set to visit that storm-ravaged area this weekend. Our Chris Pallone has the latest. In southwest Louisiana, it was a day of taking stock and cleaning up. There's so much damage here. You're going, this is, this is a disaster area. You know, I mean, it's a literal disaster. I mean, the recovery time for this is going to be phenomenal. Hurricane Laura struck the area just after midnight, the most powerful storm ever to make landfall here. Packing 150 mile per hour winds and heavy rain, the storm destroyed buildings, toppled trucks, and brought trees and power lines down. Lake Charles, one of the hardest hit cities. I'm thinking the apartment building is going to fall on top of us because you can hear stuff knocking against the, the brick. A chlorine gas leak at a plant near Lake Charles caused a major fire. The smoke could be seen for miles, and nearby residents were told not to go outside. And yet, despite all of it, the governors of Louisiana and Texas are counting their blessings. We're thankful we didn't get more storm surge than we did. A terrifying night, which will be followed by weeks, maybe months, of cleanup and construction. Chris Pallone, NBC News, Lafayette, Louisiana. More than 500,000 people were ordered to evacuate ahead of the storm. A number chose to remain and endure the dangerous night in their homes and others with concerns about coronavirus and shelters. Sam Brock spoke with those who rode out the storm. Francis, good morning. Ahead of a Category 4 hurricane, hundreds of thousands of mandatory evacuations in Texas and Louisiana. But not everybody heeded the call, although many lived to tell about it. We find out why they decided to stay behind. Families across Texas uprooted by a Category 4 hurricane after opting to ride out the storm. Why'd you stay home? Because we had trouble getting back in here whenever Hurricane Rita come through. And I swore I'd never leave again after that. The cracked trees and splintered roofs. Last night I heard a crash and of course this oak tree is in the middle of the house. Destroying homes but not shaking foundations. 
And we've done it a few too many times in the last 20 years. But anyway, we will rebuild. We always do. They battened down their property as in past storms, but this one bore a new threat, coronavirus. Being in a large shelter or a large building with a lot of people, um, it, it was a huge factor in my thinking of evacuating. Arata Young also says he couldn't afford to evacuate. The five-year Marine Corps veteran has tied up his life savings in a yoga and jujitsu gym. He just opened last week along with his fellow veteran partner, Tyler Pete. The pair weren't sure what they'd find. How relieved were you when you walked up here and saw that your gym is still intact? It was insane. Yeah, it was, I walked in and it was literally like someone had taken a 45-pound plate off of my shoulders. I'm extremely relieved. Um, I could probably kiss him. <laughs> a ray of hope shining through a frightening storm. As you can see, not every homeowner in Laura's path was so fortunate. Many now forced to begin the rebuilding process under a cloud of COVID-19 and economic uncertainty. Francis, back to you. Hoping for the best for him. Sam, thank you. President Trump delivered his case for a second term right from the steps of the White House. On the final night of the Republican National Convention, the president painted a dire portrait of a country that would plunge into chaos if Joe Biden wins the election. Throughout his speech, protesters made their voices heard, chants and music echoing faintly in the distance. No peace, no justice, no peace, no justice, no peace. NBC's Alice Barr has more on the fireworks of the night. A grand finale for the Republican National Convention. President Trump laying it all on the line in his bid for a second term in office. I profoundly accept this nomination for President of the United States. Drawing a sharp contrast between his vision for America and Joe Biden's. Joe Biden is not a savior of America's soul. He is the destroyer of America's jobs. And if given the chance, he will be the destroyer of American greatness. The president formally accepting his party's renomination against the unprecedented backdrop of the White House and at a time of crisis, offering support to those in the punishing path of Hurricane Laura. And as racial justice protests rekindle after the police shooting of Jacob Blake in Wisconsin, the president forcefully underscoring his law and order message. No one will be safe in Biden's America. My administration will always stand with the men and women of law enforcement. On the coronavirus pandemic, downplaying the devastating death toll and touting his administration's response. We will have a safe and effective vaccine this year, and together we will crush the virus. President Trump appealing to his base with promises to protect conservative values. If the left gains power, they will demolish the suburbs, confiscate your guns, and appoint justices who will wipe away your Second Amendment and other constitutional freedoms. Trailing in the polls, the president and his party making a primetime sales pitch for a second term. In Washington, Alice Barr, NBC News. Well, that dark tone served as a through line at the GOP's convention, despite the initial promise of a positive message. Make no mistake, no matter where you live, your family will not be safe in the radical Democrats' America. Crime, violence, and mob rule. Crime ravaging our streets. That is what America would see if it allowed Biden-Harris to run this country. Trump was elected to protect our families from the vengeful mob. They want to abolish the suburbs altogether. Nightmares are becoming real. Cops killed, children shot. Drug addicts, guns on the street. The mob will try to destroy you. They want to enslave you to the weak, dependent, liberal, victim ideology. Burn down the foundations of our country to the ground. Spawns of Satan. You will not recognize this country or yourself. The American way of life is being dismantled. Anarchy and chaos on our streets. This election is shaping up to be church, work, and school versus rioting, looting, and vandalism. The police aren't coming when you call. They want to steal your liberty, your freedom. They'll disarm you, empty the prisons, lock you in your home. They want to control what you see and think and believe so that they can control how you live. It's a horror film, really. It's madness. 
It remains to be seen how the tone resonates with voters, but we know ratings for the RNC have taken a hit. Wednesday drew in about 15.7 million viewers. Last week's DNC brought in just under 21.5 million on its third night. And after the onslaught of attacks on Joe Biden during the RNC. Well, the Democratic nominee, I guess, is, is, she's firing, is firing back this morning. He also, uh, he responded to calls to not even bother debating the president. And he spoke one-on-one -on -one with our Andrea Mitchell. After Republicans blamed him all week for violence, including in Kenosha, Joe Biden and Kamala Harris fighting back, Biden responding to Vice President Mike Pence saying, you won't be safe in Joe Biden's America. The problem we have right now is we're in Donald Trump's America. They're looking for more violence and more disruption because it helps them politically. He views this as a political benefit to him. You know, he's rooting uh, for more violence, not less. And it's clear about that. And what's he doing? He's kept pouring gasoline on the fire. This happens to be Donald Trump's America. You think the president of the United States is rooting for the violence because he thinks it helps him politically? I think he views it as a political benefit. And by the way, I condemn violence in any form, whether it's looting or whatever it is. So who's who's rooting for the violence here? Biden also said the biggest safety issue is people dying from COVID and what he called pressure on the scientists on testing and therapies, possibly on vaccines. Did you ever see any administration put so much pressure on the FDA? There's no bounds to what this guy does and his team does. We should listen to the scientists. How concerned are you that they're going to rush something out even before Election Day? And I, I pray to God that would happen tomorrow. That'd be wonderful. But the fact is, let's assume we finally do get a vaccine, that it works. And how much credibility are we going to have telling people to take it after going through all this stuff that they've misrepresented so far? Kamala Harris also punching back with Craig Melvin for The Today Show. And the American people, regardless of race, or gender, or age, or geographic location, have a right to believe that their leaders will speak truth, even when these are difficult truths. After Nancy Pelosi joked that Biden should not debate the president because she said the president doesn't tell the truth, Biden told me he will be at the debates, but will have to fact check the president while debating. Francis. All right, Andrea, thank you. Uh, NBC meteorologist Janessa Webb joining us now with the latest on what remains of Laura. Janessa, good morning. Hey, good morning, Francis and Philip. We're continuing to watch the storm system now downgraded to a tropical depression. But what you're going to see throughout the weekend is going to be a rainmaker. Right now, we've already seen about five inches of rain across central Arkansas. And as the system continues to split apart, it's definitely losing its wind force, but the rain is going to continue all the way into the Mississippi and upper uh, Mississippi Valley. Even for Ohio, we're going to watch that for Saturday afternoon in then it heads towards the northeast late day for your Saturday. That's a look at the big weather story of the day. Here's a closer look at your day ahead. Our temperatures across Wichita this afternoon, 97 degrees. We're also watching the threat of some severe storms sparking up a few tornadoes possible. New Orleans, more rain, lower 90s, Raleigh, 93. We'll take a look at that all-important weekend forecast coming up, guys. All right. Can't wait to hear it, Janessa. Thank you. So, so this morning you're grabbing your coffee and then your donuts. Some exciting news for the donut lovers here. Krispy Kreme is back with their popular chocolate glazed donuts for one day only. Today, the classic original glazed donut is covered in a rich chocolate glaze. It's being offered at locations across the U.S. It's normally a short-lived appearance on their menu, so make sure you actually get out there and grab it before they run out. Yeah, I do not think I've ever had a chocolate glaze. No, not from right? there. Leading the news, a wrongly imprisoned black man has been freed from a North Carolina prison after serving 44 years. 64-year-old Ronnie Long was released on Thursday after the state of North Carolina filed a motion in federal court to vacate his 1976 conviction by an all-white jury. Long had been sentenced to life in prison for first-degree rape and first-degree burglary, something he says he didn't commit. The federal appeals court says they also found a pattern of police suppression of material evidence in the case. I just appreciate the people that come out and supported me. And I wanted you to know, you understand, saying, look, if they will never, ever, never, ever, ever lock me up again. That's right. They'll never lock me up again. Yeah. All right, Ronnie says he's excited for his first meal out of prison. It'll be mac and cheese, beef ribs, a salad, and some lemonade. 
Additional charges have been filed after two people were killed during protests in Wisconsin. According to court documents, 17-year-old Kyle Rittenhouse faces two first-degree homicide charges as well as two charges of attempted homicide. On the streets of Kenosha, the community continues to call out for change after the police shooting of Jacob Blake. Here's NBC's Wendy Wolfolk. The Kenosha community is grieving as a result of this tragic shooting. A grieving community, but a fourth night of protests over the police shooting of Jacob Blake. Peaceful. The voice of those people is not falling upon deaf ears. We are hearing what is being said. And new calls for swift action. Bring upon the state attorney in this state, attorney general, to move and move quickly. We must know that justice works for the people. Wisconsin's attorney general identified the officer who shot Blake seven times in the back as Rustin Chesky. He's been with the Kenosha Police Department for seven years. But also announcing that investigators found a knife in the driver's side floorboard of Blake's car. Before the shooting, according to investigators, Shesky and two other officers were responding to a domestic incident and unsuccessfully tried to taser and arrest Blake. Oh. Meanwhile, 17-year-old Kyle Rittenhouse is charged with intentional homicide after two people were shot and killed during protests Tuesday night. There are Orlando Magic players heading back into the locker room. And unprecedented aftermath in the sports world. After the NBA abruptly canceled games this week and some Major League Baseball and soccer teams followed suit. They're using that voice to be heard and now they're using their lack of playing to be heard even louder. Professional athletes using their actions to call for change. Wendy Woolfolk, NBC News. London Zoo began its annual weigh-in to find out how the longest closure in the zoo's history since World War II has affected their animals. Staff noticed that some of the species have been sad because there were no visitors due to the pandemic. The test will confirm if over 19,000 animals have been physically changed by the toll of the lockdown. I know we have. Right? I've been sad with no Across visitors. Across the board. <laughs> you know? I wonder what that first animal was, though. It had some, it had like zebra legs. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I don't know. Fascinating. Yeah. All right. Panda fans, here is your first look at the National Zoo's new baby panda. Mei Shang left the cub alone to get some water, giving us a close-up look. You can see the cub there crying, tossing, and turning. Aww. Yeah, the baby is Mei Shang's fourth successful birth. Oh, well, mama's letting that cub <laughs> cry it out. You yeah. have to tend to it right away. Yeah, self-soothing. Right. Yeah, <laughs> after spending over 500 days in a shelter, a three-year-old dog named Joey has finally found a loving home. When Joey's new owners came to take him home, the shelter's staff lined up to drape lays around the pooch's neck. Joey responded with goodbye kisses. The staff said it was the day they have all been waiting for. So hopefully at the end of the week, all these cute puppy animals and, and nice. Like Cuties great. make you smile. Yep, great story for a Friday. Good morning, everyone. This is the last weekend of August. It's going to be kind of sloppy for most of the East Coast. Drenching rain due to that tropical uh, depression right now. Nice and sunny, though, for the Great Lakes and the heat. It's going to continue to build for the Pacific Northwest. Sunday, it's the day for the Northeast. Get out there and enjoy it. 89 across portions of the Mid-Atlantic. We'll be right back. They move today, 200,000 strong, down a broad and tree-shaded avenue in Washington, D.C., softly singing and chanting the hymns born of their movement and those that have gone before. There were no ranks, but they were orderly. They moved with dignity, but there was no sternness. Their placards demanded the uprooting of every vestige of discrimination and said it must be done now, but they showed no anger. Regardless of all else, for most, these will be the lasting impressions of the March on Washington for jobs and freedom. On this day in 1963, hundreds of thousands of protesters gathered in Washington, D.C. to demand civil and economic rights for African Americans. The march culminated with Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. delivering his historic I Have a Dream speech on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial. And today, tens of thousands are expected to gather in that same spot to protest police brutality in a march organized by the Reverend Al Sharpton's National Action Network and the NAACP. Now to a birthday party for a woman born in 1918. Aunt Bob's has lived through two pandemics and is full of advice. Here's NBC's Harry Smith. 
If it looks like Babs Miss Rucky knows how to wear a crown, it doesn't surprise her family. To them, she is royalty. We love her to death. Babs turned 102 this week. I hope I look that good when I'm 75. And still holding court. Happy Yay! birthday! She has more stories than anybody you ever seen in your life. Some are not true, some are true. Some get exaggerated, but boy, is she a lot of fun to listen to those stories. A child of immigrants born into a pandemic, through years thick and thin, a witness to history, and an optimist. I had a confidence that the country will be fine. Everything will be good, because I was told that it would be. My father told me, my mother told me, my president told me. That was FDR for the record. In the game of life, making it to 100 requires luck, love, and most likely, a twinkle in your eye. Get a Coke and chips, have fun. Have fun and enjoy. And it, it's, it's a good life. It's worth suffering for and living for. Life is good. And that part, we do believe. Harry Smith, NBC News. Wow, whatever her secret is, she better bottle that because it is working for yeah. 102 years. 102 years old, happy birthday to Bab. She does look great. Wow, if we can only, like they said it best, if we can only look like that 70 or 80, we'll Th take it. There you go. Have fun, enjoy. That's what's up. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays, starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. Among the chaos, I found a father trying to teach his son about peace. We don't have to retaliate with anger. We retaliate with love. That's why we're down here. There's always another way. So that's all I want him to see. This is a situation where the state continues to struggle to expand its testing capabilities. Protesters feel that they need to come out in full force and support their community because they feel like they're not getting that support from the Portland police. Another election day coming up against the backdrop of how to keep voters safe amid a pandemic. The moment to truly understand who we are and who we say we are is right here at our feet. You gotta get a four-year degree, but a four-year degree is super expensive. We have created a system where the ticket to the middle class is a thing that middle-class families have to stress about and borrow for and patch together. Why is this happening? With Chris Hayes, subscribe now. Today's headlines can be hard to understand, and a lot of kids have questions, so we started a newscast for them. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. But we actually saw a large convoy of the National Guard come through here. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. This morning across the country, what the new normal for schools will look like. Many teachers left making tough choices between the job they love and their family. What am I going to decide? Take care of my children or have a job? That's an impossible decision. You're creating a little community school. This is a moment we could just develop ourselves and develop our community. Let's turn it over to students. How do they really feel about returning to school? What I miss is my teachers. They are resilient. A surge in coronavirus infection. New developments on several fronts. The story. Tonight, the U.S. shattering the record for most COVID cases in a single day. From every angle. What's your level of concern that the kids who have been told they're going to be home indefinitely won't be able to catch up? On the ground. Do you have faith that this is going to bring about change soon? And in death. Here in Portland, more protests expected tonight. Do you think that police in this country are under attack? NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. The news business is dynamic and probably has never been more important. With all that we're facing, I am so proud to bring the perspective of a black woman, a daughter of immigrants, the wife and mother of a husband and kids who sadly are more vulnerable to police violence because of their color, a proud nerd, and a representative of the emerging America to cable TV news. I hope the great Gwen Ifill and my mom, Philomena Carol Lamina, will look down from heaven and be proud. 
thinking the apartment building is gonna fall on top of us because you can hear stuff knocking against the, the brick. Hurricane Laura unleashes devastation on multiple states, taking at least six lives in the process. We've got the latest. A big night for Republicans who used the White House for the final night of their convention. As President Trump accepted his party's nomination for a second term amid fanfare and big protests outside the grounds. Protests in the wake of the Jacob Blake shooting, including an interview with a 17-year-old accused of killing two, and the next steps for the NBA and professional athletes whose professional paws captured a nation. And we'll meet the woman who has survived two pandemics as she shares her secret to a happy life on this final Friday of August. Early today starts right now. Thanks for ending your week with us. I'm Francis Rivera. And I'm Philip Mena. Hurricane Laura delivered a shattering and deadly blow to the Gulf Coast, leaving a trail of chaos. At least six people died from the storm. A riverboat casino got wedged under a bridge and plumes of smoke blanketed the air after an oil refinery went up in flames. People living within a one mile radius of Westlake were told to shelter in place because of the release of chlorine gas. And this is what Lake Charles, Louisiana looks like. Boats were tossed around, roofs peeled off their homes. President Trump is set to visit that storm-ravaged area this weekend. Our Chris Pallone has the latest. In southwest Louisiana, it was a day of taking stock and cleaning up. There's so much damage here. You, you're going, this is, this is a disaster area. You know, I mean, it's a literal disaster. I mean, the recovery time for this is going to be phenomenal. Hurricane Laura struck the area just after midnight, the most powerful storm ever to make landfall here. Packing 150 mile per hour winds and heavy rain, the storm destroyed buildings, toppled trucks and brought trees and power lines down. Lake Charles, one of the hardest hit cities. I'm thinking the apartment building is going to fall on top of us because you can hear stuff knocking against the, the brick. A chlorine gas leak at a plant near Lake Charles caused a major fire. The smoke could be seen for miles, and nearby residents were told not to go outside. And yet, despite all of it, the governors of Louisiana and Texas are counting their blessings. We're thankful we didn't get more storm surge than we did. A terrifying night, which will be followed by weeks, maybe months, of cleanup and construction. Chris Pallone, NBC News, Lafayette, Louisiana. More than 500,000 people were ordered to evacuate ahead of the storm. A number chose to remain and endure the dangerous night in their homes and others with concerns about coronavirus and shelters. Sam Brock spoke with those who rode out the storm. Francis, good morning. Ahead of a Category 4 hurricane, hundreds of thousands of mandatory evacuations in Texas and Louisiana. But not everybody heeded the call, although many lived to tell about it. We find out why they decided to stay behind. Families across Texas uprooted by a Category 4 hurricane after opting to ride out the storm. Why'd you stay home? Because we had trouble getting back in here whenever Hurricane Rita come through. And I swore I'd never leave again after that. The cracked trees and splintered roofs. Last night I heard a crash and of course this oak tree is in the middle of the house. Destroying homes but not shaking foundations. We've done it a few too many times in the last 20 years. But Anyway, we will rebuild. We always do. They battened down their property as in past storms, but this one bore a new threat, coronavirus. Being in a large shelter or a large building with a lot of people, um, it, it was a huge factor in my thinking of evacuating. Arata Young also says he couldn't afford to evacuate. The five-year Marine Corps veteran has tied up his life savings in a yoga and jujitsu gym. He just opened last week, along with his fellow veteran partner, Tyler Pete. The pair weren't sure what they'd find. How relieved were you when you walked up here and saw that your gym is still intact? It was insane. Yeah, it was, I walked in and it was literally like someone had taken a 45 pound plate off of my shoulders. I'm extremely relieved. Um, I could probably kiss him. <laughs> a ray of hope shining through a frightening storm. As you can see, not every homeowner in Laura's path was so fortunate. Many now forced to begin the rebuilding process under a cloud of COVID-19 and economic uncertainty. Francis, back to you. Hoping for the best for him. Sam, thank you. President Trump delivered his case for a second term right from the steps of the White House. On the final night of the Republican National Convention, the president painted a dire portrait of a country that would plunge into chaos if Joe Biden wins the election. Throughout his speech, protesters made their voices heard, chants and music echoing faintly in the distance. No peace! No justice! No peace! No 
justice, no peace. NBC's Alice Barr has more on the fireworks of the night. A grand finale for the Republican National Convention. President Trump laying it all on the line in his bid for a second term in office. I profoundly accept this nomination for President of the United States. Drawing a sharp contrast between his vision for America and Joe Biden's. Joe Biden is not a savior of America's soul. He is the destroyer of America's jobs. And if given the chance, he will be the destroyer of American greatness. The president formally accepting his party's renomination against the unprecedented backdrop of the White House and at a time of crisis, offering support to those in the punishing path of Hurricane Laura. And as racial justice protests rekindle after the police shooting of Jacob Blake in Wisconsin, the president forcefully underscoring his law and order message. No one will be safe in Biden's America. My administration will always stand with the men and women of law enforcement. On the coronavirus pandemic, downplaying the devastating death toll and touting his administration's response. We will have a safe and effective vaccine this year, and together we will crush the virus. President Trump appealing to his base with promises to protect conservative values. If the left gains power, they will demolish the suburbs, confiscate your guns, and appoint justices who will wipe away your Second Amendment and other constitutional freedoms. Trailing in the polls, the president and his party making a primetime sales pitch for a second term. In Washington, Alice Barr, NBC News. Well, that dark tone served as a through line at the GOP's convention, despite the initial promise of a positive message. Make no mistake, no matter where you live, your family will not be safe in the radical Democrats' America. Crime, violence, and mob rule. Crime ravaging our streets. That is what America would see if it allowed Biden-Harris to run this country. Trump was elected to protect our families from the vengeful mob. They want to abolish the suburbs altogether. Nightmares are becoming real. Cops killed, children shot. Drug addicts, guns on the street. The mob will try to destroy you. They want to enslave you to the weak, dependent, liberal, victim ideology. Burn down the foundations of our country to the ground. Spawns of Satan. You will not recognize this country or yourself. The American way of life is being dismantled. Anarchy and chaos on our streets. This election is shaping up to be church, work, and school versus rioting, looting, and vandalism. The police aren't coming when you call. They want to steal your liberty, your freedom. They'll disarm you, empty the prisons, lock you in your home. They want to control what you see and think and believe so that they can control how you live. It's a horror film, really. It's madness. It remains to be seen how the tone resonates with voters, but we know ratings for the RNC have taken a hit. Wednesday drew in about 15.7 million viewers. Last week's DNC brought in just under 21.5 million on its third night. And after the onslaught of attacks on Joe Biden during the RNC. Well, the Democratic nominee, I guess, is, she's firing, is firing back this morning. He also, uh, he responded to calls to not even bother debating the president. He spoke one-on-one -on -one with our Andrea Mitchell. After Republicans blamed him all week for violence, including in Kenosha, Joe Biden and Kamala Harris fighting back. Biden responding to Vice President Mike Pence saying, you won't be safe in Joe Biden's America. The problem we have right now is we're in Donald Trump's America. They're looking for more violence and more disruption because it helps them politically. He views this as a political benefit to him. You know, he's rooting uh, for more violence, not less. And it's clear about that. And what's he doing? He's kept pouring gasoline on the fire. This happens to be Donald Trump's America. You think the president of the United States is rooting for the violence because he thinks it helps him politically? I think he views it as a political benefit. And by the way, I condemn violence in any form, whether it's looting or whatever it is. So who's, who's rooting for the violence here? Biden also said the biggest safety issue is people dying from COVID and what he called pressure on the scientists on testing and therapies, possibly on vaccines. Did you ever see any administration put so much pressure on the FDA? There's no bounds to what this guy does and his team does. 
We should listen to the scientists. How concerned are you that they're going to rush something out even before Election Day? And I, I pray to God that would happen tomorrow. That'd be wonderful. But the fact is, let's assume we finally do get a vaccine that it works. And how much credibility are we going to have telling people to take it after going through all this stuff that they've misrepresented so far? Kamala Harris also punching back with Craig Melvin for the Today Show. And the American people, regardless of race, or gender, or age, or geographic location, have a right to believe that their leaders will speak truth, even when these are difficult truths. After Nancy Pelosi joked that Biden should not debate the president because she said the president doesn't tell the truth, Biden told me he will be at the debates, but will have to fact check the president while debating. Francis. All right, Andrea, thank you. Uh, NBC meteorologist Janessa Webb joining us now with the latest on what remains of Laura. Janessa, good morning. Hey, good morning, Francis and Philip. We're continuing to watch the storm system now downgraded to a tropical depression. But what you're going to see throughout the weekend is going to be a rainmaker. Right now, we've already seen about five inches of rain across central Arkansas. And as the system continues to split apart, it's definitely losing its wind force, but the rain is going to continue all the way into the Mississippi and upper uh, Mississippi Valley. Even for Ohio, we're going to watch that for Saturday afternoon in then it heads towards the northeast late day for your Saturday. That's a look at the big weather story of the day. Here's a closer look at your day ahead. Our temperatures across Wichita this afternoon, 97 degrees. We're also watching the threat of some severe storms sparking up a few tornadoes possible. New Orleans, more rain, lower 90s, Raleigh, 93. We'll take a look at that all-important weekend forecast coming up, guys. All right. Can't wait to hear it, Janessa. Thank you. So this morning you're grabbing your coffee and then your donuts. Some exciting news for the donut lovers here. Krispy Kreme is back with their popular chocolate glazed donuts for one day only. Today, the classic original glazed donut is covered in a rich chocolate glaze. It's being offered at locations across the U.S. It's normally a short-lived appearance on their menu, so make sure you actually get out there and grab it before they run out. Yeah. Leading the news, a wrongly imprisoned black man has been freed from a North Carolina prison after serving 44 years. 64-year-old Ronnie Long was released on Thursday after the state of North Carolina filed a motion in federal court to vacate his 1976 conviction by an all-white jury. Long had been sentenced to life in prison for first-degree rape and first-degree burglary, something he says he didn't commit. The federal appeals court says they also found a pattern of police suppression of material evidence in the case. I just appreciate the people that come out and supported me. And I wanted you to know, you understand, saying, look, that they will never, ever, never, ever, ever lock me up again. That's right. They'll never lock me up again. Yeah. All right, Ronnie says he's excited for his first meal out of prison. It'll be mac and cheese, beef ribs, a salad, and some lemonade. Additional charges have been filed after two people were killed during protests in Wisconsin. According to court documents, 17-year-old Kyle Rittenhouse faces two first-degree homicide charges as well as two charges of attempted homicide. On the streets of Kenosha, the community continues to call out for change after the police shooting of Jacob Blake. Here's NBC's Wendy Wolfolk. The Kenosha community is grieving as a result of this tragic shooting. A grieving community, but a fourth night of protests over the police shooting of Jacob Blake. Peaceful. The voice of those people is not falling upon deaf ears. We are hearing what is being said. And new calls for swift action. Bring upon the, the, the state's attorney in this state, attorney general, to move and move quickly. We must know that justice works for the people. Wisconsin's attorney general identified the officer who shot Blake seven times in the back as Rustin Shesky. He's been with the Kenosha Police Department for seven years but also announcing that investigators found a knife in the driver's side floorboard of Blake's car. Before the shooting, according to investigators, Shesky and two other officers were responding to a domestic incident and unsuccessfully tried to taser and arrest Blake. Oh. Meanwhile, 17-year-old Kyle Rittenhouse is charged with intentional homicide after two people were shot and killed during protests Tuesday night. There are Orlando Magic players heading back into the locker room. And unprecedented aftermath in the sports world. After the NBA abruptly canceled games this week, 
and some Major League Baseball and soccer teams followed suit. They're using that voice to be heard, and now they're using their lack of playing to be heard even louder. Professional athletes using their actions to call for change. Wendy Woolfolk, NBC News. London Zoo began its annual weigh-in to find out how the longest closure in the zoo's history since World War II has affected their animals. Staff noticed that some of the species have been sad because there were no visitors due to the pandemic. The test will confirm if over 19,000 animals have been physically changed by the toll of the lockdown. I know we have. Right? I've been sad with no Across visitors. Across the board. <laughs> you know? I wonder what that first animal was, though. It had some, it had like zebra legs. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I don't know. Fascinating. Yeah. All right. Panda fans, here is your first look at the National Zoo's new baby panda. Mei Shang left the cub alone to get some water, giving us a close-up look. You can see the cub there crying, tossing, and turning. Aww. Yeah, the baby is Mei Shang's fourth successful birth. Yeah, Mama's letting that cub <laughs> cry it out. You yeah. have to tend to it right away. Yeah, self-soothing. Right. Yeah, <laughs> after spending over 500 days in a shelter, a three-year-old dog named Joey has finally found a loving home. When Joey's new owners came to take him home, the shelter's staff lined up to drape lays around the pooch's neck. Joey responded with goodbye kisses. The staff said it was the day they have all been waiting for. So hopefully at the end of the week, all these cute puppy animals and, and nice like cuties great. make you smile. Yep, great story for a Friday. Good morning, everyone. This is the last weekend of August. It's going to be kind of sloppy for most of the East Coast, drenching rain due to that tropical uh, depression right now. Nice and sunny, though, for the Great Lakes and the heat. It's going to continue to build for the Pacific Northwest. Sunday, it's the day for the Northeast. Get out there and enjoy it. 89 across portions of the Mid-Atlantic. We'll be right back. They moved today, 200,000 strong, down a broad and tree-shaded avenue in Washington, D.C., softly singing and chanting the hymns born of their movement and those that have gone before. There were no ranks, but they were orderly. They moved with dignity, but there was no sternness. Their placards demanded the uprooting of every vestige of discrimination and said it must be done now, but they showed no anger. Regardless of all else, for most, these will be the lasting impressions of the March on Washington for jobs and freedom. On this day in 1963, hundreds of thousands of protesters gathered in Washington, D.C. to demand civil and economic rights for African Americans. The march culminated with Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. delivering his historic I Have a Dream speech on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial. And today, tens of thousands are expected to gather in that same spot to protest police brutality in a march organized by the Reverend Al Sharpton's National Action Network and the NAACP. Now to a birthday party for a woman born in 1918. Aunt Bob's has lived through two pandemics and is full of advice. Here's NBC's Harry Smith. If it looks like Babs Miss Rucky knows how to wear a crown, it doesn't surprise her family. To them, she is royalty. We love her to death. Babs turned 102 this week. I hope I look that good when I'm 75. And still holding court. Happy Yay! birthday! She has more stories than anybody you ever seen in your life. Some are not true, some are true, some get exaggerated, but boy, is she a lot of fun to listen to those stories. A child of immigrants born into a pandemic through years thick and thin, a witness to history and an optimist. I had a confidence that the country will be fine. Everything will be good because I was told that it would be. My father told me, my mother told me, my president told me. That was FDR for the record. In the game of life, making it to 100 requires luck, love, and most likely, a twinkle in your eye. Get a Coke and chips, have fun. Have fun and enjoy. And it, it's, it's a good life. It's worth suffering for and living for. Life is good. And that part, we do believe. Harry Smith, NBC News. Wow, whatever her secret is, she better bottle that because it is working for 102 years. 102 years old, happy birthday to Bab. She does look great. Wow, if we can only, like they said it best, if we can only look like that 70 or 80, we'll take it. There you go. Have fun, enjoy. That's what's up.
You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. Among the chaos that I found a father trying to teach his son about peace. We don't have to retaliate with anger. We retaliate with love. That's why we're down here. It's always another way. So that's all I want him to see. This is a situation where the state continues to struggle to expand its testing capabilities. Protesters feel that they need to come out in full force and support their community because they feel like they're not getting that support from the Portland police. Another election day coming up against the backdrop of how to keep voters safe amid a pandemic. The moment to truly understand who we are and who we say we are is right here at our feet. You gotta get a four-year degree, but a four-year degree is super expensive. We have created a system where the ticket to the middle class is a thing that middle class families have to stress about and borrow for and patch together. Why is this happening? With Chris Hayes, subscribe now. Today's headlines can be hard to understand, and a lot of kids have questions, so we started a newscast for them. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. But we actually saw a large convoy of the National Guard come through here. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. This morning across the country, what the new normal for schools will look like. Many teachers left making tough choices between the job they love and their family. What am I going to decide? Take care of my children or have a job? That's an impossible decision. You're creating a little community school. This is a moment we can just develop ourselves and develop our community. Let's turn it over to students. How do they really feel about returning to school? What I miss is my teachers. They are resilient. A surge in coronavirus infection. New developments on several fronts. The story. Tonight, the U.S. shattering the record for most COVID cases in a single day. From every angle. What's your level of concern that the kids who have been told they're going to be home indefinitely won't be able to catch up? On the ground. Do you have faith that this is going to bring about change soon? And in death. Here in Portland, more protests expected tonight. Do you think that police in this country are under attack? NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. The news business is dynamic and probably has never been more important. With all that we're facing, I am so proud to bring the perspective of a black woman, a daughter of immigrants, the wife and mother of a husband and kids who sadly are more vulnerable to police violence because of their color, a proud nerd, and a representative of the emerging America to cable TV news. I hope the great Gwen Ifill and my mom, Philomena Carol Lamina, will look down from heaven and be proud. President Trump diving into the general election campaign last night, the second longest convention speech in modern history, second only to the one he gave four years ago, that was somewhere in between a State of the Union and a campaign rally for the first time ever, the White House, the People's House, as the president himself called it, being used to host a political convention. One top Democrat last night tweeting, get off our lawn. The president at times inflating his own record and repeatedly laying into Joe Biden. With his family and a fireworks finale, President Trump basking in the glow of his Republican renomination. I profoundly accept this nomination for President of the United States. Most notable, the night's backdrop, the president transforming the White House into a partisan political prop. This is the most important election in the history of our country. Openly flouting longstanding norms and laws. The fact is we're here and they're not. Despite more than 3,000 Americans dying from coronavirus this week alone, hundreds of supporters crowded the South Lawn with no social distancing and few masks. To save as many lives as possible, we are focusing on the science, the facts, and the data. The president taking direct aim at his Democratic rival. Joe Biden. Joe Biden. Joe Biden. Attacking Joe Biden by name 41 times, even though Biden last week never mentioned him once in his acceptance speech. Joe Biden is not a savior of America's soul. He is the destroyer of America's jobs. President Trump at times sounding more like a challenger than the incumbent, vowing to restore law and order amid a new round of racial unrest. 
but never referencing Jacob Blake, the black man shot by police in Wisconsin. The Republican Party condemns the rioting, looting, arson, and violence we have seen in Democrat-run cities all, like Kenosha. But as a candidate four years ago, Mr. Trump promised this. The crime and violence that today afflicts our nation will soon, and I mean very soon, come to an end. Biden on Thursday looking to capitalize. He's rooting uh, for more violence, not less, and it's clear about that. And what's he doing? He's kept pouring gasoline on the fire. This happens to be Donald Trump's America. Introducing the president, his daughter and senior advisor, Ivanka Trump. Dad, people attack you for being unconventional, but I love you for being real, and I respect you for being effective. President Trump praising his performance while courting critical voters. And I say very modestly that I have done more for the African-American community than any president since Abraham Lincoln. And casting the Democrats as a threat to American greatness. How can the Democrat Party ask to lead our country when it spends so much time tearing down our country? As the president spoke last night, hundreds of protesters gathered along Black Lives Plaza, uh, Black Lives Matter Plaza, just a block from here, banging pots and pans, blowing horns, and they could be lightly heard on the South Lawn last night. Peter, let's talk more about the speech. One of the, the big promises having to do with the COVID vaccine. Yeah, no, that's exactly right. This really was one of the president's biggest promises on this yet, saying definitively there would be a COVID vaccine before the end of this year or maybe even sooner, in his words. But top health officials, of course, have cautioned that that timeline may be unrealistic, that it's more likely to be available for wide use next year. Dr. Anthony Fauci just this week warning against this idea of prematurely authorizing a vaccine for emergency use, arguing that that could damage efforts to develop other vaccines. The Trump administration has denied any efforts to rush out a vaccine for political purposes. Savannah. All right, Peter Alexander at the White House. Thank you, Peter. This morning, the devastation left behind by Hurricane Laura coming into sharper focus. The powerful storm crippling parts of southwest Louisiana. The damage stretching from the coast hundreds of miles inland. Say some prayers for us. There's an awful lot of people that are hurting right now. In the coastal towns Cameron and Holly Beach, fierce winds topping 150 miles an hour ripped apart homes and decimated neighborhoods. Oh! 30 miles inland, Laurel raked through Lake Charles, blowing out windows, knocking a train off its tracks, and shredding the historic downtown district. It looks like a bomb exploded all over the city. It looks like a bomb exploded. The dangerous winds lasted for hours, knocking out power to more than 600,000 people. Laura's deadly force toppling a tree onto one family's home, killing their daughter. One of at least six fatalities reported statewide. The storm also being blamed on a fire at a chemical plant, spewing toxic fumes into the air. Despite widespread destruction, Louisiana was spared the predicted catastrophic storm surge. We have sustained a tremendous amount of damage. We have thousands and thousands of our fellow citizens whose lives are upside down. Cajun Navy! Anybody here? The volunteer group, Cajun Navy Relief, accustomed to water rescues, instead leaving their boats behind and going door to door in search of people needing help. We can do debris clearing, we can do boat rescues, boat rescues, whatever is needed in the community. Seeing somebody's face when you help them is so rewarding. You know, it makes me glad to be able to do it. Other states also joining in the rescue and relief efforts. New Jersey, Mississippi and North Carolina sending teams ahead of the storm. The widespread damage is still being assessed. The massive cleanup now slowly starting as rescue efforts continue. Please understand that right now we continue to be in an immediate response mode, which is about life saving. And this is the scene so many people are still waking up to today. These trees proving to be a massive problem. The Louisiana National Guard going from community to community, trying to cut their way through roads to reach those people who need that help the most. Joining us now by phone is the mayor of Lake Charles, Nick Hunter. Mr. Mayor, good morning. It's 24 hours since we last spoke, and now you've been able to survey the damage. What is the state of Lake Charles this morning? Well, um, <laughs> the state of Lake Charles, good question. Uh, Lake Charles is a lot different than it was 48 hours ago. Um, it's, it's, uh, this, this event has really dealt us a pretty heavy blow.
You were out and about. Tell me about some of the scenes that you saw. We're, we're looking at the footage. It's, it's, it's hard to see, and I can't even imagine how you feel as the mayor of that community. Well, when I first uh, got out of the bunker after the um, storm, I expected to see some roof damage. I mean, I expected to see some, some flooding, some, some trees in the road. We saw that. We saw um, power lines. What I didn't expect to see was there were literal, literal entire buildings that had been blown apart. There were facades of brick buildings that had been around for 100 years that were blown down. Uh, I mean, I was really, I was really blown away by, uh, by the devastation of some of these buildings. It was pretty intense. We talked about search and rescue. Uh, do you feel there are people, as we speak this morning, who are still stranded or need help? Or do you feel like you have a handle on, on the need there in terms of, of people? I am actually going to be, um, uh, I'm going to be very optimistic right now and say that we are not seeing the, um, the, the people stranded in their homes or needing to get out of their homes at this point uh, like, like you would with some other storms because we didn't have the storm surge. We didn't have the the flooded waters, um, and I have really got to give a lot of kudos to our local law enforcement, our, our local public safety, the National Guard. I mean, there's been a heck of an effort, and people are, are working their tails off like a well-oiled machine, and I really do feel like a lot of people that wanted to get out of their homes did it, and, and so now it's just picking up the pieces. Yes, and th th these are tough days. I mean, the power is out, and then I understand the water plant was D d damaged, perhaps destroyed. So w what is the state of affairs there in terms of power and water and the things that people need? Yeah, this is a, a really important message right now because people who are outside of Lake Charles thinking about coming back, they need to be really um, a blunt with themselves about the harsh reality of what they're coming back to. Mm. They are coming back to a city without power and Entergy, our company has not said this, but I am willing to say it. It's going to be at least a week, perhaps weeks, before power will be in every part of Lake Charles. The city of Lake Charles, um, we administer our local water company. We have six water uh, plants on a good day. One was completely obliterated, I mean, just wiped off the map. Two are not working. Three are working a little uh, I, I'm telling people that when you turn on the faucet, it's a trickle, and I wish I had an EPA on when that was that was going to be fixed, mm -hmm. but we don't. And I'm sorry about that, but we just got hit with the the largest hurricane uh, to hit Louisiana in the last 150 years. So when someone says, "Well, when's the water pressure going to be on?" my answer is, unfortunately, guys, I don't know. We're trying to assess what happened to our plant. Wow. Mr. Mayor, I mean, you've got so much work in front of you. I'm sure your community appreciates the straight talk, even if the message is hard to hear. Thank you for your time this morning. We really appreciate it. Well, we will rebuild from this. This is something we can recover from. Uh, we will be watching and come see you. Thank you. National Guard troops from Arizona, Michigan, and Alabama are headed to Kenosha, Wisconsin. We are not federalized. Uh, we're on state active duty where amid a night of peaceful protests, authorities have been cracking down to avoid the violence earlier in the week. Get the out. Get out. Get out. This video shows Kenosha police and U.S. Marshals forcibly arresting people in a minivan, breaking its window. Authorities say they found helmets, gas masks, and illegal fireworks. We are, are doing our best to keep it a safe environment. There's still outrage over the lack of charges against the police officer who shot Jacob Blake seven times in the back. The protests making their way to pro sports where athletes are taking a stand and refusing to play. NBA players expected to be back on the court this weekend after Wednesday's boycott. In Major League Baseball, New York Mets and Miami Marlins players walking off the field on Thursday. The Mets and Marlins will not be playing baseball tonight. State investigators say Blake had a knife in his car. Wisconsin's attorney general, who's leading the investigation, says the officers had tried to taser and arrest Blake after responding to a domestic incident. The attorney for Blake's family argues that Kyle Rittenhouse, the white teenager now charged with the murder of two protesters, was seen in this video walking by police after the gunfire before being arrested hours later. They let him literally 
go home. So that tells you a black man who is making no threat to the police, walking away from them, is shot seven times in the back. A white man kills two people and walks by the police and is not shot and not killed. There are two justice systems in America. Overnight, Rittenhouse's attorney told NBC News this was classic self-defense, and we are going to prove it. We will obtain justice for Kyle, no matter how hard the fight or how long it takes. On the anniversary of Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech, later today, Jacob Blake's family plans to attend the 2020 March on Washington, calling for social justice and police reform. Craig. And Gabe Gutierrez for us there in Wisconsin. Gabe, thank you. As a former prosecutor and someone who worked closely with police for years, yeah. is there a scenario in which that officer would have been justified, was justified in firing his weapon? Craig, I don't, I don't see it, but I don't have all the evidence. You know, the man was, was going to a, his car. He didn't appear to be armed. And if he was not armed, the use of force that was seven bullets coming out of a gun at close range in the back of the man. I don't see how anybody could reason that that was justifiable. Do you think the officer should be charged? I think that there should be a, a thorough investigation and based on what I've seen, it, it seems that the officer should be charged. There are a lot of folks who are saying, here's a man who uh, wouldn't follow police commands law enforcement tried to use a, a, a taser. He apparently is, is reaching into a car where a knife was later found. And because of those reasons, we should reserve judgment and the officer should be afforded due process. What would you say to those people who are saying that? Everyone should be afforded due process. I, I agree with that completely. But it, here's the thing. In America, we know these cases keep happening. And we have had too many black men in America who have been the subject of this kind of conduct. And it's got to stop. Last night we heard Vice President Pence say um, people would not be safe in Joe Biden's America. A few hours ago, I, I heard the Vice President say, Vice President Biden, I heard him say, he thought President Trump was rooting for more violence. How, how does more violence help the president politically? But that's not my, that's not my deal, to figure out his political strategy. But, but, I, will, but I will say this about the Republican convention some of which I have watched. I have yet to see these people who profess to be national leaders speak about this issue of the killing of unarmed black men, brown men, indigenous men in our country. At this week's RNC, um, one of the things that's, that has struck me uh, compared to RNC's past, there seems to be a, 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 a larger number of black men front and center. It would seem as if Republicans perhaps see an opportunity here uh, that Democrats don't see. There's been a lot of talk about women of color. Black men, what, what is the case for, for them to show up in a few weeks for you and Mr. Biden? First of all, every vote needs to be earned. And Joe and I believe that. So when we look at the condition of black men in America, we know we still have a whole lot of work to do. We have talked about it in, the, in regard to policing and the criminal justice system, but let's talk about the, the realities of, of the fact that every man, including every black man, wants to be able to take care of his family. The Biden-Harris plan is about investing in communities with a particular concern about the, those communities that have been long neglected to ensure that there will be economic opportunities. You devoted a fair amount of your speech to, um, to the virus. Yeah. And uh, you talked about the national mask mandate. That yeah. It sounds like that would be one of the first orders of business. Yes. How would you enforce that? It's really a, a, it's a standard. I mean, nobody's going to be punished. Come on. Uh, nobody likes to wear a mask. This is a universal feeling, right? So. So that's not the point. Hey, let's enjoy wearing masks. No, the point is this is what we, as responsible people who love our neighbor, we have to just do that right now. God willing, it won't be forever. One of the central tenets of your campaign seems to be this promise that there won't be as much chaos. Mm -hmm. 
How, how can you guarantee that? You know, there's an old saying, the fish rots from the head. Part of leadership is to set a tone for the country. We have, on the one hand, Donald Trump, who has been spending full time trying to sow hate and division in our country. On the other hand, you have Joe Biden, who has been all about saying we need to unify as a country, respect the dignity of our fellow human being. In this election, there are two clear choices. There are two. And which choice is reflective of who we aspire to be as a, as a country and as a people? Yeah, one of the criticisms, obviously, that uh, she's gotten along with the vice president is you've got the, the president and the vice president who have been out making trips to battleground states, doing small, uh, in some cases, larger in-person uh, events. Some have suggested they need to do that. So we, talk, we spent some time talking about that and why they haven't been doing that. We'll have that for you uh, coming up on the third hour. And I also asked her um, why she thinks that the president is scared when it comes to coronavirus. She said that in her speech yesterday. I asked her about that. And this idea that she's been labeled, some this week, some in, in, in the past, is radically liberal. These labels that folks have placed on her and, and Mr. Biden. We spent some time talking about that as well. Okay, so more ahead in the third hour yes. of today. All right, thank you. We are tired. We are tired of being beaten by policemen. We are tired of seeing our people locked up in jail over and over again. And then you holler, be patient. How long can we be patient? We want our freedom and we want it now. That was a 23-year-old John Lewis speaking at the March on Washington 57 years ago this morning. His poignant voice breaking through then as it would for decades. Joined now by Pulitzer Prize winning historian John Meacham. Mr. Meacham examines John Lewis's voice, his story, and his impact in his new book, His Truth is Marching On, John Lewis and the Power of Hope. It is out this week. Good to have you, Mr. Meacham. Good to see you, John. Thanks, Craig. I, I started the book this week, and you, you make a, a, a fairly bold assertion early on in the book. And it's this idea that John Lewis belongs in the Pantheon right next to George Washington, right next to Dom Thomas Jefferson. Why? How so? Because our founders in the late 18th century articulated ideals of what America should be, and John Lewis and Martin Luther King and Rosa Parks made those ideals real. They forced the nation to actually live up to the promise of the country that all were created equal. And until 60 years ago, we were living under functional apartheid in this country. And it was this young man from Troy, Alabama, segregated Troy, Alabama, never saw a white person really except for the mailman until he was uh, almost uh, 18 years old. He revolted, his soul revolted against segregation, against the white only signs, the colored only signs. And he believed in what he heard in church. He believed that you should love your neighbor as yourself and that that meant a full and fair and free country. And he was willing again and again and again to put his body on the line. He was willing to bleed and die for an ideal of America that we're still working to bring into action. John, the, the book itself, how, how did it come about and how involved was John Lewis in, in the writing of this book? Uh, very much so. Uh, I met him 28 years ago when I was a young reporter. Uh, I was honored to know him uh, through those decades. We talked fairly frequently. Uh, I saved all my notes. Uh, I always knew I'd write about him, but I thought I had another decade or so. Uh, and then late last year, of course, he was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. Cancer did what uh, the white state troopers of the segregated South could not do. Hmm. And uh, I was standing on the bridge in Selma, the Pettus Bridge, with my family and about a thousand other people in early March of this year at the commemoration of that moment at Bloody Sunday uh, when uh, John Lewis led the nonviolent marchers into the teeth of white authority simply for the right to vote, which was promised in the Constitution. And I was listening to him and realized that his vision of love his vision that if you and I did the right thing, 
if our hearts and minds were oriented in the right way, we could make this a better country. We could bring the gospel into reality. And I was listening to him and I thought, this is the story that we must tell in this moment of such dispiritedness, such uh, controversy, such division in the country. John Lewis's story inspires and illuminates. And so we spent a, a, about six weeks on the phone together because of the pandemic. And uh, I wrote this because I believe that the role of faith and the role of courage that he exemplified are the ways we have to focus if we want to make this a more beloved community. Was, was the late congressman able to, to read it before he slipped away from us? Yes, thanks for asking that. Yes, he was. And it, I must say I was in, it relieved uh, enormously uh, that he liked it. Uh, he was very generous about it. Uh, it's very daunting, as you might imagine, to send uh, an American saint and an American icon uh, your own version of what his life is. Uh, but he also wrote an afterword for the book, which is really his last testament. So his final words to the country are in this book. And what's so amazing is how hopeful he was, even amid the police violence of, of this hour, even amid the divisions and the uh, unhappiness of this hour. He believed that we could make progress. And what he would say is, and he says this in the book, is if you don't think America can change, come walk in my shoes. But if we want it to change, we need to follow the way of Lewis. John Meacham, uh, again, I've, I've just started the book, but for folks who thought they knew John Lewis, it is uh, still quite revealing. It's called His Truth is Marching On. It's out now. Uh, John Meacham, thank you. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. Among the chaos, that I found a father trying to teach his son about peace. We don't have to retaliate with anger. We retaliate with love. That's why we're down here. There's always another way. So that's all I want him to see. This is a situation where the state continues to struggle to expand its testing capabilities. Protesters feel that they need to come out in full force and support their community because they feel like they're not getting that support from the Portland police. Another election day coming up against the backdrop of how to keep voters safe amid a pandemic. The moment to truly understand who we are and who we say we are is right here at our feet. You gotta get a four-year degree, but a four-year degree is super expensive. We have created a system where the ticket to the middle class is a thing that middle class families have to stress about and borrow for and patch together. Why is this happening? With Chris Hayes, subscribe now. Today's headlines can be hard to understand and a lot of kids have questions, so we started a newscast for them. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. Well, we actually saw a large convoy of the National Guard come through here. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. This morning across the country, what the new normal for schools will look like. Many teachers left making tough choices between the job they love and their family. What am I going to decide? Take care of my children or have a job? That's an impossible decision. You're creating a little community school. This is a moment we can just develop ourselves and develop our community. Let's turn it over to students. How do they really feel about returning to school? What I miss is my teachers. They are resilient. A surge in coronavirus infection. New developments on several fronts. The story. Tonight, the U.S. shattering the record for most COVID cases in a single day. From every angle. What's your level of concern that the kids who have been told they're going to be home indefinitely won't be able to catch up? On the ground. Do you have faith that this is going to bring about change soon? And in death. Here in Portland, more protests expected tonight. Do you think that police in this country are under attack? NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. The news business is dynamic and probably has never been more important. 
with all that we're facing, I am so proud to bring the perspective of a black woman, a daughter of immigrants, the wife and mother of a husband and kids who sadly are more vulnerable to police violence because of their color, a proud nerd and a representative of the emerging America to cable TV news. I hope the great Gwen Ifill and my mom, Philomena Carol Lamina, will look down from heaven and be proud. President Trump diving into the general election campaign last night, the second longest convention speech in modern history, second only to the one he gave four years ago, that was somewhere in between a State of the Union and a campaign rally for the first time ever, the White House, the People's House, as the president himself called it, being used to host a political convention. One top Democrat last night tweeting, get off our lawn. The president at times inflating his own record and repeatedly laying into Joe Biden. With his family and a fireworks finale, President Trump basking in the glow of his Republican renomination. I profoundly accept this nomination for President of the United States. Most notable, the night's backdrop, the president transforming the White House into a partisan political prop. This is the most important election in the history of our country. Openly flouting longstanding norms and laws. The fact is we're here and they're not. Despite more than 3,000 Americans dying from coronavirus this week alone, hundreds of supporters crowded the South Lawn with no social distancing and few masks. To save as many lives as possible, we are focusing on the science, the facts, and the data. The president taking direct aim at his Democratic rival. Joe Biden. Joe Biden. Joe Biden attacking Joe Biden by name 41 times, even though Biden last week never mentioned him once in his acceptance speech. Joe Biden is not a savior of America's soul. He is the destroyer of America's jobs. President Trump at times sounding more like a challenger than the incumbent, vowing to restore law and order amid a new round of racial unrest, but never referencing Jacob Blake, the black man shot by police in Wisconsin. The Republican Party condemns the rioting, looting, arson, and violence we have seen in Democrat-run cities all like Kenosha. But as a candidate four years ago, Mr. Trump promised this. The crime and violence that today afflicts our nation will soon, and I mean very soon, come to an end. Biden on Thursday looking to capitalize. He's rooting uh, for more violence, not less, and it's clear about that. And what's he doing? He's kept pouring gasoline on the fire. This happens to be Donald Trump's America. Introducing the president, his daughter and senior advisor, Ivanka Trump. Dad, people attack you for being unconventional, but I love you for being real, and I respect you for being effective. President Trump praising his performance while courting critical voters. And I say very modestly that I have done more for the African-American community than any president since Abraham Lincoln. And casting the Democrats as a threat to American greatness. How can the Democrat Party ask to lead our country when it spends so much time tearing down our country? As the president spoke last night, hundreds of protesters gathered along Black Lives Plaza, uh, Black Lives Matter Plaza, just a block from here, banging pots and pans, blowing horns, and they could be lightly heard on the South Lawn last night. Joining us now by phone is the mayor of Lake Charles, Nick Hunter. Mr. Mayor, good morning. It's 24 hours since we last spoke, and now you've been able to survey the damage. What is the state of Lake Charles this morning? Well, um... <laughs> the state of Lake Charles, good question. Uh, Lake Charles is a lot different than it was 48 hours ago. Um, it, it's, uh, this, this event has really dealt us a pretty heavy blow. Mm. You were out and about. Tell me about some of the scenes that you saw. We're, we're looking at the footage. It's, it's, it's hard to see, and I can't even imagine how you feel as the mayor of that community. Well, when I first uh, got out of the bunker after the um, storm. I, I expected to see some roof damage. I mean, I expected to see some some flooding, some some trees in the road. We saw that. We saw um, power lines. What I didn't expect to see was there were literal, literal entire buildings that had been blown apart. There were facades of brick buildings that had been around for 100 years that were blown down. Mm. 
uh, I mean, I was really, I was really blown away by uh, by the devastation of some of these buildings. It was pretty intense. We talked about search and rescue. Uh, do you feel there are people, as we speak this morning, who are still stranded or need help, or do you feel like you have a handle on on the need there in terms of of people? I am actually going to be. Um, I'm going to be very optimistic right now and say that we are not seeing the, um, the the people stranded in their homes or needing to get out of their homes at this point uh, like, like you would with some other storms because we didn't have the storm surge. We didn't have the, the flooded waters. Um, and I have really got to give a lot of kudos to our local law enforcement, our, our local public safety, the National Guard. I mean, there's been a heck of an effort, and people are, are working their tails off like a well-oiled machine. And I really do feel like a lot of people that wanted to get out of their homes did it. And, and so now it's just picking up the pieces. Yes. And th- th- these are tough days. I mean, the power is out. And then I understand the water plant was d- d- damaged, perhaps destroyed. So w- what is the state of affairs there in terms of power and water and the things that people need? Yeah, this is a really important message right now because people who are outside of Lake Charles thinking about coming back, they need to be really um, blunt with themselves about the harsh reality of what they're coming back to. Mm. They are coming back to a city without power and energy. Our company has not said this, but I am willing to say it. It's going to be at least a week, perhaps weeks, before power will be in every part of Lake Charles. The city of Lake Charles, um, we administer our local water company. We have six water uh, plants on a good day. One was completely obliterated, I mean, just wiped off the map. Two are not working. Three are working a little. Uh, I'm telling people that when you turn on the faucet, it's a trickle, and I wish I had an EPA on when that was going to be fixed. But we don't, and I'm sorry about that, but we just got hit with the the largest hurricane uh, to hit Louisiana in the last 150 years. So when someone says, well, when's the water pressure going to be on, my answer is, unfortunately, guys, I don't know. We're trying to assess what happened to our plant. Wow. Mr. Mayor, I mean, you've got so much work in front of you. I'm sure your community appreciates the straight talk, even if the message is hard to hear. Thank you for your time this morning. We really appreciate it. Well, we will rebuild from this. This is something we can recover from. Uh, We will be watching and come see you. Thank you. National Guard troops from Arizona, Michigan, and Alabama are headed to Kenosha, Wisconsin. We are not federalized. Uh, We're on state active duty. Where, amid a night of peaceful protests, authorities have been cracking down to avoid the violence earlier in the week. This video shows Kenosha police and U.S. Marshals forcibly arresting people in a minivan, breaking its window. Authorities say they found helmets, gas masks, and illegal fireworks. We are are doing our best to keep it a safe environment. There's still outrage over the lack of charges against the police officer who shot Jacob Blake seven times in the back. The protests making their way to pro sports, where athletes are taking a stand and refusing to play. NBA players expected to be back on the court this weekend after Wednesday's boycott. In Major League Baseball, New York Mets and Miami Marlins players walking off the field on Thursday. The Mets and Marlins will not be playing baseball tonight. State investigators say Blake had a knife in his car. Wisconsin's attorney general, who's leading the investigation, says the officers had tried to taser and arrest Blake after responding to a domestic incident. The attorney for Blake's family argues that Kyle Rittenhouse, the white teenager now charged with the murder of two protesters, was seen in this video walking by police after the gunfire before being arrested hours later. They let him literally go home. So that tells you a black man who is making no threat to the police, walking away from them, is shot seven times in the back. A white man kills two people and walks by the police and is not shot and not killed. There are two justice systems in America. Overnight, Rittenhouse's attorney told NBC News this was classic self-defense and we are going to prove it. We will obtain justice for Kyle, no matter how hard the fight or how long it takes. 
on the anniversary of Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech. Later today, Jacob Blake's family plans to attend the 2020 March on Washington, calling for social justice and police reform. Craig. And Gabe Gutierrez for us there in Wisconsin. Gabe, thank you. As a former prosecutor and someone who worked closely with police for years, yeah. is there a scenario in which that officer would have been justified, was justified in firing his weapon? Craig, I don't, I don't see it, but I don't have all the evidence. You know, the man was, was going to a, his car. He didn't appear to be armed. And if he was not armed, the use of force that was seven bullets coming out of a gun at close range in the back of the man. I don't see how anybody could reason that that was justifiable. Do you think the officer should be charged? I think that there should be a, a thorough investigation and based on what I've seen, it, it seems that the officer should be charged. There are a lot of folks who are saying, here's a man who uh, wouldn't follow police commands law enforcement tried to use a, a, a taser. He apparently is, is reaching into a car where a knife was later found. And because of those reasons, we should reserve judgment and the officer should be afforded due process. What would you say to those people who are saying that? Everyone should be afforded due process. I, I agree with that completely. But it, here's the thing. In America, we know these cases keep happening. And we have had too many black men in America who have been the subject of this kind of conduct. And it's got to stop. Last night we heard Vice President Pence say um, people would not be safe in Joe Biden's America. A few hours ago, I, I heard the Vice President say, Vice President Biden, I heard him say, he thought President Trump was rooting for more violence. How, how does more violence help the president politically? <laughs> that's, not my, that's not my deal, to figure out his political strategy. But, but, I, but I will say this about the Republican convention some of which I have watched. I have yet to see these people who profess to be national leaders speak about this issue of the killing of unarmed black men, brown men, indigenous men in our country. At this week's RNC, um, one of the things that's, that has struck me uh, compared to RNC's past, there seems to be a, 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 a larger number of black men front and center. It would seem as if Republicans perhaps see an opportunity here uh, that Democrats don't see. There's been a lot of talk about women of color. Black men, what, what is the case for, for them to show up in a few weeks for you and Mr. Biden? First of all, every vote needs to be earned. And Joe and I believe that. So when we look at the condition of black men in America, we know we still have a whole lot of work to do. We have talked about it in, the, in regard to policing and the criminal justice system, but let's talk about the, the realities of, of the fact that every man, including every black man, wants to be able to take care of his family. The Biden-Harris plan is about investing in communities with a particular concern about the, those communities that have been long neglected to ensure that there will be economic opportunities. You devoted a fair amount of your speech to, um, to the virus. Yeah. And uh, you talked about the national mask mandate. That yeah. It sounds like that would be one of the first orders of business. Yes. How would you enforce that? It's really a, a, it's a standard. I mean, nobody's going to be punished. Come on. Nobody likes to wear a mask. This is a universal feeling, right? So, so that's not the point. Hey, let's enjoy wearing masks. No, the point is this is what we, as responsible people who love our neighbor, we have to just do that right now. God willing, it won't be forever. One of the central tenets of your campaign seems to be this promise that there won't be as much chaos. Mm -hmm. how, how can you guarantee that? You know, there's an old saying, the fish rots from the head. Part of leadership is to set a tone for the country. We have, on the one hand, Donald Trump, who has been spending full time trying to sow hate and division in our country. On the other hand, you have Joe Biden, who has been all about saying we need to unify as a country, respect the dignity of our fellow human being. In this election, there are two clear choices. There are two. And 
which choice is reflective of who we aspire to be as a, as a country and as a people. Yeah, one of the criticisms, obviously, that uh, she's gotten along with the vice president is you've got the, the president and the vice president who have been out making trips to battleground states, doing small, uh, in some cases, larger in-person uh, events. Some have suggested they need to do that. So we, talk, we spent some time talking about that and why they haven't been doing that. We'll have that for you uh, coming up on the third hour. And I also asked her um, why she thinks that the president is scared when it comes to coronavirus. She said that in her speech yesterday. I asked her about that. And this idea that she's been labeled, some this week, some in, in, in the past, is radically liberal. These labels that folks have placed on her and, and Mr. Biden. We spent some time talking about that as well. Okay, so more ahead in the third hour yes. of today. All right, thank you. We are tired. We are tired of being beaten by policemen. We are tired of seeing our people locked up in jail over and over again. And then you holler, be patient. How long can we be patient? We want our freedom and we want it now. That was a 23-year-old John Lewis speaking at the March on Washington 57 years ago this morning. His poignant voice breaking through then as it would for decades. Joined now by Pulitzer Prize winning historian John Meacham. Mr. Meacham examines John Lewis's voice, his story, and his impact in his new book, His Truth is Marching On, John Lewis and the Power of Hope. It is out this week. Good to have you, Mr. Meacham. Good to see you, John. Thanks, Craig. I, I started the book this week, and you, you make a, a, a fairly bold assertion early on in the book. And it's this idea that John Lewis belongs in the Pantheon right next to George Washington, right next to Tom Thomas Jefferson. Why? How so? Because our founders in the late 18th century articulated ideals of what America should be. And John Lewis and Martin Luther King and Rosa Parks made those ideals real. They forced the nation to actually live up to the promise of the country that all were created equal. And until 60 years ago, we were living under functional apartheid in this country. And it was this young man from Troy, Alabama, segregated Troy, Alabama, never saw a white person really except for the mailman until he was uh, almost uh, 18 years old. He revolted, his soul revolted against segregation, against the white only signs, the colored only signs. And he believed in what he heard in church. He believed that you should love your neighbor as yourself and that that meant a full and fair and free country. And he was willing again and again and again to put his body on the line. He was willing to bleed and die for an ideal of America that we're still working to bring into action. John, the, the book itself, how, how did it come about and how involved was John Lewis in, in the writing of this book? Uh, very much so. Uh, I met him 28 years ago when I was a young reporter. Uh, I was honored to know him uh, through those decades. We talked fairly frequently. Uh, I saved all my notes. Uh, I always knew I'd write about him, but I thought I had another decade or so. Uh, and then late last year, of course, he was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. Cancer did what uh, the white state troopers of the segregated South could not do. Hmm. And uh, I was standing on the bridge in Selma, the Pettus Bridge, with my family and about a thousand other people in early March of this year at the commemoration of that moment at Bloody Sunday uh, when uh, John Lewis led the nonviolent marchers into the teeth of white authority simply for the right to vote, which was promised in the Constitution. And I was listening to him and realized that his vision of love, his vision that if you and I did the right thing, if our hearts and minds were oriented in the right way, we could make this a better country. We could bring the gospel into reality. And I was listening to him and I thought, this is the story that we must tell in this moment of such dispiritedness, such uh, controversy, such division in the country. John Lewis's story inspires and illuminates. And so we spent uh, about six weeks on the phone together because of the pandemic. And uh, I wrote this because I believe 
that the role of faith and the role of courage that he exemplified are the ways we have to focus if we want to make this a more beloved community. Was, was the late congressman able to, to read it before he slipped away from us? Yes, thanks for asking that. Yes, he was. And it, I must say I was in, it, relieved uh, enormously uh, that he liked it. Uh, he was very generous about it. Uh, it's very daunting, as you might imagine, to send uh, an American saint and an American icon uh, your own version of what his life is. Uh, but he also wrote an afterword for the book, which is really his last testament. So his final words to the country are in this book. And what's so amazing is how hopeful he was, even amid the police violence of, of this hour, even amid the divisions and the uh, unhappiness of this hour. He believed that we could make progress. And what he would say is, and he says this in the book, is if you don't think America can change, come walk in my shoes. <laughs> but if we want it to change, we need to follow the way of Lewis. John Meacham, uh, again, I've, I've just started the book, but for folks who thought they knew John Lewis, it is uh, still quite revealing. It's called His Truth is Marching On. It's out now. Uh, John Meacham, thank you. President Trump diving into the general election campaign last night, the second longest convention speech in modern history, second only to the one he gave four years ago, that was somewhere in between a State of the Union and a campaign rally for the first time ever, the White House, the People's House, as the president himself called it, being used to host a political convention. One top Democrat last night tweeting, get off our lawn. The president at times inflating his own record and repeatedly laying into Joe Biden. With his family and a fireworks finale, President Trump basking in the glow of his Republican renomination. I profoundly accept this nomination for President of the United States. Most notable, the night's backdrop, the president transforming the White House into a partisan political prop. This is the most important election in the history of our country. Openly flouting longstanding norms and laws. The fact is we're here and they're not. Despite more than 3,000 Americans dying from coronavirus this week alone, hundreds of supporters crowded the South Lawn with no social distancing and few masks. To save as many lives as possible, we are focusing on the science, the facts, and the data. The president taking direct aim at his Democratic rival. Joe Biden. Joe Biden. Joe Biden. Attacking Joe Biden by name 41 times, even though Biden last week never mentioned him once in his acceptance speech. Joe Biden is not a savior of America's soul. He is the destroyer of America's jobs. President Trump at times sounding more like a challenger than the incumbent, vowing to restore law and order amid a new round of racial unrest, but never referencing Jacob Blake, the black man shot by police in Wisconsin. The Republican Party condemns the rioting, looting, arson, and violence we have seen in Democrat-run cities all like Kenosha. But as a candidate four years ago, Mr. Trump promised this. The crime and violence that today afflicts our nation will soon, and I mean very soon, come to an end. Biden on Thursday looking to capitalize. He's rooting uh, for more violence, not less, and it's clear about that. And what's he doing? He's kept pouring gasoline on the fire. This happens to be Donald Trump's America. Introducing the president, his daughter and senior advisor, Ivanka Trump. Dad, people attack you for being unconventional, but I love you for being real, and I respect you for being effective. President Trump praising his performance while courting critical voters. And I say very modestly that I have done more for the African-American community than any president since Abraham Lincoln. And casting the Democrats as a threat to American greatness. How can the Democrat Party ask to lead our country when it spends so much time tearing down our country? As the president spoke last night, hundreds of protesters gathered along Black Lives Plaza, uh, Black Lives Matter Plaza, just a block from here, banging pots and pans, blowing horns, and they could be lightly heard on the South Lawn last night.
I am very, very proud to be the nominee of the Republican Party. President Trump knows he inherited the first generation of Americans who couldn't promise their children a better life than their own. The party had moved from liberal to radical. This new Democratic Party wasn't just for higher taxes. Now they were for open borders, against our police, and against our God-given rights. At no time before have voters faced a clearer choice between two parties, two visions, two philosophies, or two agendas. The radical left doesn't really want better policing. They don't really care about making the justice system fairer. What they want is no policing. Biden is a Trojan horse for socialism. He's a Trojan horse with Bernie, AOC, Pelosi, Black Lives Matter, and his party's entire left wing. They want to defund the police and take away your Second Amendment rights. They want free health care for illegal immigrants. Yet they offer no protection at all for unborn Americans. I recognize that my dad's communication style is not to everyone's taste. And I know that his tweets can feel a bit unfiltered. But the results, the results speak for themselves. He makes promises and he keeps them. He is transparent and we certainly know what he's thinking. We have already built 300 miles of border wall and we are adding 10 new miles every single week. The wall will soon be complete. And I say very modestly that I have done more for the African-American community than any president since Abraham Lincoln. President Trump rectified the disparities of the 1994 Biden crime bill that disproportionately hurt African-Americans. Biden's record is a shameful roll call of the most catastrophic betrayals and blunders in our lifetime. He has spent his entire career on the wrong side of history. We want a society where every child can live in a safe community and go to a great school of their choice. Biden also vowed to oppose school choice and close all charter schools, ripping away the ladder of opportunity for black and Hispanic children. And we have deported 20,000 gang members and 500,000 criminal aliens. The goal of cancel culture is to make decent Americans live in fear of being fired, expelled, shamed, humiliated, and driven from society as we know it. America will land the first woman on the moon, and the United States will be the first nation to plant its beautiful flag on Mars. You are the reason he is going to keep fighting for four more years. <laughs> As a former prosecutor and someone who worked closely with police for years, yeah. is there a scenario in which that officer would have been justified? was justified in firing his weapon. Craig, I don't, I don't see it, but I don't have all the evidence. You know, the man was, was going to a, his car. He didn't appear to be armed. And if he was not armed, the use of force that was seven bullets coming out of a gun at close range in the back of the man, I don't see how anybody could reason that that was justifiable. Do you think the officer should be charged? I think that there should be a, a thorough investigation, and based on what I've seen, it, it seems that the officer should be charged. There are a lot of folks who are saying, here's a man who uh, wouldn't follow police commands. Law enforcement tried to use a, a, a taser. He apparently is, is reaching into a car where a knife was later found. And because of those reasons, we should reserve judgment and the officer should be afforded due process. What would you say to those people who are saying that? Everyone should be afforded due process. I, I agree with that completely. But it, here's the thing. In America, we know these cases keep happening. And we have had too many black men in America who have been the subject 
of this kind of conduct. And it's got to stop. Last night we heard Vice President Pence say um, people would not be safe in Joe Biden's America. A few hours ago, I, I heard the vice president say, Vice President Biden, I heard him say, he thought President Trump was rooting for more violence. How, how does more violence help the president politically? <laughs> that's, not my, that's not my deal, to figure out his political strategy. But, but, I, but I will say this about the Republican convention, some of which I have watched. I have yet to see these people who profess to be national leaders speak about this issue of the killing of unarmed black men, brown men, indigenous men in our country. At this week's RNC, um, one of the things that's, that has struck me uh, compared to RNC's past, there seems to be a, 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 a larger number of black men front and center. It would seem as if Republicans perhaps see an opportunity here uh, that Democrats don't see. There's been a lot of talk about women of color Black men, what, what is the case for, for them to show up in a few weeks yes. for you and Mr. Biden? First of all, every vote needs to be earned. And Joe and I believe that. So when we look at the condition of black men in America, we know we still have a whole lot of work to do. We have talked about it in, the, in regard to policing and the criminal justice system, but let's talk about the, the realities of, of the fact that every man including every black man, wants to be able to take care of his family. The Biden-Harris plan is about investing in communities with a particular concern about the, those communities that have been long neglected to ensure that there will be economic opportunities. You devoted a fair amount of your speech to, um, to the virus. Yeah. And uh, you talked about the national mask mandate. That yeah. It sounds like that would be one of the first orders of business. Yes. How would you enforce that? It's really a, a, it's a standard. I mean, nobody's going to be punished. Come on. Uh, nobody likes to wear a mask. This is a universal feeling, right? So, so that's not the point. Hey, let's enjoy wearing masks. No. The point is this is what we, as responsible people who love our neighbor, we have to just do that right now. God willing, it won't be forever. One of the central tenets of your campaign seems to be this promise that there won't be as much chaos. Mm -hmm. how, how can you guarantee that? You know, there's an old saying, the fish rots from the head. Part of leadership is to set a tone for the country. We have on the one hand, Donald Trump, who has been spending full time trying to sow hate and division in our country. On the other hand, you have Joe Biden, who has been all about saying we need to unify as a country, respect the dignity of our fellow human being. In this election, there are two clear choices. There are two. And which choice is reflective of who we aspire to be as a, as a country and as a people? Yeah, one of the criticisms, obviously, that uh, she's gotten along with the vice president is you've got the, the president and the vice president who have been out making trips to battleground states, doing small, uh, in some cases, larger in-person uh, events. Some have suggested they need to do that. So we, talk, we spent some time talking about that and why they haven't been doing that. We'll have that for you uh, coming up on the third hour. And I also asked her um, why she thinks that the president is scared when it comes to coronavirus. She said that in her speech yesterday. I asked her about that. And this idea that she's been labeled, some this week, some in, in, in the past, is radically liberal. These labels that folks have placed on her and, and Mr. Biden. We spent some time talking about that as well. Okay, so more ahead in the third hour yes. of today. All right, thank you. This morning, daylight revealing Laura's path of destruction. It looks like a bomb exploded. It does. All over the city, it looks like a bomb exploded. Roofs ripped off homes, trees uprooted. <laughs> The deadly storm scarring coastal Louisiana. Windows broke out, walls came in. The Category 4 hurricane struck overnight, tearing through towns with winds topping 150 miles an hour, enough to flip trucks off the road. And in Lake Charles, where Laura's destructive eyewall wreaked havoc, the storm shred entire buildings in a few seconds. Oh, skyscraper's going. Not good. Oh, no. A terrifying night for those who chose to stay behind. I'm thinking the apartment building is going to fall on top of us because you can hear stuff knocking against the, the brick. 
Laura's devastating winds didn't just rip through building after building, but also took down vital communication, knocking out cell phone sites like this all across the city. For Chris Watson, the only call he needed was to friends to help him clean up. His home damaged, his car totaled. There's so much damage here. You, you're going, this is, this is a disaster area. You know, I mean, it's a literal disaster. I mean, the recovery time for this is going to be phenomenal. Yet, despite the devastation, today brought the realization Laura could have been much worse, with most people here spared from any massive flooding. We're thankful we didn't get more storm surge than we did. In Texas, too, a sigh of relief. When you consider the magnitude of the damage that could have occurred here, we did dodge a bullet. Back in Louisiana, a night no one will soon forget. I'm just glad that we are all alive. That's it. And tonight, damage totals are still being calculated, but you can see the extent of the destruction behind me and realize just how long a road of recovery lays ahead for this community, determined to move on, even if it takes years to do so. Joining us now by phone is the mayor of Lake Charles, Nick Hunter. Mr. Mayor, good morning. It's 24 hours since we last spoke, and now you've been able to survey the damage. What is the state of Lake Charles this morning? Well, um, <laughs> the state of Lake Charles, good question. Uh, Lake Charles is a lot different than it was 48 hours ago. Um, it, it's, uh, this, this event has really dealt us a pretty heavy blow. Mm. You were out and about. Tell me about some of the scenes that you saw. We're, we're looking at the footage. It's, it's, it's hard to see, and I can't even imagine how you feel as the mayor of that community. Well, when I first uh, got out of the bunker after the um, storm, I expected to see some roof damage. I mean, I expected to see some, some flooding, some, some trees in the road. We saw that. We saw um, power lines. What I didn't expect to see was there were literal, literal entire buildings that had been blown apart. There were facades of brick buildings that had been around for 100 years that were blown down. Uh, I mean, I was really, I was really blown away by, uh, by the devastation of some of these buildings. It was pretty intense. We talked about search and rescue. Uh, do you feel there are people, as we speak this morning, who are still stranded or need help? Or do you feel like you have a handle on, on the need there in terms of, of people? I am actually going to be, um, uh, I'm going to be very optimistic right now and say that we are not seeing the, um, the, the people stranded in their homes or needing to get out of their homes at this point. Uh, like, like you would with some other storms, because we didn't have the storm surge. We didn't have the, the flooded waters. Um, and I have really got to give a lot of kudos to our local law enforcement, our, our local public safety, the National Guard. I mean, there's been a heck of an effort, and people are, are working their tails off like a well-oiled machine. And I really do feel like a lot of people that wanted to get out of their homes did it. And, and so now it's just picking up the pieces. Yes, and th th these are tough days. I mean, the power is out, and then I understand the water plant was d d damaged, perhaps destroyed. So w what is the state of affairs there in terms of power and water and the things that people need? Yeah, this is a, a really important message right now because people who are outside of Lake Charles thinking about coming back, they need to be really um, a blunt with themselves about the harsh reality of what they're coming back to. They are coming back to a city without power and energy. Our company has not said this, but I am willing to say it. It's going to be at least a week, perhaps weeks, before power will be in every part of Lake Charles. The city of Lake Charles, um, we administer our local water company. We have six water uh, plants on a good day. One was completely obliterated, I mean, just wiped off the map. Two are not working. Three are working a little. Uh, I, I'm telling people that when you turn on the faucet, it's a trickle, and I wish I had an EPA on when that was, that was going to be fixed, mm -hmm. but we don't. And I'm sorry about that, but we just got hit with the, the largest hurricane uh, to hit Louisiana in the last 150 years. So when someone says, well, when's the water pressure going to be on, my answer is, unfortunately, guys, I don't know. We're trying to assess what happened to our plant. Wow. Mr. Mayor, I mean, you've got so much work in front of you. I'm sure your community appreciates the straight talk, even if the message is hard to hear. Thank you for your time this morning. We really appreciate it.
Well, we will rebuild from this. This is something we can recover from. Um, we will be watching and come see you. Thank you. We're joined now by FEMA Administrator Pete Gaynor on the relief efforts going on there in the Gulf. Administrator Gaynor, good morning to you, sir. Morning. How are you guys doing? Doing okay. Doing well. Uh, and, and hope you guys down there are, are going to start doing a little bit better soon. Last hour, we talked to the mayor of, of Lake Charles, Louisiana. Uh, the mayor there urged residents who left town not to come back just yet, said that it could be at least a week or, or even more before power's back on. Uh, no ETA on water being fully restored. What, what are you seeing? What are you hearing from your team on the ground? Yeah, uh, so uh, uh, you, the point that you made about uh, don't come back, I, I like that point. Uh, and and the, our message continues to be safety. So uh, if you're in a safe place, stay there. And if you're somewhere else and you want to go back, you know, heed the directions of your local uh, elected officials, emergency managers, you know, stay safe. Uh, what we see so far is... Uh, is uh, uh, Wind-driven damage to uh, structures and buildings. Uh, lots of power down. Lots of trees down. Uh, you know, so there's, there's going to be a, a process to open up access so we can get uh, restoration crews back in on the streets, get that power restored, and make it safe for people to return uh, when that time comes. And th this region is no stranger to hurricanes. I mean, hurricanes Ike, hurricanes Rita have hit the area. So, what would you say damage from uh, Hurricane Laura looks like compared to those previous storms? Well, I, I don't like to, to compare damage. Uh, you know, every storm is unique. And uh, we are focused on Laura uh, recovery and response. And that's going to be our focus until uh, we get people back in their homes, safe, warm, and dry. Uh, you know, this, is, this, this storm is, is uh, unlike no other. Uh, Cat 4 uh, never came across uh, Louisiana uh, in, in known history. Uh, so, uh, again, our goal is safety, uh, removing debris, restoring power. And then, and again, making it safe for residents to return to their homes. Does it seem like, uh, Pete, does it seem like folks heeded those warnings and evacuated when, when they were asked to? Yeah, I think so. And uh, I think one of the, uh, the signs, uh, and we're kind of surprised by it this morning, is that uh, there's no, we, we didn't do, use any federal assets for rescues, uh, either before, during, or, or since I was last week a couple of minutes ago, which is a pretty am amazing fact uh, when you consider uh, other uh, hurricanes and other uh, uh, hazards. Uh, so I I'm really glad that people listened. They got out of harm's way. Uh, they kept themselves uh, safe and their family safe. I think that's a testament uh, to the leadership uh, of the governor and the leadership of mayors and elected leaders uh, down in Louisiana is keeping their residents safe. Uh, my hat's off to them. And, and three states have declared a state of emergency. Thousands of people are currently still without power. Residents have lost their homes. Uh, but FEMA has pre-positioned 500,000 meals and 800,000 liters of water on the ground. So can you just describe the plan to get all of that into the hands of people that need them? Yeah, so uh, it's a great question. And uh, response works best when it's locally executed, uh, state managed, and fairly supported. Uh, you know, I grew up as a local emergency manager. I was a state emergency manager. I'm now the federal emergency manager. You know, when all those things work together, uh, it, it works, uh, it works uh, like a symphony uh, most times. And so we're providing all those resources. So whether it's food, water, uh, generators, uh, blue tops for roofs, uh, we'll supply those through the state, and the state will disperse those to the locals uh, that need them most. And that's the way the, the, the system works. So we have plenty of resources uh, on the ground, just not commodities, but people, uh, specialized teams, communications teams, urban search and rescue teams. Uh, there's lots of resources down there to meet the needs of the state uh, and the locals that uh, need it today. Administrator Pete Gaynor, thank you so much and good luck to the crews that are out there. I know it's, it's a, a daunting task and a lot of work ahead of, ahead of you guys. So thanks for taking the time to talk to us. Thank you. Yeah, My pleasure. I mean, between the, the storms down, down in the Gulf and the, obviously we're in the middle of a pandemic, wildfires out, right. rest, out west, FEMA has uh, really stepped up over the last few months. National Guard troops from Arizona, Michigan, and Alabama are headed to Kenosha, Wisconsin. We are not federalized. Uh, we're on state active duty. Where, amid a night of peaceful protests, authorities have been cracking down to avoid the violence earlier in the week. Get the this video shows Kenosha police and U.S. Marshals forcibly arresting people in a minivan, breaking its window. Authorities say they found helmets, gas masks, and illegal fireworks. We are, are doing our best to keep it a safe environment. 
There's still outrage over the lack of charges against the police officer who shot Jacob Blake seven times in the back. The protests making their way to pro sports where athletes are taking a stand and refusing to play. NBA players expected to be back on the court this weekend after Wednesday's boycott. In Major League Baseball, New York Mets and Miami Marlins players walking off the field on Thursday. The Mets and Marlins will not be playing baseball tonight. State investigators say Blake had a knife in his car. Wisconsin's attorney general, who's leading the investigation, says the officers had tried to taser and arrest Blake after responding to a domestic incident. The attorney for Blake's family argues that Kyle Rittenhouse, the white teenager now charged with the murder of two protesters, was seen in this video walking by police after the gunfire before being arrested hours later. They let him literally go home. So that tells you a black man who is making no threat to the police, walking away from them, is shot seven times in the back. A white man kills two people and walks by the police and is not shot and not killed. There are two justice systems in America. Overnight, Rittenhouse's attorney told NBC News this was classic self-defense and we are going to prove it. We will obtain justice for Kyle no matter how hard the fight or how long it takes. On the anniversary of Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech, later today, Jacob Blake's family plans to attend the 2020 March on Washington, calling for social justice and police reform. Craig. And Gabe Gutierrez for us there in Wisconsin. Gabe, thank you. Okay. We are tired of being beaten by policemen. We are tired of seeing our people locked up in jail over and over again. And then you holler, be patient. How long can we be patient? We want our freedom and we want it now. That was a 23-year-old John Lewis speaking at the March on Washington 57 years ago this morning. His poignant voice breaking through then as it would for decades. Joined now by... Pulitzer Prize winning historian John Meacham. Mr. Meacham examines John Lewis's voice, his story, and his impact in his new book, His Truth is Marching On, John Lewis and the Power of Hope. It is out this week. Good to have you, Mr. Meacham. Good to see you, John. Thanks, Craig. I, I started the book this week, and you, you make a, a, a fairly bold assertion early on in the book. And it's this idea that John Lewis belongs in the pantheon right next to George Washington, right next to Tom Thomas Jefferson. Why? How so? Because our founders in the late 18th century articulated ideals of what America should be. And John Lewis and Martin Luther King and Rosa Parks made those ideals real. They forced the nation to actually live up to the promise of the country that all were created equal. And until 60 years ago, we were living under functional apartheid in this country. And it was this young man from Troy, Alabama, segregated Troy, Alabama, never saw a white person really except for the mailman until he was uh, almost uh, 18 years old. He revolted, his soul revolted against segregation, against the white only signs, the colored only signs. And he believed in what he heard in church. He believed that you should love your neighbor as yourself and that that meant a full and fair and free country. And he was willing again and again and again to put his body on the line. He was willing to bleed and die for an ideal of America that we're still working to bring into action. John, the, the book itself, how, how did it come about and how involved was John Lewis in, in the writing of this book? Uh, very much so. Uh, I met him 28 years ago when I was a young reporter. Uh, I was honored to know him uh, through those decades. We talked fairly frequently. I uh, saved all my notes. Uh, I always knew I'd write about him, but I thought I had another decade or so. Uh, and then late last year, of course, he was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. 
cancer did what uh, the white state troopers of the segregated South could not do. Hmm. And uh, I was standing on the bridge in Selma, the Pettus Bridge, with my family and about a thousand other people in early March of this year at the commemoration of that moment at Bloody Sunday uh, when uh, John Lewis led the nonviolent marchers into the teeth of white authority simply for the right to vote, which was promised in the Constitution. And I was listening to him and realized that his vision of love, his vision that if you and I did the right thing, if our hearts and minds were oriented in the right way, we could make this a better country. We could bring the gospel into reality. And I was listening to him and I thought, this is the story that we must tell in this moment of such dispiritedness, such uh, controversy, such division in the country. John Lewis's story inspires and illuminates. And so we spent uh, about six weeks on the phone together because of the pandemic. And uh, I wrote this because I believe that the role of faith and the role of courage that he exemplified are the ways we have to focus if we want to make this a more beloved community. Was, was the late congressman able to, to read it before he slipped away from us? Yes, thanks for asking that. Yes, he was. And it, I must say I was in, it, relieved uh, enormously uh, that he liked it. Uh, he was very generous about it. Uh, it's very daunting, as you might imagine, to send uh, an American saint and an American icon uh, your own version of what his life is. Uh, but he also wrote an afterword for the book, which is really his last testament. So his final words to the country are in this book. And what's so amazing is how hopeful he was, even amid the police violence of, of this hour, even amid the divisions and the uh, unhappiness of this hour. He believed that we could make progress. And what he would say is, and he says this in the book, is if you don't think America can change, come walk in my shoes. <laughs> but if we want it to change, we need to follow the way of Lewis. John Meacham, uh, again, I've, I've just started the book, but for folks who thought they knew John Lewis, it is uh, still quite revealing. It's called His Truth is Marching On. It's out now. Uh, John Meacham, thank you. Thousands are expected to gather today for the Get Your Knee Off Our Necks Commitment March, which also falls on the 57th, an 57th anniversary of the March on Washington. Uh, this is also the date when a 14-year-old black teenager named Emmett Till became a, a sobering part of American history, he was tortured and lynched by white men. Deborah Watts, co-founder of the Emmett Till Legacy Foundation, she was a toddler then, but she now works to honor her cousin's memory while seeking justice for the crime. I talked to her about what that means for her family and how Emmett Till's death still resonates today. It was one of those significant moments that moved the country in an, an emotional level and then also the consciousness of the country. I think it woke people up. In August 1955, Emmett Till left his Chicago home bound for the Deep South. For those who are not familiar with the story of Emmett Till, paint the picture for us. A 14-year-old, vibrant, intelligent young man wanted to travel to visit relatives in Mississippi with his great uncle. He happened to visit a, a store, the Bryant Grocery and Meat Market, with other cousins and was purchasing items. When leaving, Deborah Watts says a pivotal event happened involving the store clerk. He whistled at Carolyn Bryant, and that was a forbidden uh, rule. Then on August 28th, Till was kidnapped in the middle of the night. They beat him, they lynched him, they shot him, they also uh, took a 75 pound cotton gin fan and with barbed wire tied it around his neck and eventually threw him into the Tallahatchie River. When his body was recovered, his mother, Mimi Till Mobley, decided on a four day memorial. One of the things that's always struck me about the Emmett Till story, Deborah, is, is the fact that his mother insisted that that casket be open so people could see her son. Why was that so important? 
this was a horrific act that happened to her son. But she also knew that there were other attacks upon other black men and women in our country. And she knew that it was wrong. And the only way to demonstrate to our country for any kind of a change to occur would be to show his body untouched, uh, to show what hate looked like, what evil looked like. In September 1955, an all-white jury acquitted the men identified as his abductors, Carolyn's then husband and brother-in-law, who both since died. Two years ago, the investigation was reportedly reopened after this 2017 Vanity Fair article and subsequent book on Emmett Till's murder claimed that Carolyn Bryant had recanted testimony that Till also made advances toward her. Carolyn Bryant's family maintains she never recanted. What would justice look like in, in 2020 for your family? Justice looks like for us truth. We want Carolyn Bryant to be held accountable for her role in Emmett's kidnapping and his murder. Uh, so we want charges brought against Carolyn Bryant and we are currently pursuing it with a petition asking for the Department of Justice, the Attorney General in Mississippi and the DA in Mississippi to bring charges. This is 65 years we've been waiting for justice for him. How is the story of your cousin connected to um, Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor, Sandra Bland, Trayvon Martin, you're in Minneapolis, George Floyd, what's the through line? It's a bold, thick line that connects um, with the injustices that have occurred. I think that the hatred and the racism has not gone away. And I know that there were other cases well before Emmett's, but I think it inspired a movement, if you will, just as George Floyd's murder has inspired a movement. I think it's upon us and our responsibility to make sure that we connect the past to the present and future so we understand. On this, the 65th anniversary of Emmett Till's death, how, how should Americans remember your cousin? We all have a responsibility to right the wrongs so that there are no more Emmett Tills. Emmett is, is representative of, of youth, of vibrancy, of hope, of our dreams, of uh, our humanity. I hope that we can pledge to uh, be accountable to each other and to have a covenant with each other that we will not allow that kind of racism to creep into our reality. And his mother, Mamie Till Mobley, spoke up for justice until her death in 2003. But the, the Emmett Till Legacy Foundation continues to pick up that mantle. Planned events for this weekend include a vigil uh, and the March for Peace. We did reach out to the Department of Justice. They have no comment at this time. Also, no word back from the Mississippi Attorney General. And the spokesperson for Carolyn Bryant's family said there's no evidence to support charging her in the case. Among the chaos that I found a father trying to teach his son about peace. We don't have to retaliate with anger. We retaliate with love. That's why we're down here. There's always another way. So that's all I want him to see. This is a situation where the state continues to struggle to expand its testing capabilities. Protesters feel that they need to come out in full force and support their community because they feel like they're not getting that support from the Portland police. Another election day coming up against the backdrop of how to keep voters safe amid a pandemic. The moment to truly understand who we are and who we say we are is right here at our feet. You gotta get a four-year degree, but a four-year degree is super expensive. We have created a system where the ticket to the middle class is a thing that middle class families have to stress about and borrow for and patch together. Why is this happening? With Chris Hayes. Subscribe now. Today's headlines can be hard to understand, and a lot of kids have questions, so we started a newscast for them. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. Well, we actually saw a large convoy of the National Guard come through here. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern.
This morning across the country, what the new normal for schools will look like. Many teachers left making tough choices between the job they love and their family. What am I going to decide? Take care of my children or have a job? That's an impossible decision. You're creating a little community school. This is a moment we can just develop ourselves and develop our community. Let's turn it over to students. How do they really feel about returning to school? What I miss is my teachers. They are resilient. A surge in coronavirus infection. New developments on several fronts. The story. Tonight, the U.S. shattering the record for most COVID cases in a single day. From every angle. What's your level of concern that the kids who have been told they're going to be home indefinitely won't be able to catch up? On the ground. Do you have faith that this is going to bring about change soon? And in death. Here in Portland, more protests expected tonight. Do you think that police in this country are under attack? NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. The news business is dynamic and probably has never been more important. With all that we're facing, I am so proud to bring the perspective of a black woman, a daughter of immigrants, the wife and mother of a husband and kids who sadly are more vulnerable to police violence because of their color, a proud nerd, and a representative of the emerging America to cable TV news. I hope the great Gwen Ifill and my mom, Philomena Carol Lamina, will look down from heaven and be proud. This morning, daylight revealing Laura's path of destruction. It looks like a bomb exploded. It does. All over the city, it looks like a bomb exploded. Roofs ripped off homes, trees uprooted. The deadly storm scarring coastal Louisiana. Windows broke out, walls came in. The Category 4 hurricane struck overnight, tearing through towns with winds topping 150 miles an hour, enough to flip trucks off the road. And in Lake Charles, where Laura's destructive eyewall wreaked havoc, the storm shred entire buildings in a few seconds. Oh, skyscrapers going, not good. Oh, no. A terrifying night for those who chose to stay behind. I'm thinking the apartment building is going to fall on top of us because you can hear stuff knocking against the, the brick. Laura's devastating winds didn't just rip through building after building, but also took down vital communication, knocking out cell phone sites like this all across the city. For Chris Watson, the only call he needed was to friends to help him clean up. His home damaged, his car totaled. There's so much damage here. You, you're going, this is, this is a disaster area. You know, I mean, it's a literal disaster. I mean, the recovery time for this is going to be phenomenal. Yet, despite the devastation, today brought the realization Laura could have been much worse, with most people here spared from any massive flooding. We're thankful we didn't get more storm surge than we did. In Texas, too, a sigh of relief. When you consider the magnitude of the damage that could have occurred here, we did dodge a bullet. Back in Louisiana, a night no one will soon forget. I'm just glad that we are all alive. That's it. And tonight, damage totals are still being calculated, but you can see the extent of the destruction behind me and realize just how long a road of recovery lays ahead for this community, determined to move on, even if it takes years to do so. Hours after Hurricane Laura ripped through Lake Charles, daybreak brought another ominous sight. I can, don't even come across it. A nearby chemical plant engulfed in a raging fire, visible for miles, creating a balloon of black smoke that until roads were closed, passing drivers had to navigate through. And a health hazard for the thousands who live in the area, all under order to shelter in place. They need to be on the inside of their home with their doors and windows closed uh, and the air conditioning off if they're lucky enough to have electricity. Hazmat and emergency crews responded to the inferno at BioLab in Lake Charles, which manufactures pool supplies. A statement from the company that owns the facility says the fire was caused by a chlorine gas leak as the hurricane tore through in overnight hours. As this type of chlorine begins to decompose, it generates heat and it began to burn, releasing chlorine gas into the atmosphere. No one was working in the plant due to a pre-hurricane shutdown. The CDC warns high exposure to chlorine can be dangerous and lead to serious respiratory illness. Now is not the time to go sightseeing. I'm appealing to everybody in Louisiana, uh, don't get out on the road. Lester, we know up to 20,000 residents live in the area impacted by today's fire and fumes. It's tough to know the exact number still here because many evacuated ahead of the storm. 
families across Texas tonight uprooted by a Category 4 hurricane after opting to ride out the storm. Why would you stay home? Because we had trouble getting back in here whenever Hurricane Rita come through. And I swore I'd never leave again after that. The cracked trees and splintered roofs. Last night heard a crash and of course this oak tree is in the middle of the house. Destroying homes but not shaking foundations. We've done it a few too many times in the last 20 years, but anyway, we will rebuild. We always do. They battened down their property as in past storms, but this one bore a new threat, coronavirus. Being in a large shelter or a large building with a lot of people, um, it, it was a huge factor in my thinking of evacuating. Arata Young also says he couldn't afford to evacuate. The five-year Marine Corps veteran has tied up his life savings in a yoga and jujitsu gym. He just opened last week along with his fellow veteran partner, Tyler Pete. The pair weren't sure what they'd find. How relieved were you when you walked up here and saw that your gym is still intact? It was insane. Yeah, it was, I walked in and it was literally like someone had taken a, a 45 pound plate off of my shoulders. I'm extremely relieved. Um, I could probably kiss him. <laughs> <laughs> a ray of hope shining through a frightening storm. As you can see, some of the homeowners in Laura's path were not as fortunate, having to start the rebuilding process now under a cloud of COVID-19 and economic uncertainty. National Guard troops from Arizona, Michigan, and Alabama are headed to Kenosha, Wisconsin. We are not federalized. Uh, we're on state active duty. Where, amid a night of peaceful protests, authorities have been cracking down to avoid the violence earlier in the week. Get the this video shows Kenosha police and U.S. Marshals forcibly arresting people in a minivan, breaking its window. Authorities say they found helmets, gas masks, and illegal fireworks. We are, are doing our best to keep it a safe environment. There's still outrage over the lack of charges against the police officer who shot Jacob Blake seven times in the back. The protests making their way to pro sports where athletes are taking a stand and refusing to play. NBA players expected to be back on the court this weekend after Wednesday's boycott. In Major League Baseball, New York Mets and Miami Marlins players walking off the field on Thursday. The Mets and Marlins will not be playing baseball tonight. State investigators say Blake had a knife in his car. Wisconsin's attorney general, who's leading the investigation, says the officers had tried to taser and arrest Blake after responding to a domestic incident. The attorney for Blake's family argues that Kyle Rittenhouse, the white teenager now charged with the murder of two protesters, was seen in this video walking by police after the gunfire before being arrested hours later. They let him literally go home. So that tells you a black man who is making no threat to the police, walking away from them, is shot seven times in the back. A white man kills two people and walks by the police and is not shot and not killed. There are two justice systems in America. Overnight, Rittenhouse's attorney told NBC News this was classic self-defense and we are going to prove it. We will obtain justice for Kyle no matter how hard the fight or how long it takes. On the anniversary of Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech, later today, Jacob Blake's family plans to attend the 2020 March on Washington, calling for social justice and police reform. Craig. And Gabe Gutierrez for us there in Wisconsin. Gabe, thank you. Thank After Republicans blamed him all week for violence, including in Kenosha, Joe Biden and Kamala Harris fighting back today. Biden responding to Vice President Mike Pence saying, you won't be safe in Joe Biden's America. The problem we have right now is we're in Donald Trump's America. They're looking for more violence and more disruption because it helps them politically. He views this as a political benefit to him. You know, he's rooting uh, for more violence, not less. And it's clear about that. And what's he doing? He's kept pouring gasoline on the fire. This happens to be Donald Trump's America. You think the president of the United States is rooting for the violence because he thinks it helps him politically? I think he views it as a political benefit. And by the way, I condemn violence in any form, whether it's looting or whatever it is. So who's, who's rooting for the violence here? Biden also said the biggest safety issue is people dying from COVID. 
and what he called pressure on the scientists on testing and therapies, possibly on vaccines. Did you ever see any administration put so much pressure on the FDA? There's no bounds to what this guy does and his team does. We should listen to the scientists. How concerned are you that they're going to rush something out even before Election Day? And I, I pray to God that would happen tomorrow. That'd be wonderful. But the fact is, let's assume we finally do get a vaccine that it works. And how much credibility are we going to have telling people to take it after going through all this stuff that they've misrepresented so far? Kamala Harris also punching back with Craig Melvin for the Today Show. And the American people, regardless of race or gender or age or geographic location, have a right to believe that their leaders will speak truth, even when these are difficult truths. After Nancy Pelosi joked that Biden should not debate the president because the president doesn't tell the truth, she said, Biden told me he will be at the debates, but will have to fact check the president while debating. Pummeled by criticism today, the CDC clarifying the new COVID testing guidelines. In a statement saying testing may be considered for all close contacts of confirmed or probable COVID-19 patients. Walking back yesterday's recommendation, still on the CDC website, that people exposed to COVID but without symptoms do not necessarily need a test. I think this is a black eye uh, for the CDC. Dr. Tom Frieden led the CDC under President Obama. Can we control COVID by doing less testing? Testing is bedrock. It's essential to finding the virus and stopping chains of transmission. At Cure Urgent Care in New York City, Dr. Jake Deutsch says currently three quarters of those who test positive here don't have symptoms. I actually recommend that everybody who thinks they need to get tested gets tested. It's peace of mind for Erin Robinson before she travels. I wanted to make sure that I didn't have anything. I wouldn't be bringing anything with me, I guess, basically. Some states are going their own way, too. I don't agree with the new CDC guidance, period, full stop. California planning to double its testing capacity as it joins a dozen other states defying the CDC. So who decides who gets a test? Dr. Frieden says ultimately that's a local health department decision. But the CDC should have a clear recommendation nearly six months into the pandemic. For a second night, the NBA's quiet courts speaking volumes as players pause the playoffs again before a reported agreement to soon resume games. The act of protest after the shooting in Kenosha comes as players from Milwaukee demand Wisconsin legislators act on police reform, a cause bigger than the game. There has been no action. So our focus today cannot be on basketball. Finding power in their platform on a night when millions watch and hundreds of millions of dollars are spent on advertising and broadcasting rights, the message became a movement around the sporting world. We need to understand that when most of us go home, we still are black. Players in the WNBA spelling out Jacob Blake on their shirts with seven bullet holes in their backs. Soccer, tennis, hockey and baseball games canceled across the nation. Different arenas, but the same fight. I think the most difficult part is to see like people still don't care. It just shows just the hate in people's heart. Being a black man in America is not easy. Athletes turning to activism in a new era. What you're seeing in general is probably the largest, most widespread day of sports activism that our country has ever seen. Soon the games will go on as the NBA shoots for change. Miguel Almaguer, NBC News. If it looks like Babs Miss Rucky knows how to wear a crown, it doesn't surprise her family. To them, she is royalty. We love her to death. Babs turned 102 this week. I hope I look that good when I'm 75. And still holding court. Happy Yay! birthday! She has more stories than anybody you ever seen in your life. Some are not true, some are true. Some get exaggerated, but boy, is she a lot of fun to listen to those stories. A child of immigrants born into a pandemic through years thick and thin, a witness to history, and an optimist. I had a confidence that the country will be fine. Everything will be good. 
because I was told that it would be. My father told me, my mother told me, my president told me. That was FDR for the record. In the game of life, making it to 100 requires luck, love, and most likely, a twinkle in your eye. Get a Coke and chips, have fun. Have fun and enjoy. And it, it's, it's a good life. It's worth suffering for and living for. Life is good. And that part, we do believe. Harry Smith, NBC News. Among the chaos that I found a father trying to teach his son about peace. We don't have to retaliate with anger. We retaliate with love. That's why we're down here. There's always another way. So that's all I want him to see. This is a situation where the state continues to struggle to expand its testing capabilities. Protesters feel that they need to come out in full force and support their community because they feel like they're not getting that support from the Portland police. Another election day coming up against the backdrop of how to keep voters safe amid a pandemic. The moment to truly understand who we are and who we say we are is right here at our feet. You got to get a four-year degree, but a four-year degree is super expensive. We have created a system where the ticket to the middle class is a thing that middle class families have to stress about and borrow for and patch together. Why is this happening? With Chris Hayes. Subscribe now. Today's headlines can be hard to understand, and a lot of kids have questions, so we started a newscast for them. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. We actually saw a large convoy of the National Guard come through here. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays, starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. This morning across the country, what the new normal for schools will look like. Many teachers left making tough choices between the job they love and their family. What am I going to decide? Take care of my children or have a job? That's an impossible decision. You're creating a little community school. This is a moment we can just develop ourselves and develop our community. Let's turn it over to students. How do they really feel about returning to school? What I miss is my teachers. They are resilient. A surge in coronavirus infection. New developments on several fronts. The story. Tonight, the U.S. shattering the record for most COVID cases in a single day. From every angle. What's your level of concern that the kids who have been told they're going to be home indefinitely won't be able to catch up? On the ground. Do you have faith that this is going to bring about change soon? And in death. Here in Portland, more protests expected tonight. Do you think that police in this country are under attack? NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. The news business is dynamic and probably has never been more important. With all that we're facing, I am so proud to bring the perspective of a black woman, a daughter of immigrants, the wife and mother of a husband and kids who sadly are more vulnerable to police violence because of their color, a proud nerd, and a representative of the emerging America to cable TV news. I hope the great Gwen Eiffel and my mom, Philomena Carol Lamina, will look down from heaven and be proud. Women and LGBTQ candidates are positioned to make history up and down the ballot in 2020, shattering records set in the 2018 midterms. More are running for Congress this year than ever before, including at least 266 women of color. But we're not just seeing cracks in the glass ceiling at the national level, it's happening in state houses and city halls and on school boards across the country. Let's take a look at some of the women and LGBTQ candidates making and poised to make history. Black women have seen historic electoral wins in 2020 amid a summer of protests over the police killings of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Rashard Brooks, and other black Americans. At least 130 black women filed to run for congressional seats in this year's election, a number that's steadily increased since 2012 when it was 48. In June, Ferguson, Missouri elected Ella Jones its first black mayor six years after the police shooting of Michael Brown pushed the Black Lives Matter movement into the national spotlight. In Cobb County, Georgia, Sharice Davis looked at the conservative county school board members and saw no black women. She ran for office and won. 
Republican women are also running in record numbers. After a blue wave in 2018, Republican women are hoping to close the gender gap in party identification and party leadership. At least 227 Republican women have filed to run for the House, almost double what that number was a decade ago. After winning her primary, GOP House candidate Nancy Mace came one step closer to becoming the first Republican woman elected to Congress from South Carolina. Elsewhere, LGBTQ candidates are making their own kind of history. When Brie Kidman, Maine's first openly non-binary Senate candidate, was filing forms for the election, Kidman noticed only gendered titles like Mrs., Ms., or Mr. in the drop-down menu. Kidman alerted the Senate Ethics Committee, and a week later, the non-binary option Mix was added to the site. Two states, Kansas and Vermont, could elect their first openly transgender lawmakers to their state legislatures. If Stephanie Byers and Taylor Small win their races in November, they'll join at least four other openly trans lawmakers serving in other states. While 2020 is breaking records all over, this year isn't a complete anomaly. It's another point and trend line of women and LGBTQ candidates growing power in politics. It's a realignment that could change the face of American politics forever. Suburban women are a coveted voting demographic. They were key to President Donald Trump's victory in 2016, and they're shaping up to be a pivotal demographic in this year's election, too. In his own appeals to suburban voters, President Trump has tweeted about protecting suburban housewives and their suburban lifestyle dreams from the invasion of low-income housing. But what do the suburbs really look like in 2020? And how closely does President Trump's idea of the suburban housewife match up to the reality? The suburban voter, the suburban housewife, women and men living in the suburbs, they want security and they want safety. They don't want to have people coming in and forcing low-income housing down their throats. The reality is that the suburbs that President Trump is imagining, affluent, homogenous, fearful of cities, doesn't exist anymore. While he characterizes suburbia as the pinnacle of the American dream, poverty is rising faster in the suburbs than in cities. In the past few decades, the old pattern of affluent suburbs surrounding poor cities has been reversed, as low-income residents are rapidly pushed out of gentrifying city centers. And they're increasingly diverse. Minorities now comprise around 30% of suburban residents, about the same fraction as the nation as a whole. And what about housewives? How many women would fit that description? According to Pew Research, marriage rates have dropped dramatically since the 1960s. About 70% of women with children work outside of the home. And they're the primary breadwinners in 40% of households with children under 18. Overall, the share of stay-at-home moms is a little over half of what it was in 1967. And they're more likely to care about health care and immigration than crime and drugs. But it's important to note that the issues that matter most to women vary widely across race, generation, income, and education level. It's difficult to flatten them into one monolithic voting block, which is what the generalization of the American suburban housewife does. Polls show that former Vice President Joe Biden is leading President Trump in three key swing states largely because of Biden's edge among women voters. So if President Trump wants to win in 2020, he might want to start thinking of women as more than an outdated stereotype. President Trump diving into the general election campaign last night, the second longest convention speech in modern history, second only to the one he gave four years ago, that was somewhere in between a State of the Union and a campaign rally for the first time ever, the White House, the People's House, as the president himself called it, being used to host a political convention. One top Democrat last night tweeting, get off our lawn. The president at times inflating his own record and repeatedly laying into Joe Biden. With his family and a fireworks finale, President Trump basking in the glow of his Republican renomination. I profoundly accept this nomination for President of the United States. Most notable, the night's backdrop, the president transforming the White House into a partisan political prop. This is the most important election in the history of our country. Openly flouting longstanding norms and laws. The fact is we're here and they're not. 
Despite more than 3,000 Americans dying from coronavirus this week alone, hundreds of supporters crowded the South Lawn with no social distancing and few masks. To save as many lives as possible, we are focusing on the science, the facts, and the data. The president taking direct aim at his Democratic rival. Joe Biden. Joe Biden. Joe Biden. Attacking Joe Biden by name 41 times, even though Biden last week never mentioned him once in his acceptance speech. Joe Biden is not a savior of America's soul. He is the destroyer of America's jobs. President Trump at times sounding more like a challenger than the incumbent, vowing to restore law and order amid a new round of racial unrest, but never referencing Jacob Blake, the black man shot by police in Wisconsin. The Republican Party condemns the rioting, looting, arson, and violence we have seen in Democrat-run cities all, like Kenosha. But as a candidate four years ago, Mr. Trump promised this. The crime and violence that today afflicts our nation will soon, and I mean very soon, come to an end. Biden on Thursday looking to capitalize. He's rooting uh, for more violence, not less, and it's clear about that. And what's he doing? He's kept pouring gasoline on the fire. This happens to be Donald Trump's America. Introducing the president, his daughter and senior advisor, Ivanka Trump. Dad. People attack you for being unconventional, but I love you for being real, and I respect you for being effective. President Trump praising his performance while courting critical voters. And I say very modestly that I have done more for the African-American community than any president since Abraham Lincoln. And casting the Democrats as a threat to American greatness. How can the Democrat Party ask to lead our country when it spends so much time tearing down our country? As the president spoke last night, hundreds of protesters gathered along Black Lives Plaza, uh, Black Lives Matter Plaza, just a block from here, banging pots and pans, blowing horns, and they could be lightly heard on the South Lawn last night. I am very, very proud to be the nominee of the Republican Party. President Trump knows he inherited the first generation of Americans who couldn't promise their children a better life than their own. The party had moved from liberal to radical. This new Democratic Party wasn't just for higher taxes. Now they were for open borders, against our police, and against our God-given rights. At no time before have voters faced a clearer choice between two parties, two visions, two philosophies, or two agendas. The radical left doesn't really want better policing. They don't really care about making the justice system fairer. What they want is no policing. Biden is a Trojan horse for socialism. He's a Trojan horse with Bernie, AOC, Pelosi, Black Lives Matter, and his party's entire left wing. They want to defund the police and take away your Second Amendment rights. They want free health care for illegal immigrants. Yet they offer no protection at all for unborn Americans. I recognize that my dad's communication style is not to everyone's taste, and I know that his tweets can feel a bit unfiltered, but the results, the results speak for themselves. He makes promises and he keeps them. He is transparent, and we certainly know what he's thinking. We have already built 300 miles of border wall, and we are adding 10 new miles every single week. The war will soon be complete. And I say very modestly that I have done more for the African-American community than any president since Abraham Lincoln. President Trump rectified the disparities of the 1994 Biden crime bill that disproportionately hurt African-Americans. Biden's record is a shameful roll call of the most catastrophic betrayals and blunders in our lifetime. He has spent his entire career on the wrong side of history. 
We want a society where every child can live in a safe community and go to a great school of their choice. Biden also vowed to oppose school choice and close all charter schools, ripping away the ladder of opportunity for black and Hispanic children. And we have deported 20,000 gang members and 500,000 criminal aliens. The goal of cancel culture is to make decent Americans live in fear of being fired, expelled, shamed, humiliated, and driven from society as we know it. America will land the first woman on the moon, and the United States will be the first nation to plant its beautiful flag on Mars. You are the reason he is going to keep fighting for four more years. As a former prosecutor and someone who worked closely with police for years, yeah. is there a scenario in which that officer would have been justified, was justified in firing his weapon? Craig, I don't, I don't see it, but I don't have all the evidence. You know, the man was, was going to a, his car. He didn't appear to be armed. And if he was not armed, the use of force that was seven bullets coming out of a gun at close range in the back of the man. I don't see how anybody could reason that that was justifiable. Do you think the officer should be charged? I think that there should be a, a thorough investigation. And based on what I've seen, it, it seems that the officer should be charged. There are a lot of folks who are saying, here's a man who uh, wouldn't follow police commands law enforcement tried to use a, a, a taser. He apparently is, is reaching into a car where a knife was later found. And because of those reasons, we should reserve judgment and the officer should be afforded due process. What would you say to those people who are saying that? Everyone should be afforded due process. I, I agree with that completely. But it, here's the thing. In America, we know these cases keep happening. And we have had too many black men in America who have been the subject of this kind of conduct. And it's got to stop. Last night we heard Vice President Pence say um, people would not be safe in Joe Biden's America. A few hours ago, I, I heard the Vice President say, Vice President Biden, I heard him say, he thought President Trump was rooting for more violence. How, how does more violence help the president politically? But that's not my, that's not my deal, to figure out his political strategy. But, but, I, but I will say this about the Republican convention some of which I have watched. I have yet to see these people who profess to be national leaders speak about this issue of the killing of unarmed black men, brown men, indigenous men in our country. At this week's RNC, um, one of the things that's, that has struck me uh, compared to RNC's past, there seems to be a, 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 a larger number of black men front and center. It would seem as if Republicans perhaps see an opportunity here uh, that Democrats don't see. There's been a lot of talk about women of color. Black men, what, what is the case for, for them to show up in a few weeks for you and Mr. Biden? First of all, every vote needs to be earned. And Joe and I believe that. So when we look at the condition of black men in America, we know we still have a whole lot of work to do. We have talked about it in, the, in regard to policing and the criminal justice system, but let's talk about the, the realities of, of the fact that every man, including every black man, wants to be able to take care of his family. The Biden-Harris plan is about investing in communities with a particular concern about the, those communities that have been long neglected to ensure that there will be economic opportunities. You devoted a fair amount of your speech to, um, to the virus. Yeah. And uh, you talked about the national mask mandate. That yeah. It sounds like that would be one of the first orders of business. Yes. How would you enforce that? It's really a, a, it's a standard. I mean, nobody's going to be punished. Come on. Uh, nobody likes to wear a mask. This is a universal feeling, right? So, so that's not the point. Hey, let's enjoy wearing masks. No, the point is this is what we, as responsible people who love our neighbor, 
We have to just do that right now. God willing, it won't be forever. One of the central tenets of your campaign seems to be this promise that there won't be as much chaos. Mm -hmm. how, how can you guarantee that? You know, there's an old saying, the fish rots from the head. Part of leadership is to set a tone for the country. We have on the one hand, Donald Trump who has been spending full time trying to sow hate and division in our country. On the other hand, you have Joe Biden, who has been all about saying we need to unify as a country, respect the dignity of our fellow human being. In this election, there are two clear choices. There are two. And which choice is reflective of who we aspire to be as a, as a country and as a people? Yeah, one of the criticisms, obviously, that uh, she's gotten along with the vice president is you've got the, the president and the vice president who have been out making trips to battleground states, doing small, uh, in some cases, larger in-person uh, events. Some have suggested they need to do that. So we, talk, we spent some time talking about that and why they haven't been doing that. We'll have that for you uh, coming up on the third hour. And I also asked her um, why she thinks that the president is scared when it comes to coronavirus. She said that in her speech yesterday. I asked her about that. And this idea that she's been labeled, some this week, some in, in, in the past, is radically liberal. These labels that folks have placed on her and, and Mr. Biden. We spent some time talking about that as well. Okay, so more ahead in the third hour yes. of today. All right, thank you. This morning, daylight revealing Laura's path of destruction. It looks like a bomb exploded. It does. All over the city, it looks like a bomb exploded. Roofs ripped off homes, trees uprooted. The deadly storm scarring coastal Louisiana. Windows broke out, walls came in. The Category 4 hurricane struck overnight, tearing through towns with winds topping 150 miles an hour, enough to flip trucks off the road. And in Lake Charles, where Laura's destructive eyewall wreaked havoc, the storm shred entire buildings in a few seconds. Whole skyscrapers going, not good. Oh no! A terrifying night for those who chose to stay behind. I'm thinking the apartment building is gonna fall on top of us because you can hear stuff knocking against the, the brick. Laura's devastating winds didn't just rip through building after building, but also took down vital communication, knocking out cell phone sites like this all across the city. For Chris Watson, the only call he needed was to friends to help him clean up. His home damaged, his car totaled. There's so much damage here. You, you're going, this is, this is a disaster area. You know, I mean, it's a literal disaster. I mean, the recovery time for Miss is going to be phenomenal. Yet despite the devastation, today brought the realization Laura could have been much worse, with most people here spared from any massive flooding. We're thankful we didn't get more storm surge than we did. In Texas, too, a sigh of relief. When you consider the magnitude of the damage that could have occurred here, we did dodge a bullet. Back in Louisiana, a night no one will soon forget. I'm just glad that we are all alive. That's it. And tonight, damage totals are still being calculated. But you can see the extent of the destruction behind me and realize just how long a road of recovery lays ahead for this community, determined to move on, even if it takes years to do so. We're joined now by FEMA Administrator Pete Gaynor on the relief efforts uh, going on there in the Gulf. Administrator Gaynor, good morning to you, sir. Morning. How are you guys doing? Doing okay. Doing well. Uh, and, and hope you guys down there are, are going to start doing a little bit better soon. Last hour, we talked to the mayor of, of Lake Charles, Louisiana. Uh, the mayor there urged residents who left town not to come back just yet. Said that it could be at least a week or, or even more before power's back on. Uh, no ETA on water being fully restored. What, what are you seeing? What are you hearing from your team on the ground? Yeah, uh, so uh, uh, you, the, the point that you made about uh, don't come back, I, I like that point. Uh, and and the, our message continues to be safety. So uh, if you're in a safe place, stay there. And if you're somewhere else and you want to go back, you know, heed the directions of your local uh, elected officials, emergency managers, you know, stay safe. Uh, what we see so far is... Uh, is uh, uh, Wind-driven damage to uh, structures and buildings. Uh, lots of power down. Lots of trees down. Uh, you know, so there's, there's going to be a, a process to open up access so we can get uh, restoration crews back in on the streets, get that power restored, and make it safe for people to return uh, when that time comes. 
And th this region is no stranger to hurricanes. I mean, Hurricanes Ike, Hurricanes Rita have hit the area. So what would you say damage from uh, Hurricane Laura looks like compared to those previous storms? Well, I, I don't like to, to compare damage. Uh, you know, every storm is unique. And uh, we are focused on Laura uh, recovery and response. And that's going to be our focus until uh, we get people back in their homes, safe, warm, and dry. Uh, you know, this, is, this, this storm is, is uh, unlike no other. Uh, Cat 4 uh, never came across uh, Louisiana uh, in, in known history. Uh, so, uh, again, our goal is safety, uh, removing debris, restoring power, and then, and again, making it safe for residents to return to their homes. Does it seem like, uh, Pete, does it seem like folks heeded those warnings and evacuated when, when they were asked to? Yeah, I think so. And uh, I think one of the, uh, the signs... Uh, and we're kind of surprised by it this morning is that uh, there's no we, we didn't do, use any federal assets for rescues uh, either before, during or, or since I was last week a couple of minutes ago, which is a pretty am amazing fact uh, when you consider uh, other uh, hurricanes and other uh, uh, hazards. Uh, so I, I'm really glad that people listened. They got out of harm's way. Uh, they kept themselves uh, safe and their family safe. I think that's a testament uh, to the leadership uh, of the governor and the leadership of mayors and elected leaders uh, down in Louisiana is keeping their residents safe. Uh, my hat's off to them. And, and three states have declared a state of emergency. Thousands of people are currently still without power. Residents have lost their homes. Uh, but FEMA has pre-positioned 500,000 meals and 800,000 liters of water on the ground. So can you just describe the plan to get all of that into the hands of people that need them? Yeah, so uh, it's a great question. And uh, Response works best when it's locally executed, uh, state managed, and fairly supported. Uh, you know, I grew up as a local emergency manager. I was a state emergency manager. I'm now the federal emergency manager. You know, when all those things work together, uh, it, it works. Uh, it works uh, like a symphony uh, most times. And so we're providing all those resources. So whether it's food, water, uh, generators, uh, blue tarps for roofs, uh, we'll supply those through the state, and the state will disperse those to the locals uh, that need them most. And that's the way the, the, the system works. So we have plenty of resources uh, on the ground, just not commodities, but people, uh, specialized teams, communications teams, urban search and rescue teams. Uh, there's lots of resources down there to meet the needs of the state uh, and the locals that uh, need it today. Administrator Pete Gaynor, thank you so much, and good luck to the crews that are out there. I know it's, it's a, a daunting task and a lot of work ahead of, ahead of you guys. So thanks for taking the time to talk to us. Thank you. Yeah, My pleasure. I mean, between the, the storms down, down in the Gulf and the, obviously we're in the middle of a pandemic, wildfires out, right. rest, out west, FEMA has uh, really stepped up over the last few months. National Guard troops from Arizona, Michigan, and Alabama are headed to Kenosha, Wisconsin. We are not federalized. Uh, we're on state active duty. Where, amid a night of peaceful protests, authorities have been cracking down to avoid the violence earlier in the week. Get the this video shows Kenosha police and U.S. Marshals forcibly arresting people in a minivan, breaking its window. Authorities say they found helmets, gas masks, and illegal fireworks. We are, are doing our best to keep it a safe environment. There's still outrage over the lack of charges against the police officer who shot Jacob Blake seven times in the back. The protests making their way to pro sports where athletes are taking a stand and refusing to play. NBA players expected to be back on the court this weekend after Wednesday's boycott. In Major League Baseball, New York Mets and Miami Marlins players walking off the field on Thursday. The Mets and Marlins will not be playing baseball tonight. State investigators say Blake had a knife in his car. Wisconsin's attorney general, who's leading the investigation, says the officers had tried to taser and arrest Blake after responding to a domestic incident. The attorney for Blake's family argues that Kyle Rittenhouse, the white teenager now charged with the murder of two protesters, was seen in this video walking by police after the gunfire before being arrested hours later. They let him literally go home. So that tells you a black man who is making no threat to the police, walking away from them, is shot seven times in the back. A white man kills two people and walks by the police and is not shot and not killed. There are two justice systems in America. Overnight, Rittenhouse's attorney told NBC News this was classic self-defense and we are going to prove it. We will obtain justice for Kyle no matter how hard the fight or how long it takes. 
on the anniversary of Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech. Later today, Jacob Blake's family plans to attend the 2020 March on Washington, calling for social justice and police reform. Craig. And Gabe Gutierrez for us there in Wisconsin. Gabe, thank you. There We are tired. We are tired of being beaten by policemen. We're tired of seeing our people locked up in jail over and over again. And then you holler, be patient. How long can we be patient? We want our freedom and we want it now. That was a 23-year-old John Lewis speaking at the March on Washington 57 years ago this morning. His poignant voice breaking through then as it would for decades. Joined now by Pulitzer Prize winning historian John Meacham. Mr. Meacham examines John Lewis's voice, his story, and his impact in his new book, His Truth is Marching On, John Lewis and the Power of Hope. It is out this week. Good to have you, Mr. Meacham. Good to see you, John. Thanks, Craig. I, I started the book this week, and you, you make a, a, a fairly bold assertion early on in the book. And it's this idea that John Lewis belongs in the pantheon right next to George Washington, right next to Tom Thomas Jefferson. Why? How so? Because our founders in the late 18th century articulated ideals of what America should be, and John Lewis and Martin Luther King and Rosa Parks made those ideals real. They forced the nation to actually live up to the promise of the country that all were created equal. And until 60 years ago, we were living under functional apartheid in this country. And it was this young man from Troy, Alabama, segregated Troy, Alabama, never saw a white person really except for the mailman until he was uh, almost uh, 18 years old. He revolted, his soul revolted against segregation, against the white only signs, the colored only signs. And he believed in what he heard in church. He believed that you should love your neighbor as yourself and that that meant a full and fair and free country. And he was willing again and again and again to put his body on the line. He was willing to bleed and die for an ideal of America that we're still working to bring into action. John, the, the book itself, how, how did it come about and how involved was John Lewis in, in the writing of this book? Uh, very much so. Uh, I met him 28 years ago when I was a young reporter. Uh, I was honored to know him uh, through those decades. We talked fairly frequently. Uh, I saved all my notes. Uh, I always knew I'd write about him, but I thought I had another decade or so. Uh, and then late last year, of course, he was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. Cancer did what uh, the white state troopers of the segregated South could not do. Hmm. And uh, I was standing on the bridge in Selma, the Pettus Bridge, with my family and about a thousand other people in early March of this year at the commemoration of that moment at Bloody Sunday uh, when uh, John Lewis led the nonviolent marchers into the teeth of white authority simply for the right to vote, which was promised in the Constitution. And I was listening to him and realized that his vision of love, his vision that if you and I did the right thing, if our hearts and minds were oriented in the right way, we could make this a better country. We could bring the gospel into reality. And I was listening to him and I thought, this is the story that we must tell in this moment of such dispiritedness, such uh, controversy, such division in the country. John Lewis's story inspires and illuminates. And so we spent uh, about six weeks on the phone together because of the pandemic. And uh, I wrote this because I believe that the role of faith and the role of courage that he exemplified are the ways we have to focus if we want to make this a more beloved community. Was, was the late congressman able to, to read it before he slipped away from us? 
Yes, thanks for asking that. Yes, he was. And it, I must say I was in, it relieved uh, enormously uh, that he liked it. Uh, he was very generous about it. Uh, it's very daunting, as you might imagine, to send uh, an American saint and an American icon uh, your own version of what his life is. Uh, but he also wrote an afterword for the book, which is really his last testament. So his final words to the country are in this book. And what's so amazing is how hopeful he was, even amid the police violence of, of this hour, even amid the divisions and the uh, unhappiness of this hour. He believed that we could make progress. And what he would say is, and he says this in the book, is if you don't think America can change, come walk in my shoes. <laughs> but if we want it to change, we need to follow the way of Lewis. John Meacham, uh, again, I've, I've just started the book, but for folks who thought they knew John Lewis, it is uh, still quite revealing. It's called His Truth is Marching On. It's out now. Uh, John Meacham, thank you. Thousands are expected to gather today for the Get Your Knee Off Our Next Commitment March, which also falls on the 57th, an 57th anniversary of the March on Washington. Uh, this is also the date when a 14-year-old black teenager named Emmett Till became a, a sobering part of American history. He was tortured and lynched by white men. Deborah Watts, co-founder of the Emmett Till Legacy Foundation, she was a toddler then, but she now works to honor her cousin's memory while seeking justice for the crime. I talked to her about what that means for her family and how Emmett Till's death still resonates today. It was one of those significant moments that moved the country in an, an emotional level and then also the consciousness of the country. I think it woke people up. In August 1955, Emmett Till left his Chicago home bound for the Deep South. For those who are not familiar with the story of Emmett Till, paint the picture for us. A 14-year-old, vibrant, intelligent young man wanted to travel to visit relatives in Mississippi with his great uncle. He happened to visit a, a store, the Bryant Grocery and Meat Market, with other cousins and was purchasing items. When leaving, Deborah Watts says a pivotal event happened involving the store clerk. He whistled at Carolyn Bryant, and that was a forbidden uh, rule. Then on August 28th, Till was kidnapped in the middle of the night. They beat him, they lynched him, they shot him, they also uh, took a 75-pound cotton gin fan and with barbed wire tied it around his neck and eventually threw him into the Tallahatchie River. When his body was recovered, his mother, Mimi Till Mobley, decided on a four-day memorial. One of the things that's always struck me about the Emma Till story, Deborah, is, is the fact that his mother insisted that that casket be opened so people could see her son. Why was that so important? This was a horrific act that happened to her son. But she also knew that there were other attacks upon other black men and women in our country. And she knew that it was wrong. And the only way to demonstrate to our country for any kind of a change to occur would be to show his body untouched, uh, to show what hate looked like, what evil looked like. In September 1955, an all-white jury acquitted the men identified as his abductors, Carolyn's then-husband and brother-in-law, who both since died. Two years ago, the investigation was reportedly reopened after this 2017 Vanity Fair article and subsequent book on Emmett Till's murder claimed that Carolyn Bryant had recanted testimony that Till also made advances toward her. Carolyn Bryant's family maintains she never recanted. What would justice look like in, in 2020 for your family? Justice looks like for us truth. We want Carolyn Bryant to be held accountable for her role in Emmett's kidnapping and his murder. Uh, so we want charges brought against Carolyn Bryant, and we are currently pursuing it with a petition asking for the Department of Justice, the Attorney General in Mississippi, and the DA in Mississippi to bring charges. This is 65 years we've been waiting for justice for him. How is the story of your cousin connected to um, Ahmaud Arbery, 
Breonna Taylor, Sandra Bland, Trayvon Martin, you're in Minneapolis, George Floyd. What's the through line? It's a bold, thick line that connects um, with the injustices that have occurred. I think that the hatred and the racism has not gone away. And I know that there were other cases well before Emmett's, but I think it inspired a movement, if you will, just as George Floyd's murder has inspired a movement. I think it's upon us and our responsibility to make sure that we connect the past to the present and future so we understand. On this, the 65th anniversary of Emmett Till's death, how, how should Americans remember your cousin? We all have a responsibility to right the wrongs so that there are no more Emmett Tills. Emmett is, is representative of, of youth, of vibrancy, of hope, of our dreams, of uh, our humanity. I hope that we can pledge to uh, be accountable to each other and to have a covenant with each other that we will not allow that kind of racism to creep into our reality. And his mother, Mamie Till Mobley, spoke up for justice until her death in 2003. But the, the Emmett Till Legacy Foundation continues to pick up that mantle. Planned events for this weekend include a vigil uh, and the March for Peace. We did reach out to the Department of Justice. They have no comment at this time. Also, no word back from the Mississippi Attorney General. And the spokesperson for Carolyn Bryant's family said there's no evidence to support charging her in the case. The FBI now investigating the police shooting of Jacob Blake in Kenosha, Wisconsin. The Wisconsin Attorney General identifying Rustin Shesky, a seven-year veteran of the Kenosha Police Department, as the officer who shot Blake. Meanwhile, a 17-year-old from Illinois is in custody in connection with a double fatal shooting at the protests on Tuesday. NBC News correspondent Shaq Brewster joins me now. He has been in Kenosha all week long. Shaq, let's start with the Jacob Blake shooting. What more do you know about the shooting itself and the officer who fired the shots into Blake's back. Well, Allison, you mentioned some of the more recent information that we learned, that the officer was a seven-year veteran, Mr. Rustin Chesky. And we also know a little bit more of the timeline and the circumstances surrounding what exactly happened on that Sunday evening. Officers say that they uh, reply or they were responding to a call from a woman who said her boyfriend was uh, at the location and wasn't supposed to be there. They're not saying whether or not that person is Mr. Blake. They're just saying that was the call that they were responding to. And they say when they got on scene, they encountered Mr. Blake, they tried to arrest him, and they unsuccessfully tased him. In that interaction at some point, they say that Mr. Blake admitted to them that he had a knife in his possession. They do not say whether or not they saw that knife or whether or not uh, they knew where that knife exactly was. But then they say after the officer shot Mr. Blake seven times in the back, they do confirm that they did recover. Investigators recovered a knife in the, uh, from the floorboard of the driver's side of that vehicle. So we now know more information than we have known since this all began. We had that statement that came out on Sunday evening after the shooting, but now we're starting to get a fuller picture of exactly what happened and what uh, occurred at that shooting. Uh, Allison, while I have you on this topic, I want to bring up a, a new statement or a new tweet that we just heard uh, from Andrew Yang. And the reason why I'm doing that, I know that might sound a little bit confusing, but the reason why I'm reading this tweet is because he says he just spoke to Jacob Blake Sr., the father of Mr. Blake, who's in the hospital right now. And, Ms. and Mr. Yang says his son is conscious. He says his first question after he woke up was, quote, Daddy, why did they shoot me so many times? Andrew Yang continues to write on Twitter that he wept to his father. He has restraints on, even though he can't move his legs. So it sounds like, according to Mr. Yang, who says he spoke to Jacob Blake's father, uh, Mr. Blake is conscious right now. He does have handcuffs uh, as he's in that hospital bed. And that's the latest from we know, or the latest we know about his condition at this point. Allison? Shaq, let me ask you as well about the teen in custody for Tuesday's shooting. He was from Illinois. What do we know about why he was in Kenosha? Yeah, yeah 17 year old Kyle Rittenclip and, uh, Kyle, excuse me, I messed up. <laughs> Kyle Rittenhouse, 17 years old. He's from Antioch, Illinois, which is about 30 minutes away from where we are right now in Kenosha. And 
Right now, we know he's in custody. He's in Illinois custody. At some point, they want to bring him from Illinois to Wisconsin. We will see him in court, at least virtually tomorrow at some point. Uh, it seems like it'll be about tomorrow morning, and it'll be via Zoom or some other form like that. We'll, we'll see him in court. But what we did find overnight, uh, he was actually interviewed on Tuesday night. Tuesday night is when he was accused of shooting and killing two protesters, one 26-year-old man, the other was 36 years old. And ahead of that shooting, he was interviewed by The Daily Caller, an online publication. Listen to a chunk of that interview where he explains why he was here in Kenosha. Our job is to protect this business, and part of my job is to also help people. If there's somebody hurt, I'm running into harm's way. That's why I have my rifle, because I protect myself, obviously. But I also have my med kit. Right now, he's charged with intentional homicide, but the district attorney suggested in a press conference yesterday that there may be some updated charges that may come from it. But we do know he is in custody right now, and he, we can expect to see him in court tomorrow morning. Allison? Shaq, last night, Vice President Pence referenced Kenosha at the RNC, but he did not mention Jacob Blake's shooting. Uh, how's that going over in Kenosha today? Right. Well, I'll tell you, Allison, it, it, it's not something that many people here are focused on right now. I know you see behind me, people are painting up these murals yeah. that, that are going on. You see there's, uh, there's plywood all over the city that we saw all downtown after that first night of violence. People started to protect their businesses. And you see some people still painting, and this is something that goes on block by block. We're at a different location than we were when I spoke to you even just two hours ago. But what people have been telling me is this is where they want their focus to be on. They want their focus to be on healing the community, on bringing people together. Together, They still see that video and they still understand there's outrage over the shooting of Mr. Jacob Blake, but they want people to come together and do so peacefully. One thing to also note about what we've been hearing, yes, Vice President Pence, he did not mention Jacob Blake by name, but listed Kenosha as one of the cities where he's calling on the violence to end. Well, President Trump also has done something similar referenced Kenosha and the violence and saying that he's sending federal officials. Uh, the governor of Wisconsin disputes that, but he says he's sending uh, federal officials. But President Trump also never mentioning Mr. Blake by name. That is in stark contrast. And I know you were just talking to Ali Vitale about that, about what you're hearing from the Biden-Harris campaign. Vice President Biden uh, inst or almost immediately put out a statement. We heard uh, Senator Kamala Harris today talk about how she felt viewing that, that tape and that video that came out on Sunday afternoon or Sunday evening. So you're seeing a dramatic uh, a divide between how different people and different leaders are responding to this crisis. Last point I'll make for you is here in Kenosha, this is a swing county. As we look ahead to November 2020 in the general election, this is a county that pres uh, President Obama won twice in 2008 and 2012. And then President Trump flipped it by about 250 votes in 2016. Should I really this? Okay. Some of you may remember that two years at the March for Our Lives, I said, spread the word. Have you heard? All across the nation, we are going to be a great generation. That was in 2018. I didn't know what would hit us in 2020. A pandemic that shut our schools and put our young lives on hold. More killings of un unarmed black people by police. Attacks on our right to vote. More killing, oh wait. The worst economic crisis since the Great Depression that we learned about in school. And more extreme weather than ever before. But great challenges produce great leaders. We have mastered the selfie and TikToks. Now we must master ourselves. Less than a year before he was assassinated, my grandfather predicted this very moment. He said that we were moving into a new phase of the struggle. The first phase was the civil rights, and the new phase is genuine equality. Genuine equality is why we are here today and why people are coming together all across the world.
road from New Zealand to New Jersey. He said that we must not forget the days of, the, of Montgomery. We must not forget the sit-ins movement. We must not forget the Freedom Rides, the Birmingham movement, and Selma. Papa King, we won't! My generation has already taken to the streets peacefully and with masks and socially distanced to protest racism. And I want to ask the young people here to join me in pledging that we have only just begun to fight and that we will be the generation that moves from me to we. We are going to be the generation that dismantles systemic racism once and for all, now and forever. We are going to be the generation that calls a halt to police brutality and gun violence once and for all, now and forever. We are going to be the generation that reserves climate change and saves our planet once and for all, now and forever. And we are going to be the generation that ends poverty here in America, the wealthiest nation on earth, once and for all, now and forever. We are the great dreams of our grandparents, great-grandparents, and all our ancestors. We stand and march for love, and we will fulfill my grandfather's dream. So, show me what democracy looks like. This is what democracy looks like. A proud dad. Let me thank God that we've been able to assemble today and to thank Reverend Sharpton and the National Action Network and all of the conveners that actually are here today and most of all these families that have been impacted by police brutality and misconduct. So we've come to bear witness, to remain awake, to remember from where we've come and to carefully consider where we're going. Whether you are here in person, online, or watching on MSNBC and other networks, thank you for joining us for this March on Washington. Together, we are taking a stand and we're taking a giant step forward. Let me also thank Al Green for the very, very warm introduction, my dear friend. But we're taking a step forward on America's rocky but righteous journey towards justice. August 28th is a day to remember the triumphs and tragedies that have taken place in our historic struggle for racial justice. Today, we commemorate the March on Washington to jobs and freedom in 1963, where my father declared his dream. But we must never forget the American nightmare of racist violence exemplified when Emmett Till was murdered on this day in 1955, and the criminal justice system failed to convict his killers. 65 years later, we still struggle for justice, demilitarizing the police, dismantling mass incarceration, and declaring and determinately as we can that black lives matter. In our struggle for justice, there are no permanent victories. For on this day, 12 years ago, I was honored to address the Democratic National Convention in Denver. And on that night, on that evening in the Bow High City, our spirits were soaring as the Democrats nominated Barack Obama, who would go on to become the first African-American president of these United States. 
But the progress we celebrated then is imperiled yet again. And now we must march to the ballot box and the mailboxes to defend the freedoms that earlier generations worked so hard to win. In so many ways, we stand together today in the symbolic shadow of history. But we are making history together right now. We're marching with the largest and most active multi-generational, multi-racial movement for civil rights since the 1960s. From high school students to senior citizens, black as well as white, Latino, Asian American, Native American, Pacific Islanders, Americans are marching together, many for the first time, and we're demanding real, lasting, structural change. We are marching together for time-honored goals and in timely ways. We are courageous, but conscious of our health. We are socially distant, but spiritually united. We are making, masking our faces, but not our faith in freedom. And we are taking our struggle to the streets and to social media. The nation has never seen such a mighty movement, a modern day incarnation of what my father called the coalition of conscience. And if we move forward with purpose and passion, we will complete the work so boldly began in the 1960s. We're marching to overcome what my father called were the triple evils of poverty, racism, and violence. And today, those evils have exacerbated four major challenges that currently face our country. First, COVID-19 tragically has killed more than 175,000 Americans, disproportionately African-American, and Latino and low-income people in every background. Second, more than 30 million Americans are unemployed again, disproportionately people of color. COVID-19 has laid bare the structural and racial inequalities in our economy that kept too many people trapped in the debt and poverty. Third, police brutality and gun violence are killing so many unarmed African Americans. Today, we march with their families and we say their names. George Floyd, Boham Jean, Breonna Taylor, Eric Garner, Michael Brown, Tamir Rice, Yusef Richardson, Terrence Crutcher, Trayvon Martin, Ahmad Aubrey, uh, Elijah McClain, and so many of us. And fourth, our voting rights are under attack. We must vigorously defend our right to vote because those rights were paid for with the blood of those lynched for seeking to exercise their constitutional rights. They were paid for with the blood of civil rights workers, such as Sammy Young, Jr., Goodman, Swerney, and Cheney, Jimmy Lee Jackson, Viola Luizzo, James Reed. Those rights were paid for through the sacrifices made by heroes such as C.T. Vivian, Fannie Lou Hamer, Hosea Williams, and John Lewis. But since the United States Senate has failed to renew the Voting Rights Act, we have had to overcome a whole new trick bags of tactics to suppress our votes. Discriminatory voter ID requirements, cutbacks in early voting and vote by mail, voter purges targeting those who have missed several elections, and disenfranchising those who have served their time and paid their debt to the society. And now COVID-19 is making it dangerous, even deadly, to stand in line at polling places. We shouldn't have to risk our lives to cast our votes. We need to be able to do what President Trump does, vote safely by mail. But now we are struggling to overcome the dismantling of the U.S. Postal Service for the express purpose of suppressing our vote. With all these threats to our lives and liberties, our challenge is to use this moment to expand this movement, a movement that not only raises its voice, but casts its votes, pursues its vision, and makes lasting change. The scripture says, where there is no vision, the people perish. 
Our vision is best expressed, expressed by a phrase we must never forget. That is the beloved community. With those words, my father, John Lewis, Ella Baker, Rosa Parks, and so many other historic women and men envision an America whose dramatic practice is as good as its promise. An America where the triple evils of poverty, racism, and violence will be replaced by peace, justice, and shared abundance. And where hate and fear finally give way to help and love. To achieve that America, we need to raise our voices and cast our votes. Over the weeks ahead, culminating on Election Day, we need to vote as if our lives and our livelihoods, our liberties depend on it, because they do. No person, no people are more keenly aware of the risk of disenfranchisement than those who have suffered from it. There is a knee upon the neck of democracy, and our nation can only live so long without the oxygen of freedom. The strength must be exercised by more than rhetoric and more than marching. The simple challenge before us is that everyone can cast a ballot, and everyone who can must cast a ballot. And that ballot that is cast must be counted, and the result must, must be transparent and known to the whole world. And so today, I can call on everyone with the means to drive people to the polls, to make a plan for yourself, for your family and your neighbor, for those organizations and companies that care about democracy. I call on you today to offer your resources and your capacity to make sure every ballot is to count it. If our forefathers were willing to die for the right to vote, we can work for the right to vote. And I will continue to call on you to act in the coming days. You know, my father was assassinated in Memphis, Tennessee, while standing in solidarity with poor working people, sanitation workers, whose slogans, I am a man, was a statement that they were human beings with rights that should be respected and acknowledged. They were asking for safe working conditions, for a living wage, for recognition of their union, and for human dignity. They summed up their struggle with those four words, I am a man. That simple but powerful slogan impairs movements today from Black Lives Matter to fight for 15 and to the Me Too struggle against sexual harassment and abuse. Movements of marginalized Americans are still trying to claim the dignity they've been denied. Martin Luther King Jr. fought for the dignity of work, and that fight is never ending. In 1963, the March on Washington demanded jobs and freedoms. In 1968, the Memphis sanitation strike workers and that demanded and the Poor People's Campaign insisted that working people should not live and labor in poverty. Those fights foreshadowed our struggle today to make the minimum wage a living wage, not a poverty wage. And we are fighting alongside the frontline workers, sanitation workers, healthcare workers, grocery workers, transport workers, food service workers, and so many more. They are praised for being essential, but they are treated as if they're expendable. While standing with sanitation workers in Memphis, Dad said, so often we overlook the work and the significance of those who are not in professional jobs, of those who are not in the so-called big jobs. But let me say to you tonight that wherever you are or whenever you are engaged in work that serves humanity and is for the building of humanity, it has dignity and worth. Now we have a president who confesses greatness with grandiosity. But my father knew better. Everyone, he said, can be great because everyone can serve. He understood the human yearning for recognition. And in his famous speech, he explained that everyone wants to be a drum major, the leader of the marching band. And he challenged us to channel our drum major instinct into becoming drum majors for justice. While we honor our history, we must be living a living movement, not a monument. If dad were here today, I'm sure he would implore us not to deify him or selectively quote him when convenient. He would want us to be drama majors for justice, to champion the ideals he promoted, racial justice, social equality, and peace. And he would gently but intently challenge us not to dwell upon the past, 
but to live and labor in what he called the fierce urgency of now. So if you're looking for a savior, get up and find a mirror. We must become the heroes of the history we are making. And us means all of us. In 1963, after my father spoke, Bayard Rustin, the architect of the march, asked the participants to join and demanded that Congress pass strong civil rights and voting rights laws. More than half a century later, we must demand that the United States Senate stop blocking passage of the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act and the John Lewis Voting Rights Restoration Act. And so when we conclude today, let's remember that it Remember that it, this is the commitment march in the spirit of 1963. I ask you to join me in pledging to act in three ways. First, because our civil and human rights are at stake in this election, I ask you not only to register and vote, but make sure that at least one other person registers and votes. Second, I ask you to commit to service and struggle in your community, from voter registration to raising the minimum wage to demilitarizing the police. Get involved with one or more of many worthwhile struggles in your community. And third, I ask you to pledge, as my father and John Lewis did, to get into good trouble and do it nonviolently. Remember that in the fight against injustice, nonviolence doesn't mean passive acceptance. It means peaceful resistance. We must come together and join with the Black Lives Movement to raise our voices and say enough is enough. We must come with the Poor People's Campaign, the Climate Change and Environmental Justice Movement, the Women's March and Me Too Movement, the Parkland Students and March for Our, no a March for our Lives, and say enough is enough. Martin Luther King Jr. famously said that the moral arc of the universe is long but bends toward justice. But he was also the first to say that it doesn't bend on, it on its own. We must do some work ourselves. In the final year of his life, he wrote in his last book, Where do we go from here, chaos or community? Well, my sisters and brothers and dear friends, in this defining moment for our history and our country, we must answer Dr. King's question. Will our answer be chaos or community? I believe some have chosen the answer with chaos, including the current occupant in the White House today. But we who believe must choose community, because if we choose community, we can avoid watching the dream turn into a permanent nightmare. If we choose community, 50 years from now, people will say that we were able to redeem the soul of America and begin to fulfill the promise of democracy by systematically eliminating systematic racism and exploitation. My friends, if we choose community, we will be able to answer in the affirmative to the scripture. Here comes that dreamer. Come, let's slay him, and we shall see what will become of his dream. Finally, this afternoon, I want to say to you, not only do I come as a protester, but I come as a victim. My daddy was killed when I was 10 years old. Gunned down, you know that, by assassin's bullet. Some of you know, but may not know. Six years later, my daddy's mother, my grandmother was gunned down in the church while playing the Lord's Prayer. So I understand what it means to lose a loved one. But I'm so thankful that my grandfather and my mother and my aunts and uncles taught me about love because granddaddy used to say, I refuse to allow any person to reduce me to hatred. The man that killed my lovely wife and the man that killed my son, I refuse to allow them even to reduce me to hatred. I love everybody, I'm every man's brother. If we're gonna resolve these issues in America, we've gotta come together. Dad talked about it in that sermon, Levels of Love. He talked about all of them. I'm only going to talk about the highest level of love. That love that seeks nothing in return. That love that is totally unselfish. You love someone if they're young, you love them if they're old. You love them if they're black, you love them if they're white. 
You love them if they're Native American. You love them if they're Hispanic or Latino American. You love them if they're African. You love them if they're Asian. You love them because you know that God calls you to do that. And if we're going to resolve all of these conflicts and crises in America, we got to find a way to do it in love. Thank you and God bless you. And let's keep on keeping on. Hello, 57th March on Washington. I'm Joy Ann Reed from MSNBC, and I wish that I could be there with you today as Reverend Al Sharpton is my colleague, my friend, my off-the-record pastor, and my big brother. I arrived in East Flatbush, Brooklyn, New York in 1986 at age 18, having left when I was two. It was an era when Black Lives Matter meant Michael Griffiths, Yusuf Hawkins, Sean Bell, Amadou Diallo, Patrick Dorisman, and Gavin Cato. It meant the Central Park Five and the replacement of New York City's first black mayor, David Dinkins, with Giuliani time. A stay away if you're black Bensonhurst and Howard Beach and Reverend Al Sharpton, who was the only one who seemed to know what to do and who cared enough to do it. A generation earlier, it was Jesse Jackson, and before him, Dr. King. But for my generation, it was Reverend Al. Little did I know that many years later, I would get to know Rev as a local producer and host on Radio One, when he was our big national host, and that he would become my colleague at MSNBC and a great mentor, supporter, and friend. Meanwhile, the National Action Network has never stopped working, even as the names have changed to Trayvon Martin, Michael Brown, Eric Garner, Sandra Bland, Tamir Rice, Freddie Gray, George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and Jacob Blake. I marched with Rev in Selma when he pulled me to the front of the line so that I could be there to witness history and John Lewis's second to last public appearance. And I've watched him nurture grieving families as they cry out for justice. He has marched on presidents and had presidents confide in him. He has inspired me to use my gifts to make real change. And he has been our backstop and our defender in dark times. We know that when we call him, he will be there and he will do something and cause something to be done. 57th anniversary march on Washington. Please join me in saluting our defender and my big brother, Reverend Al Sharpton. No justice, no justice, no justice, no justice. What do we want? What do we want? What do we want? When do we want it? 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 All right. 57 years ago, in 1963, there was a struggle in Birmingham, Alabama. There was the assassination of Medgar Evers, the head of the Mississippi NAACP, in the middle of struggle and murder, they came to Washington to demand that the federal government give them a Civil Rights Act and voting rights. They marched that day in a hot, blistering day like today, saying that as we struggle, we need legislation. And they stayed on that movement until they got the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Voting Rights Act of 1965. They came young and old. They came from the South. Many of them couldn't stop on the road to use a bathroom because it was against the law, but they came anyhow. Many of them couldn't stop and eat in a restaurant. They had to put their sandwiches in a paper bag because no restaurant would serve them because it was against the law, but they came anyhow. 
Many of them couldn't rest in a motel overnight, but they came anyway because it was against the law for them to stop. Because they came in 63, we were able to come back in 2020, riding whatever we wanted to ride, stay in whatever hotels was available. They opened the door for us, but there's still some doors we have to open and some people we've got to straighten out. 2020. Twenty twenty, we must deal with those that want to rob our right to vote. And even though we are here in the midst of a pandemic, socially distancing, telling y'all to distance, and I'm keep saying spread out. We want to come to show with our bodies that enough is enough. When I was headed to George Floyd's funeral, I talked with Martin III, and I said, you know, maybe we need to go back to Washington. He said, well, let's talk it out, Reverend Al. As I was giving the eulogy, I announced this march. We didn't know how we were gonna do it, how we were going to plan it, how many would come, but we did it. Why are we in Washington? I talked with one of the leading minds of our nation, Dr. Michael Eric Dyson, and he told me that, Reverend Al, you got to understand that until there's federal legislation, every state will do what it wants to do. We have passed in the House of Representatives the George Floyd Policing and Justice Act. Now we need to pass that act in the Senate. We need Mitch McConnell and the U.S. Senate to meet on the George Floyd Policing and Justice Act are we going to meet you senators at the poll in November 3rd, whether we got the mail in, walk in, ride in, crawl in, we want our bill passed. Several weeks ago, John Lewis, an outstanding congressman, made his transition. Last time Martin and I were here, he was with us, John Lewis. He and Reverend Jose Williams and Amelia Boykin were beaten on the Edmund Pettus Bridge, tear gas, that led to the Selma to Montgomery March that got us to right the vote. And that right lasted till 2000. And 13, when they took and gutted out the middle of that bill, taking away the map. When well, we come to Washington saying, how do you memorialize John Lewis and allow the bill that he stood for us to die? We want the John Lewis voting rights bill for the Congress. So we didn't just come today to have a show. Demonstration without legislation would not lead to change. We didn't come out and stand in this heat because we didn't have nothing to do. We come to let you know if we will come out by these numbers in the heat and stand in the heat that we will stand in the polls all day long. They keep telling me about how it's a shame 
that black parents have to have the conversation with our children. How we have to explain if a cop stops you. Don't reach for the glove compartment. Don't talk back. The conversation. Well, we've had the conversation for decades. It's time we have a conversation with America. We need to have a conversation about your racism, about your bigotry, about your hate, about how you would put your knee on our neck while we cry for our lives. We need a new conversation. Oh, we didn't come to start trouble, we came to stop trouble. You act like it's no trouble to shoot us in the back. You act like it's no trouble to put a chokehold on us. We scream, I can't breathe 11 times. You act like it's no trouble to hold a man down on the ground until you squeeze the life out of him. It's time for a new conversation. I wondered why, I asked Dr. Dice, why did they have the march at Lincoln's Memorial? Why didn't they go to the Jefferson Memorial? Why didn't they go to the Washington Monument? And he told me, you gotta understand, Reverend Al, 100 years before 63, 1963, was 1863. 1863, Abraham Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation. He promised us full citizenship if we fought to save the Union. He promised us 40 acres and a mule. We never got the full citizenship. We never got the reparations. We come to Lincoln because you promised, Mr. Lincoln, and the promise has been broken. And we come like Dr. King came 57 years ago to say we are tired of broken promises. Tell it. Tell it. Tell it. Tell it. Some say to me, Reverend Al, y'all ought to denounce those that get violent, those that are looting. All of the families have denounced looting. What we haven't heard is you denounce shooting. We will speak against the looting, but when will you speak against wrong police shooting? I remember Reverend Dr. Wyatt T. Walker sat Reverend W. Franklin Richardson who spoke today and sat us down and said that after the Montgomery boycott and they had gone to Albany, Georgia and the movement stalled because in Albany they treated them with a certain kindness. And they said they wanted to find someone that would demonstrate the raw disregard for rights. And as they did, they went all over the South. And Reverend Fred Shuttlesworth told them to come to Birmingham because there was a police chief there named Bull Connor. And Bull Connor would act in an insensitive and brutal way. Well, in 1963 and 1964, they fought Bull Connor. Here we are in 2020. We've gone from Bull Connor to Bull Trump. We've gone from a mean-spirited sheriff to a mean-spirited president whose lips drink 
with the words of interposition and nullification. We do not want to be disrespected. How do you speak while this young man, Jacob, lies in a hospital and you won't call his name? How do you sit while Breonna Taylor is in a grave and you won't call her name? How do you sit while Eric Garner is in a grave and you won't call his name? How do you sit while George Floyd is laying in a grave and you won't call his name? Well, Mr. Trump, look right down the block from the White House. We come to Washington by the thousands. We gonna call their name. We gonna call their name. We'll never let America forget what you done. Call their names. This is the time, this is the time for legislative change. This is the time for us to vote like we never voted before. And don't just vote for the top of the ticket. Vote all the way down. Go down from the top to the bottom. Vote all the way to the dog catcher. We want to get rid of anybody that's in our way because our parents died to give us the right to vote. You can mess with the mail, but it ain't the sacrifice that Goodman and Cheney and Swerner gave. Our vote is dipped in blood. Our vote is dipped in those that went to their grave. We don't care how long the line, we don't care what you do, we're going to vote not for one candidate or the other, but we're going to vote for a nation that'll stop the George Floyds, that'll stop the Breonna Taylors. They say when George Zimmerman was acquitted for the murder, when he was acquitted for the murder of Trayvon Martin. Three young genius sisters wrote the slogan, Black Lives Matter. And it resonated. Why did it resonate? Because too long, you acted like we didn't matter. They said, well, everybody matters, but everybody hasn't mattered the same in America. reason we had and still have to say Black Lives Matter is because we get less health care like we don't matter. Yes. We go to jail longer for the same crime like we don't matter. Right. Tell it. We get poverty, unemployment, double the others like we don't matter. We treat it with disrespect by policemen that we pay their salaries like we don't matter. So we figured we'd let you know whether we tall or short, fat or skinny, light skin or dark skin, black lives matter. And we won't stop until it matters to everybody. Let the sister, if she want to hold up her fist, leave her alone. Let me say, as we hear from some of the victims, and as we get ready to march over to the King Memorial, 1963, Dr. King 
talked about he had a dream. Today, we heard from his heir and his son, Martin Luther King III, his beautiful wife, Andrea, and his granddaughter, Yolanda. And they are in their bloodline, the children and grandchildren of the dreamer. But we come in the same spiritual lineage because I want this country to know that even with your brutality, you can't rob us of our dreams. Your bigotry can't rob us of our dreams because we've always had the dream beyond our circumstance. We always had the dream of being what we were not allowed to be. We are the dream keepers, which is why we come today black and white and all races and religions and, so, and sexual orientations to say this dream is still alive. You might have killed the dreamer, but you can't kill the dream because truth crushed the earth shall rise again. We gonna rise never to fall again. We gonna stand up even when our legs are tired. We gonna make this dream come true. Let me say this. Let me say this as we close. Shh. I want everybody to be orderly. Let me say this. We all should leave here committed to keeping this dream alive. I want everybody that went to the website of National Action Network Net, nationalactionnetwork.net, that wants to help us on election day be poll watchers to protect our vote. I want you that will be signing up. Early voting starts in two weeks. We on a nonpartisan way want to put people all over this country they want to suppress our vote. We've got to have foot soldiers that will protect the vote and that will be out there. And I want you to say to yourself that you could have been so much more. You had ideas and dreams, not only as a race, but as a person. But society had their knee on your neck. We could have developed and been as successful as others, but society had their knee on our neck. But we're not going to lay and submit no more. We're not going to take it. Some have different tactics, but we all are rising up. You're going to get your knee off our neck. If we got to march every day, if we got to vote every day, we will get your knee off our neck. Enough is enough, enough is enough, enough is enough. No justice, no justice, no justice, no justice. All right, I want to bring out, I want y'all to back up. I want y'all to bring to my left is the mother of Breonna Taylor. Where the other family? We got the other Where they at? We got Acevedo family. We got the We got the Blake family. Say her name. Say her name. Say her name. Say her name. Let us hear from Tamika, the mother of Brianna Taylor. Give me four. Hi, everybody. <laughs> First, I just want to um, 
thank everybody who's been uh, in support of getting justice for Breonna Taylor. Uh, second, I just want to, uh, I got to thank Louisville, Until Freedom, my family, and most importantly, Kenneth Walker for coming out here and continuing to say her name louder. Uh, what we need is change, and we're at a point where we can get that change, but we have to stand together. We have to vote. I'm good. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's right. Say her name. Say her name. Say her name. All right, wait a minute. Shh. I brought Mr. Lincoln all of the broken promises. We all stop when a man was killed with a knee on his neck, narrated his own death on videotape and didn't know they were recording. But his death has been the impetus of a global movement. I bring you his brother, the brother of George Floyd, Fiona Floyd. Get my sister Bridget, my attorney Tony Ramanucci, my wife Kita, my sister Tanya, my nephew Brandon. Your brother, your brother, your brother. Sarah. Okay. All right. Hey, I'm so overwhelmed right now with everybody's here right now. Man. Man, no, it's, it's okay. Hey, I, I wish George were here to see this right now. That's who I'm marching for. I'm marching for George, for Brianna, for Ahmad, for Jacob, for Pamela Turner, for Michael Brown. Trayvon, and anybody else who lost their lives are too evil. I got you. It's never been more clear than change right now. It's happening right now because we demand it. Everyone here has made a commitment because they wouldn't be here for no other reason right now. It's hot, and I know it's hot, but as of now, we here because we are being fried right now, man. All right. Man, Bridget, I'm trying. 
I'm, I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. I got it. I got it. As of now, everybody out here right now, our leaders, they need to follow us while we're marching to enact laws to protect us. Man, I, it's hard, man. It's really hard. I'm, I'm so sorry, man. My brother George, he's looking down right now. He's thankful for everything that everybody is doing right now. Y'all showing a lot of empathy and passion, and I'm enjoying every last bit of it right now. If it weren't for y'all, I don't know where I'd be right now because y'all are keeping me running. I have to advocate for everybody, man, because right now, Jacob Blake, I'm feeling, it's hard just to talk right now, shot seven times, man, with his kids. That's painful. I don't, I'm, I'm done, I'm done. I don't, I'm done my sister grab. I'm Bridget Floyd, George Floyd's sister. I want you guys to ask yourself right now, how would the history books remember you? What will be your legacy? Will your future generations remember you for your com complacency, your inaction? Or would they remember you for your empathy, your leadership, your passion for weeding out the injustices and evil in our world? You know, Martin Luther King stood here 57 years ago, and he told the world his dream. But I don't think y'all know that we're here right now and have the power to make it happen. I don't think y'all hear me. But we have to do it together. We have to do it together for our generations to come, our children. My brother cannot be a voice today. We have to be that voice. We have to be the change. And we have to be his legacy. Thank you from the Floyd family. Now, shh. wait a minute, y'all too close to each other. Y'all stretch your arms out and stretch out now. 
I know we outside and you got on a mask, but don't get that close. Y'all spread your arms and social distance. Y'all too tight up here. Few days ago, few days ago, okay. All right, go ahead. Go ahead. Father Quincy. I'll talk to Father Quincy. Yeah, go ahead, Father Quincy. Okay, go ahead, Quincy. Come on, sisters. Give a hand to Floyd family as we get ready. Please have one speaker. Shh. Now, Y'all are too loud. Why are you screaming? Now, a few days ago, I got a call and talked to a father whose son was shot in Kenosha, Wisconsin seven times in the back while he was running into his car. Policeman had the edge of his t-shirt. There was no weapon in his hand. There was no threat to the policeman. By law, a policeman should only use deadly force when they are on a life extenuating circumstance. What could have been the circumstance when a man's running away from you? What could have been the circumstance when a man is trying to get in his car? Now they say they may have found a knife in his car. Well, did they examine the police to see if they had x-ray vision to see through the car door? When he shot him, he didn't know what was in the car. What he knew was that a black man seems to be expendable. And we come to say we are no longer expendable. We are going to demand justice. His mother and father are both here. His mother got a little heat exhaustion and is sitting in the tent, but I bring you the father of this young man who we are all rallying for. This is Jacob's daddy who said to me, I'm going to fight for my son. I'm going to fight for justice. Let's welcome to the platform Jacob Senior. Hey, we need to make way. Jacob Blake, say his name, say his name, say his name, say his name. His, his sister's going to first speak for the mother who's here in the tent. America, unapologetically. I am here to tell you in front of the world that you got the right one. God has been prepared me. America, your reality is not real. Catering to your delusions is no longer an option. We will not pretend. We will not be your docile slave. We will not be a footstool to oppression. Most of all, we will not dress up this genocide and boo and call it police brutality. We will only pledge allegiance to the truth. Black America, 
I hold you accountable. You must stand, you must fight, but not with violence and chaos. With self-love, learn to love yourself, black people. Unify. Group economics. Black women, you are your brother's keeper. I know it's heavy, but forgive him and heal his manhood was taken from him a long time ago. Build him up. Black children, read, learn, grow, and live, and question everything. Black men, stand up. Stand up, black men. Educate yourself and protect the black family unit. Period. No justice. No justice. No justice. Jacob Blake. Jacob Blake. Jacob Blake. Jacob Blake. There are two systems of justice in the United States. There's a white system and there's a black system. The black system ain't doing so well. But we're gonna stand up. Every black person in the United States is gonna stand up. We're tired. I'm tired of looking at cameras and seeing these young black and brown people suffer. We're gonna hold court today. We're gonna hold court on systematic racism. It's going to, we're gonna have court right now. Guilty. Yeah. Guilty. 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 Racism against all of us. Guilty. 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 Racism against Trayvon Martin. We find him guilty. guilty. Racism against George Floyd. We find him guilty. guilty. Racism against Jacob Blake. Abdul Dawala. If I said the name wrong, Allah forgive me. Guilty. guilty. And we're not taking it anymore. I ask everyone to stand up. No justice! No, no justice! No I met this man when I was seven years old. How did I know I was going to meet this man again in these circumstances? I truly did not want to come and see y'all today for these reasons. My father was in town for the first march on D.C. I have a duty. I have a duty to support and understand each one. I love everybody in this crowd. I love you. If nobody told you today, Big Jake loves you. But we're going to stand up, baby. We're going to stand up together. I need your strength. Big Daddy's legs ain't that good anymore. I need your strength. No justice. No peace. No justice! No peace! I love y'all. I want to bring attorney V.I.V. Lamont, who represents these families. Then I want attorney Stewart to come, who represents others. There are many families here, and I think we should hear from a few more before we march to the King Memorial. Good afternoon, D.C. I'm attorney B. Ivory Lamar. I represent the Joel Acevedo family who was killed in the city of Milwaukee by an off-duty officer before George Floyd and was strangled for 10 minutes. 
I also represent the family of Jacob Blake, who was unhumanly just killed, se shot seven times, but he lives today. At this time, I want to just thank Reverend L. Sharpton and the National Action Network for having this event here today, because action is what we're here for. I'm going to tell you right now, we're tired of talking. We're tired of talking. We're tired of playing games. 2020 is the year that America is going to be put on timeout. We thank the Milwaukee Bucks. and all the NBA teams who sacrificed their game for this special cause. We thank the Major League Baseball, we thank all the actors, entertainers, celebrities across this country who utilize their platform for justice. Today, I just want to let you know, this is the last season of the police version of How to Get Away with Murder. We know your playbook. We know your plays. Step one, claim that you in fear. Find an object or an action and say that you in fear so that you can justify killing a black or brown person. Step two, assassinate that black or brown person. And then step three, you assassinate his character. Then after you get to step four, you delay your investigation. You, you exaggerate it. You got the video that takes 20 seconds to watch, but you take two, three, four, five, six months to say you're still investigating. And then when you call an uproar around our community, then you attack our protesters that are gathering peacefully and take any extreme and use tear gas against them. I want to let you know we're here today because the game is over. This timeout is not in vain. We know your plays, and it's over. It is training day for police officers and law enforcement agencies across the country. It is training day. If you don't train your officers on the standard operating procedures and get them racial bias training, the great civil rights lawyers of this country will hold you accountable. And I'm going to let you right know right now, it's not going to be cheap, because black lives matter. I want to thank you right now all across this country for standing up for justice, standing up for this very important cause. The time is now to take change, and we're not going to stop until we get it. And we're going to shut it down if we don't get it. If we don't get it, if we don't get it, thank you. Yeah, I'll say that. Two minutes. Two minutes. I'm now I'm going to bring up the family of Joel Acevedo, another case in the state of Wisconsin where an officer strangled an innocent man for 10 minutes. Ooh. <clears throat> Let us free. We need to be free. We are free people. I come down here to let everyone know and let these governments know as well that we have rights. And if there's not going to be no justice, there's never going to be no peace. I love that this is what God wants our brothers and sisters to stand in one and unity with the Hispanics, Asians, every different nationality that is standing, here, that is standing for right. Joel Acevedo did not deserve to die. He was my son invited to a police party where there was drugs and alcohol. The city of Milwaukee's been hiding this case. They choked him for over 10 minutes in the officer's house, Michael Mattioli, along with his two accomplices that they want to use as witnesses. Andrew Jokowski. And Eric, Mr. Peterson, I tell you right now, America, wake up. 
because you're going to get a rude awakening. And we come against you, Satan, in the name of Jesus Christ. We stand for what's right. Thank you. I love you all. As we bring on Attorney Stewart and the family of Ahmed Aubrey, hold it. We're trying to get everybody in. As we get the next set of family members to come forward and then prepare to march to the King Memorial. Many athletes and artists have stood for justice. One of them said, I'm coming to sing for the family. May we hear from internationally acclaimed artist B.B. Winans. I've been watching her for a half hour. Y'all think I'm blind? Oh, no. Sorry. No justice! Music, huh? This song I wrote after the death of Freddie Gray. My son at the time was 15 years old. And all I remember was seeing my son's eyes in Freddie's eyes. And I went to the piano and I wrote a song, not just for my son, but for every son and every daughter that's represented. Black lives matter. I said black lives matter. Black lives to see his eyes looking back at me with that smile his possibilities and our plans don't take away from me with your hand at night, I close my eyes and I pray, Lord, cover him with love and your grace. How can you know his heart, my friend, when already judged him by? His skin. See, it's the right to live that we're after. Wanna trade my tears, my tears to laughter. Cause in one moment, one moment, dreams are shattered. Our sons and daughters matter. Yes, black lives matter. Oh, oh. So let my words resound clear with hands lifted high.
training. The training's doing. I'm attorney Chris Stewart with attorney Justin Miller, and I bring you words and thanks for the support that y'all have given us in all of our cases. On behalf of Gianna Floyd, the daughter of George Floyd. On behalf of Rashard Brooks, and Tamika Brooks is in the crowd. On behalf of Walter Scott and Alton Sterling, and all of the other names. The support is because of the community here. Because of Rev, because of Lee Merritt, because of Ben Crump, because of all of the people that are standing up and fighting. 57 years ago, we were standing right here, trying to fight poverty and oppression. That illness has not changed. There has been no vaccine for racism. There's been no quarantine for police brutality. And that's what we're here for today, because we're all the cure. All of these families up here, their children are not victims. They're the vaccine. Thank you for your support. Continue to fight, because without you, we're nothing. Let us hear. Attorney Merritt is bringing the mother, the sister of Bath and John, killed by a policewoman who said she thought it was her house. Let us hear from his sister. Hello, everyone. My name is Elisa Findlay. I first want to thank the National Action Network. <laughs> I would like to thank the National Action Network, Reverend Al Sharpton and Martin Luther King III for organizing and convening this march. Botham Ja is my brother. September 6 marks two years since I last heard his voice, heard his laugh, two years since my family has felt whole because September 6th will be two years since Amber Geiger shot my brother through his heart. Both of them died while sitting at his home, eating ice cream and watching football. He was minding his own business. Since then, I have been on a mission to seek reform to the severely broken justice system because both of them would still be alive today. Instead, we are nine days away from the second anniversary of his murder. Two years of saying his name and Antoine Rose's name. Ten years of seeking justice for DJ Henry. Four years of saying Terrence Crutcher's name, saying Chantel Davis, Delron Small, Sandra Bland, Tatiana Jefferson, and so many others. I am tired of learning new names, adding new hashtags to an already, already long list of victims of police terror. We cannot allow our brothers and sisters to only be remembered for how they died. We need to continue to push for change so that their lives were not taken in vain. We are all in this together. We are our brothers and sisters keeper. Thank you. The mother of Ahmed Aubrey, young man jogging, shot down in cold blood in Georgia, Brunswick, Georgia. Give Wanda a big hand. I stand before you as the proud mother of Ahmad Aubrey. I'm carrying a very broken heart, but also a grateful heart that God chose my son, Ahmaud Aubrey, to be a part of this most huge movement. I do believe if we continue to stand and fight together, that we will get change. That's right. Sadly, we have these type of tragic events far too often. But I want each of you to please don't forget their names. Please let their names 
live forever. I want to share three words with you that I know Ahmad would want me to share with you as well, and that is, I love you. I love you all for standing with us. We love you. I also want you guys to help me chant his name and maybe he'll hear it in the heavens. Say his name. Say his name. Thank you and I love you. I can skip. I can skip. Yeah, you don't have to do me at all. You spoke, man. No. Okay. Let us hear from Lee, Attorney Lee Merritt. Black power. I said black power. Black power. Look, we cannot be afraid to stay black power. You cannot say that black lives matter if you don't believe in black power. Black power. The only way we stop this from happening is when we begin to exercise our own power. I've been hearing a lie from the Republican National Convention all week, and they keep telling me that this man freed the slaves. Let me tell you something. Lincoln didn't free no slaves. We freed the slaves. We free ourselves when we fight for ourselves, and we fight for ourselves through black power. Say it with me, black power. Black power. Say their names, Atatiana Jefferson, Jamel Roberson, Ahmaud Arbery, both of Jean, Oscar Grant, Seville Smith, DeAndre Yarber, Terrence Crutcher, and so many names we can't, we can't say them all, but listen, when we say black power, that means it all. So one more time so they hear you in the White House. Black power. Let us hear from the father of Ahmed Aubrey. One thing I just want to thank God for all support for my son and his mother. I just want to say it's been a hard road because my boy been lynched by three white men. And it's been a hard road for me and my family. And uh Sometimes I find myself saying, I can't believe it, but it's real because I sit back, I'm used to my boy calling me every day and tell me he loved me, and sometimes I be like, wow, he forgot to call me. And it, it just ain't real, I can't believe it. So I sit back and say, my boy gone, he not coming back. So me and his family got to be his boys now. And we got to keep on fighting. And I'm going to fight, because I'm here to fight. I'm not going to stop till God call me home. Right. More power to the people, and thank y'all. Right. Can, can we also say the name Trayvon Martin? Trayvon Martin, Trayvon Martin, please welcome Trayvon Martin's mother, Sabrina Fulton. our hero, our shero, Sabrina Fulton. As she comes, Trayvon Martin, Trayvon Martin, Trayvon Martin, Trayvon Martin, Sabrina Fulton. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. I just want to say, even though we're going through a crisis, even though it looks dark, I want to tell you to be encouraged. 
I want to tell you, in spite of what we go through, be strong, stand tall, be encouraged. Don't stop saying Black Lives Matter. Don't stop peaceful protesting. Don't stop praying. Don't stop uniting. Stand together. This is what this is about. We was built for this. And last but not least, I want to leave with you my favorite Bible verse. It's Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, and it says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not unto your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct your path. So regardless of what you're going through, trust in God. He's the only thing that matters. Stand up, people. Stand up. We was built for this. Keep fighting. Amen. Trayvon Martin. Trayvon Martin. Trayvon Martin. Let's give a round of applause to Sabrina Fulton. All of these families for their strength and their courage. Another brother who the NYPD killed, Eric Garner. I can't breathe. I can't breathe. I can't breathe. We have now Eric Garner Jr. And if you all would let her make her way to the rostrum, Eric Garner's mother, Gwen Carr. Come on, Eric Garner Jr., give him a round of applause. I can't breathe. I can't breathe. It's been six years since I, my father's words became our words. We have to make a change. I'm challenging the young people to go out and vote. It's possible for a change. We just have to put in the work. Go out and find out what we have to do and what people we have to vote in to make a change. We had to march peacefully. I don't want to see no looting. I don't want to see no, no nothing. Just march peacefully. I'm Eric Gardner Jr. That's my message. Hold on, hold on. Stefan We have the mother of Oscar Grant, ladies and gentlemen. Just a word, quickly, please. What's your name? Rhonda Johnson, ladies Rhonda and gentlemen. Johnson. Rhonda Johnson. Good afternoon. I want you to know that this race is not given to the swift nor to the strong, but to the one who endures. And we are a fighting people. Michael says, Michael 6 and 8 says, what does the Lord require of you? To walk humbly and justly. And when we think about justice, we look at us as a people, we have not received the justice that we deserve. And it's gonna require each and every one of us to continue to band together, to continue to march, to continue to protest, to continue to call the injustices unjust. And you as a people, we as a people can make it happen. We can change some of the laws that are before us. If we band together, I have with me my brother, Cephas Johnson, Uncle Bobby, and we are here to fight till the end because we know we know from Oscar's case, only 11 months in the county jail, where is the justice? Where is the justice? We look at liberty, and liberty is in balance. And until we as a people begin to fight like we are fighting on today, like Martin Luther King had that dream, and so we must have the dream that we're gonna see equality of all people. I am Oscar Grant. Say his name. Say his name. Say his name. Say his name. Louder, say his name. All right, we love you. We got a couple more out of respect. We just need everyone to bring very brief greetings so we can line up to march. The mother of Dontre Hamilton, give her a round of applause. The people have the power. 
We will show up on November the 3rd to take our country back. We will show up November the 3rd to take our family back. I am Dontre Hamilton's mother. You know, this is not even fair. He was shot 14 times for sleeping in a park. I will never stop fighting for you. Let's fight together. Vote. Hold on, hold on. Sisters, sisters and brothers. My brown mother is here. Where is she? Sisters and brothers, let me just say this. The problem is, the police have killed so many of us, there's not even enough time for us to hear from every family. But I'm going to acknowledge the families that are around me, just acknowledge who's here. The family of Stephon Clark is here. Hold your fist up, brother. The family of Michael Brown is here. There's Leslie. Come stand next to me, Leslie, just so people can see you. The family of Seville Clark is here. Seville Smith, I'm sorry. Terrence Crutcher. The family Terrence Crutcher's twin sister is here. Um, who am I leaving out? David Jones is here. Am I leaving anybody out? Who? Philip Philip Pinnell, the family, the family of Philip Pinnell, Antoine Rhodes, Montez Hambrin, is are you his mother? The mother of Montez Hambrin. Look, Emmanuel Lee. There are there. You see all the names that are being called. Clark, yeah. There you go. We want to pray for all of these families. Pamela Turner. Pamela Turner. Tamir Rice. Tamir Rice, please. Niles Arrington, please. Please follow the instructions of the marshals and begin to line up to my right. Hold on, Leslie, 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 Leslie's going to speak. As we begin to my, y'all all right with one more, Leslie? Yeah, Everybody Leslie, good? Leslie, Leslie's going to speak. Yeah, and then Stephon Clark gonna speak. Um, I'm well, no, I'm not doing all that. We're doing two. We no, we're not. Stephon we're not gonna do any. Yes, we're gonna, we no, no, we can't do it, bro. There's no time. Yes, we, I'm talking, we, to we gotta, we gotta march. We gotta march. Move to. The, you're on TV, though, brother. Stephon, you're on TV. Yeah. yeah. I know. You're on camera. Okay. We didn't come out from California now. All right. On my mama kids. You need it. So, let's let everybody. Let's let everybody line up. You can see the crowd shifting to the right. Let's make way for these families to lead the march. Y'all, you get over there. Maybe you can jump on the mic over there. All right? I'm sorry. It's just one person after another. It's coming, brother. Who? T Tony Robinson. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. Law and order. For many people, it sounds like this. But in politics, it means you're tough on crime, and it goes way back. As far as this problem of law and order is concerned, I am for law and order. Today, it's become one of President Trump's favorite phrases. I am the law and order candidate. I am your president of law and order. But what exactly does he mean by law and order? Well, during his first campaign, it meant a lot of things, like securing the border and cracking down on gangs. But he also pledged to reduce violent crime and support law enforcement. America's police and law enforcement personnel are what separates civilization from total chaos and the destruction of our country as we know it. 
On the campaign trail, Trump said officers would not be shot under his watch. He also pledged to pursue the death penalty for cop killers. But the number of police killed by firearms has remained fairly steady throughout the last few years, and the Department of Justice hasn't executed those who've killed cops. However, Trump has tried protecting the police in other ways. In 2017, he signed an executive order calling for harsher penalties for those who harm officers. And when Trump signed his recent executive order promoting police reform, he continued to back the blue. Nobody needs a strong, trustworthy police force more than those who live in distressed areas. And nobody is more opposed to the small number of bad police officers, and you have them. They're very tiny. I use the word tiny. It's a very small percentage. And lately, Trump says he's deploying hundreds of federal agents to major cities like Chicago to fight crime. Interestingly, public perception of crime rates have been wrong for a long time. While a majority of people year after year believe crime is going up, the reality is that crime has been consistently dropping for decades. The big story with crime rates is that they have been plummeting since the 1990s. They plummeted during the Bush administration, they plummeted during the Obama administration, and they have continued to fall during uh, the Trump administration. But this year may be different. David Skolansky is a law professor at Stanford. He explained while crime is down overall this year, during the pandemic, several cities are reporting an uptick in shootings and homicides. Trump has put some of the blame on civil unrest following George Floyd's death, but Skolansky says it's more complicated. Many of these things have to do with the COVID-19 pandemic. The fact that people have been um, stuck at home may be increasing rates of domestic violence. The fact that hospitals are overwhelmed may have made some assaults that previously would not have been deadly, deadly assaults. The fact that the pandemic has caused the economy to go into a tailspin may be responsible for some of the increase in homicide. Finally, um, there, there's some evidence that the spate of police shootings of particularly young black men. I, wanna, I, I do thank everyone. But things are, are improving, and the local people here are rebuilding. Someone asked me this morning, what do you want the nation and the world to think Kenosha is? It's a great place to live. It's a great place to raise a family. We have great schools. We have great parks and lakes, great places to raise a family. And when all of this calms down, like I hope it's trending toward right now, if you really go outside this small area right here, life goes on as normal in Kenosha County, in the city of Kenosha. The part that's damaged and hurt, we're all going to work together to rebuild. And we're, we're looking forward to the rebuilding part. We're doing that right now. And uh, for those on the outside of Kenosha, it's a great place to be and I'm very proud to be part of it. Good afternoon. Last night, as it's already been alluded to, was much calmer, much safer here in the city of Kenosha and the surrounding area. Hopefully that means that we're moving to a safer place altogether and we can return to normalcy. Um, we need a place where we have peace, where we heal, and we can work toward growth. With that, though, the, the emphasis is, has been on law enforcement, and it's our burden to do that. We can't do that alone. We need citizens. We need everybody's assistance in that. And in order to accomplish that, we need the media and elected officials to be part of the solution, not part of a problem. Comments that are made that are divisive do not bring us closer to the goal we want where we have inclusion and safety and unbiased for all. So over the last number of days, we've had some major events. We've had two people lose their lives senselessly while peacefully protesting. I'm not sure the details behind what led to the altercation, but two people were, were killed, one person seriously injured senselessly. Earlier, I made comments about the role of curfew in that. 
my comments were misconstrued. The Kenosha Police Department and the Sheriff's Department function under a curfew as a tool to keep people safe. And we're requesting all people to obey that curfew to stay home. In no way was my, my comment earlier intended to suggest that by being out after curfew that those persons played a role in their deaths. Tragically, lives were lost and a person were injured. That rests solely on the person who did that, not on the victims of this crime, any more than the victims of the, the countless arsons and other things that are going on. This is in the hands of those who create it. We ask for everybody's help in stopping the violence, assisting the investigations, so we can hold those accountable in a court of law. Good afternoon. I'm Major General Paul Knapp. I'm Wisconsin's Adjutant General and Commander of the Wisconsin National Guard. I'm happy to be here today to update you on the efforts of the Wisconsin National Guard in supporting civil authorities here in Kenosha. Our first Guard members arrived on Monday and we've steadily increased our numbers uh, supporting the city each day in response to requests from local authorities here. I'd like to again emphasize that we are citizen soldiers and airmen. That means that we live and work in these communities that we're your neighbors uh, all across Wisconsin and we come when we are called. We're invested in these communities and we want the best for Kenosha and Wisconsin and we'll continue to be here to support for as long as we're needed. Additionally, we're bringing in National Guard soldiers from other states, specifically Michigan, Alabama, and Arizona, supporting this effort as well, uh, which will increase our number uh, of troops supporting the people here in Kenosha. I'd like to say that we're, we're grateful for their partnership and the partnership of all of the agencies, not just law enforcement, that have come together here in Kenosha. In terms of uh, bringing in soldiers from other states, uh, I was asked yesterday why that was, uh, and I want to make sure that I answer that, uh, that clearly. Uh, so in Wisconsin, we have one uh, military police company uh, that is uh, assigned here in Wisconsin. Uh, I made the, the uh, assessment that due to the situation here that we would be best served by having additional military police companies which have additional training in civil disturbance and how to deal with that. Uh, so there were other states uh, that have this capability that offered uh, their assistance uh, and Governor Evers uh, gladly accepted that support. I'll also say that we're grateful to see the calm uh, that has, uh, has uh, ensued over the last few nights. Uh, it has been much better, much more peaceful, uh, and that is a great sign here. And remind everyone that the, the, uh, all of the resources that are here in Kenosha are designed to support everyone's First Amendment rights to, uh, to peacefully and lawfully demonstrate. All the National Guard soldiers and airmen took an oath to uphold and protect the Constitution. It's why we wear the uniform. We also wear this uniform because we want to serve our fellow citizens. We love this state and nation, and we want to protect the freedoms that we enjoy. So in closing, if you're a community leader, an influencer, or anyone who wants to have your voice heard, please know that these vast resources of our country are here at your disposal to peacefully and lawfully exercise your First Amendment rights. Don't let looting, rioting, or any other unlawful behavior drown out your voice. Thank you. And now, since I'm the last speaker, I'm going to open up for questions uh, first, uh, if anyone has any questions for me since I'm up here at the podium. How many troops do you have in town? So, uh, as I mentioned before, we don't discuss specific numbers, but I, I will tell you that we have over 1,000 today. How long will they be here? Uh, as I mentioned in my statement, uh, we'll be here as long as we're needed. Is it a day-to-day -day basis sort of thing? Absolutely. It is. We, we reevaluate. We're in uh, meetings, regularly scheduled and impromptu meetings uh, with both the governor and the local authorities uh, determining the needs of the local community, for sure. Can you just emphasize one more time, uh, who makes the final call for whether you all are deployed uh, to Kenosha, for example? That would be the governor. Hey, what are the essential uh, duties of the government here in town? We're doing a, an array of different things. Uh, I'd like to emphasize that we are in support of local authorities, so uh, we don't self-deploy. 
Uh, we don't decide on our own where we go or what we do while we're out there supporting the local community. So we work in conjunction with the local authorities uh, and every day we're on a day-to-day -day basis planning where uh, they would best be utilized. Uh, we, we're doing things like uh, point security, uh, securing uh, facilities, uh, we are in a reactionary role. One of the things that we're prepared to do is to assist firefighters if they were to get into a situation uh, where they needed to fight a fire uh, and the, the scene wasn't safe for any number of reasons. That's one of the things that we would also do. For the, uh, for this uh, is a general question uh, for sure. anyone. Any concern about the weekend? I know there are some demonstrations planned. <clears throat> I'll, I'll uh, take the first crack at that. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I don't know that I would say I'm concerned, but we're definitely keeping track on the weekend. The weekend is a different dynamic. Uh, so uh, in conjunction with the local authorities, uh, we're making sure that we're prepared that anything might come up over the weekend. Before you leave, does the president uh, or anybody in his administration have any role or has they played any role in your uh, being here or do you consult with them when you do anything here? Um, as has been mentioned uh, in the press already, the uh, Governor Evers has been in contact with, with the White House. Uh, I'm not privy to the specifics of those discussions, uh, but there have been discussions. And just clarification, those 1,000 guardsmen that are here, does that include the out-of-state ones? Uh, again, I, I, don't, I, I, I just gave you a, like, a, like over 1,000, uh, and uh, that, as of right now, does not include those. Or I guess my question is, are the out-of-state members here, or are they still on their way? Okay, uh, yes, good question. So uh, they are, uh, they're en route right now. Uh, we have some that are driving here, uh, the ones from Michigan, and then the others will be uh, arriving via uh, airplane uh, later today. Can someone tell us how many people have been arrested in relation to the protests and on what charges? Uh, I'll let Chief Miskinnis come up and address the, address the crowd. To date, there have been somewhere around 50 people arrested, just under 50 for a variety of uh, offenses from curfew to weapons charges, um, drug charges, um, illegal fireworks, and I believe a suspect last night was arrested for possession uh, or possessing a um, flamethrower, actually that was the, the night before. Uh, I have a question about Jacob Blake. Um, if he's still currently being shackled to the hospital bed, can someone clarify those reports? I can tell you that he is and has been under the guard of an outside agency. I can't speak to to that and nobody here can. Has is anyone spoken to that agency? What would be the agency? Do you know that? I, I can't speak to it, that, but it's, it's an outside law enforcement agency. Is it standard practice policy to have someone like that? It is. It, it, so in an effort to, to have an outside investigation in place, it's also very helpful, obviously, to have an outside agency guard that, that person for his protection and to, for liability reasons for the department. Does it have anything to do with the outstanding warrant? Uh, that's my understanding that that was um, in place against him from July. He, he's being guarded because he's under arrest, and yeah, he was. It was for an outstanding warrant for third-degree sexual assault. And um, a follow-up question, if I may, can you tell us if the officers who responded to that call on Sunday knew of the outstanding warrant? I can't. I can't speak. I believe that's why they were there, but I, I don't know specifically. Would that have changed the nature of the response, you know, knowing that someone had a history versus... It would certainly be heightened awareness, but in, in this case, the, the altercation, and remember that I'm not aware of the details of this, is that there was some resisting in the basis of that contact and the arrest, so that's what changed the dynamics of it. Did you know if the officers have been interviewed yet by uh, the investigators? I believe DCI has spoken with them, yes. Have they gotten an idea of why he responded as he did on that call? They, they do not share any details with me with the investigation until it's done. I'm not sure if this question will be for you, for Sheriff Beth, but uh, a number of people on the jail roster this morning were still in custody, I think it was two days after an arrest for um, uh, being out after curfew, which I understand is a violation. Can you explain why? It, it, it usually, it seems well, rather long for violations, so people are asking. They have an answer. You want to stick with the chief first? And <laughs> Does anybody else have any more questions for Chief? Yes, I would like to yes, ask sir. a question. Right here? Oh, yeah. yeah. Yes, so, so this is in regards to, to what happened Tuesday night um, with, the, with the shooting. Okay. Um, the, the suspect was seen on video walking away from the scene, presumably based on the position with a body or someone on the ground behind him with an assault rifle, and he was able to leave the scene. He wasn't questioned. So just from a procedural standpoint, can you give us an idea on why that didn't happen? 
why he was able to leave the scene when presumably, or when people were actually heard on video as well saying, this man shot someone? Sure, that, that's a good question. So to understand what happened that night and what you saw in the film, or the, the video clip there, you need to understand what was happening in the greater scheme of things. There were a lot of people in the area, a lot of people with weapons, and unfortunately, a lot of gunfire. So what the officers were walking into, or driving into at this case, was a shots fired complaint. Not a shooting, not a person down complaint. We have had many of those over the course of, of this unfortunate uh, event. So they're responding to that, they see somebody walking toward them with his hands up. That too isn't out of the ordinary given how the events have been going on. Many people, as I drove around, and others have explained, have seen the same thing. We have armed individuals out protesting or counter-protesting or simply walking around exercising their right, will put their hands up. So that's not, it might have been ab abnormal two weeks ago, is no longer abnormal. So there was nothing to suggest that this person was involved in any criminal behavior. He continued, he made contact um, near the officer's door, and you can hear on the, uh, the recording I heard that the officers are telling him to get out of the work. Clearly they're not seeing him as a suspect or a threat of any kind. He's allowed to leave where he goes to Antioch and turns himself in because we have no idea that he's involved. The officers become focused on what they see down down the road. Was that a lapse in judgment? What's that? Was that a lapse in judgment to not stop him? I, not I would say him? not. Given the circumstances, and again, as I said, two weeks ago, my answer might have been different. But right now, the, the totality of circumstances, nothing suggested this person or anybody else who was armed around them was the person. They're very unlikely to have heard any comments from the crowd next to the vehicles that were there, the radio traffic, the gunfire, the crowd. A church group had its U-Haul pulled over a thousand dollars worth of relief supplies including first aid kits, snacks, water, and fire extinguishers were seized but they have not been returned. What can you tell us about that? I'm not aware of that incident. Officer, at uh, the initial shooting, were the police officer aware that there were three babies in the car when they fired on the suspect? Are you referring back to the beginning of this? Yes, I'm talking about the gentleman who was shot seven times. There were three babies in the car. Did, did they understand there were three children in that car? I can tell you once again that I don't have the details of that event, no matter how many times you ask the question. The details are in the hands of the DCI, not me. Can you tell yes, us sir, the right, here? right oh, on the floor sorry. right here? Go ahead, sir. No, generally speaking, like clearly the kid was underage. He was 17 years old. What is the rule? I mean, it had an officer. Who, uh, I mean, had an officer caught that from the get-go. I mean, this may have not have happened. Like, what is the general rule of thumb about checking IDs? I mean, do does he do officers do that in in that regard? So uh, again, back to two weeks ago, it was very likely that that would have been done, given the the vast number of people out. Some people wearing masks, some not. The appearance of people we don't have. You know, I, I can't really answer that in current context because now there's so many. He wasn't clearly an underage person. I, I think if you small I saw a small child with one, we could do that. But it's very difficult to to try to ascertain that there is an age issue when it's that close. Militia members have told me that without exception, law enforcement officers were friendly to them as they walked around with semi-automatic weapons on the streets that night. Did that have anything to do with the fact that the now accused shooter was able to walk right past deputies and now there's an extradition fight out of Illinois? I can't speak to that. I believe everybody out there in law enforcement has been friendly to both sides. And I can tell you that as there is no reason to disbelieve what I just said about not knowing this person was a suspect, that that had any role in it. Next question right here in the back of the room. Can you tell us how Rittenhouse got the gun and are any more people going to be charged in that, that particular case? I don't have any details as to how he obtained the gun. I know we're following up on a number of things and if there are other violations, is, 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 Two is, more is, questions is, for is, Chief is, is right true, over here. It, right over here. Chief, um, has Kyle Rittenhouse been questioned yet? And I know you said that you didn't know what led up to this shooting, but it's been a number of days, um, and there's a lot of video. So how, how is that, I guess, possible? Well, That's as in question. most homicide cases, they, they, take, they take days. It also takes um, the cooperation of the person involved, and if they invoke their the right to an attorney, uh, we may not get that information. I can't speak to what the details were about 
um, his his motive because I do not know. Final question for Chief Miskinnis right here. Chief? Yes, sir, go ahead. Oh, thank you. Chief, what is the department policy in regards to use of force uh, in uh, situations where a person that is accused of or suspected of a crime is fleeing from officers, and what is the state law under which you operate? Well, we, we follow the Department of Justice. There's a training and standards um, confrontational uh, force. Continue. It, it has a host of number of things, but there's a hierarchy and the level of force that can be used is that level that is sufficient to take a person into custody and, and take that effect. So depending upon what action the person who is being arrested takes, that drives the level of force used by the officer. Are they required to use deadly force in the event someone's fleeing? Are they required? No, and I don't believe that there was a deadly force used for fleeing. Chief, can you tell us Chief, That's, that's the final question for Chief Miskinnis. Does anybody have questions for Sheriff Beth? I, the, the one from earlier about uh, arrest. I'll reiterate the question. Uh, there was a number. Of, there was number of arrests, obviously, throughout the week, and some people have been held, according to Joe Rasta, for two plus days after being arrested for uh, uh, violating curfew. That's for, um, we had some questions about that being rather long for a violation. For a, a violation, can you explain why people held that long? Uh, I don't know. I truthfully don't know who's in there. Um, I know there are a few curfew ones, but they have to post bond if and uh, they also have to provide proper identification. We have to be able to know who they are. So if they've not done either of those two, then uh, they might have to appear in court. And right now, court's a little bit delayed, but uh, so that might answer your question, but I don't know of a specific circumstance. And on a follow-up, can you explain why um, bail is being paid in the scene rather than Kenosha? We learned about that one this morning. Uh, probably just for the safety of everybody coming to it. We're sending them to a scene. Truthfully, that's the first I heard of it because I've been dealing with so many other things that wasn't a priority for me to, to to do that. Over here, does anybody have any questions for the sheriff? Right back information here. information okay. on whether Kyle Rittenhouse's mother drove him to Wisconsin and will she face consequences? <laughs> I actually was asked that question this morning and it's the first I heard of it. I don't know. I didn't know that she did. Again, we're not investigating that part. We all, and I know we've kind of said this, but we all have different roles in this entire situation. That investigation is not under my, in my world. Right in the back, blue shirt, blue hat. No, that was part, that's part okay. Of the All right. Yes, sir. You have a question, um, Sheriff? Have you seen uh, the video that is circulated around of, of officers or law enforcement that were that were offering bottles of water and, and saying we appreciate you to some you know armed individuals that that I, walking around? I was asked about a few different ones today, and truthfully, yeah. I've watched no social media. I've watched no news broadcast. I've watched. I've not read any papers since uh, since last week. Okay. So, but that one I did see. And uh, it's an armored car, it says Sheriff on it. It wasn't one of our Bearcats. Right now we have 19 armored vehicles here that are all being utilized. It wasn't one of ours, but um, as the chief pointed out, and one of the, one of the and I don't know, I'm not a techie person, I don't do Facebook, but one of the people that was videotaping said, they, it sounds like they were out in Portland too, and they, they commented on how friendly the law enforcement was here in Wisconsin. Well, I don't want to know if I take that as a compliment or not, but but the fact that one of our people who are here threw a bottle of water to someone walking down the street, I understand that part. Um, his comment that he made it it doesn't it doesn't mirror all of law enforcement's perspective on what happened. Uh, th this group of people that are carrying weapons here, if they're in their house, and again. I support the Second Amendment. If they're in there protecting their uh, their property, uh, uh, I have no issue with that. And uh, the people that have been here carrying guns, they haven't been arrested because it's it's a right that they have. Do uh, have we asked for them to come? Are we asking? Are we asking to, for them to come in and support things? I'm not. Uh, one of the things is you could clearly see the situation escalated Tuesday night. Uh, because a 17-year-old boy carrying uh, what appears to be an assault rifle who has no idea how to handle a situation like this. Um, I don't care if he had the right intentions or not. Two people are currently dead, and one almost had his arm blown off. Um, so the comments that, that whoever was in that armored vehicle said, it does not reflect, reflect what, what we here in Kenosha are asking for. Uh, we have, as you heard the general say, we've got a lot of military personnel. We have a lot 
of law enforcement personnel from throughout the state, throughout the Midwest, and truthfully, we have, we have them from throughout the country are here right now to help protect Kenosha. Were you anticipating the, the room? Can you tell us what the status is of the nine people who were arrested this week um, in relation to the situation at a Speedway gas station? It sounds like they had... That wasn't us. Was, was that Kenosha police? It was. Can you talk about that, Chief? Chief? Hey, why don't you guys stick with one person at a time, and that way... <clears throat> We can, we can wrap it up. And I don't mean to cut you off. We'll get, we can, I, I think the chief probably can answer that. Right here. Uh, the 50 people who were arrested for protest-related charges, can you tell in general where they're from? Are they from in town, out of town? Uh, I've heard of a lot of out-of-town people. I'm not saying that there aren't some from in town, but I'm aware that a lot are from out of town. Sheriff, were you anticipating that some of those armed individuals, armed groups would be out on the streets Tuesday night to confront protesters? Was law enforcement anticipating that? I don't, my, the, our department and, and the people that were out there uh, probably knew that. Is Again, my day from the minute I get up until the minute I fall asleep somewhere, um, there are certain things that I'm kind of privy to and enlightened on. I'm sure our staff knew that. I'm sure the law enforcement out there knew that because they could see them. And I'm sure that whoever's ever out in the field relayed that back to the command post. But so, beforehand, because sometimes there's online chatter. I'm sure that they did. I'm sure that they did. And um, uh, again, the fact that they were out there isn't against the law. And the fact that... Uh, the one picture that I saw of the suspect, uh, he had a mask on. And again, I don't know what he was doing the rest of the time, so I, I don't know if pe other people saw him later. But the one I saw, he had a mask on, he had a baseball cap on, he had a, a, some kind of yellow or green shirt. And, and he looked young to me, but I couldn't have told you that he was underage. So it was, um, I don't know if I answered your question. Final question for Sheriff. Sheriff, Sheriff you I know your agency it? is not investigating the officer involved shooting. Then don't, Jacob, then don't ask the question. But, <laughs> and I know that your deputies were not involved, but just as the top law enforcement official uh -huh. in this county, when you see that cell phone video, I didn't see the, the cell, cell phone, cell phone video. video of the shooting of Jacob Blake, okay. as the top law enforcement official in this county, do you see a problem just from that video of what that officer did? I, I think I answered. I did not see the video. You have never seen that cell phone video. I'm sticking to the same thing I answered earlier. Yes, Is I have not. Problem with that? That you haven't seen okay. that video? All right. Sure, Thank I'll you, sure. for Sheriff Beth. <laughs> uh, I'll bring Chief Miskinis back up to answer your question in the middle, and then we'll move on. I have one follow-up for the Chief as well. After that, no more follow-ups. Right here in the middle. Uh, can you tell us what the status is of the nine people who were arrested in relation to the situation at the Speedway gas station? It sounds like they were out of plate or out of state plates. Could, have you uh, discovered I, any more information about I can, that? I can address that in, in general. I don't have great details on it, but the Kenosha Police Department received um, a tip that there was a, a number of vehicles, three, that were on the uh, southwest side of town uh, with out of state plates in a remote area, and that was deemed suspicious. We initiated surveillance with them and eventually uh, made contact with a gas station across town where I believe they were fueling up a, a gas can. Um, don't quote me on that because I'm not necessarily sure, but I, I think that's what I recall hearing. In the course of identifying the, the occupants of two of the vehicles, um, the third vehicle attempted to leave, uh, uh, disobeyed orders, wouldn't roll the windows down, would not cooperate with the investigation, and due to the actions of the driver, um, an entry was made into the car. So that being done, they're investigating what's going on. They found uh, shields, masks, um, illegal um, fireworks, some believed controlled substances. And uh, we called for the assistance of, of ATF, who is in town. They provided a supporting role um, with that. And then uh, the investigation was remains ours. Pretty much what I just laid out for you. What are the legal fireworks? Like just too big? Or? Well, I, I, well, again, not with the details, but it, but it may be a size, the amount, of, the amount of explosives involved in it. I don't have the details on that. Where are they from? Uh, those from out of state. I don't recall which state it was from. On Monday, 200 cars came down the interstate and were allowed to come through into this area. Is that? Car, car going to be I, I believe there. I was told that was one more question. That's so. the last question for the chief. Thank you very much. Does anybody have questions for Mayor Antaramian? 
Anybody have questions for County Executive Cruiser? I have a question yes, mayor. for the mayor. For the mayor, yes, go ahead. Um, some organizations have called on you to ask the chief and the sheriff to resign amid all of this unrest and then the officer involved shooting. Do you plan to ask them to do that? No. Um, I think that when you look at what has occurred over the last week and all the activities that are going on, everyone is doing the best they can with the situation they have, and I think both the chief and the sheriff clarified the situation that they, uh, I think, as to why people were making that request. Mayor, if there are armed groups out this weekend, I mean, how do you want law enforcement to address that? If we, I've, I've made it really clear of my opinion of armed uh, militia out on the, um, in the city, do not want you here, do not expect you to be here, and you should stay away. And I think that's as clear as I can make it. How do you want law enforcement to Again, I think I just made it as clear as I am able to make it, and law enforcement will do their jobs. Mayor, this church group that had $1,000 worth of essentially humanitarian supplies seized, will there be any attempt to return that property to those groups who have not been charged with crimes? I will look into it. I do not know anything about it, though, to be honest with you. Any other questions for Mayor Antoramian? Okay, thank, thank you. Mayor. Any questions for County Executive Cruiser? Are there any expected changes to the code view, or are we sticking with 7 through Sunday? We're sticking through 7 through Sunday. All right. If no questions for County Executive Cruiser, any final questions for General Knapp? Ladies and gentlemen, that concludes our press conference. Thank you very much for your time. We will see you Monday right back here at 1 p.m. Thank you, Thank you again. Right here. voters this question. What do you have to lose by trying something new? I will fix it. Watch. I will fix it. So what do black voters think about President Trump now? NBC News correspondent Morgan Radford asked them that very question. Allison, that's right. I went back to my home state of North Carolina, which is where then-candidate Trump was four years ago in Charlotte, North Carolina, in Mecklenburg County, when he essentially asked black and brown voters, what do you have to lose by voting for me? In essence, saying, why not take a chance on voting for me, even though we know that black voters tend to vote disproportionately for the Democratic Party. So I went back four years later to Charlotte, and I asked black voters, in the past four years, what did you have to lose, if anything at all? Our conversation touched on things like coronavirus, the president's relationship with race and black unemployment. Take a listen to what they had to say. President Trump has billed himself as the law and order president. Does that make you feel more or less safe as a black American? The question is law and order for whom? And what I hear a lot of times is law and order in order to keep people in line, not law and order to make sure justice is fair. 
to make sure that, you know, everybody's experiencing the justice system in the same way. Law and order, to me, is saying, I'm going to keep things the way they are and in, in, in the same place, you know, to make sure people know where they belong. As a black business owner, mm -hmm. do you think you are better or worse off since President Trump took office? Oh, it's been worse off. Worse off. I've sacrificed the things that I enjoy in my life just to keep this business open. Um, I gave up my car, you know, to do that. So you gave up your car to keep your business open? Yes, I did. And it was a point to where it's like, OK, do I keep the business open or do I pay my rent? Why did when he asked that question, why did that excite you so much? Oh, it excited me because I think that blacks have been lumped into this in, in this group where they're thought that if you vote any other way except straight ticket Democrat, then you're not really black. You're not good enough. You're not part of the community. You're not cool. You're, you know, it's just that's the way that they treat us. And whenever he said that, it was calling it out. And it gave me, it empowered me. I could tell you that. It empowered me to say, you know what, I could step up and really be, you know, who I who I'm meant to be. While the Democrats and the independents we spoke to said that they believe that the president fundamentally has a race relations problem, that he doesn't handle the topic of race well, the Trump supporters we spoke to said that they believe the president is not racist and that race is essentially an emotional topic. And while we do know that this topic can be emotional, race has been brought front and center during the RNC this week, we also know that there are real economic impacts. For example, when it comes to black Americans, 22 percent of all COVID deaths have been among black Americans. That's 36,000 black people who've died since the pandemic began in this country. We also know that black businesses and black unemployment is also disproportionately impacted. 41% of black owned businesses have permanently shut their doors since the pandemic. That's compared to 17% of white businesses. So we do know that when it comes to COVID, when it comes to unemployment, when it comes to those jobs numbers and it comes to black business, we do know that there are real and statistical differences. Allison. So what do suburban women actually think of President Trump? Take a listen as some of them share their thoughts on the upcoming election. I'm going to show you a tweet from the president. He's been going after voters like you, women living in suburban areas. <laughs> What's your response yeah, I, to that? I don't, I think laughter. I don't know what to think. In one speech recently, I called you suburban housewives, and they all loved it. But what I got, they said, sir, I don't know if that's politically correct. I said, don't worry about it. They'll get over it, right? By kind of blanketing every woman in as a suburban housewife is offensive. What they need to focus on is, here's my issue, and this is why you should vote for me. Not because this is where you live, and I'm going to have some kind of a dog whistle that's going to scare you into voting for me. So we aren't 1950s housewives anymore. We're educated, strong women who are trying to raise families while working full-time out of the home, you know, a lot of us are, and to make us think that we're going to be, you know, this, you know, defund the police thing, and we're going to all of a sudden be overrun in our communities by all these bad people is, is ludicrous. I'm in the suburbs, and um, I also have children, and I'm not voting for Donald Trump, because when he is saying that, he is speaking to a certain base, which he's obviously not including me in that, in that base. You think it's racist? Yes, it is. It's, it, I mean, there's no way, other way around that. I think that if anything, he, he needs to get on board with the fact that the suburban moms are out there wanting to educate our children, making sure that they understand the privilege that they have in their lives that a lot of children don't have, because I point that out to my kids constantly. And I, I'm just so like fired up and passionate about making sure, you know, that I'm raising good citizens. For me, just speaking as a black woman, um, I, it's hard to tune out. Just six months ago, I was called the N-word to my face at work multiple times. So the economy and all of those things, I get that they're a problem, but they're a problem for my children. You know, this, this is the problem for my children and the economy doesn't matter. He also said the invasion of neighborhoods will undermine safety for the suburban housewife. Do you feel threatened? Oh gosh, no. I feel threatened by so many other things. That's completely racist. What I feel scared of is more the rise of white nationalism and people having guns who shouldn't have guns, who aren't trained. I find myself very open-minded, you know, I'm, and that's, that doesn't, I'm not in that suburban mom group that he's referring to. 
Hey, everyone, I'm Allison Mars. You're watching NBC News Now. Let's go to NBC News correspondent Savannah Sellers. She's got the latest headlines for us from NBCNews.com. Savannah, I got my Friday shirt on today. I'm really feeling it. This is a pre-vacation Friday for me, so I'm extra, extra into it. Okay, Allison, it's so funny you just said that. I was going to say, hey, before I get to the news, I don't have returns, so I don't know. Are you wearing your Friday shirt or not? Because the conventions are over and we all need them back. <laughs> Yes, I'm happy to the hear The shirt it, so. is back for today. And then I, well, I promise when I come back from my week off, I will do a, a full week. We'll get all the Monday to Fridays in. And a big thank you to you because I, be, I believe you're in next week and always grateful uh, for your coverage there. I am, and I'm excited to be here with everyone watching, and you so deserve the break, especially before we head into the craziness of this fall. So enjoy your break, Allison. And now let's get started wrapping up the week with the devastation from Hurricane Laura. At least 10 are dead after the storm tore through Louisiana with dangerous high winds. Laura flattened buildings and left hundreds of thousands without power, and it could take days to fully assess the damage. The mayor of Lake Charles, Louisiana, spoke about the destruction on the Today Show. What I didn't expect to see was there were literal, literal entire buildings that had been blown apart. There were facades of brick buildings that had been around for 100 years that were blown down. Uh, I mean, I was really, I was really blown away by, uh, by the devastation of some of these buildings. And a big update out of the NBA. The league says playoffs will restart Saturday following three days of postponed games. Of course, this all started Wednesday when the Milwaukee Bucks boycotted their playoff game to protest the shooting of Jacob Blake. The NBA and its players union also announced they'll create a social justice coalition to promote police and criminal justice reform. Teams also plan to work with local election officials to transform home arenas into polling locations for the November election. Meanwhile, 17-year-old Kyle Rittenhouse is now facing six charges over the killing of two people during protests in Kenosha, Wisconsin. Two of those charges include first-degree homicide, which means the teen could be sentenced to life in prison if he's convicted in Wisconsin. However, Rittenhouse lives in Illinois, and today a judge postponed a hearing to determine if he should return to Wisconsin to face charges. Rittenhouse's lawyers say he was acting in self-defense during the protests, all sparked by the officer-involved shooting of Jacob Blake last weekend. Blake's father gave an update on his son's condition earlier today. Let's make it very clear. My son is, is fighting for his life. He's holding on. He's holding on. Um, he's medicated uh, pretty much all the time. Moving on to Capitol Hill, where House Democrats today announced contempt proceedings against Secretary of State Mike Pompeo. The House's Foreign Affairs Committee says Pompeo ignored requests to submit State Department documents, all related to the impeachment inquiry into President Trump. The committee's chairman, Elliot Engel, also criticized Pompeo for speaking at the RNC during a State Department trip to Israel. In a statement, Engel wrote that Pompeo, quote, demonstrated alarming disregard for the laws and rules governing governing his own conduct. And lastly, Japan's longest serving prime minister Shinzo Abe says he's resigning due to health issues. In a press conference, Abe appeared with tears in his eyes explaining, quote, I cannot be prime minister if I cannot make the best decisions for the people. Abe has struggled with ulcerative colitis for years, a digestive illness that he says has recently gotten worse. He says he'll continue to serve until a new leader takes over within the coming weeks. Just a tough time for Japan as it tries to recover from the financial toll of the pandemic, just like we all are. Allison? Absolutely, Savannah. All right, thank you so much. We'll catch up with you in about an hour. President Trump granting a full pardon to Alice Johnson at the White House today. She spoke at the Republican National Convention last night. Trump commuted Johnson's prison sentence back in 2018 after she spent more than two decades in jail on drug charges. So we're taking Alice from a commutation to a full pardon, and I'm going to sign it right now, and we're very proud of Alice and the job you've done and what you represent. NBC News correspondent Carol Lee joins me now. Carol, Kim Kardashian helped persuade President Trump to commute Johnson's sentence back in 2018. Do we know what pushed him to pardon her today? 
Well, Allison, according to the president, he saw her in the audience at his speech last night from the White House and decided to have her come over to the White House so he could give her a full pardon. He said that um, he asked his staff if they could get her, and she came over. He said they didn't even discuss it, meaning he and, and Alice, and he just signed the document right there. So it was a little um, spontaneous for him, whether he's been thinking about this for a long time, for a while now, I don't know. But he said that he had saw her. Uh, last night and decided this was something that he wanted to do. And she also spoke at the Republican National Convention. So um, the White House and the president certainly feel like this is one of his big success stories. And, and obviously, he's trying to appeal to African-American voters in the run-up to the November election. And this is a place in which he thinks he has some potential to do that. Carol, if my math is correct, we have 67 days left till the election. Mm -hmm. President Trump's back on the campaign trail. He'll be in New Hampshire this evening. What's on his agenda? Well, his agenda is pretty simple. It's to try to win New Hampshire this time around. He lost it really narrowly in 2016, and now that they're trying the the president's campaign it openly admits he needs every electoral vote he can get in November. And New Hampshire is was in striking distance, clearly, in 2016. Barack Obama won it in 2012. Um, and so President Trump is going to head there to hold a, an actual campaign rally. This is not an official White House event. There'll be about 1,000 people there. Um, and we're told that he's supposed to hit on some of the similar themes that we heard from him in his acceptance speech at the White House last night. And, and But it's all aimed Allison at him trying to pick up as many electoral votes as he can in November. And New Hampshire's a state where his campaign feels like they were very close last time, and there's no reason why he shouldn't be able to get it this time. Carol, his RNC speech last night clocked in about in about 70 minutes. He still mm -hmm. has more to say today, though. What has the president been tweeting about the RNC? Well, ratings, ratings, ratings. He loves to talk about ratings. Um, and so he tweeted that great ratings and reviews last night. Thank you. Um, and he's he's really focused on the idea that a lot of people tuned into his speech. He was um, told very happy about the way that it looked in the setting, even though obviously it's highly controversial that he decided to hold his speech at the White House. But he's, uh, you know, focused on on ratings, which, which frankly are a little bit down from what the Democratic community convention was. But we, we know from the president that that's something he pays very close attention to. And so that's what he's been tweeting about today, Allison. How about the campaign, Carol? Uh, what's the Trump campaign saying about the convention? They're feeling really good about it. They feel like both weeks, actually, that last week they did a really good effort to counter-program the Democratic convention. The president was out there traveling almost every day in different states, and they feel like the convention went really well for them. You have uh, Tim Murtaugh, the Trump campaign's communications director, said our four days were unqualified success, and that that he felt like they had really done a, a tremendous job in terms of getting the president's message out there. He said that the president, over four days, um, was an unqualified success, and the president delivered exactly the message he should deliver. He also said that, you know, they feel like they dominated the week and that they um, managed to, at the same time, now that Joe Biden is getting out on the campaign trail, uh, smoke him out. That's how, the, how they're putting it, that they, you know, have obviously made an issue of, of Joe Biden being in his basement. He's now getting out, and he's going to supposed to campaign a little bit in the country. They feel like that's a success. They would like him to be out there. They really want, um, They, in their view, they feel like the more that Joe Biden is out there and in front of voters, the better that is for Donald Trump. But they feel quite good about the convention, and they're trying now to capitalize it and keep the momentum going with by having the president out there in New Hampshire today. All right, convention season, if you will. Our two weeks of conventions are now over. It's yeah. time for campaigning. Carol Everybody Lee, thank you nap. so much. <laughs> <laughs> 57 years after Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. delivered his I Have a Dream speech in Washington, D.C., a new generation of leaders raising its voice in the fight against racial injustice. Thousands of people took to the National Mall today for the Get Your Knee Off Our Necks Commitment March on Washington. Dr. King's eldest son, Martin Luther King III, spoke on the very same steps where his father shared his dream for America. We need to vote as if our lives and our livelihoods, our liberties depend on it, because they do. No person, no people, 
are more keenly aware of the risk of disenfranchisement than those who have suffered from it. There is a knee upon the neck of democracy, and our nation can only live so long without the oxygen of freedom. NBC News correspondent Morgan Radford is at today's march in Washington, D.C. Allison, we're standing here just outside the Lincoln Memorial. You can see the leaders of this march, as well as the families who have been affected, who've lost loved ones to brutality and police brutality. They're coming here now, and we're about to now begin the march all the way to MLK Memorial. So, of course, this is on the 57th anniversary of that famous I Have a Dream speech delivered by Dr. King. And many of the people we've spoken to here today are asking, why are we still having to fight for justice, even in 2020, even 57 years after that famous speech was delivered. You can hear them chanting. Today they've been chanting, Black Lives Matter, no justice, no peace, because today this is about achieving equality, it is about achieving justice, and is it about achieving equal protection. Allison? A Wisconsin activist walked 750 miles just to get to that march on Washington. Frank Nitty told NBC News those miles are just one leg of the relay to end racial injustice. So we got about 34 or 33 miles on the other side of this to do, um, and then we there. When I found out they were having a George Floyd protest on the same day as the Martin Luther King speech, I felt like what better way to honor Martin Luther King than walking? And then I was like, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to walk there, you know. A lot of people was like, he's not going to make it, you know, didn't think I would really do it. So that's what really made it like a crazy idea to be going over 30 miles a day for 24 days straight. Frank uh, was out here protesting. He had been out here marching on a consistent basis for so many days. And then when he decided to walk to Washington, he asked me, he said, Tori, do you want to come along? I didn't. I said, if you're serious, let's go. Black lives so far, we've been called out of our names, uh, racial uh, epithets, and we have encountered every day things that should not have happened to any human being in America. These people are at war with us walking down the street. So we have to continue to bring these uh, nasty, ugly issues to the front so America can see ac exactly what's going on. My mother marched in the march. They're the same. Nothing's changed. And it, 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 it can't stay this way. It's been 400 years. It's time for a change. So we've had a lot of moments where people just had like an outpouring of love that happened from all the hate that we were receiving. Having people from Milwaukee drive down with tons of supplies, having the people in Warsaw come through with tons of supplies. There was an officer in Valparaiso that marched with us, stuck his hands up for Black Lives Matter. Um, before we left Indiana, there was a state trooper that gave me her badge and said, you fight for me while I fight for you. That was a very emotional moment for me as well. And to be a person, an individual that people look up to for that, I could never in a million years imagine that anyone would ever look up for, to me for that. So I thank God for this opportunity and I, I appreciate everyone that believes in anything that I say or anything that we're doing because we're just trying to get equality for black people. We need to get organized together as a nation of activists so we can call on each other whenever we need help. We need to demand change, not ask for change. They think this is a negotiation. This is not a negotiation. I came here to demand change. I'm tired. Are y'all tired? Because I'm tired. So when it's time to vote, we gonna vote. And if y'all see me up here, if you an activist, stop me out there so we can organize. It's time, this is the revolution. This is the revolution. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they wanna make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays, starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. Among the chaos, that I found a father trying to teach his son about peace. We don't have to retaliate with anger. We retaliate with love. That's why we're down here. There's always another way. So that's all I want them to see. This is a situation where the state continues to struggle to expand its testing capabilities. Protesters feel that they need to come out in full force and support their community because they feel like they're not getting that support from the Portland police. Another election day coming up against the backdrop of how to keep voters safe amid a pandemic. The moment to truly understand who we are and who we say we are is right here at our feet. 
got to get a four-year degree, but a four-year degree is super expensive. We have created a system where the ticket to the middle class is a thing that middle class families have to stress about and borrow for and patch together. Why is this happening? With Chris Hayes. Subscribe now. Today's headlines can be hard to understand, and a lot of kids have questions, so we started a newscast for them. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. We actually saw a large convoy of the National Guard come through here. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays, starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. This morning across the country, what the new normal for schools will look like. Many teachers left making tough choices between the job they love and their family. What am I going to decide? Take care of my children or have a job? That's an impossible decision. You're creating a little community school. This is a moment we can just develop ourselves and develop our community. Let's turn it over to students. How do they really feel about returning to school? What I miss is my teachers. They are resilient. A surge in coronavirus infection. New developments on several fronts. The story. Tonight, the U.S. shattering the record for most COVID cases in a single day. From every angle. What's your level of concern that the kids who have been told they're going to be home indefinitely won't be able to catch up? On the ground. Do you have faith that this is going to bring about change soon? And in death. Here in Portland, more protests expected tonight. Do you think that police in this country are under attack? NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. The news business is dynamic and probably has never been more important. With all that we're facing, I am so proud to bring the perspective of a black woman, a daughter of immigrants, the wife and mother of a husband and kids who sadly are more vulnerable to police violence because of their color, a proud nerd and a representative of the emerging America to cable TV news. I hope the great Gwen Eiffel and my mom, Philomena Carol Lamina, will look down from heaven and be proud. Search and rescue teams scouring Lake Charles, Louisiana today, just miles from where Hurricane Laura made landfall. NBC News correspondent Sam Brock rode along with the National Guard search and rescue team today. And I see, Sam, it looks like you are still with those guys today. Tell me all about it. Yeah, we're still uh, with the high water vehicles right now. These crews, Allison, have been spending all day loading up with supplies. We have some water here, some uh, ready to eat meals that they're handing out to folks who have lost power, lost electricity, lost water. As we drive down some of these streets, what you'll see is that in some cases, the power lines and or the street signals are just dangling, broken trees everywhere that have knocked into homes, roofs ripped off in some cases. This is actually a pretty mild block from what we've seen recently. And they're getting phone calls, the National Guard, from family members saying either we need help well, we can't locate someone. Can you please stop by and check on them? So they're doing that. They're also delivering the resources and bringing those who need shelter right now back home. Because the issue, I'll tell you, Allison, having been out here for the last several hours, is that people just can't get to their homes. I mean, trees are blocking the roads. Power lines are, rocking the roads, are blocking the roads. They can't get to where they need to go. They can't get the resources they need. And bear with us, it's a little bumpy right now. And so the National Guard is <laughs> using these really military style vehicles to get there, reach these folks and help them in whatever way they can. Sam, since some people haven't been able to get home yet, since they may not have necessarily gotten a chance to assess all the damage because they're still trying to get over trees and, and get through barricades. I apologize do, if you can't hear me right now. Crews, I cannot do, hear anyone. Oh, sorry, I got you, Allison. Sam? All right, I think we I got you. Oh, Sam, I think, oh, excellent. Hey, you got a little bit of a bumpy ride there. Losing your uh, earpiece is understandable. Uh, let me ask you this. I, I know that you said people are having trouble even just getting home. Has that made it difficult to assess just how bad the damage is uh, at this stage of the game? Yes, I mean, suffice it to say, the hundreds of millions, if not the billions, but trying to actually get onto the properties right now, they're not even at that advanced stage. There's tree cutting going on. There's power yeah. restoration. Um, those kind of need to happen yeah. first before you can have a really accurate damage assessment. I'd love to be able to, to play a soundbite for you, Allison, of a woman that we interviewed. Her name is Clara. She lives in this area. She found out that it was going to become a Category 4 hurricane too late, could not get out in time. Here's how she described her experience to us these last couple of days. 
It was demons. There was like demons outside of our house. It's devastation. It's sad. Oh, there's going to be people hurt. There's going to be people dead if they can find them, if they stay. We didn't know if our house was even going to be here, and we walked. And it, it was like when we came out of it, there was nobody. You saw Clara Burcham there holding back tears, or in some cases actually crying. I mean, the yeah. gratitude, Allison, that she expressed to these National Guardsmen, hard to articulate in words. The hugs, just the expressions on her face, you could tell it means so much that this help is coming right now. And they're doing about 110 missions a day. That's how many they did yesterday. The goal is to do the same or more now. A lot of these folks, Allison, they did stay behind, but it was not by choice. They found out either too late how strong this hurricane was going to be, or they don't have the means to get out. So before we look through this right. of a prism of people making irresponsible decisions, really, in many cases, they just got blindsided or didn't have the resources to leave. And that's why they right. find themselves in the position they're in right now. Yes, and we were talking about that with Ali Velsha yesterday. Some people just don't have uh, somewhere to go. They didn't have the money maybe for the gas, or like she said, they just didn't know until it was too late to go somewhere. Uh, Sam, thank you so much uh, for taking the time to talk to us. It must be uh, both such an upsetting thing to see the damage there and also uh, so heartwarming to see people so grateful for the help. It's the best of both worlds. I mean, the generosity that we're seeing right now and the pain they're experiencing, that's perfect way to capture it, Allison. Thank you for having me on. Sam, thanks so much. It could take weeks, if not months, for folks in Louisiana to recover from Hurricane Laura. NBC News reporter Priscilla Thompson joins me now from Sulphur, Louisiana. Priscilla, what are the biggest issues there today? Well, Allison, we are just now learning that the state of Louisiana is reporting an additional four storm-related deaths. Uh, these four people believed to have died from uh, carbon monoxide poisoning due to a generator that they had in their home. And so that does bring uh, the death toll from the storm up to 10. But you asked me about some of those other issues that they are facing here. And I think you can see some of that right behind me. This house has had essentially the entire roof torn off of it. And that that is the type of destruction that we're seeing in various areas uh, uh, throughout Lake Charles and Sulphur in this area. And, you know, there are some folks who are out here beginning to clean up the brush that are in their yards. But the other really big concern here is things like this, this down power line that you see here. There are many, many people right now who lost power during that storm and are still without power right now uh, as we speak. And so those are really uh, the issues at hand here. You've got fallen trees and the roads that folks are working to clear so that workers can get in to restore power and begin to restore uh, many of those services. The good news, however, is that the storm surge was originally predicted to be up to 20 feet, and that was not the case. They did not see a storm surge that high, and so you didn't see as many of those flooding, uh, the flooding of homes and those flood-related deaths that we might have seen, uh, but the damage and the destruction is what the folks uh, here are going to be left working to clear clean up, Allison. Priscilla, I know thousands of people evacuated ahead of the storm. Any idea when those people can go back home? Well, Allison, I was actually in Shreveport before this. That was one of the areas where folks were able to evacuate to. And as I made my way into Lake Charles and Sulphur earlier today, uh, there was definitely a lot of traffic on the roads. Um, I saw miles long lines of people looking to get gas. So it seems that some people may already be coming back in and they are able to do that. Uh, but local officials here have warned that folks need to be prepared, that they are coming into a situation where they are not going to have power or might not have water, and they need to be prepared to deal with that. Um, but the other thing that I'm actually seeing as I'm out here in this neighborhood is folks like this that you see down there in those bright colored vests, volunteers who have come in from all across the country to help out in this recovery effort. And I actually had an opportunity to speak uh, with one of those volunteers, Luke, earlier today about why he made the drive here from uh, Oklahoma. Take a listen to what he told me. Really, it's a call to service. Um, about 80% of Team Rubicon is made up of military veterans. Um, it just kind of runs in our blood. It's in our DNA. We want to get out and help. And once we get out of the service, sometimes our hands are kind of up and we don't really know what to do with ourselves. Just like anybody else, you turn the news on and see something like this happens. Um, 
you know, we want to help. So Team Rubicon is that avenue for it. The camaraderie we get working with other veterans, people that have done things, seen things we've done, it's amazing. And so they're just wrapping up here in this neighborhood, but they've actually been helping to clear some of those trees out of the roadway. Um, they tell me that the goal really is to help out in that way so that when those uh, crews come in to begin restoring power and restoring water, they're able to do that without having to worry about how they're going to get through on some of these streets that have been uh, pretty badly messed up. Allison. Priscilla, I know you're not all that far from Lake Charles, and they're dealing with a chemical plant fire there. Do we know the latest on that and what, what that situation is? Well, earlier today, we did know that the uh, the fire was still smoldering. And so the folks who live in that area okay. were still being asked if they were in a one mile radius of that area uh, to stay inside their homes. And that also means making sure that if they do have power, that air condition is not running and that those windows are closed. And that was a bit concerning because there was also a heat advisory uh, in many of these areas around here today. And so you've got people who are forced to be in their homes, uh, not open open windows, not go outside uh, as a heat advisory is going on, but it's because they don't want them to breathe in that contaminated air. Um, and, you know, those folks have a lot of them have been under that shelter order since yesterday during Hurricane Laura, when that chemical fire began. Uh, it had to do with a chlorine leak that sort of uh, caused that. Um, and so many of those folks have been stuck inside their homes, unable to leave, unable to get that fresh air uh, for at least 24 hours now, Allison. Priscilla, I know it's good news that you didn't see that terrible storm surge there, but I know it's also real tough for folks uh, without power, uh, dealing with all those downed trees, the roofs blown off their homes. Uh, I know it's a tough day there today. Thank you so much for uh, telling us what's going on. Thanks, Allison. Kamala Harris says the officer who shot Jacob Blake should be charged. The Democratic vice presidential nominee explaining her position in an exclusive interview with Today Show anchor Craig Melvin. As a former prosecutor and someone who worked closely with police for years, yeah. based on what you've seen, what you know about the case, is there a scenario in which that officer would have been justified, was justified in firing his weapon? Craig, I don't, I don't see it, but I don't have all the evidence. You know, from what I saw, which is what the public is seeing, so, you know, I'm not the prosecutor in the case. Um, I don't have all the evidence, but, you know, the man was, was going to a, his car. He didn't appear to be armed. And if he was not armed, if he was not armed, the use of force that was seven bullets coming out of a gun at close range in the back of the man, um, I, I don't see how anybody could reason that that was justifiable. Do you think the officer should be charged? I think that there should be a, a thorough investigation, and based on what I've seen, it, it seems that the officer should be charged. To yeah. those who are saying right now across this country, and there are a lot of folks who are saying, here's a man who uh, wouldn't follow police commands, law enforcement tried to use a, a, a taser, um, and then he apparently is, is reaching into a car where a knife was later found. And because of those reasons, we should reserve judgment and the officer should be afforded due process. What would you say to those people who are saying that? Everyone should be afforded due process. I, I agree with that completely. That is absolutely one of the important tenets of our, of our system of justice. Um, but it, here's the thing. In America, we know these cases keep happening. And we have had too many black men in America who have been the subject of this kind of conduct, and, and many of whom have lost their lives, and we speak their names all the time. Again, George Floyd, I, I mean, just as the most recent, you know, most public example of this. And it's got to stop. It's got to stop. You know, listen, there are still two forms of justice in America. We have to be honest about that. Republicans have made um, law and order a central theme of the campaign. Uh, they're, they're holding up the, the violent part of the protests in Kenosha, in Portland, in Seattle, in Minneapolis. They're holding these up as examples of what this country would look like if Joe Biden and Kamala Harris were to be elected. Last night, we heard Vice President Pence say 
um, people would not be safe in Joe Biden's America. A few hours ago, I, I heard the vice president say, Vice President Biden, I heard him say that the president was rooting for more violence. He thought President Trump was rooting for more violence. How, how does more violence help the president politically? I mean, I can't I, look. You're gonna have to ask Kellyanne Conway or somebody. I don't know, but that's not my that's not my deal to figure out his political strategy. But, but do I, you think? But I will say this about the Republican convention, some of which I have watched. I have yet to see these people who profess to be national leaders speak about this issue of the killing of unarmed black men, brown men, indigenous men in our country. I have yet to see them speak about it. And this is a moment. We are, we are two months, practically, a little bit more, away from an election to decide who will become the next president of the United States. While we are in the midst of at least four crises, and the American people, regardless of race, or gender or age or geographic location have a right to believe that their leaders will speak truth even when these are difficult truths to speak and to hear and we're not seeing that in the Republican National Convention we're not seeing that from the people who say that they should be leading our country from today into the future in the midst of these crises are you heading to the polls or to the post office this presidential election? NBC News can help you figure that out. Go to NBCNews.com slash plan your vote. We have a new state by state guide there with information on voting rules, deadlines and restrictions. Kyle Rittenhouse will stay in Illinois for now. Today, a judge delayed his extradition hearing until September 25th. Rittenhouse is the 17-year-old charged in connection with the shooting that killed two people and critically injured another in Kenosha, Wisconsin this week. NBC News reporter Shaquille Brewster joins me now from Kenosha. Shaq, what happened today? Why did the judge delay Rittenhouse's extradition hearing? Well, Allison, it was a hearing that lasted just about one minute. It was a virtual hearing when we didn't even see Rittenhouse in, uh, appear in that hearing. It was a hearing that was live streamed. And essentially what happened was his attorneys asked for more time. He said, they said they're, he's acquiring new counsel. He's trying to figure things out. And they asked for more time for any decision on extradition to be made. This was an extradition hearing. We know that Rittenhouse is from Antioch, Illinois, which is about 30 minutes away from where we are right now. He drove up to Kenosha on Tuesday with his firearm, and he is accused of shooting and killing two of those protesters injuring another one. And uh, this is a hearing to determine whether or not he will go from Illinois to Kenosha to be tried here. We know he's facing six counts right now, including reckless endangerment, including intentional homicide, including possession of a deadly weapon. His attorneys say that he was essentially uh, uh, acting in self-defense, calling it a classic self-defense charge or self-defense case. Um, but it's a matter of time. We'll see what exactly happens. We'll know that we'll see him in court on September 25th, just about 30 days from now, as that hearing has been postponed. Allison? Uh, Shaq, let's talk about Jacob Blake. His father says he is handcuffed to his hospital bed while he is currently paralyzed. I, I don't know how else to ask this, but why on earth is a paralyzed man in handcuffs in the hospital? Uh, and do you have a better understanding of why police were trying to detain him in the first place before he was shot? Well, to your second question, no, we don't have a better understanding of why police were trying to detain him. We have that statement from the attorney general. The state is running this investigation, and they say that officers arrived, they tried to arrest him, and they, two officers unsuccessfully tried to tase him, but they did not answer the question of why he was uh, subject to arrest initially. As for the, uh, the detail from his father that he's being uh, shackled to his hospital bed, well, the police chief just confirmed that detail. He said that he didn't have much to provide, but he said that currently Mr. Blake is being uh, held by an outside law enforcement agency. He said that it's in connection to an outstanding warrant that was issued in July that was connected to a third degree sexual assault charge. Now, we have reached out to Mr. Blake's attorney to see what is the status of that warrant. There is reporting out there suggesting that those warrants have shifted or there, there's been some sort of update with that. We were working to confirm that. But that was all the, off the police chief was able to say. And in addition to that, the police chief added that he did not know whether or not 
the officers, when they went to the, when they pulled up and responded to that call on Sunday night before the shooting, whether or not those officers were aware of the warrant. That's part of the state investigation, and that's where the uh, where Kenosha's police chief is kind of passing this off to, but now giving us that new detail. Allison. Shaq, how is Blake doing today? I know his father spoke at the march in Washington, D.C. Uh, what's the latest right. on his condition and how he's doing? His father is in Washington, D.C. right now. We actually got to catch up with him. Our Garrett Haig uh, interviewed him uh, as he was walking up before his speech. And one thing to note, he said while uh, his son is doing better, he is in the hospital, he is still holding on and fighting for his life. Listen to a little bit of the interview earlier today from D.C. But my son is paralyzed from the waist down. We don't know if he'll be paralyzed for the rest of his life or until the swelling. But I don't care. He grabbed my hand when I went into the hospital. He was, he was squinting. And... Uh, I said, what's wrong, man? You in pain? And he said, no, I thought I was hallucinating. And he grabbed my hand and he just wept. So you hear his father encounter, or explaining or revisiting the encounter he had with his own son. We know that he was here just a couple of days ago and got to have that experience with him in the hospital. Allison? Shaq, I just, I just can't stop shaking my head because I can't understand who a man who is in tears from pain, who is paralyzed, it, it, it is attached to the hospital bed. I know we need to move on from this one, but it just, it, it does not make sense to me at all. Border, it borders on, on sounding yeah. inhuman. Uh, I know today we also got some new information. Today, the Wisconsin DOJ identifying the other officers who were involved in Blake's shooting. What other information do you have? That's right. They gave a few more details about the exact exchange and what happened before the shooting. And they also detailed the officers involved. We already knew about Officer Rustin Chesky. He was the one who fired the seven shots into the back of Mr. Blake. That is confirmed by the uh, state DOJ, DOJ. But what they say in the new detail that we received is that right before the shooting, as per officers arrived, Mr. Chesky or Officer Chesky uh, also tried to tase Mr. Blake, and that was an unsuccessful attempt to tase him. There was another officer on the scene, Officer Vincent Arenas, who also fired his taser in that initial exchange, also fired it unsuccessfully. And then we also have the name of Officer Brittany Marinick. She just joined the force back in January. Her role in the situation is not exactly clear. I know there's some video uh, from that initial video that we saw that sparked everything. There's video sh showing her helping out and assisting Mr. Blake uh, after the shooting. Uh, but yes, we now have a fuller picture of what happened, an answering those or answers to those basic questions that we've been asking since the start of this, since Sunday night, where the real last statement that we got was on that Sunday night. Allison. Shaq, I know we need to let you go, but quick question before you do. Uh, what are the concerns? Yeah. Are there any about protests or violence or anything tonight and heading into the weekend? Well, I'll say the uh, protests for the past two nights have been largely peaceful. That is not to say that there haven't Great. been arrests. One of the main things that we've been seeing from law enforcement is they pulled up the curfew. So instead of it being at 8 p.m., it is now at 7 p.m. And in doing that, they explained the reason they did that is to allow uh, arrests to happen in daylight, essentially. And one of the arrests have already gone viral. It was the arrest of uh, folks in a black van and a bread truck. And they said they were with a, a food service, a food delivery service. Well, officers arrested nine individuals after they were seen filling up individual gas tanks um, or gas canisters uh, inside their vehicle. Officers say they found illegal fireworks, they found gas masks, and they found helmets. So officers are saying that is an example of what they can do now that they have an earlier uh, curfew time. In addition to that, we also have the mobilization of the National Guard that is still here. Three other states contributing to the efforts here in Wisconsin, contributing to the National Guard mission, still under the National Guard command, so still under state control. But now you have more reinforcements as we head into the weekend. We do expect protests to continue as they have been happening every night. Again, last two nights have been largely peaceful, so we expect that to happen through the weekend as people 
continue to reflect on and continue to react to the shooting of Mr. Blake. Allison. All right, Shaq, thank you so much. And thanks for all of your great coverage from Kenosha throughout the week. Thank you. Tuesday's Democratic Senate primary in Massachusetts is shaping up to be a close one. Senator Ed Markey has a slight lead over Congressman Joe Kennedy in the latest polls. Kennedy is a four-term congressman. He's also the grandson of Robert F. Kennedy. NBC News correspondent Antonia Hilton caught up with both candidates. Kennedy has hammered Senator Markey's immigration record and passed opposition to school integration efforts. And the concerns raised by the family of D.J. Henry, a black man killed by police 10 years ago. Senator, you were the only His one father tweeted this video about Markey. Uh, not only did you not act um, in any way, uh, but we felt like you were just dismissing us, um, using an, even the term colored in the conversation. Markey later apologized to the family. Are either of you the right person for this moment? We're looking at a race between two white men, one who's been a senator and in power for a very long time, and one who comes from a dynastic, well-known family. I am uh, a person of extraordinary privilege. I understand that. So from day one in this race, we have been really deliberate about one showing up in communities that often are overlooked and underheard. It does take activism and advocacy and engagement in a local community. And I think Senator Markey's had a long time to show that. Markey's spent the final days attacking Kennedy's commitment to progressive Hello. causes. Hello. How you doing? Hi. And contrasting the famous family's vast wealth yep, with his own humble beginnings. I like your sneakers. What do you Thank got? you. Why should a Massachusetts voter worry if you lose? I bring proven leadership and I am a change agent. Congressman Kennedy, when he had a chance to lead on Medicare, he waited two years. When he had a chance to respond to the State of the Union address for the whole party, he didn't even mention the climate crisis in his response. Do you not think that what? Congressman Kennedy counts as a progressive? So the question is, are you a leader? Do you get ahead of the curve? Are you willing to take risks to make the big changes on Medicare for all, on the Green New Deal, on ensuring that we don't militarize the streets of this country? Uh, and that's what I've done throughout my career. And that's not what Congressman Kennedy has been doing. I grew up here in Massachusetts. And as I've spoken to black voters, some of them have said that they haven't seen you in their communities. They're not sure you're really fighting for them. Well, uh, Rachel Rollins, who is the district attorney in Boston, has my back on uh, issue after issue. I have been there. I have been partnering and fighting with them on the issues that they care the most about. And that's why they have my back in this race. Thank you, Clement. Thank you for all you are doing. If Kennedy loses, he'll be the first in his family to lose a race in Massachusetts. Why not just wait till he retires? We're saying we'll give you six more years of something less than maximum effort. And somebody says, wait? It's somehow going to ruffle too many feathers? I'd like to help you. But a couple of folks thought it would be rude if I actually got it, jumped in, and pushed our country and our party to actually give you the dignity that you deserve. And if I lose fighting for that, I lose. But they deserve it. Hey, good luck. Antonia joins us live now. We heard from the candidates there. What else are you hearing from voters about these two Democrats? Hey, Allison. So it's been really interesting here in Massachusetts over the last several days, as I've spoken to voters, you see this race breaking down along lines of race, age, and class. And so one of the major drivers in the last couple of weeks has been the fact that young progressives here in Massachusetts are flocking to the 74-year-old incumbent Senator Ed Markey. And they're joining what's called the Markeyverse, uh, a Twitter and TikTok-fueled online community that celebrates his work on the Green New Deal, Medicare for All, and also pokes a bit of fun at Congressman Kennedy. Uh, Kennedy, on the other hand, though, has a bit of an edge with voters of color and working class voters who say they haven't seen Ed Markey in their communities over the years. They feel like he hasn't demonstrated much leadership. Some of them actually barely remembered who he was once this race got started. And they're interested in getting some fresh blood in there. And they also remember the Kennedy legacy. And some of those voters, particularly voters of color, think that Kennedy will fight for their issues uh, better than Markey has. And so uh, the young progressives are behind the 74-year-old. And then you see a lot of the voters of color and working class voters behind Kennedy. Uh, which uh, it makes for an interesting race where some of the assumptions you might have made on the surface yeah, about sure does. have been flipped upside down.
Yeah, it's such an interesting breakdown. Uh, let me ask you about House Speaker Nancy Pelosi. She endorsed Congressman Kennedy. How did that go over in Massachusetts? Yeah, Pelosi's endorsement was big news here. And I actually asked Congressman Kennedy about that directly. And what he said to me was, you know, no question about it. He saw her endorsement as a boost to his campaign. He sees her as a hero. However, what we saw was that the Markey uh, supporter, supporter community uh, looked at that endorsement as uh, more proof that their assessment of Kennedy as being to establishment as being part of a wealthy dynastic family that they see as feeling entitled to being a senator. Um, they saw her endorsement of Kennedy as proof that he was an establishment figure and that, you know, gave them all the more reason then to continue supporting Markey. And you actually saw him get a big influx of uh, donations from his supporters. And so, uh, you know, some of them have argued that Pelosi, you know, ended up kind of messing things up in the final days for Kennedy, although the Kennedy camp certainly sees her endorsement as, um, you know, something extremely positive and as a boost for the campaign. Uh, but it's certainly become a topic here. A lot of the voters, as I've been out following both campaigns, have brought it up. Some of them celebrate it, and others of them say, see, this is exactly what we're talking about. The 39-year-old uh, shouldn't get to pull the rug out from underneath uh, Markey. This is such a fascinating primary. We'll see how things turn out on Tuesday. Thank you so much. Thanks, Allison. And you can watch the full story tomorrow on The Weekend Report on Quibi. Viral pro-Trump tweets are coming from fake African-American spam accounts, Twitter says, and it's taking them down. The spammers are posing as black people leaving the Democratic Party in support of President Trump. NBC News reporter Ben Collins joins me now. Ben, tell us more about what happened here and how Twitter found out about it. Sure. So one of these tweets went extremely viral and was also very fishy. It was an account that said, you know, look, I'm a, I'm a lifelong Democrat. I'm going to vote Republican this year. This was on, you know, Wednesday of the RNC. And you could say, you know, I'm done with this trash. I'll be registering Republican. I got 13,000 retweets. Uh, and people were like, I don't really know about this. It kind of appears that this profile picture is a Dutch model, which it was. And I talked to that Dutch model. And he was pretty nervous about his identity being stolen. <laughs> And uh, oh, yeah, it, it, was, it was pretty rough. So Twitter uh, was like, okay, we should look into this. They found a spam network around this account and also another account called Kron619 had 38,000 followers and had five retweets, by the way, that had over 10, uh, five tweets that ever had over 10,000 retweets. So these are extraordinarily viral things tied to a spam operation that was pushing these pro-Trump messages pretending to be African-Americans. Ben, Twitter says it's seen an increase in copy pasta, an attempt to copy, paste, and tweet the same phrase, and that it may limit the visibility of those tweets. Uh, for non-super techies like me, copy pasta is a new term. What else should uh, average people who don't necessarily have your tech knowledge, what should we be watching out for here? What are other signs that the tweets you might be reading or the posts that you're seeing on social media are fake? So copy pasta is a, is a thing that was used by trolls for a long period of time uh, just to joke around and mess around with services. Now it appears it's being used for political purposes. This was a 4chan thing. It was a Reddit thing. And now it's becoming sort of a Twitter thing to joke around about politics or to seed these political messages. Um, and that's what you should look for. If you see the same tweet being tweeted over and over again underneath the replies of a famous person, a politician, somebody who's breaking news, um, that's what copy pasta mm -hmm. is. That's done to simulate support for uh, you know a group of people that really doesn't have that much support. It's astroturfing, um, and that's what happened here. These these some of these accounts um, they weren't just retweeted ten thousand times. They th those messages were then posted onto other fake African American accounts that were created this month. So uh, this is a coordinated thing. We don't know exactly who's behind it, uh, but we do know this is uh, this is not authentic. This is very artificial behavior. And it's probably something we're going to see a lot more of as the election gets closer. Ben Collins, thanks so much for talking us through it. And now I know what copy pasta is. I appreciate it. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you. Among the chaos that I found a father trying to teach his son about peace. We don't have to retaliate with anger. We retaliate with love. That's why we're down here. There's always another way. So that's all I want him to see. 
This is a situation where the state continues to struggle to expand its testing capabilities. Protesters feel that they need to come out in full force and support their community because they feel like they're not getting that support from the Portland police. Another election day coming up against the backdrop of how to keep voters safe amid a pandemic. The moment to truly understand who we are and who we say we are is right here at our feet. You got to get a four-year degree, but a four-year degree is super expensive. We have created a system where the ticket to the middle class is a thing that middle class families have to stress about and borrow for and patch together. Why is this happening? With Chris Hayes. Subscribe now. Today's headlines can be hard to understand, and a lot of kids have questions, so we started a newscast for them. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. We actually saw a large convoy of the National Guard come through here. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays, starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. This morning across the country, what the new normal for schools will look like. Many teachers left making tough choices between the job they love and their family. What am I going to decide? Take care of my children or have a job? That's an impossible decision. You're creating a little community school. This is a moment we can just develop ourselves and develop our community. Let's turn it over to students. How do they really feel about returning to school? What I miss is my teachers. They are resilient. A surge in coronavirus infection. New developments on several fronts. The story. Tonight, the U.S. shattering the record for most COVID cases in a single day. From every angle. What's your level of concern that the kids who have been told they're going to be home indefinitely won't be able to catch up? On the ground. Do you have faith that this is going to bring about change soon? And in death. Here in Portland, more protests expected tonight. Do you think that police in this country are under attack? NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. The news business is dynamic and probably has never been more important. With all that we're facing, I am so proud to bring the perspective of a black woman, a daughter of immigrants, the wife and mother of a husband and kids who sadly are more vulnerable to police violence because of their color, a proud nerd and a representative of the emerging America to cable TV news. I hope the great Gwen Eiffel and my mom, Philomena Carol Lamina, will look down from heaven and be proud. Homeland Security may start collecting phone numbers from travelers coming into U.S. airports for coronavirus contact tracing. Cue the privacy concerns. NBC News Justice correspondent Julia Ainsley joins me now. Julia, we're talking phone numbers and emails here. Who would be subject to this and how does this all fit into the federal government's current contact tracing program? Well, it's interesting, Allison, even Americans who are coming into the United States would be subject to this. Anyone arriving on an international flight would have to start providing more information. If you can think about arriving on your last international flight that might have not been in 2020, you had to provide some information, your address, (laughs) one phone number. Now they're going to start asking for email addresses, secondary phone numbers, secondary contacts that they can get in touch with. And this is what they are now considering. What is new here is more information, and they say that it's because they want to be able to do contact tracing. So say someone on your flight notifies the airline that they, after leaving the flight, tested positive for COVID-19, then they could alert all of the passengers. That sounds like a reasonable thing to do. But what people in the airline industry are saying is that this goes above and beyond what they're seeing in other countries and actually fails on some other levels. For example, unlike England, where someone would arrive in the UK and have to quarantine for 14 days, there's no such thing like this. There's really even no reporting requirement that you would have to tell the airline after you land. But they say that there aren't enough safeguards on this information. So some people who are civil liberties experts look at how this is being collected and say, there's no end date here. There's no time where they have to get rid of this information or to stop collecting this information. And DHS is so far not putting any safeguards that would keep this information from being used for other purposes like law enforcement. It would go into a database where anyone like ICE, say, could access this. When they say this could be another example of the administration using COVID to really promote some policies that they've long wanted to do, some of them may be to get more information on, say, people overstaying their visas. And they say that it really could cause more privacy concerns as they ask for more information. 
Julia, what kind of a sign off would a program like this need? What would have to happen for it to take effect? And are uh, the Department of Homeland Security or the CDC commenting? So right now they're not commenting. We know that this is being uh, kind of pinged back and forth between CDC and DHS. There are people at both agencies who have to look at this and sign off and see if this does meet standards. But, but really, in the end, this could be implemented much in the way we've seen executive orders be implemented kind of overnight by this administration. And then the process could always get halted in courts. One thing that's really interesting about this, though, is the argument that we need to watch people coming in on international flights, because some public health experts that we spoke to, my colleague Laura Strickler and I, said that really it's domestic flights you would want to watch more. There are places in the U.S. with 100 times more the number of COVID cases than some of these international destinations. But really, DHS only has yeah, jurisdiction sure. to collect information on the international travelers, which really throws into question the real reason and the purpose behind this to begin with. Yeah, it does for sure. Uh, Julia Ainsley, thank you so much for your reporting. Have a great weekend. You too. We have our first coronavirus reinfection case here in the U.S., according to researchers in Nevada. Doctors say a 25-year-old man tested positive for COVID-19 back in April, then tested positive again in May. NBC News medical correspondent Dr. John Torres joins me now. Dr. John, this is the first time we're talking about a reinfection case here in the U.S., but we've reported on at least four worldwide over the last week. Tell us what you know about the U.S. case, and then what are your concerns about reinfections going forward? And Allison, you know I like to put things in perspective. So let me put this in a little bit of perspective. Right now, 24 million cases worldwide that we know about. Of those 24 million cases, four are reinfections, are validated reinfections, verified ones that we know happen. So what's happened here in these four cases, one in Hong Kong, one in Belgium, one in the Netherlands, and now one in the U.S., is they got sick. They recovered from COVID-19, and then they got sick again from COVID-19 with a virus that was looked at genetically and found to be a little bit different the second time around than the first time. Two of those cases, they actually had less symptoms, so it looked like their antibodies kicked in and helped protect them from it. The other case, it was a person who had an immune system issues, so they're in a different category, but the U.S. case actually got sicker, and so that's raising a, a few concerns that, okay, what's happening here because the antibodies didn't seem to protect as much, but again, putting in perspective and talking to experts, what they're telling me is they would be surprised if this didn't happen because this is the nature of viruses. They're constantly changing. They're constantly mutating. And these are small mutations for the most part, but every now and then it can turn to a little bit bigger of a mutation, which means that people can get reinfected. But for the average person going around on their daily lives, not really going to affect them. Typically, this happens in academic and research and scientific communities, but now with so much attention being put on coronavirus, we're hearing about it in the media. And the main thing, the main concern is people will get panicky about this and get really anxious about it when, in fact, it's something that's happened on such a limited scale. It is going to take some watching, and a couple things need to happen. One, see if it happens more often. If it happens more often, that gets more concerning. But for the immediate term, What's that going to do to the vaccine? How's that going to affect the vaccine? We don't know at this point, and we're hoping the vaccine still is something you can get once, maybe twice in your lifetime. But if this continues, we see more reinfections, then it might be we need that vaccine on a yearly basis, much like we do with the flu shot now, Allison. Dr. John, let's talk a little bit, if you don't mind, about how the coronavirus spreads. We know it primarily spreads through the air. Do we have a sense of just how long it survives in the air? So on the average, and we've been talking about this for a month, it goes three to five feet. And that's why we talk about that social distancing of six feet. But we're finding out that some of those particles, and this is, again, the nature of how viruses spread, is some of those particles can turn into smaller particles, which are aerosolized or airborne particles, and they can last for longer periods of time. Theoretically, they can last for hours, but that doesn't necessarily mean that that's going to cause people to get sick. But the important part is to make sure that you have those airborne particles in that equation you use to try and figure out how to minimize people's risks. And that means, of course, making sure that that they that when they're in close contact, they wear masks, all those things we talk about because they help with both sides of the equation. Dr. John, I know you spoke with a Harvard professor about why we need outdoor air to stop this virus from spreading. What did he tell you? 
So, and he's talking about what he's now using, and I use as a fourth W. So, essentially, we talk about wear your mask, wash your hands, watch your distance. And he's added a fourth W, which is, win which is, he says windows for the W, but it stands for ventilation and uh, filtration. By ventilation, he's saying simply open up a window. And there's a very specific reason why he says we need to do that. Here's what he has to say. If I'm sick, right, and I'm emitting particles as we talk or sing or cough, they'll accumulate indoors. And in fact, the small particles will stay aloft indefinitely until one of two things happens. One is they're diluted out of the air through ventilation. So you want to bring in more outdoor air. Or you can clean them out of the air through filtration. But really, if we're not doing that, then the particle levels are just going to build up and up, up uh, in, while we spend time indoors. So essentially what he's talking about, again, is the vent ventilation and filtration. By ventilation, he's saying open windows, which is now the fourth W I'm going to start using, Allison. And by opening windows, we get that fresh air exchange for indoor air, and we lessen the chances of getting coronavirus. That's important. Even when the weather turns cold, it's important if you can do it. Put people, Bundle kids up, bundle teachers up, open those windows. Same thing at home, same thing in offices. All right. It's the fourth W. We'll be using it going forward. Dr. John, thanks so much. You bet. Hey, everyone. I'm Allison Morris. You are watching NBC News Now. Let's get to NBC News correspondent Savannah Sellers. She's got the very latest Friday headlines for us from NBCNews.com. Savannah, I will hand it off to you. Thanks, Allison. Yes, loving the Friday shirt. We're wrapping up this week with the devastation from Hurricane Laura. At least 11 are dead in Louisiana and Texas after the storm tore through the Gulf. Laura flattened buildings and left hundreds of thousands without power, and it could take days to fully assess the damage. The mayor of Lake Charles, Louisiana, spoke out about the destruction on the Today Show. What I didn't expect to see was there were literal, literal entire buildings that had been blown apart. There were facades of brick buildings that had been around for 100 years that were blown down. Uh, I mean, I was really, I was really blown away by, uh, by the devastation of some of these buildings. And a big update out of the NBA. The league says playoffs will restart Saturday following three days of postponed games. Of course, this all started Wednesday when the Milwaukee Bucks boycotted their playoff game to protest the shooting of Jacob Blake. The NBA and its players union also announced they'll create a social justice coalition to promote police and criminal justice reform. Teams also plan to work with local election officials to transform home arenas into polling locations for the November election. Meanwhile, 17-year-old Kyle Rittenhouse is now facing six charges over the killing of two people during protests in Kenosha, Wisconsin. Two of those charges include first-degree homicide, which means the teen could be sentenced to life in prison if he's convicted in Wisconsin. However, Rittenhouse lives in Illinois, and today a judge postponed a hearing to determine if he should return to Wisconsin to face charges. Rittenhouse's lawyers say he was acting in self-defense during the protests, all sparked by the officer involved shooting of Jacob Blake last weekend. Blake's father gave an update on his son's condition earlier today. Let's make it very clear. My son is, is fighting for his life. He's holding on. He's holding on. Um, he's medicated uh, pretty much all the time. Moving on to Capitol Hill, where House Democrats today announced contempt proceedings against Secretary of State Mike Pompeo. The House's Foreign Affairs Committee says Pompeo ignored requests to submit State Department documents, all related to the impeachment inquiry into President Trump. The committee's chairman, Elliot Engel, also criticized Pompeo for speaking at the RNC during a State Department trip to Israel. In a statement, Engel wrote that Pompeo Pompeo, quote, demonstrated alarming disregard for the laws and rules governing his own conduct. And lastly, Japan's longest-serving Prime Minister Shinzo Abe says he's resigning due to health issues. In a press conference, Abe appeared with tears in his eyes, explaining, quote, I cannot be Prime Minister if I cannot make the best decisions for the people. Abe has struggled with ulcerative colitis for years, a digestive illness that he says has recently gotten worse. He says he'll continue to serve until a new leader takes over within the coming weeks. Allison? All right, Savannah, thank you so much. We'll see you in about an hour. Sounds good. 
President Trump granting a full pardon to Alice Johnson at the White House today. She spoke at the Republican National Convention last night. Trump commuted Johnson's prison sentence back in 2018 after she spent more than two decades in jail on drug charges. So we're taking Alice from a commutation to a full pardon, and I'm going to sign it right now, and we're very proud of Alice and the job you've done and what you represent. NBC News correspondent Carol Lee joins me now. Carol, Kim Kardashian helped persuade President Trump to commute Johnson's sentence back in 2018. Do we know what pushed him to pardon her today? Well, Allison, according to the president, he saw her in the audience at his speech last night from the White House and decided to have her come over to the White House so he could give her a full pardon. He said that um, he asked his staff if they could get her, and she came over. He said they didn't even discuss it, meaning he and, and Alice, and he just signed the document right there. So it was a little um, spontaneous for him, whether he's been thinking about this for a long time, for a while now, I don't know, but he said that he had saw her uh, last night and decided this was something that he wanted to do. And she also spoke at the Republican National Convention. So um, the White House and the president certainly feel like this is one of his big success stories. And, uh, and obviously, he's trying to appeal to African-American voters in the run-up to the November election. And this is a place in which he thinks he has some potential to do that. Carol, if my math is correct, we have 67 days left till the election. Mm. President Trump's back on the campaign trail. He'll be in New Hampshire this evening. What's on his agenda? Well, his agenda is pretty simple. It's to try to win New Hampshire this time around. He lost it really narrowly in 2016, and now that they're trying the the president's campaign openly admits he needs every electoral vote he can get in November, and New Hampshire is was in striking distance, clearly, in 2016. Barack Obama won it in 2012. Um, and so President Trump is going to head there to hold a, an actual campaign rally. This is not an official White House event. There'll be about 1,000 people there, um, and acceptance speech at the White House last night. And, and But it's all aimed, Allison, at him trying to pick up as many electoral votes as he can in November, and New Hampshire's a state where his campaign feels like they were very close last time, and there's no reason why he shouldn't be able to get it this time. Carol, his RNC speech last night clocked in about, in about 70 minutes. He still mm -hmm. has more to say today, though. What has the president been tweeting about the RNC? Well, ratings, ratings, ratings. He loves to talk about ratings. Um, <laughs> and so he had tweeted that great ratings and reviews last night. Thank you. Um, and he's he's really focused on the idea that a lot of people tuned into his speech. He was um, told very happy about the way that it looked in the setting, even though obviously it's highly controversial that he decided to hold his speech at the White House. But he's, uh, you know, focused on, on ratings, which, which frankly are a little bit down from what the Democratic convention convention was, but we, we know from the president that that's something he pays very close attention to, and so that's what he's been tweeting about today, Allison. How about the campaign, Carol? Uh, what's the Trump campaign saying about the convention? They're feeling really good about it. They feel like both weeks, actually, that last week they did a really good effort to counter-program the Democratic convention. The president was out there traveling almost every day in different states, and they feel like the convention went really well for them. You have uh, Tim Murtaugh, the Trump campaign's communications director, said our four days were unqualified success and that that he felt like they had really done a, a tremendous job in terms of getting the president's message out there. He said that the president, over four days, um, was an unqualified success, and the president delivered exactly the message he should deliver. He also said that, you know, they feel like they dominated the week and that they um, managed to, at the same time, now that Joe Biden is getting out on the campaign trail, uh, smoke him out. That's how, the, how they're putting it, that they, you know, have obviously made an issue of, of Joe Biden being in his basement. He's now getting out, and he's supposed to campaign a little bit in the country. They feel like that's a success. They would like him to be out there. They really want, um, they, in their view, they feel like the more that Joe Biden is out there in front of voters, the better that is for Donald Trump. But they feel quite good about the convention, and they're trying now to capitalize it and keep the momentum going with by having the president out there in New Hampshire today. All right, convention season, if you will. Our two weeks of conventions are now over. It's yeah. time for campaigning. Carol, thank you so much. <laughs> 
57 years after Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. delivered his I Have a Dream speech in Washington, D.C., a new generation of leaders raising its voice in the fight against racial injustice. Thousands of people took to the National Mall today for the Get Your Knee Off Our Next Commitment March on Washington. Dr. King's eldest son, Martin Luther King III, spoke in the very same steps where his father shared his dream for America. We need to vote as if our lives and our livelihoods, our liberties depend on it, because they do. No person, no people are more keenly aware of the risk of disenfranchisement than those who have suffered from it. There's a knee upon the neck of democracy, and our nation can only live so long without the oxygen of freedom. NBC News correspondent Morgan Radford is at today's march in Washington, D.C. Allison, we're standing here just outside the Lincoln Memorial. You can see the leaders of this march, as well as the families who have been affected, who've lost loved ones to brutality and police brutality. They're coming here now, and we're about to now begin the march all the way to MLK Memorial. So, of course, this is on the 57th anniversary of that famous I Have a Dream speech delivered by Dr. King. And many of the people we've spoken to here today are asking, why are we still having to fight for justice, even in 2020, even 57 years after that famous speech was delivered. You can hear them chanting. Today they've been chanting, Black Lives Matter, no justice, no peace, because today this is about achieving equality, it is about achieving justice, and is it about achieving equal protection. Allison? A Wisconsin activist walked 750 miles just to get to that march on Washington. Frank Nitti told NBC News those miles are just one leg of the relay to end racial injustice. So we got about 34 or 33 miles on the other side of this to do, um, and then we're there. When I found out they were having the George Floyd protest on the same day as the Martin Luther King speech, I felt like what better way to honor Martin Luther King than walking? And then I was like, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to walk there, you know. A lot of people was like, he's not going to make it, you know, didn't think I would really do it. So that's what really made it like a crazy idea to be going over 30 miles a day for 24 days straight. Frank uh, was out here protesting. He had been out here marching on a consistent basis for so many days. And then when he decided to walk to Washington, he asked me, he said, Tori, do you want to come along? I didn't. I said, if you're serious, let's go. Black lives far we've been called out of our names, uh, racial uh, epithets, and we have encountered every day things that should not have happened to any human being in America. These people are at war with us walking down the street, so we have to continue to bring these uh, nasty, ugly issues to the front so America can see exactly what's going on. My mother marched in the march. They're the same. Nothing's changed. And it, 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 it can't stay this way. It's been 400 years. It's time for a change. So we've had a lot of moments where people just had like an outpouring of love that happened from all the hate that we were receiving. Having people from Milwaukee drive down with tons of supplies, having the people in Warsaw come through with tons of supplies. There was an officer in Valparaiso that marched with us, took his hands up for Black Lives Matter. Um, before we left Indiana, there was a state trooper that gave me her badge and said, you fight for me while I fight for you. That was a very emotional moment for me as well. And to be a person, an individual that people look up to for that, I could never in a million years imagine that anyone would ever look up to me for that. So I thank God for this opportunity and I, I appreciate everyone that believes in anything that I say or anything that we're doing because we're just trying to get equality for black people. We need to get organized together as a nation of activists so we can call on each other whenever we need help. We need to demand change, not ask for change. They think this is a negotiation. This is not a negotiation. I came here to demand change. I'm tired. Are y'all tired? Because I'm tired. So when it's time to vote, we're going to vote. And if y'all see me up here, if you're an activist, stop me out there so we can organize. It's time. This is the revolution. This is the revolution. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. Among the chaos, I found a father trying to teach his son about peace. 
We don't have to retaliate with anger. We retaliate with love. That's why we're down here. There's always another way. So that's all I want him to see. This is a situation where the state continues to struggle to expand its testing capabilities. Protesters feel that they need to come out in full force and support their community because they feel like they're not getting that support from the Portland police. Another election day coming up against the backdrop of how to keep voters safe amid a pandemic. The moment to truly understand who we are and who we say we are is right here at our feet. You got to get a four-year degree, but a four-year degree is super expensive. We have created a system where the ticket to the middle class is a thing that middle class families have to stress about and borrow for and patch together. Why is this happening? With Chris Hayes. Subscribe now. Today's headlines can be hard to understand, and a lot of kids have questions, so we started a newscast for them. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. But we actually saw a large convoy of the National Guard come through here. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays, starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. This morning across the country, what the new normal for schools will look like. Many teachers left making tough choices between the job they love and their family. What am I going to decide? Take care of my children or have a job? That's an impossible decision. You're creating a little community school. This is a moment we can just develop ourselves and develop our community. Let's turn it over to students. How do they really feel about returning to school? What I miss is my teachers. They are resilient. A surge in coronavirus infection. New developments on several fronts. The story. Tonight, the U.S. shattering the record for most COVID cases in a single day. From every angle. What's your level of concern that the kids who have been told they're going to be home indefinitely won't be able to catch up? On the ground. Do you have faith that this is going to bring about change soon? And in depth. Here in Portland, more protests expected tonight. Do you think that police in this country are under attack? NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. The news business is dynamic and probably has never been more important. With all that we're facing, I am so proud to bring the perspective of a black woman, a daughter of immigrants, the wife and mother of a husband and kids who sadly are more vulnerable to police violence because of their color, a proud nerd, and a representative of the emerging America to cable TV news. I hope the great Gwen Eiffel and my mom, Philomena Carol Lamina, will look down from heaven and be proud. Search and rescue teams scouring Lake Charles, Louisiana today, just miles from where Hurricane Laura made landfall. NBC News correspondent Sam Brock rode along with the National Guard search and rescue team today. And I see, Sam, it looks like you are still with those guys today. Tell me all about it. Yeah, we're still uh, with the high water vehicles right now. These crews, Allison, have been spending all day loading up with supplies. We have some water here, some uh, ready to eat meals that they're handing out to folks who have lost power, lost electricity, lost water. As we drive down some of these streets, what you'll see is that in some cases, the power lines and or the street signals are just dangling. Broken trees everywhere that have knocked into homes, roofs ripped off in some cases. This is actually a pretty mild block from what we've seen recently. And they're getting phone calls, the National Guard, from family members saying either we need help or we can't locate someone. Can you please stop by and check on them? So they're doing that. They're also delivering the resources and bringing those who need shelter right now back home. Because the issue, I'll tell you, Allison, having been out here for the last several hours, is that people just can't get to their homes. I mean, trees are blocking the roads. Power lines are blocking the roads. Are blocking the roads. They can't get to where they need to go. They can't get the resources they need. And bear with us, it's a little bumpy right now. And so the National Guard is <laughs> using these really military-style vehicles to get there, reach these folks, and help them in whatever way they can. Sam, since some people haven't been able to get home yet, since they may not have necessarily gotten a chance to assess all the damage, because they're still trying to get over trees and, and get through barricades. I apologize do, if you can't hear me right rescue now. Crews, I cannot do, hear anyone. Oh, sorry, I got you, Sam. Allison. All right, I think we... I got you. Oh, Sam, I think... Oh, excellent. Hey, you got a little bit of a bumpy ride there. Losing your uh, earpiece is understandable. Uh, let me ask you this. I, I know that you said people are having trouble even just getting home. Has that made it difficult to assess just how bad the damage is uh, at this stage of the game? 
Yes, I mean, suffice it to say, the hundreds of millions, if not the billions, but trying to actually get onto the properties right now, they're not even at that advanced stage. There's tree cutting going on, there's power yeah. restoration. Um, those kind of need to happen yeah. first before you can have a really accurate damage assessment. I'd love to be able to, to play a soundbite for you, Allison, of a woman that we interviewed. Her name is Clara. She lives in this area. She found out that it was going to become a Category 4 hurricane too late, could not get out in time. Here's how she described her experience to us these last couple of days. It was demons. There was like demons outside of our house. It's devastation. It's sad. Oh, there's going to be people hurt. There's going to be people dead if they can find them, if they stay. We didn't know if our house was even going to be here, and we walked. And it, it was like when we came out of it, there was nobody. You saw Clara Bertram there holding back tears, or in some cases actually crying. I mean, the yeah. gratitude, Allison, that she expressed to these National Guardsmen, hard to articulate in words. The hugs, just the expressions on her face, you could tell it means so much that this help is coming right now. And they're doing about 110 missions a day. That's how many they did yesterday. The goal is to do the same or more now. A lot of these folks, Allison, they did stay behind, but it was not by choice. They found out either too late how strong this hurricane was going to be, or they don't have the means to get out. So before we look through this right. of a prism of people making irresponsible decisions, really, in many cases, they just got blindsided or didn't have the resources to leave. And that's why they right. find themselves in the position they're in right now. Yes, and we were talking about that with Ali Velsha yesterday. Some people just don't have uh, somewhere to go. They didn't have the money maybe for the gas, or like she said, they just didn't know until it was too late to go somewhere. Uh, Sam, thank you so much uh, for taking the time to talk to us. It must be uh, both such an upsetting thing to see the damage there and also uh, so heartwarming to see people so grateful for the help. It's the best of both worlds. I mean, the generosity that we're seeing right now and the pain they're experiencing, that's Perfect way to capture it, Allison. Thank you for having me on. It could take weeks, if not months, for folks in Louisiana to recover from Hurricane Laura. NBC News reporter Priscilla Thompson joins me now from Sulphur, Louisiana. Priscilla, what are the biggest issues there today? Well, Allison, we are just now learning that the state of Louisiana is reporting an additional four storm-related deaths. Uh, these four people believe to have died from uh, carbon monoxide poisoning due to a generator that they had in their home. And so that does bring uh, the death toll from the storm up to 10. But you asked me about some of those other issues that they are facing here, and I think you can see some of that right behind me. This house has had essentially the entire roof torn off of it. and. That is the type of destruction that we're seeing in various areas uh, uh, throughout Lake Charles and Sulphur in this area. And, you know, there are some folks who are out here beginning to clean up the brush that are in their yards. But the other really big concern here is things like this, this down power line that you see here. There are many, many people right now who lost power during that storm and are still without power right now uh, as we speak. And so those are really uh, the issues at hand here. You've got fallen trees and the roads that folks are working to clear so that workers can get in to restore power and begin to restore uh, many of those services. The good news, however, is that the storm surge was originally predicted to be up to 20 feet, and that was not the case. They did not see a storm surge that high, and so you didn't see as many of those flooding, uh, the flooding of homes and those flood-related deaths that we might have seen, uh, but the damage and the destruction is what the folks uh, here are going to be left working to clean up, Allison. Priscilla, I know thousands of people evacuated ahead of the storm. Any idea when those people can go back home? Well, Allison, I was actually in Shreveport before this. That was one of the areas where folks were able to evacuate to. And as I made my way into Lake Charles and Sulphur earlier today, uh, there was definitely a lot of traffic on the roads. Um, I saw miles long lines of people looking to get gas. So it seems that some people may already be coming back in and they are able to do that. Uh, but local officials here have warned that folks need to be prepared, that they are coming into a situation where they are not going to have 
have power or might not have water, and they need to be prepared to deal with that. Um, but the other thing that I'm actually seeing as I'm out here in this neighborhood is folks like this that you see down there in those bright colored vests, volunteers who have come in from all across the country to help out in this recovery effort. And I actually had an opportunity to speak uh, with one of those volunteers, Luke, earlier today about why he made the drive here from uh, Oklahoma. Take a listen to what he told me. Really, it's a call to service. Um, about 80% of Team Rubicon is made up of military veterans. Um, it just kind of runs in our blood. It's in our DNA. We want to get out and help. And once we get out of the service, sometimes our hands are kind of up and we don't really know what to do with ourselves. Just like anybody else, you turn the news on and see something like this happens. Um, you know, we want to help. So Team Rubicon is that avenue for it. The camaraderie we get working with other veterans, people that have done things, seen things we've done. It's amazing. And so they're just wrapping up here in this neighborhood, but they've actually been helping to clear some of those trees out of the roadway. Um, they tell me that the goal really is to help out in that way so that when those uh, crews come in to begin restoring power and restoring water, they're able to do that without having to worry about how they're going to get through on some of these streets that have been uh, pretty badly messed up. Allison. Priscilla, I know you're not all that far from Lake Charles, and they're dealing with a chemical plant fire there. Do we know the latest on that and what, what that situation is? Well, earlier today, we did know that the uh, the fire was still smoldering. And so the folks who live in that area okay. were still being asked if they were in a one mile radius of that area uh, to stay inside their homes. And that also means making sure that if they do have power, that air condition is not running and that those windows are closed. And that was a bit concerning because there was also a heat advisory uh, in many of these areas around here today. And so you've got people who are forced to be in their homes, uh, not only open windows, not go outside uh, as a heat advisory is going on, but it's because they don't want them to breathe in that contaminated air. Um, and, you know, those folks have, a lot of them have been under that shelter order since yesterday during Hurricane Laura when that chemical fire began. Uh, it had to do with a chlorine leak that sort of uh, caused that. Um, and so many of those folks have been stuck inside their homes, unable to leave, unable to get that fresh air uh, for at least 24 hours now, Allison. Priscilla, I know it's good news that you didn't see that terrible storm surge there, but I know it's also real tough for folks uh, without power, uh, dealing with all those down trees, the roofs blown off their homes. Uh, I know it's a tough day there today. Thank you so much for uh, telling us what's going on. Thanks, Allison. Kamala Harris says the officer who shot Jacob Blake should be charged. The Democratic vice presidential nominee explaining her position in an exclusive interview with Today Show anchor Craig Melvin. As a former prosecutor and someone who worked closely with police for years, yeah. based on what you've seen, what you know about the case, is there a scenario in which that officer would have been justified, was justified in firing his weapon? Craig, I don't, I don't see it, but I don't have all the evidence. You know, from what I saw, which is what the public is seeing, so, you know, I'm not the prosecutor in the case. Um, I don't have all the evidence, but, you know, the man was, was going to a, his car. He didn't appear to be armed. And if he was not armed, if he was not armed, the use of force that was seven bullets coming out of a gun at close range in the back of the man, um, I, I don't see how anybody could reason that that was justifiable. Do you think the officer should be charged? I think that there should be a, a thorough investigation, and based on what I've seen, it, it seems that the officer should be charged. To yeah. those who are saying right now across this country, and there are a lot of folks who are saying, here's a man who uh, wouldn't follow police commands, law enforcement tried to use a, a, a taser, um, and then he apparently is, is reaching into a car where a knife was later found. And because of those reasons, we should reserve judgment and the officer should be afforded due process. What would you say to those people who are saying that? Everyone should be afforded due process. I, I agree with that completely. That is absolutely one of the important tenets of our, of our system of justice. Um, but it, here's the thing. In America, we know these cases keep happening. And we have had too many black men in America who have been the subject of this kind of conduct. 
and, and many of whom have lost their lives, and we speak their names all the time. Again, George Floyd. I mean, just as the most recent, you know, most public example of this. And it's got to stop. It's got to stop. You know, listen, there are still two forms of justice in America. We have to be honest about that. Republicans have made um, law and order a central theme of the campaign. Uh, they're, they're holding up the, the violent part of the protests in Kenosha, in Portland, in Seattle, in Minneapolis. They're holding these up as examples of what this country would look like if Joe Biden and Kamala Harris were to be elected. Last night we heard Vice President Pence say um, people would not be safe in Joe Biden's America. A few hours ago, I, I heard the vice president say, Vice President Biden, I heard him say that the president was rooting for more violence. He thought President Trump was rooting for more violence. How, how does more violence help the president politically? I mean, I can't I, look. You're gonna have to ask Kellyanne Conway or somebody. I don't know. But that's not my that's not my deal to figure out his political strategy. But, but do I, you think? But I will say this about the Republican convention, some of which I have watched. I have yet to see these people who profess to be national leaders speak about this issue of the killing of unarmed black men, brown men, indigenous men in our country. I have yet to see them speak about it. And this is a moment. We are, we are two months, practically, a little bit more, away from an election to decide who will become the next president of the United States. While we are in the midst of at least four crises, and the American people, regardless of race, or gender, or age, or geographic location, have a right to believe that their leaders will speak truth, even when these are difficult truths to speak and to hear. And we're not seeing that in the Republican National Convention. We're not seeing that from the people who say that they should be leading our country from today into the future in the midst of these crises. Are you heading to the polls or to the post office this presidential election? NBC News can help you figure that out. Go to NBCNews.com slash plan your vote. We have a new state by state guide there with information on voting rules, deadlines and restrictions. Kyle Rittenhouse will stay in Illinois for now. Today, a judge delayed his extradition hearing until September 25th. Rittenhouse is the 17-year-old charged in connection with the shooting that killed two people and critically injured another in Kenosha, Wisconsin this week. NBC News reporter Shaquille Brewster joins me now from Kenosha. Shaq, what happened today? Why did the judge delay Rittenhouse's extradition hearing? Well, Allison, it was a hearing that lasted just about one minute. It was a virtual hearing when we didn't even see Rittenhouse in, uh, appear in that hearing. It was a hearing that was live streamed. And essentially what happened was his attorneys asked for more time. He said, they said they're, he's acquiring new counsel. He's trying to figure things out. And they asked for more time for any decision on extradition to be made. This was an extradition hearing. We know that Rittenhouse is from Antioch, Illinois, which is about 30 minutes away from where we are right now. He drove up to Kenosha on Tuesday with his firearm, and he is accused of shooting and killing two of those protesters, injuring another one. And uh, this is a hearing to determine whether or not he will go from Illinois to Kenosha to be tried here. We know he's facing six counts right now, including reckless endangerment, including intentional homicide, including possession of a deadly weapon. His attorneys say that he was essentially uh, uh, acting in self-defense, calling it a classic self-defense charge or self-defense case. Um, but it's a matter of time. We'll see what exactly happens. We'll know that we'll see him in court on September 25th, just about 30 days from now, as that hearing has been postponed. Allison? Uh, Shaq, let's talk about Jacob Blake. His father says he is handcuffed to his hospital bed while he is currently paralyzed. I, I don't know how else to ask this, but why on earth is a paralyzed man in handcuffs in the hospital? Uh, and do you have a better understanding of why police were trying to detain him in the first place before he was shot? Well, to your second question, no, we don't have a better understanding of why police were trying to detain him. We have that statement from the attorney general. The state is running this investigation, and they say that officers arrived, they tried to arrest him, and they, two officers unsuccessfully tried to tase him, but they did not answer the question of why he was uh, subject to arrest initially. 
Uh, as for the, uh, the detail from his father that he's being uh, shackled to his hospital bed, well, the police chief just confirmed that detail. He said that he didn't have much to provide, but he said that currently Mr. Blake is being uh, held by an outside law enforcement agency. He said that it's in connection to an outstanding warrant that was issued in July that was connected to a third-degree sexual assault charge. Now, we have reached out to Mr. Blake's attorney to see what is the status of that warrant. There is reporting out there suggesting that those warrants have shifted or there, there's been some sort of update with that. We were working to confirm that. But that was all the, off, the police chief was able to say. And in addition to that, the police chief added that he did not know whether or not the officers, when they went to the, when they pulled up and responded to that call on Sunday night before the shooting, whether or not those officers were aware of the warrant. That's part of the state investigation, and that's where the uh, where Kenosha's police chief is kind of passing this off to, but now giving us that new detail. Allison. Shaq, how is Blake doing today? I know his father spoke at the march in Washington, D.C. Uh, what's the latest right. on his condition and how he's doing? His father is in Washington, D.C. right now. We actually got to catch up with him. Our Garrett Haig uh, interviewed him uh, as he was walking up before his speech. And one thing to note, he said while uh, his son is doing better, he is in the hospital, he is still holding on and fighting for his life. Listen to a little bit of the interview earlier today from D.C. But my son is paralyzed from the waist down. We don't know if he'll be paralyzed for the rest of his life or until the swelling. But I don't care. He grabbed my hand when I went into the hospital. He was, he was squinting. And... Uh, I said, what's wrong, man? You in pain? And he said, no, I thought I was hallucinating. And he grabbed my hand and he just wept. So you hear his father encounter, or explaining or revisiting the encounter he had with his own son. We know that he was here just a couple of days ago and got to have that experience with him in the hospital. Allison? Shaq, I just, I just can't stop shaking my head because I can't understand who a man who is in tears from pain, who is paralyzed, it, it, it is attached to the hospital bed. I know we need to move on from this one, but it just, it, it does not make sense to me at all. Border, it borders on, on sounding yeah. inhuman. Uh, I know today we also got some new information. Today, the Wisconsin DOJ identifying the other officers who were involved in Blake shooting. What other information do you have? That's right. They gave a few more details about the exact exchange and what happened before the shooting. And they also detailed the officers involved. We already knew about Officer Rustin Chesky. He was the one who fired the seven shots into the back of Mr. Blake. That is confirmed by the uh, state DOJ, DOJ. But what they say in the new detail that we received is that right before the shooting, as for officers arrived, Mr. Chesky or Officer Chesky uh, also tried to tase Mr. Blake, and that was an unsuccessful attempt to tase him. There was another officer on the scene, Officer Vincent Arenas, who also fired his taser in that initial exchange, also fired it unsuccessfully. And then we also have the name of Officer Brittany Marinick. She just joined the force back in January. Her role in the situation is not exactly clear. I know there's some video uh, from that initial video that we saw that sparked everything. There's video sh showing her helping out and assisting Mr. Blake uh, after the shooting. Uh, but yes, we now have a fuller picture of what happened, ans answering those or answers to those basic questions that we've been asking since the start of this, since Sunday night, where the real last statement that we got was on that Sunday night. Allison. Shaq, I know we need to let you go, but quick question before you do. Uh, what are the concerns? Yeah. Are there any about protests or violence or anything tonight and heading into the weekend? Well, I'll say the uh, protests for the past two nights have been largely peaceful. That is not to say that there haven't Great. been arrests. One of the main things that we've been seeing from law enforcement is they pulled up the curfew. So instead of it being at 8 p.m., it is now at 7 p.m. And in doing that, they explain the reason they did that is to allow uh, arrests to happen in daylight, essentially. And one of the arrests have already gone viral. It was the arrest of uh, folks in a black van and a bread truck. And they said they were with a, a food service, a food delivery service. Well, officers arrested nine individuals after they were seen filling up individual gas tanks. 
um, or gas canisters uh, inside the vehicle. Officers say they found illegal fireworks, they found gas masks, and they found helmets. So officers are saying that is an example of what they can do now that they have an earlier uh, curfew time. In addition to that, we also have the mobilization of the National Guard that is still here. Three other states contributing to the efforts here in Wisconsin, contributing to the National Guard mission, still under the National Guard command, so still under state control. But now you have more reinforcements as we head into the weekend. We do expect protests to continue as they have been happening every night. Again, last two nights have been largely peaceful, so we expect that to happen through the weekend as people continue to reflect on and continue to react to the shooting of Mr. Blake. Allison? All right, Shaq, thank you so much, and thanks for all of your great coverage from Kenosha throughout the week. Thank you. Tuesday's Democratic Senate primary in Massachusetts is shaping up to be a close one. Senator Ed Markey has a slight lead over Congressman Joe Kennedy in the latest polls. Kennedy is a four-term congressman. He's also the grandson of Robert F. Kennedy. NBC News correspondent Antonia Hilton caught up with both candidates. Kennedy has hammered Senator Markey's immigration record and passed opposition to school integration efforts. And the concerns raised by the family of D.J. Henry, a black man killed by police 10 years ago. Senator, you were the only His father didn't, tweeted this video about Markey. Uh, not only did you not act um, in any way, uh, but we felt like you were just dismissing us, um, using an, even the term colored in the conversation. Markey later apologized to the family. Are either of you the right person for this moment? We're looking at a race between two white men, one who's been a senator and in power for a very long time, and one who comes from a dynastic, well-known family. I am uh, a person of extraordinary privilege. I understand that. So from day one in this race, we have been really deliberate about one showing up in communities that often are overlooked and underheard. It does take activism and advocacy and engagement in a local community. And I think Senator Markey had a long time to show that. Markey spent the final days attacking Kennedy's commitment to progressive Hello. causes. Hello. How you doing? Hi. And contrasting the famous family's vast wealth yep, with his own humble beginnings. I like your sneakers. What do you Thank got? you. Why should a Massachusetts voter worry if you lose? I bring proven leadership and I am a change agent. Congressman Kennedy, when he had a chance to lead on Medicare, he waited two years. When he had a chance to respond to the State of the Union address for the whole party, he didn't even mention the climate crisis in his response. Do you not think that what? Congressman Kennedy counts as a progressive? So the question is, are you a leader? Do you get ahead of the curve? Are you willing to take risks to make the big changes on Medicare for all, on the Green New Deal, on ensuring that we don't militarize the streets of this country? Uh, and that's what I've done throughout my career. And that's not what Congressman Kennedy has been doing. I grew up here in Massachusetts, and as I've spoken to black voters, some of them have said that they haven't seen you in their communities. They're not sure you're really fighting for them. Well, uh, Rachel Rollins, who is the district attorney in Boston, has my back on uh, issue after issue. I have been there. I have been partnering and fighting with them on the issues that they care the most about. And that's why they have my back in this race. Thank you, Clement. Thank you for all you're doing. If Kennedy loses, he'll be the first in his family to lose a race in Massachusetts. Why not just wait till he retires? We're saying we'll give you six more years of something less than maximum effort. And somebody says, wait? It's somehow going to ruffle too many feathers? I'd like to help you. But a couple of folks thought it would be rude if I actually got it, jumped in, and pushed our country and our party to actually give you the dignity that you deserve. And if I lose fighting for that, I lose. But they deserve it. Hey, good luck. Antonia joins us live now. We heard from the candidates there. What else are you hearing from voters about these two Democrats? Hey, Allison. So it's been really interesting here in Massachusetts over the last several days, as I've spoken to voters, you see this race breaking down along lines of race, age, and class. And so one of the major drivers in the last couple of weeks has been the fact that young progressives here in Massachusetts are flocking to the 74-year-old incumbent Senator Ed Markey. And they're joining what's called the Markeyverse, uh, a Twitter and TikTok-fueled online community that celebrates his work on the Green New Deal, Medicare for All, and also pokes a bit of fun at Congressman Kennedy. Uh, Kennedy, on the other hand, though, has a bit of an edge with voters of color and working class voters who say they haven't seen Ed Markey in their communities over the years. They 
they feel like he hasn't demonstrated much leadership. Some of them actually barely remembered who he was once this race got started. And they're interested in getting some fresh blood in there. And they also remember the Kennedy legacy. And some of those voters, particularly voters of color, think that Kennedy will fight for their issues uh, better than Markey has. And so uh, the young progressives are behind the 74-year-old. And then you see a lot of the voters of color and working class voters behind Kennedy. Uh, which uh, it makes for an interesting race where some of the assumptions you might have made on the surface yeah, about it sure does. have been flipped upside down. Yeah, it's such an interesting breakdown. Uh, let me ask you about House Speaker Nancy Pelosi. She endorsed Congressman Kennedy. How did that go over in Massachusetts? Yeah. Pelosi's endorsement was big news here, and I actually asked Congressman Kenny about that directly. And what he said to me was, you know, no question about it. He saw her endorsement as a boost to his campaign. He sees her as a hero. However, what we saw was that the Markey uh, supporter, supporter community uh, looked at that endorsement as uh, more proof that their assessment of Kennedy as being to establishment as being part of a wealthy dynastic family that they see as feeling entitled to being a senator. Um, they saw her endorsement of Kennedy as proof that he was an establishment figure and that you know gave them all the more reason then to continue supporting Marquis. And you actually saw him get a big influx of uh, donations from his supporters. And so, uh, you know, some of them have argued that Pelosi, you know, ended up kind of messing things up in the final days for Kennedy, although the Kennedy camp certainly sees her endorsement as, um, you know, something extremely positive and as a boost for the campaign. Uh, but it's certainly become a topic here. A lot of the voters, as I've been out following both campaigns, have brought it up. Some of them celebrate it, and others of them say, see, this is exactly what we're talking about. The 39-year-old uh, shouldn't get to pull the rug out from underneath uh, Markey. This is such a fascinating primary. We'll see how things turn out on Tuesday. Thank you so much. Thanks, Allison. And you can watch the full story tomorrow on The Weekend Report on Quibi. Viral pro-Trump tweets are coming from fake African-American spam accounts, Twitter says, and it's taking them down. The spammers are posing as black people leaving the Democratic Party in support of President Trump. NBC News reporter Ben Collins joins me now. Ben, tell us more about what happened here and how Twitter found out about it. Sure. So one of these tweets went extremely viral and was also very fishy. It was an account that said, you know, look, I'm a, I'm a lifelong Democrat. I'm going to vote Republican this year. This was on, you know, Wednesday of the RNC. And you can say, you know, I'm done with this trash. I'll be registering Republican. I got 13,000 retweets. Uh, and people were like, I don't really know about this. It kind of appears that this profile picture is a Dutch model, which it was. And I talked to that Dutch model. And he was pretty nervous <laughs> about his identity being stolen. And uh, oh, yeah, it, it, was, it was pretty rough. So Twitter uh, was like, OK, we should look into this. They found a spam network around this account and also another account called Kron619 had 38,000 followers and had five retweets, by the way, that had over 10, uh, five tweets that had over 10,000 retweets. So these are extraordinarily viral things tied to a spam operation that was pushing these pro-Trump messages pretending to be African-Americans. Ben, Twitter says it's seen an increase in copy pasta, an attempt to copy, paste, and tweet the same phrase, and that it may limit the visibility of those tweets. Uh, for non-super techies like me, copy pasta is a new term. What else should uh, average people who don't necessarily have your tech knowledge, what should we be watching out for here? What are other signs that the tweets you might be reading or the posts that you're seeing on social media are fake? So copy pasta is a, is a thing that was used by trolls for a long period of time uh, just to joke around and mess around with services. Now it appears it's being used for political purposes. This was a 4chan thing. It was a Reddit thing. And now it's becoming sort of a Twitter thing to joke around about politics or to seed these political messages. Um, and that's what you should look for. If you see the same tweet being tweeted over and over again underneath the replies of a famous person, a politician, somebody who's breaking news, um, that's what copy pasta is. Mm -hmm. That's done to simulate support for uh, you know a group of people that really doesn't have that much support. It's astroturfing, um, and that's what happened here. These, these some of these accounts 
um, they weren't just retweeted 10,000 times. They, th those messages were then posted onto other fake African-American accounts that were created this month. So uh, this is a coordinated thing. We don't know exactly who's behind it, uh, but we do know this is, uh, this is not authentic. This is very artificial behavior. And it's probably something we're going to see a lot more of as the election gets closer. Ben Collins, thanks so much for talking us through it. And now I know what copy pasta is. I appreciate it. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you. Among the chaos that I found a father trying to teach his son about peace. We don't have to retaliate with anger. We retaliate with love. That's why we're down here. There's always another way. So that's all I want him to see. This is a situation where the state continues to struggle to expand its testing capabilities. Protesters feel that they need to come out in full force and support their community because they feel like they're not getting that support from the Portland police. Another election day coming up against the backdrop of how to keep voters safe amid a pandemic. The moment to truly understand who we are and who we say we are is right here at our feet. You gotta get a four-year degree, but a four-year degree is super expensive. We have created a system where the ticket to the middle class is a thing that middle class families have to stress about and borrow for and patch together. Why is this happening? With Chris Hayes, subscribe now. Today's headlines can be hard to understand and a lot of kids have questions, so we started a newscast for them. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. But we actually saw a large convoy of the National Guard come through here. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. This morning across the country, what the new normal for schools will look like. Many teachers left making tough choices between the job they love and their family. What am I going to decide? Take care of my children or have a job? That's an impossible decision. You're creating a little community school. This is a moment we can just develop ourselves and develop our community. Let's turn it over to students. How do they really feel about returning to school? What I miss is my teachers. They are resilient. A surge in coronavirus infection. New developments on several fronts. The story. Tonight, the U.S. shattering the record for most COVID cases in a single day. From every angle. What's your level of concern that the kids who have been told they're going to be home indefinitely won't be able to catch up? On the ground. Do you have faith that this is going to bring about change soon? And in death. Here in Portland, more protests expected tonight. Do you think that police in this country are under attack? NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. The news business is dynamic and probably has never been more important. With all that we're facing, I am so proud to bring the perspective of a black woman, a daughter of immigrants, the wife and mother of a husband and kids who sadly are more vulnerable to police violence because of their color, a proud nerd, and a representative of the emerging America to cable TV news. I hope the great Gwen Eiffel and my mom, Philomena Carol Lamina, will look down from heaven and be proud. Homeland Security may start collecting phone numbers from travelers coming into U.S. airports for coronavirus contact tracing. Cue the privacy concerns. NBC News Justice correspondent Julia Ainsley joins me now. Julia, we're talking phone numbers and emails here. Who would be subject to this and how does this all fit into the federal government's current contact tracing program? Well, it's interesting, Allison, even Americans who are coming into the United States would be subject to this. Anyone arriving on an international flight would have to start providing more information. If you can think about arriving on your last international flight that might have not been in 2020, you had to provide some information, your address, <laughs> yeah. one phone number. Now they're going to start asking for email addresses, secondary phone numbers, secondary contacts that they can get in touch with. And this is what they are now considering. What is new here is more information, and they say that it's because they want to be able to do contact tracing. So say someone on your flight notifies the airline that they, after leaving the flight, tested positive for COVID-19, then they could alert all of the passengers. That sounds like a reasonable thing to do. But what people in the airline industry are saying is that this goes above and beyond what they're seeing in other countries and actually fails on some other levels. For example, unlike England, where someone would arrive in the UK and have to quarantine for 14 days, there's no such thing like this. There's really even no reporting requirement that you would have 
have to tell the airline after you land. But they say that there aren't enough safeguards on this information. So some people who are civil liberties experts look at how this is being collected and say, there's no end date here. There's no time where they have to get rid of this information or to stop collecting this information. And DHS is so far not putting any safeguards that would keep this information from being used for other purposes like law enforcement. It would go into a database where anyone like ICE, say, could access this. When they say this could be another example of the administration using COVID to really promote some policies that they've long wanted to do, some of them may be to get more information on, say, people overstaying their visas. And they say that it really could cause more privacy concerns as they ask for more information. Julia, what kind of a sign-off would a program like this need? What would have to happen for it to take effect? And are uh, the Department of Homeland Security or the CDC commenting? So right now they're not commenting. We know that this is being uh, kind of pinged back and forth between CDC and DHS. There are people at both agencies who have to look at this and sign off and see if this does meet standards. But, but really, in the end, this could be implemented much in the way we've seen executive orders be implemented kind of overnight by this administration. And then the process could always get halted in courts. One thing that's really interesting about this, though, is the argument that we need to watch people coming in on international flights, because some public health experts that we spoke to, my colleague Laura Strickler and I, said that really it's domestic flights you would want to watch more. There are places in the U.S. with 100 times more the number of COVID cases than some of these international destinations. But really, DHS only has yeah, jurisdiction sure. to collect information on the international travelers, which really throws into question the real reason and the purpose behind this to begin with. Yeah, it does for sure. Uh, Julia Ainsley, thank you so much for your reporting. Have a great weekend. You too. We have our first coronavirus reinfection case here in the U.S., according to researchers in Nevada. Doctors say a 25-year-old man tested positive for COVID-19 back in April, then tested positive again in May. NBC News medical correspondent Dr. John Torres joins me now. Dr. John, this is the first time we're talking about a reinfection case here in the U.S., but we've reported on at least four worldwide over the last week. Tell us what you know about the U.S. case, and then what are your concerns about reinfections going forward? And Allison, you know I like to put things in perspective. So let me put this in a little bit of perspective. Right now, 24 million cases worldwide that we know about. Of those 24 million cases, four are reinfections, are validated reinfections, verified ones that we know happen. So what's happened here in these four cases, one in Hong Kong, one in Belgium, one in the Netherlands, and now one in the U.S., is they got sick. They recovered from COVID-19, and then they got sick again from COVID-19 with a virus that was looked at genetically and found to be a little bit different the second time around than the first time. Two of those cases, they actually had less symptoms, so it looked like their antibodies kicked in and helped protect them from it. The other case, it was a person who had an immune system issues, so they're in a different category, but the U.S. case actually got sicker, and so that's raising a, a few concerns that, okay, what's happening here because the antibodies didn't seem to protect as much, but again, putting in perspective and talking to experts, what they're telling me is they would be surprised if this didn't happen because this is the nature of viruses. They're constantly changing. They're constantly mutating. And these are small mutations for the most part, but every now and then it can turn to a little bit bigger of a mutation, which means that people can get reinfected. But for the average person going around on their daily lives, not really going to affect them. Typically, this happens in academic and research and scientific communities, but now with so much attention being put on coronavirus, we're hearing about it in the media. And the main thing, the main concern is people will get panicky about this and get really anxious about it when, in fact, it's something that's happened on such a limited scale. It is going to take some watching, and a couple things need to happen. One, see if it happens more often. If it happens more often, that gets more concerning. But for the immediate term, What's that going to do to the vaccine? How's that going to affect the vaccine? We don't know at this point, and we're hoping the vaccine still is something you can get once, maybe twice in your lifetime. But if this continues, we see more reinfections, then it might be we need to have vaccine on a yearly basis, much like we do with the flu shot now, Allison. Dr. John, let's talk a little bit, if you don't mind, about how the coronavirus spreads. We know it primarily spreads through the air. Do we have a sense of just how long it survives in the air? 
So on the average, and we've been talking about this for a month, it goes three to five feet. And that's why we talk about that social distancing of six feet. But we're finding out that some of those particles, and this is, again, the nature of how viruses spread, is some of those particles can turn into smaller particles, which are aerosolized or airborne particles, and they can last for longer periods of time. Theoretically, they can last for hours, but that doesn't necessarily mean that that's going to cause people to get sick. But the important part is to make sure that you have those airborne particles in that equation you use to try and figure out how to minimize people's risks. And that means, of course, making sure that that they that when they're in close contact, they wear masks, all those things we talk about because they help with both sides of the equation. Dr. John, I know you spoke with a Harvard professor about why we need outdoor air to stop this virus from spreading. What did he tell you? So, and he's talking about what he's now using, and I use as a fourth W. So, essentially, we talk about wear your mask, wash your hands, watch your distance. And he's added a fourth W, which is, win which is he says windows for the W, but it stands for ventilation and uh, filtration. By ventilation, he's saying simply open up a window. And there's a very specific reason why he says we need to do that. Here's what he has to say. If I'm sick, right, and I'm emitting particles as we talk or sing or cough, they'll accumulate indoors. And in fact, the small particles will stay aloft indefinitely until one of two things happens. One is they're diluted out of the air through ventilation. So you want to bring in more outdoor air. Or you can clean them out of the air through filtration. But really, if we're not doing that, then the particle levels are just going to build up and up uh, in, while we spend time indoors. So essentially what he's talking about, again, is the vent ventilation and filtration. By ventilation, he's saying open windows, which is now the fourth W I'm going to start using, Allison. And by opening windows, we get that fresh air exchange for indoor air, and we lessen the chances of getting coronavirus. That's important. Even when the weather turns cold, it's important if you can do it. Put people, Bundle kids up, bundle teachers up, open those windows. Same thing at home, same thing in offices. All right. It's the fourth W. We'll be using it going forward. Dr. John, thanks so much. You bet. Hey, everyone. I'm Allison Mars. You're watching NBC News Now. Let's go to NBC News correspondent Savannah Sellers. She has the latest headlines from NBCNews.com. Savannah, let's do this one more time. Let's put this Friday in the books and call it a weekend. Yes, let's finish up this week, Allison. Thanks mm -hmm. for having me back. We are now going to talk about the March on Washington. Thousands of people hit the streets of D.C. today to call for racial equality. The gathering also commemorated the original March on Washington from 1963, when Martin Luther King delivered his famous I Have a Dream speech. But, of course, today's march comes less than a week after the shooting of Jacob Blake, renewing calls for police reform. MLK's son offered his personal story earlier today. Not only do I come as a protester, but I come as a victim. My daddy was killed when I was 10 years old, gunned down, you know that, by assassin's bullet. Some of you know, but may not know. Six years later, my daddy's mother, my grandmother was gunned down in the church while playing the Lord's Prayer. So I understand what it means to lose a loved one. Also in Washington today, President Trump announced a full pardon for Alice Marie Johnson. You might recognize her from the RNC this week, where she spoke about criminal justice reform. Johnson was 21 years into a life sentence for a first-time nonviolent drug offense until President Trump commuted her sentence in 2018. Here's part of Trump's announcement earlier today. We're going to give a full pardon. We're going to do it right now. That means you have been fully pardoned. That's the ultimate thing that can happen that means you can do whatever you want in life and just keep doing the great job you're doing. Now, an unsettling story out of California's Central Valley. Merced County officials are ordering a poultry processing plant to shut down following a massive coronavirus outbreak. At least 358 employees from the Foster Farms plant tested positive for the virus, and eight have died. It's unclear how the plant will proceed with the shutdown, and they could not immediately be reached for comment. But local health officials say it's one of the worst outbreaks in the state. Now turning to another sobering indicator of the state of the economy. MGM Resorts is laying off 18,000 employees who had previously been furloughed, meaning now their job cuts are permanent. The casino company did say they plan to keep calling workers back as they reopen other properties, and they'll have health benefits through September 30th.
And finally, an update on Alexei Navalny, the opponent of Russian President Vladimir Putin, who we told you earlier this week had fallen ill aboard a flight to Moscow after a suspected poisoning at an airport. The plane had to make an emergency landing where Navalny was treated by Russian doctors who claimed no poison was found. He was then airlifted to Germany, where doctors did find indications of poisoning. He remains in a medically induced coma, but the medical team treating him says his condition is improving. That's something we'll definitely be keeping an eye on, Allison, as that back and forth unfolds. Oh, Savannah, that is just a wild story. Uh, hoping his condition improves for sure. Thank you so much. Thanks for holding down the fort next week while I'm on vacation. You are the absolute best. I'll see you uh, in September. You got it. Enjoy your time off. Thanks, my friend. President Trump has a pretty busy schedule this weekend. He's heading to Louisiana and Texas to see the damage from Hurricane Laura. But first, he's taking his campaign to Londonbury, New Hampshire tonight, NBCNews.com. Senior White House reporter Shannon Petty Peace is there. Shannon, this is a Make America Great event and an airport hangar there, and it is open to the public. We could see all the folks. But the coronavirus restrictions much stricter than what we saw at the White House last night. Tell us about the rules in the president's upcoming speech. Well, they're stricter because New Hampshire has a state mandate that requires people at an event, over 100 people, to wear a mask. However, as you might be able to see behind me, uh, people are taking that requirement very loosely. There's a lot of people who don't have masks on here. The campaign is handing them out, uh, but people are either wearing them around their chin, around their ear, or not wearing them at all. Uh, and of course, as we saw in the Rose Garden, or in the White House South Lawn, yesterday, where you had people packed in together, not wearing masks, the Trump campaign is going to have an argument making the case that people should wear masks now. Even though it is the law, the White House continues to hold events when it's not required to wear a mask, where no one in attendance virtually has masks on, Allison. Shannon, uh, how about the president's other trips this weekend to Louisiana and Texas? What can you tell us about that? Well, everything's pretty fluid at the moment. He basically announced yesterday that he was planning to do this. Here's what uh, White House Chief of Staff Mark Meadows had to say about it earlier. Uh, actually, we've got two different locations that we're going down. Uh, it, the plans are to, to leave tomorrow to actually head down there to uh, uh, not only uh, evaluate the damage, but, but have discussions with local leaders, both in law enforcement and rescue first responders. Uh, I was on the phone yesterday with, uh, and he was as well, with governors. I was on the phone with law, local law enforcement, uh, as well as a, a couple of mayors. and so. Uh, uh, we'll, it, it appears right now that we're looking at uh, a trip to Louisiana and Texas, although that's still very fluid based on really uh, the needs and, and the demands on the ground. We want to make sure we're not in the, in the way as we go in to offer uh, additional support. Now, of course, Allison, there was a lot of question about whether the president would change his schedule because of this storm. As we've seen past presidents do, and the last time he was supposed to come to New Hampshire, he canceled the plans because of another storm. The president obviously chose to stick to his schedule uh, coming to this event tonight, despite uh, all of the, the tragedy that's really unfolding on the ground there in Texas and Louisiana. Shannon, the Trump campaign also announcing he'll be heading to Charlotte, North Carolina next week for an evan Evangelicals for Trump event. Evangelicals backed the president in 2016. What kind of support does he have with them right now? Well, they still support the president in very large numbers, but not as large as they supported him in 2016. And to get reelected, the president's really going to need everybody who voted for him in 2016 to come out again. So that's an area that the White House has acknowledged. Uh, it has softening support. Uh, Kellyanne Conway was talking about this last week, saying, you know, there's areas like on the pro-life pro movement and other outreach they're planning to do to the evangelical community. This event, obviously, one of them. Uh, the vice president, Mike Pence, is going to be key as well in turning out these evangelical voters. Um, but it, it is a group that they really need to shore up support from, Allison. Shannon, the president has been criticized this week for not condemning the police shooting of Jacob Blake in Kenosha, Wisconsin. But today, Chief of Staff Mark Meadows said they did reach out to Blake's family. What else is the White House saying? Well, and this is something that the president 
uh, did not really bring up in his address. Uh, he talked a lot about uh, the protests and the violence and the rioting that has followed uh, these police-involved shootings, including the one of Jacob Blake, uh, but did not mention Jacob Blake by name. Here's what Mark Meadows had to say about it earlier. Well, he asked me to reach out to the family uh, yesterday. Uh, I actually did that. Uh, I, I spoke to uh, uh, a pastor that's uh, associated with the family, had a very good conversation there. Uh, he's trying not to make this political, but the other part of it, he is a, uh, a, a rule of law president. And what he asked, I can tell you, I was in the Oval when he asked the very first day, when we really didn't know anything about this, he asked the attorney general to make sure that he investigated it, get to the truth, make sure that those uh, that have had any potential wrongdoing are held accountable. It's so, I mean, you can see the White House once again in one of these situations trying to walk this line that they feel like they need to walk uh, between showing some sort of empathy for the victims of these shootings, but at the same time having to show this um, unwavering support for law enforcement and police. And you can hear Mark Meadows saying that right there, that this is a law and order president, essentially saying that uh, you know, they are still on the side of the police, Allison. All right, Shannon Petty Peace in Londonderry, New Hampshire, where we await the president's arrival. Thank you so much. Is silence the key to President Trump's re-election message? NBCNews.com senior political analyst Jonathan Allen says the president can't admit that he's in power right now and the hellscape he projects on his opponent's election is already here. John joins me live now. John, this is a president who so often projects the quiet part out loud, but you write that Trump won't dare say that he is in control here. Why not? Well, Allison, he said that he made America great. And he said that he's going to make America great again, again. Uh, and the part that he's not saying is that to go from having made America great again to making it great again, again, uh, means that it's not as great as it was at some point during his presidency. Uh, and the obvious part of that, the part that's silent, is that there are 180,000 dead Americans from the coronavirus. Uh, the real economy is floundering. Uh, and there's civil unrest in the streets all during his presidency. And uh, as much as he will blame China for the coronavirus and as much as he will blame Democratic mayors and Democratic governors for the violence in the streets or blame uh, liberalism, uh, political philosophy of the other side for the violence in the streets, uh, what he's saying to the public, to the voting public, is that if you elect him president, those things will go away. And yet, right now, he's president. And the question, of course, uh, the obvious question from that is, what's he waiting for? Uh, one of the issues that you touched on there, John, the economy. We have talked about the economy as one of President Trump's greatest strengths. It is often where he polls the best with American voters. Uh, but we just saw the weakness of the economy in the jobless claims out yesterday. More than a million new people were on the unemployment line last week. What does that do to Trump's argument that he has built the greatest economy in history? A fair reading of the Trump economy before coronavirus, Allison, is uh, that it was doing well, but not nearly as well as President Trump uh, liked to tout. That is to say, uh, it was not the greatest economy in the history of the world by any uh, normal measure. I mean, uh, the economic growth that we saw, less than 3 percent uh, by year uh, over the course of the Trump presidency, is modest economic growth, good economic growth, but certainly not um, you know, certainly not anything by by historical standards. His measure of the stock market hitting new highs during his presidency, it typically hits new highs uh, during any presidency. Uh, the unemployment rate, uh, the lowest in 50 years uh, in his presidency, certainly a big deal. But during the coronavirus, it also hit its high since the Great Depression. Uh, we're looking at a period right now where uh, we have seen uh, about 30 million Americans out of work. And uh, we're facing a situation where uh, the stock market economy, where the uh, shareholder economy and the real economy in terms of uh, those who are unemployed, in terms of uh, the ability of businesses to stay open, uh, have divorced themselves. And so uh, what we're looking at is an economy that is going to have some, uh, take some time to, to come back. And so his critics yeah. uh, often, uh, you know, sort of don't take into account the uh, sort of exigencies of 
uh, the coronavirus and how that would have hit any who had to shut down commerce or had to suggest commerce be shut down. And at the same time, uh, Trump's boasts about what the economy was uh, before that period are, are, you know, far exaggerated. I mean, John, you, you went through the issues, right? The things that Trump is trying uh, to pin on Joe Biden here. I mean, he's saying if under a Joe Biden presidency, we'd have violence in the streets, no defense against a pandemic, an imbalanced relationship with China. It sounds here like President Trump is running as the challenger, uh, not as the incumbent. Yeah, he's running against his own presidency. Um, you know, all but saying uh, he's describing the conditions that the United States is currently experiencing and saying this is what it would look like under a Biden presidency. It's, um, you know, sort of a, a remarkable uh, a remarkable thing that's going on. Typically, presidents running for reelection will run as uh, a change candidate in, in a certain way, despite the fact they're in office, they'll say, what it is that they're going to change about things in the next four years. But in this case, the president is attacking essentially what's going on in the country right now and simply saying that's what would be going on under a Biden presidency. Let me ask you this, John. We spoke to a head of the RNC on Monday. Here you are now that it's Friday, now that it's over. Uh, what did you take away from this week? How would you say the Republicans did with their home field advantage going last after the Democrats? Allison, I think, um, you know, from the perspective of trying to rally the Trump base, I think they did a pretty good job. I think mm -hmm. uh, from perspective mm -hmm. of trying to reach out to people who don't already agree with the president, um, you know, we'll have to see. But uh, I'm not sure that the president brought in a whole lot of new voters. Party conventions tend to not do a, a great deal uh, in terms of doing that. And they're typically pretty ephemeral. There may be a little bit of a bounce. There may not be a little bit of a bounce. But voters aren't going to the polls, and they're not mailing in ballots, uh, you know, generally speaking, for, for a little while. Uh, we still have three debates to come. Um, you know, I think this is a, a moment in time that will elapse pretty quickly. All right. Well, both conventions now behind us. John, wishing you and your family a great relaxing weekend full of all the good stuff like baseball. I hope it's a great one. Wishing you a great vacation. Hey, thanks. Is there such a thing as a bad vacation? Uh, not usually, but I mean, in the time of coronavirus, they may be. <laughs> I don't uh, want to find out. Exciting. <laughs> than they used to be. Look, you know I'm simple. If I got a little baseball and a little sunshine, I'll be fine. John, thank you so much. We'll see you soon. Take care. Will President Trump see a jump in his approval ratings now that the Republican National Convention is over? NBC News national political correspondent Steve Kornacki looks at the latest numbers. All right, so President Trump has had his convention, his chance to try to move the numbers in his favor. Let's take a look here. This is where he stood going into the convention. What we're comparing him to here are past presidents at the same point, running for re-election, going into their conventions. What you see here, Trump's approval rating coming into this convention was 44 percent, and running against Joe Biden in the polls, he was losing by nine. Our poll had it at 50 for Biden, 50 for Biden and 41 for Trump. And you can see how that's stacks up against past presidents. You got two who ended up winning easily, Reagan and Clinton. They were both over 50 percent in their approval rating coming into their conventions, and that certainly held uh, to Election Day. Obama and George W. Bush, look at that, 48-47. Those were their approval ratings at the time of their conventions. Both got reelected, but of course, both got reelected very narrowly. So again, the approval rating higher than Trump, and they were just able to get reelected, both of them. And then you see below Trump here, George H.W. Bush, Jimmy Carter, well below uh, Trump in terms of the approval. These are the two modern incumbent presidents who were defeated for re-election. You see mid to low 30s right there. So it's interesting to take a look at this 44 number for Donald Trump because he's sort of between two groups here. He's between the two presidents who lost and the two presidents who won by small margins. And as you start to say, uh, Trump's hopes here lie in getting that approval number up. Obama and, and W give you a sense of where it needs to be. The high 40s. If Obama, excuse me, if Trump can get it to 47, 48 percent, somewhere in that neighborhood, that could plausibly put him in a position to win the election. Now, that sounds 
Very simple, 44 to 47, 48. You know, sounds like an easy thing to do. Keep in mind though, Trump's at 44, he's trying to get to 47, 48. Let's take a look at his average approval rating every day of his presidency. On any given day of his presidency, if you average all the polls that are out there at that point together, take a look here. What's the highest he's gotten? 47.4, that is the highest he's done that was April 1st of this year. As the coronavirus set in, there was that brief period, you can see it right there, where his numbers jumped up, 47.4 April 1st. That's the highest of his entire presidency. The lowest end of 2017 was 37%. And the highest since the summer began, since the summer of 2020, is 44.3. Look at that. That goes all the way back to January 2017. So he's at 44.3 right now. He needs to get up to 47, 48. Sounds easy. But this is the story of his presidency. If he were to get up there to George W. Bush, Barack Obama levels, that'd be quite a feat for him compared to what it's been so far. The Republican and Democratic conventions are over the election, just 67 days away. But some voters still haven't made up their minds yet. NBC News political reporter Vaughn Hilliard continuing our County to County series, this time from Grand Rapids, Michigan. Vaughn, what are voters there telling you about who they might support come November? We're 67 days away, Allison. You said it, 67 days. And this is a time where really it's a matter of trying to turn out folks who have had your back in the past and who need who you need to have have their back in November. And that's why I want to let you listen to a couple of these folks, because we're in Kent County, Michigan. To give you an idea, it was 11,000 votes uh, was the difference between Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump back in 2016. That was the margin. And so if you're the Trump campaign there is the realization that you can't afford to lose many folks here on the ground. And that's where Kent County is our focus, because this is a traditionally conservative area. This is the greater Grand Rapids area, dating back to being Gerald Ford's hometown. But when you have conversations with folks, it's clear that this is a place that has slowly over the years given way, opened itself to voting for Democrats. Just four years ago, Hillary Clinton lost this county by just three percentage points. And that's why Democrats hope that they can make even greater gains in this more middle of the road conservative town, but one that has shown a willingness to vote Democrat in the past. I want to let you listen to a couple of voters we talked to. We for sure are going with Biden, for sure. Um, we, we've, I just feel like this county has, is probably shifting towards Biden because of Trump's track record over the last, what, three plus years. I'm very undecided. Um, I don't know who I want to vote for. The Democrats have potential here, Allison. That first woman you heard from, Sarah Van Deven, uh, she and her husband there, they voted for Mitt Romney back in 2012. And yet they said that they have kids and that they do not want a Donald Trump type presidency. And that's kind of the gist that you get from a lot of the folks here. This is a place where it is 80 percent white, but also about a third of the residents in this county have college degrees. And when you look at the polling, white college educated voters in a significant way are moving their support to Joe Biden here this year compared to just four years ago. You know, on that line with that question, last night I was actually just about a block down the road from here and there was a group of nine men in their 40s, 50, 50s. And I went up and just started a conversation with them, asked them about sort of Joe Biden or Donald Trump. All nine of them described themselves as being either middle of the road or leaning more conservative, but not a single one said that they intend to vote for Donald Trump. And they noted, well, being even, yes, conservative. And they said that they're all part of the same church, uh, a, a Christian reformed church down the road from here. They said that nobody should miss, uh, should take this as a misnomer, that just because you may be conservative and a Christian, doesn't mean you're pledging allegiance to Donald Trump. They said that they, when it comes to immigration policies, uh, prefer a more humane approach. Uh, when it comes to the plight of the poor, being able to reconcile uh, the policies at the federal level with those of those uh, within their own communities that have less than them. I think that's sort of the energy where Joe Biden hopes to tap into here in Kenton County. Uh, Vaughn, let me ask you, what are the top issues for voters there? Are there a couple of issues that they say this is what is going to make the difference, whether I go Democrat or Republican? 
There's a great swath of those voters there that have focused much more on uh, the tactics and style of President Trump in the way that he impacts uh, communities, particularly communities of color, but also the way in which he has uh, largely divided and made folks angry within even communities like this towards their neighbors. But I want to let you listen to a couple individuals who are still up for grabs, you could say, still trying to decide between Joe Biden and Donald Trump here in this crunch hour. Take a listen. I'm not hearing anybody talk about, you know, getting rid of carbon emissions in, in uh, low-income areas. I'm not hearing anybody talk about financial equity and creating real equity for people of color and also Caucasian people. I think, you know, the American people, um, it, it, whoever's president, are not going to put up with this. Um, you know, the law and order does need to, we, we do need to have some sort of civility. You know, you can't just wantonly go and, and, and break into someone's business and burn it down, something that maybe has been generational businesses. So I, I do think we need to have whoever's president is going to calm this whole thing down. Allison, those two voter, voters critical here in Kent County, the first gentleman, DeAndre Jones, he wrote in Bernie Sanders in November of 2016. That second gentleman, uh, Jerry Stepanovich, he voted for Donald Trump in 2016. And he, as of just of one week ago, was much more inclined towards Joe Biden. But as you just heard him say, after listening to that nomination speech from Donald Trump last night, was clearly mirroring, reflecting uh, the concern that Donald Trump is imposing onto the greater country about violence and this idea of riots and the divide within these city cores, something that he said that he himself is concerned about and is what is now leading him towards Donald Trump, Allison. Yeah, Vaughn, 67 days may not sound like a long time, but it certainly gives people some time to, to go over the issues, figure out how they feel, switch how they feel, perhaps. I think we may uh, see a lot of that in, in the days ahead. Vaughn, and I just love that we're back to counting things down. I miss that uh, from, our, from our days way back in 2019 and, and early 2020. Agreed. Agreed. <laughs> Thanks, my friend. Thanks, my friend. If you still don't know how you'll vote in the 2020 presidential election, NBC News is here to help. We have a new state-by-state -state guide called Plan Your Vote. It has information on voting rules, deadlines, restrictions by state. Check it out. That's NBCNews.com slash Plan Your Vote. Jacob Blake is no longer shackled to his hospital bed. That's according to his lawyer, who added that between an abdominal injury, an arm injury, and his spine, Blake can barely move a millimeter without being in excruciating pain. NBC News reporter Shaquille Brewster is in Kenosha, Wisconsin. Shaq, Blake's lawyer said one of Blake's feet had been shackled to his bed because of an outstanding warrant that stemmed from an incident in July. What can you tell us about that incident and also how Blake's legal team was able to get that shackle removed? Right. Let's walk it back a little bit, because we heard from his father, Mr. Uh, Jacob Blake Sr., who said that he one of the more uh, stressful and the hardest part of visiting his son in the hospital, which he did a couple of days ago, was seeing his son with those shackles around his ankles. And uh, that was something that was asked of county officials and elected officials here. Why was that happening? Well, the police chief earlier this afternoon said that those shackles were there uh, by an outside law enforcement agency, that they were put on by an outside law enforcement agency and that Mr. Blake was being guarded because of that warrant that you mentioned. The warrant uh, had to do with a third degree sexual assault charge that Mr. Blake was facing. Well, now his attorneys are saying that that charge and that warrant has been vacated at this point. Those shackles have been removed and the deputies that were there at the hospital have since uh, left and are no longer there at the hospital. That was a source of much outrage, hearing those details. Uh, Gabe Gutierrez, uh, our, my NBC News colleague, he was talking with the attorney general, and he pushed back on that very forcefully. Uh, it seems like it has been resolved. What happened in between and what was needed to, uh, what was done to get those shackles removed and to get that uh, law enforcement presence out of his hospital room, it's not clear at this point. But as of what his attorneys are saying right now, the latest as we have it is that those guards have been removed and those shackles are no longer there. Allison. Shaq, today the Wisconsin DOJ I also identified the other officers who were involved in Blake's shooting. Any other new information there? What can you tell us? 
Well, yeah, they identified the new officers and also gave a few more details about the situation, what led to that shooting and what happened in the moments before the shooting. We already knew the name of Officer Rustin Chesky. He was the officer who fired the seven shots into Mr. Blake's back that was captured on video that sparked all of the unrest. What the uh, new statement from the attorney general, and remember, the attorney general of Wisconsin is the one investigating this. This is a state investigation at this point. Well, the new statement says that uh, Officer Chesky arrived, tried to arrest Mr. Blake, and fired his uh, taser unsuccessfully. Then the statement also lists a second officer, Officer Vincent Arenas, and says that he also tried firing his taser unsuccessfully. We know that a third officer, Officer Brittany Marinick, was there. Not clear exactly what her role was. She uh, has been on the force uh, just since January, but we now know the three officers involved. We also know that they, two of them at least, uh, tried to and attempted to fire their taser and was unsuccessful in doing that. All that coming out in the statement that came out just this morning. Remember, Allison, we, the initial statement that we got was on Sunday. We got a little bit more yesterday and this latest nugget coming this morning. Right. We also got some more uh, information, Shaq. This afternoon, police identified the two people who were shot and killed at the protest right. in Kenosha on Tuesday. What do you know about them? That's right. Two men, one 26 years old, uh, the other 36 in uh, shot and killed in that protest yes. on Tuesday night or after the protest Tuesday night. The first one, 36-year-old Joseph Rosenbaum. We know that he was engaged to be married. We know that he had a young daughter. Uh, Rosenbaum uh, was, oh. according to his profile, he came from Waco, Texas. And then there's Anthony Hubler, who's 26 years old. His friends are calling him a hero because in one of those videos, more the, the one that was widely spread, where you see uh, the 17-year-old with the gun, uh, being chased by several people. Well, that chase began after Rosenbaum was shot and people were trying to chase him to disarm him, according to what they were saying in that video. And uh, Anthony essentially came up and was trying to disarm him when he was shot with that AR-15 style weapon. So those are the two victims as we know it. There is a third victim who uh, is out of the hospital at this point who uh, did not die, was, uh, suffered a gunshot wound. Um, we also know he is involved and he seems to be doing okay at this point. But those are the two victims who lost their lives, 36 years old and 26 years old. Allison. Oh, it's just heartbreaking, Shaq. Shaq, thank you so much for all of the updates today and for your great reporting from Kenosha throughout the week. Thank you, Allison. So what actually happened during the protests in Kenosha, Wisconsin, Tuesday night that left two people dead and another injured? Investigative reporter Emmanuel Saliba used footage from that night to piece together some of the key moments. Just a warning, the video you're about to see is graphic and it may be disturbing. It's around 11.45 p.m. on Tuesday, August 25th in Kenosha, Wisconsin. We're in the parking lot of CarSource, a used car dealership located on the corner of 63rd Street and Sheridan Road. The city of Kenosha has been rocked by tension following the shooting of 29-year-old Jacob Blake by police officers on August 23rd. The city is experiencing a third night of unrest. A warning, these images might be disturbing to some. Two witnesses capture footage of a shooting about to unfold in this parking lot. The first witness standing across the street captures a young man with a rifle running into the dealership parking lot. He's being chased. It's unclear what happened before this moment, but we do know that armed citizens were out in the streets guarding local shops. A shirtless man throws what appears to be a plastic bag in the young man's direction. A second witness captures the same man running after him. They shoot. The shirtless man falls. The young man with the rifle has looped around the car to see that he is now lying on the ground. It's unclear from this footage who fired the shots. The young man takes out his phone and appears to make a phone call. A man takes off his shirt to apply first aid. In later footage, we see that the man on the ground has a visible head wound. It's at this point that we can identify this individual, thanks to specific markers like the orange medical pack, green shirt, blue medical gloves, and a beige baseball cap. 
NBC News has reviewed his social media profile, cross-referenced it with earlier videos of the same individual that day, and is confident that this is 17-year-old Kyle Rittenhouse. He is seen running away from the scene. The same young man with the rifle and the orange medical kit is seen moments later running north on Sheridan Road. A third witness captures footage of him being chased by a group of people. A man wearing a white shirt takes a swing at his head. He loses his hat. Rittenhouse trips and falls to the ground. Rittenhouse sits up and aims his rifle as multiple men run towards him. We're going to play the video again and slow it down to get a better sense of exactly what happened. Here, he fires his weapon at least once towards the man with the light jeans. He shoots at a second person here. The man with the skateboard appears to be hit in the chest. He discharges another shot towards this man with the beige shorts. The sequence of events was also captured by a photographer standing on the other side of the street. Here's the man with the light jeans. He appears to kick the man with the rifle. The first two gunshots are discharged at this moment. The man in the hoodie appears to hit him with his skateboard and tries to grab his weapon. He discharges his rifle again. The man with the skateboard clutches his chest. Another man is in frame now. His hands are up. He's holding what appears to be a handgun. A final shot is discharged. Rittenhouse gets up, turns to walk north towards the gas station. This man in a baseball cap is left holding his right arm where he was hit. He appears to still be holding a handgun. Gunshots continue to ring out. It's unclear where they're coming from. 20 seconds later, we see Rittenhouse run towards police vehicles. He waves and puts his hands up. Police do not apprehend Rittenhouse immediately. According to authorities, the shooting resulted in two fatalities and a third gunshot victim was transported to a hospital with serious but non-life-threatening injuries. The next day, police arrested 17-year-old Kyle Rittenhouse in his hometown of Antioch, Illinois. He faces six charges, including first-degree intentional homicide. Kyle Rittenhouse's attorney said this in response to the charges. This was classic self-defense, and we are going to prove it. We will obtain justice for Kyle no matter how hard the fight or how long it takes. Among the chaos, I found a father trying to teach his son about peace. We don't have to retaliate with anger. We retaliate with love. That's why we're down here. There's always another way. So that's all I want him to see. This is a situation where the state continues to struggle to expand its testing capabilities. Protesters feel that they need to come out in full force and support their community because they feel like they're not getting that support from the Portland police. Another election day coming up against the backdrop of how to keep voters safe amid a pandemic. The moment to truly understand who we are and who we say we are is right here at our feet. You got to get a four-year degree, but a four-year degree is super expensive. We have created a system where the ticket to the middle class is a thing that middle class families have to stress about and borrow for and patch together. Why is this happening? With Chris Hayes. Subscribe now. Today's headlines can be hard to understand, and a lot of kids have questions, so we started a newscast for them. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. We actually saw a large convoy of the National Guard come through here. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays, starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. This morning across the country, what the new normal for schools will look like. Many teachers left making tough choices between the job they love and their family. What am I going to decide? Take care of my children or have a job? That's an impossible decision. You're creating a little community school. This is a moment we can just develop ourselves and develop our community. Let's turn it over to students. How do they really feel about returning to school? What I miss is my teachers. They are resilient. 
surge in coronavirus infections. New developments on several fronts. The story. Tonight, the U.S. shattering the record for most COVID cases in a single day. From every angle. What's your level of concern that the kids who have been told they're going to be home indefinitely won't be able to catch up? On the ground. Do you have faith that this is going to bring about change soon? And in death. Here in Portland, more protests expected tonight. Do you think that police in this country are under attack? NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. The news business is dynamic and probably has never been more important. With all that we're facing, I am so proud to bring the perspective of a black woman, a daughter of immigrants, the wife and mother of a husband and kids who sadly are more vulnerable to police violence because of their color, a proud nerd, and a representative of the emerging America to cable TV news. I hope the great Gwen Eiffel and my mom, Philomena Carol Lamina, will look down from heaven and be proud. Louisiana residents are cleaning up what Hurricane Laura left behind. 500,000 people in the state don't have power, and even the most prepared communities are still a mess today. I think we packed uh, 100 sandbags preparing for it with our family. Uh, the community's done a good job of preparing for it, but uh, after the devastation driving around town, it's a war zone. It really is. It looks like a tornado came through more than a, than a hurricane. MSNBC anchor Ali Velshi shows us the damage in Sulphur, Louisiana. Allison, I'm here in Sulphur, uh, Louisiana. This is part of the problem here. Power down everywhere. You see these power lines down. Uh, we've got bucket trucks. We've got electrical workers. They're working through the state and through uh, East Texas to get power restored. And they are trying to because the winds are down. But the bottom line is there's so much of this damage that it's, it's going to be days, if not weeks, before. I mean, look, everywhere you go here, there are trees down. Uh, this is a residential area. And there are power lines down. In fact, uh, you see this tree down over here. And beyond it, you can you can see a power a, a power pole had snapped, and there is, in fact, a uh, transformer uh, below it. So everything we're seeing has some uh, damage in it. Uh, we've either got trees down, or we've got, in the case uh, over here, take a look at this tree that's come down just toward the edge of a house. Uh, but in this case, you've got the tree that went right through the roof of the house, and that's causing another problem because, as you can see, it's raining now. Uh, and I just had uh, more thunder, which means it's going to rain more. That hamper these repair efforts. In this particular area, a number of the people who did live here did evacuate to other areas, and they are coming back. We're seeing a lot of people at work today trying to clean up their properties. There are some parts of Louisiana, however, that people have not been able to get back into because it's flooded, and there were a lot of people who didn't leave for all sorts of reasons that you and I have discussed over the last couple of days. So authorities are going through trying to make sure that everybody is safe and accounted for, and then that this uh, type of repair that is necessary that people have the help they need and they're able to repair it. So uh, the storm's gone, the worst of it's gone, but in fact, for people who have lived through this or their homes have been through it, there is going to be a lot of work. And it is important to understand after Hurricane Harvey, there was a large percentage of people who didn't come back even a year after Harvey. So once you've got water damage and once you've got structural damage, this work is really hard. Uh, certainly for the next days and weeks, it's going to be very hard for Louisiana. Uh, but this may, for some people, be something that carries on for a matter of months. Allison? 57 years ago, thousands of people marched on Washington demanding freedom and equal rights. Standing in front of the Lincoln Memorial back on August 28, 1963, Martin Luther King Jr. gave his legendary I Have a Dream speech. Today, a new march on Washington for racial justice and an end to police brutality. One of the speakers, George Floyd's sister. I'm Bridget Floyd, George Floyd's sister. I want you guys to ask yourself right now. How would the history books remember you? What will be your legacy? Will your future generations remember you for your com complacency, your inaction? Or would they remember you for your empathy, your leadership, your passion? What we need is change, and we're at a point where we can get that change. But we have to stand together. We have to vote. There's a knee upon the neck of democracy, and our nation can only live so long without the oxygen of freedom. 
NBC News correspondent Garrett Haig has more from the march. Hey, Allison, we've come to the end of a long, hot day here at the Lincoln Memorial and really across the mall. Tens of thousands of people out here today to rally in support of all those lives lost by uh, African-Americans in this country, killed by police, to continue to fight for justice through lines stretching all the way back to the first march on Washington 57 years ago. From speaker after speaker, I think we heard two really clear points today. The first, the obviously political. A number of speakers called on the Senate to pass and the president to sign the George Floyd Justice in Policing Act. They want to see that bill move through the Senate, get to the president's desk, see some real action on this cause. Second was for people not to get tired, not to get fatigued by a struggle that has taken generations in this country, but to stay in the streets, to stay visible, to stay vocal, and to keep the names of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and Ahmaud Arbery and now Jacob Blake on their lips and in the public focus. And Speaking of Mr. Blake, I spoke to his father today. He was here at the march. He was very emotional. He told me that his own father had participated in the first march here 57 years ago, and he traced the arc of that fight through this moment. Until the system is just, there is no justice. Mm, that's right. That's right. There was a, a Caucasian young boy, 17 years old, killed two, shot one, blew his arm off, and walked home. To Illinois. Mm. They gave him a, a bottle of water and a high five. They gave my son seven in his back. Blake's father was one of many relatives of people who've been killed by police who spoke at the end of the program here. A very emotional, really series of moments lined up one after another before this crowd, again, in the tens of thousands, marched from the Lincoln Memorial behind me to the MLK Memorial just a few blocks away. The crowd so big, Allison, it did for a time hold up the president's departure uh, to get out of town. The traffic in the streets of D.C. essentially ground this city to a halt forcing everyone to focus on this issue. Allison. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. Among the chaos, I found a father trying to teach his son about peace. We don't have to retaliate with anger. We retaliate with love. That's why we're down here. It's always another way. So that's all I want him to see. This is a situation where the state continues to struggle to expand its testing capabilities. Protesters feel that they need to come out in full force and support their community because they feel like they're not getting that support from the Portland police. Another election day coming up against the backdrop of how to keep voters safe amid a pandemic. The moment to truly understand who we are and who we say we are is right here at our feet. You got to get a four year degree, but a four year degree is super expensive. We have created a system where the ticket to the middle class is a thing that middle class families have to stress about and borrow for and patch together. Why is this happening with Chris Hayes? Subscribe now. Today's headlines can be hard to understand, and a lot of kids have questions, so we started a newscast for them. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. We actually saw a large convoy of the National Guard come through here. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. This morning across the country, what the new normal for schools will look like. Many teachers left making tough choices between the job they love and their family. What am I going to decide? Take care of my children or have a job? That's an impossible decision. You're creating a little community school. This is a moment we can just develop ourselves and develop our community. Let's turn it over to students. How do they really feel about returning to school? What I miss is my teachers. They are resilient. A surge in coronavirus infections. New developments on several fronts. The story 
Tonight, the U.S. shattering the record for most COVID cases in a single day. From every angle. What's your level of concern that the kids who have been told they're going to be home indefinitely won't be able to catch up? On the ground. Do you have faith that this is going to bring about change soon? And in death. Here in Portland, more protests expected tonight. Do you think that police in this country are under attack? NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. The news business is dynamic and probably has never been more important. With all that we're facing, I am so proud to bring the perspective of a black woman, a daughter of immigrants, the wife and mother of a husband and kids who sadly are more vulnerable to police violence because of their color, a proud nerd, and a representative of the emerging America to cable TV news. I hope the great Gwen Eiffel and my mom, Philomena Carol Lamina, will look down from heaven and be proud. Colleges and universities are trying to control the spread of COVID-19 and keep their campuses open. This week, the University of Arizona said it found early signs of COVID-19 in a dorm and was able to prevent an outbreak by testing wastewater. NBC News medical contributor Dr. Lippy Roy joins me now. Dr. Roy, I'm so sorry to start with toilet talk, but it's necessary today. Uh, would you tell us about this wastewater testing? Could this be a key way to catch the coronavirus before people are even showing symptoms? Well, Allison, it's Friday, so anything goes on a Friday, right? So, um, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, well, this is really interesting. So this is um, the University of Arizona. They are uh, looking at, and they're not the only institution, looking at wastewater as um, as a way to, to monitor for potential cases, um, especially um, uh, especially asymptomatic patients uh, beyond just individual uh, testing, um, nasopharyngeal or PCR testing. And this data can really help predict possible outbreaks um, in specific areas, such as university dormitories. Um, we know that uh, the viral genetic material can stay in, uh, can be detected in, in feces, and um, it can be shed in feces of infected patients. But what we don't know is how long, how much, and how long, according to the CDC. Uh, but this University of Arizona team, um, they're working on the connection between viral cases in wastewater and a number of infected people in the community. So I think there's potential for um, monitoring this um, in, in in advance in terms of predicting outbreaks in, in, in groups, certainly in university settings. So, Dr. Roy, we heard about this study where they were testing wastewater. We also heard this week about a woman potentially uh, getting the coronavirus uh, when she was on a flight in the airplane bathroom. This raises, for me at least, concerns about how careful do we need to be with shared bathrooms? Are those a potential problem site? Does this mean the virus can be transmitted through waste? Uh, again, sorry for all the bathroom talk, but just concerning to think, should I not be using public bathrooms right now? Is that putting myself at, at risk? Yeah, I mean, these are questions where we don't really know all the answers to these questions. And I, I remember we, uh, we've okay. been talking about this, Allison, for months now, right? We've been talking about how we are literally yeah. learning every day about this novel coronavirus. I do want to encourage the viewers to really still stick to the CDC guidelines in terms of what we really do know in terms of effectively reducing the, vi the spread of this virus. We know that we wear masks. I'm going to reach for my masks right now. I have multiple, so wear a mask. Um, maintain that physical distancing and the good hand hygiene. Those are the three main things to do. If you do those three things, it, you have a much more much reduced chance of getting the virus. Dr. Roy, another new study, uh, this one is from South Korea, says that children may shed the virus for up to three weeks. What does that tell us about kids in COVID-19? Are they infectious or potentially infectious longer than adults? Yeah, so this was an interesting study. This is a study by um, uh, groups in South Korea looking at 91 children under the age of 19 across 22 hospitals. And what they found was that um, that half of the kids that were symptomatic and about 20% of the kids that were asymptomatic were shedding the virus about three weeks out. And so this actually has implications in terms of public health strategies um, with respect to mitigation of community spread, especially in light of schools reopening and, and daycares and camps and universities. Um, so uh, it's something to be, to be aware of. And we also, if you couple this study with previous um, uh, uh, studies looking at 
children, where we know that children can both in, get infected and transmit the virus to each other and to adults. Um, this is something that we all need to, again, collectively be aware of while thinking of um, decreasing or mitigating community spread. Mm -hmm. Uh, Dr. Roy, just this week, the FDA approved a rapid test that's cheap, it's quick, it's less invasive than the nasal swab uh, that we have seen uh, quite a bit. Uh, what should our viewers know about this particular test? Yeah, so look, I'm always a fan of uh, new testing, new diagnostics, but the key that thing that I'm always looking for that all uh, public health uh, individuals, certainly uh, uh, the medical and public health communities are looking for is accuracy of the test and rapidity of the results. So Abbott Laboratories uh, has come out with a, another COVID-19 portable antigen test that really des delivers the results within 15 minutes and it sells for five bucks. So that's great, it's cost effective and it's rapid results. Uh, and I think you just you use a, a credit card or it's a, the test is like the size I think, of, a, of a credit card. But again, what to me yeah. what I would want is the sensitivity and specific, specificity of the data um, of, of the results. So I think we need to really see large scale um, uh, results um, in order for me to really uh, accurately say how good this test is, particularly if it's, if it's going to be widespread testing, Allison. Dr. Roy, thank you so much. You hit everything uh, from testing wastewater to new tests. We are very grateful uh, that you were here with us today. Have a really nice weekend. You too, Allison. Bye. Thanks. Just 67 days left in the race for the White House, but left-wing Democrats in Massachusetts are focusing on another race. The progressive group, Justice Democrats, is endorsing Alex Morse, a candidate they think can take on Richard Neal, a 16-term incumbent in the Massachusetts congressional primary next week. Dasha Burns looks back at the Justice Democrats' election record so far. March 2020, Marie Newman, a business consultant and anti-bullying activist, unseated eight-term incumbent Representative Dan Lipinski in Illinois' third congressional district. Congressman Dan Lipinski is the first House incumbent to lose a primary this year. June 2020, Jamal Bowman, a middle school principal in the Bronx, won his primary race against 16-term incumbent Elliot Engel to become the next representative of New York's 16th. Our movement is designed to restore that faith, to restore that hope. In August 2020, Cori Bush, a nurse and Black Lives Matter activist, defeated Representative Lacey Clay, a 10-term incumbent whose family held the seat for over 50 years in Missouri's first. I'm just the activist with no name, no title, and no real money. There's a common thread here. Besides beating out incumbents and in upset primaries, these candidates were all in endorsed by a group called Justice Democrats. Started by some alumni of Bernie Sanders' 2016 campaign, their goal is to elect like-minded progressives to Congress. They recruit candidates to run for office and campaign for them. JD is unique in that we are laser focused on exactly one thing, which is yanking the Democratic Party in Congress to the left. And we do that by challenging uh, corporate friendly, uh, corporate backed Congress people with more progressive, younger, more diverse, often women um, who are running for office because they are fed up with the direction of the Democratic Party. Justice Democrats first turned heads in 20 2018, when they recruited a bartender from Queens, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, to run for Congress. I was nominated to run by a phenomenal organization called Justice Democrats, and then helped her defeat 10-term incumbent Representative Joe Crowley. I can't let you go. She's looking at herself on television right now. In that same year, Justice Democrats endorsed three members of the squad, Ilhan Omar, Rashida Tlaib, and Ayanna Presley in their first bids for Congress. I'm curious to know how you find folks and how you recruit them. We first do kind of a scan of the entire country of where are districts that are primarily working class, that are quite diverse, where the voters in those districts are really hurting because they don't have things like Medicare for all um, or free public higher ed or are really in pain because of the legacy of systemic racism in them and, and the police um, in their communities. So once we find kind of our pool of districts, districts that we think are really ripe for a new kind of leadership, we do a really thorough search of 
all the community leaders that we can find um, of, of folks who have really invested in on the ground in their community for years and years. People who have sacrificed, who've given their all for their communities. If JD's on board with me, I'm filing my papers next week. In 2018, the organization's success rate was under 10%. Now, in 2020, five out of the nine candidates Justice Democrats have endorsed have made it onto the ballot in November, and three are favorites to win in the general. But they haven't yet seen success outside Democratic strongholds. And four out of the five candidates they're backing who will be on the ballot in November are in solid blue districts. Part of this is by design. We, by and large, do endorse in strongly blue districts. That's part of our theory of change, is that we, under no circumstances ever, want to be responsible for um, handing a district to a Republican. Justice Democrats' agenda has not exactly been met with open arms from the party's establishment. In 2019, the DCCC implemented a policy to blacklist outside consulting firms working to help candidates to defeat Democratic incumbents. We're kind of the founding principle of that list. We're the, the, the crux of that list. But Democratic voters had a choice in the primary between progressives and moderates. And the moderate